This story is about a schoolboy who was bullied by everyone for his weak skills and mediocrity in school. He often did not get enough sleep and slept in class, as he liked to play video games until late. His eyes opened and sparkled with joy. Emotions were overflowing. He had not experienced such happiness for a very long time and thought that this was real. Standing in front of the class with their hands raised in joy, everyone was surprised by such an act. Kazuro, that's the name of our main character, thought that he had defeated a terrible monster and saved the world from destruction. Everyone praised him, rejoiced, and thanked him. He was pleased and glad that he had finally become a hero. Opening his eyes, he found himself in front of the class, not understanding what was happening. Everyone laughs at him. Kazuro's smile disappears from his face, turning into the horror of realizing that it was a dream. How ashamed and awkward he felt because he achieved everything he wanted all his life. The world in which our hero lived was filled with monsters, and becoming a hero who would free humanity was his cherished dream. A long time ago, a war broke out on the planet with the monsters that came to our world. They callously killed people and destroyed cities one after another. The idea that this was the end of humanity was real, but the monsters that came to our world were extremely dangerous. But they had one vulnerability. A person could absorb them, making them his weapon. This is how absorbers appeared in the world. Unfortunately, not everyone had this power. Absorbers were in great demand, and their power was our salvation from monsters. But the power of the absorber depended only on the monster it absorbed and the number. They were divided into three types. Those who could absorb the power of one monster, the so-called B-rank. There were the most of them. A-rank, those who can absorb two monster powers and S-rank, three or more monsters. Kazuro was an ordinary low-ranking guy. The thoughts in his head overwhelmed him, standing in front of the class in confusion. The dream was so real it's hard to believe that it's not real. After this, I sat down and wanted to play my favorite game, where you have to kill ghosts. Trying not to pay attention to the jokes and grins of his classmates, he again plunged into the game world. The teacher started yelling at Kajuro for behaving like this. Not only did he sleep in class, but he also sat on his phone and his academic performance was poor. Today is the exam, after which it will be clear who will become the absorber. Our hero completely forgot that the exam is divided into theoretical and practical parts today. On the theoretical side, everything was terrible. But on the practical side, this is what will determine the fate of our hero. Chance to become a scavenger. Otherwise, you will work tirelessly at a construction site until the end of your days. This gave Kazuro strength and confidence, realizing that hard work and hard work on a construction site, pulling bears and operating construction equipment is not his thing. The teacher raises our hero to refresh his knowledge and tell him how to properly absorb monsters and use their power. Kazuro begins to get up from his desk slowly. Kazuro is a witty guy. Knowing how to absorb the powers of a monster, it is enough to find a way to irritate the monster so that it mindlessly attacks, revealing its vulnerabilities, or to attack unnoticed. But this is difficult and rarely feasible. Most monsters can smell a person a mile away. The class bursts out laughing. The answer is not entirely correct. If you act this way, then the risk of death is quite high. You need to act as a group, attack at the same time, and victory will most often go to the absorbers. The guys laugh at the guy knowing how weak he is and how he cannot cope with the monsters alone. His deskmate and best friend Poe also laughs and tells other classmates that the boy clearly doesn't understand anything. The teacher is angry for stupid answers. Monsters have many powers and even control the elements of nature. These are extremely dangerous creatures. You have to be careful. Kajuro didn't care much about the teacher's words. He wanted to quickly start working as an absorber and show everyone what he was really capable of. Answering the teacher's questions, he asks permission to charge the phone, thereby undermining the silence in the class and striking insolence. Kajuro behaves this way because he was always bored at school and there were no useful subjects for him there. The girls in the class laugh at our hero, thinking that he is stupid. Kazuro has long been accustomed to this reaction. He just likes the smiles of beautiful girls. But there has never been a girl. 
The desire to meet a beautiful girl who understands him and supports him so that he can push her against the wall and express all his feelings, or at least a beautiful monster. True, your actions can only scare the girl, and the chance will be missed. The thoughts of this slightly anxious teenager made him blush and did not please the teacher very much. Kazuro always liked to look at beautiful girls, but this was not always the case. He was modest in terms of communicating with girls, and therefore most often heard refusal. From such thoughts, loudly, the class laughed with all their hearts. Only the teacher was ashamed. Anger grew and could barely be restrained. She was already shaking from Kazuro's impudence. But she understood that the boy was only provoking and wanted to leave the lesson. A hit on the table silenced everyone, and the breath caught in their lungs. Her gentle hand in moments of anger turned into a rather dangerous weapon, and getting hit on the head with such a hand would be painful. The teacher's eyes filled with anger. Emotions took precedence over reason. Kazuro knew that punishment would inevitably overtake him. He had not seen such a teacher for a long time. The previous time, he was also to blame for the stink bomb in the office. The teacher sends Kajuro to the wall, hoping that he will come to his senses someday. The boy still manages to laugh it off and is just glad that he was given the opportunity to be alone in the corner. The teacher was very upset by this behavior that her head began to hurt. The teacher begins to tell the children how the exam will be assessed and the options where to take it. A grade can be obtained for completing the room corresponding to the letter B in room B, C, in room C, and D in room D. The children sat at their desks and listened carefully to the teacher. They wanted to pass the exam with flying colors and ensure a good life for themselves. Kazuro also needs to listen to the material, so the teacher allows him to sit down. Since our hero is lazy and weak, the teacher advises him to choose the weakest room. D. Kazuro, listening to the teacher's advice, walked to his desk and rubbed the back of his head with his hand, pretending that he agreed and so and he will do it. Children turn on their holographic computers to select the room where they will take the exam. Difficult choices that will shape their future. Each student carefully reads the description of each room with monsters to determine where to go and what they can pull with their strength. A classmate at his desk suggests going to room D together, to which Kazuro responds with a categorical no. He decided long ago to go through room A to prove to himself and others that he is strong. Poe laughs and advises him to stop joking and do as the teacher said. Without thinking for long, Kajuro presses a button on the screen to start the exam in room A. This choice will entail many tests and show future development towards working in the Absorber Bureau. A teleporter begins to activate on the screen to transport Kajuro to the testing area. Advanced technology with magic makes this possible. Kajuro begins to feel how his body is gradually being sucked into the monitor screen. The neighbor at the desk is shocked by what is happening, since a weak absorber cannot survive in Zone A. He starts shouting to the teacher to pull him out and not let him in. Poe was very scared for his friend and thought that he would not return alive. The teacher starts shouting for Kajuro to stop, otherwise he might die. This is too dangerous for a student of his level. All the children are surprised at how crazy the act is, but he decided a long time ago and was not going to give up. Everyone in the class looks on in surprise as Kazuro is pulled into the teleport of Zone A, a room where monsters live much more dangerous than in the video game. The rest of the children could not even think of going to this zone because they understood that they were too weak. The teacher, seeing how Kazuro was pulled into Zone A, got scared and realized that the exam would not be possible without sacrifices. Our hero and other schoolchildren find themselves in an old, abandoned place infested with monsters. Determination is visible in the eyes. They stood and waited to be brought up to date and told where to go. There was a dark forest and a dark sky all around. Kajuro still had the same company, the school's favorite and main star, Suyuki, with her minions and two classmates. They looked at our hero with great contempt. These were students from another class, and they knew each other. The bespectacled boy always offended Kazuro with the fact that he was a weakling and could not even summon a monster. He stood behind Suyuki 
and adjusted the frame of his glasses on his face. Suddenly a strange ghost appears above his classmates, his red eyes and pale skin. For the first time they saw a ghost in person. The girl felt something appear behind her and began to tremble with fear, and her lips curled and trembled. The guys were scared and alarmed by the appearance of the monster at the start of the exam. The girl immediately climbed into the arms of her classmate, who always loved her. The boy did not immediately understand what had happened, as the girl pressed hard and almost knocked him down. Kajuro did not show fear. He saw a harmless ghost in front of him, although the others were scared. But he looked with suspicion. He was ready to begin the exam and show what he was capable of. This ghost turned out to be an examiner and will take an exam, according to the rules of which Nada will hold out for a day in an old, abandoned hospital and absorb the powers of at least one monster. The ghost looked like an ancient monk who helped people. Crows flew around and created an eerie atmosphere. Having learned that they had to stay in a hospital full of monsters for 24 hours, the children got scared and thought that they would definitely not survive. In order to be protected at night, they had to capture the monster's forces before midnight in order to get into the safe zone. The examiner assured the children that if they were in danger and they could not cope with it, everyone is given a scroll that will take them back to class. If they can kill the goblins and take their bead, they will receive a reward. Scrolls provided the ability to transfer, but not protection. If it was lost or damaged, you would not be able to get out of here. The exam starts now. Two hours left until midnight. Our group stood in front of the huge arch of the hospital with monsters in fear and anticipation of something that will change their lives. A long and tall staircase led to the main entrance, and the decorative arches and decorations on the pillars were quite old. Even in front of such a terrible place, they looked at Kajuro and did not understand why he came here. He had no chance. Everyone was sure of his imminent death and told him to get out. The bespectacled boy stood behind, and this place was quite creepy that he was a little scared. Kajuro stood in front of the entrance and decided to go first in order to find a monster for himself as quickly as possible and test his skills. The guys behind saw that the boy went first. They decided not to split up yet and to follow him. The crows only frightened the children with their cries and forced them to follow inside. Upon entering the hospital, there were pools of blood everywhere a disgusting smell and frightening sounds. Looking at all this, there were fewer and fewer good thoughts, so they stayed together. Kajuro and the rest of the students walked down the hospital corridor. There is blood all around. Fear creeps into the hearts even more, but Kajuro cannot be overcome by this. Being at the front, our hero wanted to play a trick on his classmates by coming up with an insidious plan to scare them. Looking around the corridors of the hospital and seeing several paintings on the wall with portraits of the chief physician and director. The idea of making a joke may not have been appropriate, but it would have diluted the already tense situation. Pretending that there was a crowd of monsters in front of him, he signaled to the others to stop. Kajuro began to slowly move back, showing with all his appearance that he was scared. His steps were very careful and slow. He asked everyone not to make noise. He said that there was a huge fanged monster with a large mouth and a long tail devouring a man, and around there was a crowd of small orcs grinning their teeth. Suyuki and his comrades got a little scared and began to show that they were scared. Kajuro began to scream in fear and run as fast as he could, setting an example for the others in order to scare them more. His scream was loud and could wake up the monsters, so the guys had no choice but to run away from here and back to the exit. The children rushed to run along the blood-stained corridor towards the exit, trying not to turn around. The fear in their eyes gave them the strength to run faster and hope for survival. While on the street, the students fell exhausted to the ground, knowing that the monsters did not leave the exam area, they could relax. They tried to catch their breath and calm down. Suddenly, after they came to their senses, they noticed that Kazuro is not with them. The thought was that he did not have time and was grabbed before leaving. But suddenly loud laughter is heard from the balcony of the hospital. The guys raise their heads to see who is laughing so hard and see him. It was Kajuro, standing and applauding his cowardly classmates. For the first time, he mocked them. 
We bought it, he said. He clapped his hands and said that now it's clear who the bespectacled coward is. The guys were terribly unhappy with this action and began shouting at him in an irritated voice. They were ashamed that some weakling humiliated them, especially the main beauty of the school. The bespectacled man, without finding words, told Kazuro everything he was thinking and said what he would get for it. Beauty was upset at how she was set up and made to feel afraid, because she is the strongest of them. Her skill level was much greater than the others. The henchmen began to tell Kazuro what a brute and scum he was. Kajuro looked at their frightened faces. He was relaxed and felt no fear. Confidence in his abilities was high, but the statements of his classmates slightly shamed him. The beauty, proudly raising her head, said that she was not afraid, but simply followed the others, that in case of danger she would save them. To which the henchmen were touched by her words and were sure that she would have saved them. She was from an influential family and meant a lot to them. Kajuro, listening to all this nonsense, simply turned around and left in search of monsters to absorb and defeat them. And while they are on the street, he has a better chance of finding someone first. Suyuki and the guys were very unhappy that they were being ignored and were not going to leave it like that. Going down to the first floor, he began to explore the offices in search of monsters and came across an ophthalmologist's office from where strange sounds were coming. Here it is, Kazuro exclaimed joyfully. Suddenly the same group entered the corridor, praising their queen, and began to say that he should not interfere with them and, if he saw or heard anything, tell them, and the beauty would sort it out. Kazuro was already fed up with their arrogance, and knowing that there was a monster in the office, an insidious plan matured in his head to teach the upstarts a lesson. If they are so strong, then it will not be difficult for them to defeat the monster. Politely letting them into the office, asking forgiveness to the beauty for their behavior, gives them the opportunity to be the first to fight the monster of this office. Fortunately, there are enough monsters in the hospital. Entering the office, they saw a strange creature sitting on a chandelier fan and were seriously scared. Their mouths were wide open and wanted to scream, but they understood that they would then be noticed and could be killed. This monster possessed the magic of illusions and made them feel their worst nightmares. He used his skill and a red light sparkled on the dark ceiling, which shocked them and made the children stand in stupor. Looking into the big red voice, the trio froze in a trembling stupor, succumbing to hypnosis. Kazuro watched from the side, not knowing the full danger, thinking that they would cope and just waited. At first, he didn't understand why the guys froze and began to cower in fear. Seeing the trembling beauty Suyuki leaving the office, Kazuro turned pale. He was scared, thinking that he had set them up by falling into a very strong monster that none of them could cope with. Are you okay? He said, to which the girl told him what the monster was capable of, how he mocked them, forced them to plunge into their darkest nightmares. But it didn't last long, and we managed to get out. Afterwards, they decided that Kajuro had set them up and that he knew about the monster, but did not warn him. It turns out that he used them to find out the monster's weak point and defeat it. The beauty and the company were terribly angry and said that he had no chance anyway. Kazuro, realizing that the target guys came to the conclusion that the monster is not strong enough to kill them, which means defeating it will not be difficult, you just need to be more cunning. This infuriated the guys even more that he considered them unreasonable. Seeing that the irritated guys were leaving along the corridor in search of other monsters, Kazuro began to figure out how to catch the monster in the ophthalmology office and absorb its power, since it is very entertaining. The ability to freeze with fear will give you a great advantage over your enemies. Seeing a switch on the wall, he came up with the great idea of spinning the monster on the chandelier fan, thereby stunning it. Kajuro presses the button and waits for the show. Seeing the monster spinning on the fan and screaming, Kajuro stood in anticipation of defeating it. Hearing from Suyuki that the monster has hypnosis, Kajuro did not look at him and closed his eyes. The monster began to beg the guy to stop it, and he would give him the power. Kajuro is a smart guy and knows that monsters cannot be trusted, but he pretends to believe the monster so that he will buy it. Kajuro turns off the fan, expecting what the monster would do, and he, in turn, wanted to attack the guy. But it turned out that from such spinning, the monster's eye had dried out, 
and could not use hypnosis. The monster asks the guy to give him eye drops from the cabinet because his voice has dried out a lot because of it. Now, if Kajuro wants to survive, he must do as the monster said. Otherwise, the red eye will attack the guy and tear him into small pieces. For now, Kajuro agrees, thinking another thought in his head on how to defeat such a monster. He does not take his voice off this scarecrow hanging on the chandelier. He begins to walk towards the medicine cabinet and tries to open it. Seeing that in the cabinet, in addition to various medicines and potions, there was also medical alcohol. Kazuro immediately understood what he had to do, and carefully, without giving it away, wiped the sticker off the bottle. Throwing the bottle to the monster, without showing it, he began to wait for a reaction in order to attack in time. He did not want to be hypnotized, and stood with his back to the monster waiting for him to start using the drops. The monster, smiling creepily, was already imagining how he would deal with the guy after he dropped his voice. Opening the bottle, he brought it to his eye and dribbled. Kazuro had never heard such cries of pain before. Smiling sarcastically and watching the monster through the reflection on the glass door of the locker, he realized that this was the right time to attack. Gathering his power, he casts the absorption spell. Glad that everything went so easily, Kajuro was excited about how absorbing the monster would affect him. The monster began to turn into a red stream of mana that rushed into Kazuro's body. Realizing that now he would strengthen his abilities, he was ready to immediately find out what this monster was capable of. Having absorbed the monster, Kazuro saw in the mirror how the monster was imprinted on his body. It was a red voice. Now he could stop the enemy and weaken his abilities. This ability was still very weak, but it could be upgraded. As he left the office, he began to notice that the red voice allowed him to see other monsters nearby, despite the obstacles. The corridor was all stained with blood, and there was a light fog around that rose from the monster's abilities, hiding them. Indeed, the ability of the bloody eye was amazing. It gave Kazuro confidence because now he could control where the monsters were and were not afraid of an accidental collision. Meanwhile, the beautiful Suyuki and her henchmen came across several goblins. The beauty was not taken aback and hit one. Realizing that there were more enemies and she might not be able to cope, they decided to run away. Running along the corridor as fast as they could, they tried to break away and find a place where they could fight off the damned creatures. The bespectacled boy screamed the most and did not want to die. His friend was also very scared and hoped that Suyuki would protect them. Kajuro on the landing, walking down. The thought immediately came to mind that he would distract the goblins and the group would be able to escape. The guys, seeing Kajuro, immediately said that now it was his turn to take on the enemy and reminded him that if he couldn't, then let him use the teleportation scroll. Seeing the crowd of approaching goblins, Kajuro even became happy because he remembered that the examiner said that their beads were very valuable. Finally, the time has come to use the bloody eye for its intended purpose and get rich, Kajuro said. It is noteworthy that the bloody eye acts on monsters a little differently. It simply fetters them so that they cannot move. Kazuro, having previously obtained a chainsaw in one of the offices, began to mercilessly destroy the goblins because there was a good reward for them. Holding the green goblin stones in his hands, he already imagined what he could spend them on, what fun things to do and what he had long wanted to try from food. Wandering through the corridors, all the ghosts and monsters fled from Kajuro. His abilities frightened everyone and made them run without looking back. But it was all in vain. Kazuro killed them without a twinge of conscience, hoping to profit from something valuable. Continuing to walk along the corridor in search of a worthy opponent, he stumbles upon a surgery room from where a strange glow and music can be heard. In it sat a beautiful maiden with ample breasts and long black hair. She was dressed in a kimono and a white strap was visible on her belt. Kazuro and the devoured monster, seeing the beauty, immediately blushed as bad thoughts entered their heads. She sat in the office and played the zither. The melody was pleasant and bewitching. The skills of this beautiful monster fascinated and frightened at the same time. Who knows what she's capable of? Kazuro wondered what such a beauty was doing in the operating room and how strong she was. He felt danger from her but could not estimate how much. Kajuro began to think about how to defeat her and absorb the power. There were several ideas, but the red voice dissuaded him from going. 
since he knew that she was dangerous. Kajuro then suggested that she was not just in the operating room. He thought that she had died during the operation and that this place was holding her captive. Plucking up courage, he saw the doctor's coat, and the idea came by itself. Armed with a syringe, he decided to pretend to be a doctor. If she wanted to attack, the red voice would grab her, to which the voice said that she was too strong and this wouldn't work with her. Opening the door, Kazuro looked at the girl playing a musical instrument, afraid to take the wrong step. Hearing the noise, the beauty immediately exclaimed in a menacing voice and was not happy that she was interrupted. She immediately used a musical impulse with her magic to stun the enemy. Kazuro felt the power of the beautiful maiden's zither. The pain in my ears was severe and made it impossible to move. Falling to his knees, Kazuro was confused and thought that he could die in a skirmish with such a monster. He introduced himself as a doctor and hoped that it would help. Her gloomy face showed distrust and anger. The desire to kill was visible on her face. Kazuro began to say that he was a professional surgeon and would be able to help her. Trying not to show his incompetence, he began to clean up the workplace and ask the girl to trust him. Having convinced her to lie down, Kazuro took out a syringe and asked what was bothering Our Lady that she needed to have an operation. Kazuro blushed, looking at the beautiful forms, but the beauty's words surprised him more because she asked for a breast reduction. Life had not prepared him for this. Making a serious face, Kazuro asked the girl to relax so that he could give her an injection. Her skin was so strong that the syringe did not want to go in. Without showing it, he tried to inject more than once, pretending that he did not hit the vein. Through tears, the girl began to scream that enough was enough and asked him to get ready, otherwise she would kill him. Kazuro said that her skin is too strong and the needles won't take it. They can try something better, if she agrees, without anesthesia. In the process of trying to inject the beauty, at that moment classmates passing by heard voices and decided to see what was happening there. Surprise was visible on their faces. They looked at what was happening in surprise and admired how fearlessly Kajuro spoke to the monster. He grew in their eyes and made them think that he was not as weak as he seemed. Also, all this time, Kajuro was being watched by an examiner who was a ghost. The ability to fly and not show one's presence allows one to evaluate children's actions fairly and impartially. But Kajuro's actions made the examiner wonder how confident he was in the face of danger, how he correctly assessed the situation. After so many attempts to inject the busty girl, she finally gives the go-ahead for the operation without anesthesia, but asks to be more gentle if not like the girl in front of him. Taking out a chainsaw, Kazuro did not want to spoil such beauty and tried to dissuade her. He started the chainsaw, the sound of which really infuriated the beauty, and began asking questions like how long to cut. Should they be the same or should one be larger than the other? Kazuro knows that in order to devour a monster, he must make him angry. In his head, he tried to come up with more caustic words in order to achieve his goal and absorb her power. Kazuro reminded her that without anesthesia, it would be very painful, so she would have to endure it. After so much bullying and stupid questions, the girl became very angry, starting to scream and threaten Kajuro. Taking her zither in her hands, she wanted to use her strongest spell and kill Kazuro. The monster's aura was very strong, but the level of irritation reached a limit, which was not difficult for the guy to absorb its abilities. Using his power... Kajuro takes great pleasure in casting absorption spells. The busty beauty watches with great surprise as her strength is useless in front of Kazuro and the attack played a cruel joke on her. The monster's powers were absorbed. The screams coming from the office could be heard throughout the entire hospital. A monster of this level of power should give amazing skills, the guy thought. The skills were successfully absorbed and Kajuro now had two monsters with super skills. Now all that remained was to gain enough trust from them to team up in battles. Confidence in his abilities, thirst for more. Now with two monsters of this level, he will be able to defeat anyone by giving them orders. The busty beauty began to shout at him that he would control her so unceremoniously. She was her own mistress and would not tolerate anyone ordering her around. Kazuro assured the girl that he had something else in mind and was not going to boss her around. He wanted to make friends with them in order to defeat his enemies, and he would never push around such a beauty. With virtues like hers, you can stop anyone.
The beauty was dissatisfied with the guy's vulgar jokes and confronted him about his depraved thoughts, to which he replied that she had misunderstood again. It just so happens that the skill of the red eye fetters the enemy, but the enemy's mind is clear. This does not give 100% confidence in holding for a long time and puts him at risk. And with the beauty's skills, their brain is exposed to fear. It cannot think sensibly, and in a duet with the bloody eye, immobilizes the enemy confidently and for a long time. Hearing over the hospital speakers that there was less than an hour left by midnight, the voice from the speakers suggested that those who had absorbed the monsters should go to a safe zone to rest and gain strength. Hearing this proposal, Kajuro headed there in the company of his two monsters. The desire to see his classmates who thought he was weak and prove them wrong overwhelmed him. The school beauty and her friends heard that time was short and Nada was going to the safe zone. They were just nearby and came first. Seeing what the room looked like for those who had absorbed the power of one monster, they were upset because it was dirty and cold. While the trio was looking at the room and complaining about the lack of comfort, their classmates approached the entrance. The girl was upset by her cowardice because she had not absorbed a single monster. The guy tried to calm her down and tell her not to worry. Kazuro approached them from behind, confident and pleased with his victories. Entering the room, he met a bunch of people who kept pestering and teasing him. However, Kajuro didn't care about them anymore because he knew what was cooler. Kazuro passed by. He listened to their banter and complaints that they did not want to be in the same room with him. Kajuro reassured them, saying that he was not like them, and that's why he was going to the apartment for one. Chamber for VIP clients. The guys were surprised by this decision and didn't believe it. They thought that Kazuro was deceiving them and the system wouldn't let him in, but the thought of doubt was visible that he could still do it. Approaching the protective barrier of the VIP chamber, Kazuro extended his hand to open it and enjoys the reward of a worthy client. The guy's reaction didn't take long. When the barrier was opened, everyone was incredibly surprised by this decision. Everyone thought that he was cheating and was unfairly getting into the VIP chamber. Anger consumed them, and there was no end to their emotions. Kazuro's grin only added gasoline to the fire. Entering the room, Kajuro saw a plate of hot food and a pleasant atmosphere. The room was warm and the pleasant smell was driving me crazy. The camping stove, in which a delicious dish of fish and vegetables was cooked, showed by its appearance that it was delicious, and the smell conveyed all the contrast of the components. Having tasted the tender fish dish, he closed his eyes in admiration and tried to fully appreciate the taste. Having appreciated this delicious dish, he approached the barrier, behind which stood the main beauty of the school with her henchmen to tease them. But they couldn't go in and try. The anger took them more and more, but watching how Kazuro ate the fish with great appetite and enjoyed the comfort was disgusting. The arrogance of the main beauty of the school did not allow her to spend the night in a room without amenities and comfort. She wanted to get into the VIP room and was ready to negotiate. Sitting in his cozy room, Kazuro ate delicious dishes, but the trio disturbed him with a desire to buy his right or exchange with him for a fee. Kazuro, looking at their angry and arrogant faces, refused to teach them a lesson. No matter what amount they offered, he would still stand his ground. His classmates stood their ground and offered him a lot of money to give up his place. Unexpectedly, the girl reminded him that she was from a rich and influential family, and he would not be in trouble for such behavior. Putting his chopsticks aside, Kazuro looked at them and thought that he had not taught them a lesson enough if they continued to behave like this and the threats were unnecessary. Approaching them closer, Kazuro offered to fulfill his wish if they so wanted to get into his apartment. Our influential beauty received an offer. If she slaps her partner with glasses, he will think about the offer to switch with them. She immediately agreed, which made the bespectacled man surprised by this decision. A classmate immediately calmed the guy down, saying that she would compensate for the blow, reminding him that her family was influential and would help him. Preparing for the blow, the girl swung with all her might and hit him in the face, almost knocking off his glasses. The bespectacled man was even thrown back from such a blow, he was confused. Well, I'm happy, the girl said. Now will you give us the place? Kazuro changed his mind, and saying that it was great, but not impressive, turned around and joyfully, after such and such a show, decided to go to the table and continue the meal. 
Realizing that Kajuro would not give them his place, they turned around upset and left. Glad that the group had finally left behind, I continued to enjoy the hot food. Against the background of their screams, another welding of classmates flared up. Unfortunately, not everyone was able to absorb the monster's power. Those who were unable to absorb the monster before midnight were prohibited from entering the safe zone. The girl was very afraid to be alone and asked her classmate to be with her. Kazuro knew this couple because the guy was in love with her. He often ran after her at school and helped her in everything. I have never seen a classmate answer him. She was afraid to be alone, asked the guy to take places with her and give up his place because he loved her. Knowing that her classmate is not indifferent to her, she uses an insidious technique in the form of a kiss to achieve her goal. She was sure that the guy would give in and give her the place. Looking at this, Kajuro understood that she had taken advantage of him, and he felt sorry for the guy. But he could not do anything. After the first kiss from the girl he loved, he immediately agreed to everything and gave up his place. Now, the girl was safe, and he remained near the entrance to wait until dawn. Kazuro was very tired from all these scandals and quarrels and lay down in a warm bed. He fell asleep quickly, and his snoring was so loud that it did not let anyone sleep. Because of the terrible snoring, no one could sleep. Everyone was tired and looking at these beds, they did not think that they could sleep here. And the snoring drives them crazy. The thought of what a bastard this Kazuro is doesn't leave them alone. Being in this blood-spattered room, we looked for a cleaner place to rest. The influential classmate was already dreaming that morning would come and teach the nasty Kazuro a lesson to prove that she was the strongest and most gifted here. Looking at the blood-stained bed, he doesn't understand how anyone can sleep here. The bespectacled boy, in order to please his beautiful classmate, offers to lay his shirt down so that it doesn't get dirty. But alas, it will not be possible to remove the smell of blood. Putting a shirt on the bed didn't make it any cleaner, but it did provide at least some place to lie down and rest. The idea was good. The desire to please my classmate was great. While everyone was trying to sleep and rest, our loving boy, who had sacrificed his place for his beloved, was sitting near the safe zone looking at his watch. Suddenly, he heard a noise coming from the dark corridor, some ominous growling and grinding. Goosebumps of fear immediately ran through my body. Approaching closer in front of the guy, an entity appeared, two meters tall and with blood-red eyes. The classmate immediately took a defensive stance and prepared for battle. The appearance of this monster was like maniacs from horror films. The mask was tied with ropes, through which one could see. The bloody face of the monster made everyone fall into horror. The boy was pretty scared when he saw such a formidable opponent standing in front of him. A trembling ran through his body. Cold sweat appeared on his face. His eyes twitched with fear. Trying not to faint, the boy gathered the strength to call his absorbed monster to help. The devoured monster was an axe-wielding warrior, a strong opponent. He saw the face of the frightened boy and did not yet know what he would have to fight. Unexpectedly, a warrior with an axe is attacked by a huge maniac with a chainsaw. He looked so intimidating that the warrior with an axe was not sure that he could survive a fight with such an opponent. Having managed to place a block, he saved himself from a crushing blow from a chainsaw. Sparks flew in all directions, and the force of the impact was incredible. Hearing what was happening behind the barrier, everyone woke up and jumped out of their beds. Even Kajuro came out to see what was happening. Everyone was scared, except him. The guys started shouting to a classmate that her boyfriend was attacked by a monster with a chainsaw, and he was fighting there. To which the girl, trembling, did not say a word. Jumping headlong under the blanket, she was cowardly with fear and was afraid only for herself, showing that she was indifferent to him. Everyone was shocked by this attitude. Her boyfriend is fighting a monster, but she doesn't care. Each of her classmates looked at her with contempt for her indifference to him. Kazuro, confident in himself, decided to come closer and assess how much selenium the monster is and whether it is worthy of being devoured. A monster with a chainsaw attacked the warrior with an axe, knocked him to the ground and began to trample him. Everything was so fast that the guys barely had time to see everything. The blows were very strong and it was clear that the warrior with the axe was losing in this duel. His chances were getting less and less. 
Being pinned to the ground, a monster with a chainsaw tears off the warrior's arm. The monster's foot stood on the head and squeezed it. From the pain of tearing off his hand, the monster barely remained conscious. It was a cannibal. He greedily ate the warrior's hand, trying to get enough. Such a monster was very difficult to defeat. His mask tied to his face hid who he really was, and his torn clothes spoke of his long stay here. Having appreciated the taste of the axe warrior's flesh, he was not satisfied and threw it away. Apparently, the taste of the same monster was unpleasant for a cannibal with a chainsaw. Being angry and hungry, he continued to attack the warrior in order to kill him. The anger caused by hunger was very strong and frightening. Taking his saw in his hands, he began to loudly gas it, causing the sharp chain to unwind. After another blow, the warrior's head was cut off. Fear and bitterness were visible in his eyes. The fight was not equal, but there was nowhere to run. This was his last fight. The head lying at the feet of the absorber said that now he was next. The warrior he so hoped for turned out to be too weak in front of this mountain with a chainsaw. Kazuro was amazed by the monster's strength and understood that such a monster would be very useful in his collection. Such strength and power. What? Nada. His satisfied and interested face was thinking about what he lacked for battles, and an attacking monster would be very useful. The monsters that Kazuro absorbed only had a stun effect, and there was no warrior among them. Having collected such a trinity, he will be able to withstand any opponent without any problems. While Kazuro was thinking, the cannibal cornered his classmate to taste his flesh. The roar of the chainsaw drove me crazy and made me even more afraid. In fear, he began to scream for help. The horror he felt was indescribable. Thoughts that this was his end appeared in his head. Classmates, seeing this, being afraid to do something themselves, began shouting to his girlfriend that he would die now if nothing was done. She didn't care about the guy. She was afraid herself and did nothing. She just trembled under the blanket and said that she was scared and wouldn't get out. Kajuro was disgusted to see such a reaction. He saw betrayal on her part. It was disgusting to realize that such love. While everyone stood behind the barrier and cowered in fear, instead of distracting the enemy, the boy in tears begged them to save him, at least Kazuro. His eyes began to shed tears of despair. Swinging his chainsaw, the monster tried to cut the guy so that he could taste the fresh, young flesh. But although the guy was scared, he didn't give up so easily. Having dodged the blow, he wanted to get to the barrier by sneaking under the huge monster. The saw chain, stained with blood, only splashed blood everywhere and frightened him with its roar. Unfortunately for the guy, the cannibal had a good reaction and did not miss the moment, hitting the guy in the stomach from his knee, realizing that he had missed the saw. The boy began to fly to the side, feeling severe pain from broken ribs. The blow was so strong that it broke a couple of ribs and blood gushed from the mouth. He had never experienced such pain. The chances of salvation disappeared with every second of confrontation with such a powerful monster with a chainsaw. Flying away from the blow, he slammed into the wall, almost losing consciousness. The number of fractures and the pain that followed them was great. The splash from the blow and strong cries of pain could be heard throughout the entire corridor. The condition was deplorable. The monster slowly approached with a screaming chainsaw to finish off the boy. The monster looked at him like he was a piece of meat and did not feel any pity. The sharp chain wanted to greedily dig into the guy's flesh and shred it. Being stunned and barely conscious, he suddenly feels pain in his shoulder. Seeing how the chain has dug into his body, tearing his flesh, he screams in pain. The sawn-off hand that the monster was holding was dripping with blood. The guy lost consciousness as a result of the incident. Greedily and with a crunch of bones, the monster ate the guy's hand, saying that he had not eaten human flesh for a long time. Horror ran through my body looking at this. While the monster was eating his hand, the boy began to come to his senses. Having come to his senses, he saw the monster eating his hand and remembered that the examiner gave them scrolls for salvation. He begins to slowly put his hand into his pocket so that the monster does not notice and takes out a scroll from there. Taking the scroll out of the inner pocket of his jacket, he wanted to quickly use it and save himself, realizing that he had failed the exam. 
The scroll glowed and was quite bright. The monster could notice such a glow. After finishing his hand, the monster notices bright glares of light behind him and turns to the guy's side. Wanting still young human flesh and waving a chainsaw, he attacks him so that he does not run away. The monster's obsession was immeasurable. The boy, with the last of his strength, manages to jump to the side in order to survive. From such a blow, fragments flew. The thirst for profit, the desire to kill, such a monster could not be stopped. Kajuro shouts to his classmate to quickly tear the scroll, otherwise he will die. Kajuro behaved quite calmly when they tried to kill a classmate in front of his eyes and did not interfere, to which the boy gathers his thoughts and agrees with this. Fear prevents him from thinking normally, but Kazuro's words reminded him of what to do. He kneels down and tears the scroll with his teeth, while the monster swings his chainsaw in anticipation of the final victorious blow. Tearing the scroll with your teeth releases a huge power of teleportation back to the classroom. She acts quite quickly and can save anyone in a difficult situation. The boy was saved. The chainsaw blow did not catch the magic of the scroll, and the monster remained a beggar. A sharp saw chain flew through the boy's already disappeared head. The monster was very confused and did not understand what had happened. He screamed out of anger, not understanding where his prey had gone. He wanted more meat and thirsted for blood. The body expressed tension and readiness for aggressive actions. Kazuro was waiting for the right moment to fight the monster. Because his power made it possible to absorb the monster when he was as enraged as possible. Plus, he had to come up with a plan on how to defeat such a thug. Looking at the boy, the monster begins to shred the barrier, but it does not give in. Anger overwhelms him, but this is not enough for Kajuro. The big and angry monster has been trying to cut through the protective barrier for a long time and does not want to give up. Kajuro pretends that the monster is not trying hard, yawning and showing complete calm, that the monster's strength does not impress anyone and does not cause fear. The monster is even more irritated by this situation. Kazuro comes up with the idea of going up to the barrier and teasing the cannibal with his delicious hand, thereby angering the monster more. The boy provokes the monster by saying that his hand is so tasty and full of protein and the taste is just lickable, to which the monster, drooling, looks at the hand, emitting a pleasant young smell of flesh. Hunger controls him and gives him no rest. The monster cannot break through the barrier and begins to understand this. His face can't tear himself away from the sight of the nice, fresh meat that he loves so much. Kajuro teases the monster more and more, to which he boils. He abruptly removes his hand and begins to make faces, sticking out his tongue and fooling around with all his might. This brazen behavior of the guy began to make the monster very angry. I use a hail of my strongest blows on the barrier, exuding anger and loud screams with the chainsaw chain hitting the barrier in the hope of getting to this wretch and devouring him. After such an attempt, the monster decides to retreat, realizing that he was wasting his energy in vain because he failed to break through the barrier. Kajuro notices that the monster can leave. Kajuro is not happy with this situation, and he activates the barrier to get out. The monster must not be released otherwise it could harm someone else. Having collected himself, Kajuro comes out, thereby showing the monster that he is not in the protection zone and can be attacked. The monster pays attention to the boy and with great desire wants to kill and devour him. Turning around, the monster rushed to run towards Kajuro, its desire for hunger and anger taking over and controlling it. The drool, like that of a dog, developed at high speed. Kajuro decided to have fun. Realizing that he should not show his strength to his classmates, he began to gain time by mocking the monster. The monster can't keep up with the guy and hits the barrier. The children are amazed at Kazuro's stupid and reckless behavior, but they don't interfere. Once again, the monster leaves as a beggar, screaming in irritation. This was not enough for Kajuro, and he goes out again to provoke the monster. He again sees the guy come out and teases him. Kajuro will not back down and will bully the monster until he wins so that he gives up. This time he runs even faster, screaming and the crazy roar of the chainsaw, trying to have time to cut off this damned head of the impudent boy. But again he doesn't have time. 
Kazuro stands in front of the barrier and laughs right in the face of a huge monster. Classmates are at a loss as to how brave or stupid he is, so they tease the monster. Suyuki, watching such risky actions by Kazuro, was a little worried and did not understand why she would do this to a monster. A classmate in a blue jacket and blonde hair was very surprised when he saw that the monster began to run away. The bespectacled boy, hearing the words of his comrade, also began to look and was stunned by the fact that Kazuro ran after him. The guys were so surprised that they did not understand what was happening and how Kazuro could so fearlessly pursue such a huge and evil monster that only recently he almost killed their classmate. Chasing the monster along the corridor, Kazuro tried with all sorts of screams to stop him and fight to absorb such a big guy. But the monster was already very exhausted by Kazuro's pathetic jokes and actions and therefore ran away. Having caught up, he began to provoke the monster with his hand, saying how tasty and juicy it was. The monster was very surprised by such actions that the boy chases after him and offers to devour him. This has never happened to him before. Looking at the guy's hand, hunger again spoke in the monster's head, and he tried to attack the guy. A tasty and juicy hand loomed in front of the face and only beckoned with its appearance alone. Launching his chainsaw, he swung without a shadow of a doubt to kill this slippery provocateur and devour him. The strong swing of a large chainsaw with sharp teeth on a chain was already aimed at the boy's head. Having time to react, Kazuro uses the magic of the red eye to stop the monster. Such a spell is enough for such a thug, but not for long. The ability was useful and allowed you to control and not allow yourself to be attacked. It worked! Kajuro exclaimed. And looking at the frozen body of the monster, he began to insult that he was weak and could not do anything. Kajuro's arrogant feeling gave him the opportunity to take a closer look at the monster and not be afraid for himself, being motionless. The monster choked with saliva while looking at the delicious boy. He wanted to quickly kill and devour this scoundrel. Kazuro's provocations did not stop. He kept showing his delicious hands and saying how delicious he was. Freed from the stupor spell, the monster immediately attacked the guy, but he dodged as if nothing had happened. The strong impact of the saw began to cut through the floor of the hospital, and a large number of sparks began to fly in all directions. The monster was already on the aisle, so if it would be enough to absorb it a little more and its defense would fall, it would become an easy prey for Kazuro. His body seemed to be burning with great anger towards the boy and wanted to kill and tear the insolent man into pieces. A look that exuded the maximum level of hatred and anger made his whole body tense. This was the limit of his emotional protection. Now Kajuro could attack him. Kajuro, with a slight smirk on his face, casts an absorption spell. Now he will have a great attacking warrior in his arsenal. It begins to absorb the monster and all its abilities. In bewilderment, the monster screams, not understanding how he was defeated, and in every possible way shows his dissatisfaction that this should not have happened. Finally, the boy had an attacking monster, which was displayed as a chainsaw on his hand. The collection has been replenished, Kazuro said. He looked at his left hand and enjoyed the new sign of the monster that would serve him. The examiner watched everything that happened. He was sure that this was the new Lord of the Monsters. Although the guy's actions were questionable, there was almost no doubt. Through the windows of the hospital, he saw each and every action of the test participants. The examiner saw great potential in the boy, and the way he dealt with such a formidable opponent while playing raised many questions. His thoughtful look began to suspect that the boy really had abilities that would help him achieve high results in life. The speakers in the safe zone said that there were seven hours left before dawn, and the guys were getting ready to continue the exam. The speaker worked on the examiner's magical abilities and did not require electricity, which the hospital did not have anyway. The children panicked, because the monster that Kazuro ran after could be nearby and waiting for them. They were sure that Kajuro had already gone to class after tearing up the teleportation scroll, because he could not defeat such a monster. Kajuro enters the room with his hands in his pockets, showing complete calm and confidence. They looked at him with many questions, but they did not think that the boy was capable of absorbing such a big guy with weak indicators. 
Kazuro said that the monster with the chainsaw is no longer there, and they have nothing to fear. If they want to complete the exam, they should look for other monsters. Classmates with surprised and angry faces did not believe that such a bastard could win. They began to assume that the monster simply ran away somewhere, and Kazuro did not find him, and they think that he wants to set them up again. Despite the insults of his classmates, Kajuro began to think about how the absorbed abilities of monsters could help him become one of the leaders of the Devourers. Remembering that the Absorbers have their own hierarchy of strength and class, he already imagined how he flaunts himself at the top of the food chain and controls everyone. After much thought, he was tired since he had slept very little, and running after the monster had exhausted him greatly. I didn't think for long. I plopped down on the bed with a comfortable mattress and tried to sleep. The warm room warmed us, and the smell of food gave us comfort. As dawn came, the sun began to filter through the dusty windows. The street was calm and quiet. Huge houses could be seen through the windows nearby, and the place did not look so abandoned. Leaving the VIP room, Kazuro had breakfast with warm toast cooked on a magic tile that she cooks herself. The mood was good, and he looked pretty good. Seeing his classmates leaving the safe zone, he noticed that they looked tired and hungry. Suyuki held her stomach and also wanted hot food and warm tea, but to get involved with Kajuro, who set them up. Kazuro decided to offer them his toast as a sign of reconciliation and act more amicably. If they don't eat, they will have little chance of fighting monsters without powers. This only infuriated the principled beauty Suyuki and the bespectacled man, but their friend was interested, although he understood that it was low to agree to such a thing, to be friends with trash. Kajuro began to smile at their reaction and continued to finish his toast. From the guy's conversations, the traitor to her boyfriend finally woke up, and everyone looked at her with contempt. She yawned loudly and drew attention to herself. Kajuro stood near her bed and, hearing the sounds, turned his head and stopped chewing. Seeing that everyone was looking at her like that, she felt guilty, but she was not going to show it. The condemning glances seemed to cut her from the inside. Kajuro and the others looked at her, showing complete disgust for her action. Kazuro said that she took advantage of the guy's feelings and he paid for it, and she, in turn, did not even help him. That guy didn't deserve this. Hearing Kazuro's words, the girl became pretty angry and began to make excuses that she did not have the absorbed monster and could not help him in any way. You should have helped him, the girl exclaimed. Kazuro began to shout at her that she had abandoned him to the mercy of fate and they had to help him. The monster that attacked him was very weak and they did not know how to save him and they were not obliged to. He survived, but failed the exam, outnumbered by his competitors, Kajuro said. The girl's gaze was filled with fear and disappointment in herself. She was overwhelmed with emotions and anger towards others who blamed her and did not stand up for themselves. The examiner was watching them all this time since he has no right to interfere. Now he had to inform the guys about the last test for them and finish the exam. A voice from the speakers intervened in the welding of classmates, announcing that the upcoming test was to capture or destroy a dangerous monster. They have until noon! The trio of our hero's main haters began to discuss a plan to catch the monster. They had to gather their strength and pass the test. Suyuki decides to take action and asks his comrades to keep up and keep their eyes open. Not everyone agreed with the words of the main beauty, since the monster that had to be caught or killed was of the highest level, and the monsters they absorbed were of an average level, and there was little chance of such an undertaking. Suyuki began to reassure her friend by saying that there were three of them, and they could cope with such a monster. Hearing that everyone was making plans to catch the monster and not offering her their help, she was terribly scared, realizing that she would be alone. Suddenly a monster with a large tongue and glowing eyes appears on the ceiling behind her. The girl does not feel threatened because she is very worried that no one wants to help her. Noticing the monster, Kazuro tensed up greatly as it came out of nowhere and took them by surprise. Fear temporarily consumed him. The others didn't even show that they noticed anything. The monster looked like a cross between a man and a spider, huge claws and six glowing eyes. Such a creepy creature could climb walls and ceilings silently, and the spikes on its hands looked very sharp. 
Kazuro was even more surprised that only he could see this monster. The others did not even notice such a huge thing on the ceiling. They were calm, which means they definitely didn't notice anything, remembering that one of the skills of the red eye is to see other monsters and their aura. Thanks to him, he was able to notice this. Kajuro realized that only he had a chance to defeat such a dangerous high-level monster. Kazuro began to tell them not to relax, because the monster might be somewhere nearby and attack them. Meanwhile, the monster began to descend and crawl closer to the girl standing near her bed. Pointing his finger at his classmate, he says that there is a monster over her, and everyone needs to leave here urgently. His face did not show fear, and the guys again suspected that the boy was joking. The others didn't believe him because they didn't see the monster. Again, they decided that Kajuro was mocking them in order to provoke them. Suyuki said that such jokes are too dangerous and cruel to the others. And Kajuro, we need to stop making fun of them like that. The girl standing in the corner, realizing that everyone still blames her for what happened, is very unhappy that they are making fun of her so much, since she is very afraid of monsters. She begins to feel that no one needs her anymore. Suddenly, a hand breaks through her thin waist, making a deep hole in her stomach. This wound was very large and fatal, damaging internal organs and causing shock. Everyone, seeing this, became a little worried and realized that Kajuro was not joking. The girl stood opposite them with fear and shock in her eyes, and the hole in her stomach was bleeding heavily. Suyuki was very frightened and ran into her friend with blonde hair, who stood behind and was also shocked by what he saw. Lowering her eyes, she noticed a terrible wound on herself. The shock did not let her understand what had happened. There was no one nearby, and here it was. Fear permeated her entire body, and there was no saving her. The girl began to ask in fear for help, not understanding what had happened. Grabbing the girl's almost lifeless body, the monster wrapped its tongue around her and grabbed her by the face with sharp claws. He greedily devoured her with his gaze and did not feel any pity for the girl. The monster was large and had six eyes, which helped him see everything clearly. He tears her into three parts mercilessly and cold-bloodedly. All that the others see is how the standing girl simply flew into pieces, but Kazuro sees the monster and understands everything. The lifeless remains greatly frighten others. Standing in bewilderment, the guys begin to understand that the monster is invisible and they have no idea how to fight such an enemy. They all stood together at the end of the corridor and wondered what they should do in such a situation. Kajuro tells them that he sees the monster thanks to the red eye skill and they should run away from here. The beauty understands that the red voice should have gone to her since she was the first to see it. This makes her very angry. The bespectacled man who was taken away cannot yet think soberly and stands shocked. While the guys stood at a loss as to what to do, Kajuro turned around and ran to lure the monster out and kill it alone. The others notice that the only person who can see the monster begins to run away. The beautiful Suyuki decided to think about what to do, but the bespectacled man reasoned with her in time that this was not the time or place to think. They should run otherwise, and they would be torn apart by the monster. She was very angry at Kajuro for so mercilessly letting the monsters kill and not trying to help. The trio began to run after Kajuro because he alone could see the monster. The girl decided that the girl had a better chance of killing such a creature if she acted together with Kazuro. Seeing the trio running after him, Kazuro didn't like it because he was hiding his skills, and if they saw them there would be too many questions. Seeing that a monster was chasing them, Kazuro had to choose between the secret and the lives of the guys. The monster moved very quickly along the walls and did not lag behind. The boy with blonde hair ran as fast as he could and hoped to survive. Kazuro looked at the monster who was catching up with them and realized that he had to decide quickly, otherwise he would die. The speed and dexterity of such a creature was great. It was necessary to act with certainty. Suddenly, a monster with a chainsaw spoke in Kazuro's mind and offered to let him deal with this six-eyed one. He felt a strong disgust for that monster and wanted to kill him. Chainsaw wanted blood and fights. He was not comfortable sitting and doing nothing. 
He was eager to go outside and have fun. Kazuro had heard that the monster with the chainsaw wanted a fight, but he didn't see the opportunity yet and had no idea how to act. Kazuro doubts that a chainsaw will overcome such a monster, but the idea of how to win comes to mind almost immediately. Feeling that they won't be able to run for long and the monster is still faster, Kazuro decides to attack. Stopping abruptly, he is already preparing to enter the battle using his monsters in a fight with such a dangerous six-eyed thing. His classmates, who were running as fast as they could, saw that Kazuro had stopped. Very tired of such a marathon, they started shouting at him to run. Suki looked at the boy in surprise and said that they had to get to the exit and then the monster wouldn't touch them. Kazuro, having gathered himself, decided not to run, but to take the fight. Everyone was surprised by such courage or naive stupidity to engage in battle with such a monster. They tried to dissuade him. The bespectacled boy and Suyuki thought that it was better to get to the exit than to face such a monster that was not visible, understanding. Knowing that they wouldn't be able to run for long, they began to support Kajuro and hoped that he would win. Realizing that they are not as brave as him, they begin to root for him. Having approached, the monster jumps on our hero in an aggressive manner to tear him into small pieces. He stuck out his tongue and waved it in all directions. The examiner watching them had a camera built into his voice. He was not the only one watching the children. The headquarters of the monster absorbers, which organized these kinds of exams, considered candidates to join their ranks. Many participants were killed and severely injured. The board members watching were horrified by the number of deaths and injuries. There have been too few worthy absorbers in recent years. There are fewer and fewer of them. The exams went very poorly. There were too many losses, and there was great resentment. Hopes that there would be no worthy candidates were too high. One of the examiners started smoking a cigarette, trying to calm his nerves after seeing losses among applicants. Turning to a colleague managing Zone A, asking if her candidates had a chance to survive. His candidates failed the exam in Zone B. There is hope, said Yuri, a member of the board and one of the strongest absorbers. A guy named Kazuro has a good chance of joining their ranks, but it all depends on whether he will survive the battle. They saw on the monitor screen a guy's fight against a high-ranking monster and hoped that the boy would cope. An aggressive face with an open mouth and protruding tongue ferociously approaches Kazuro. This green creature looked very disgusting and only wanted to kill as many children as possible. Casting the red-eye binding spell, Kajuro prepares for his next actions. Everything happens so quickly that the slightest mistake will cost him his life. But the monster managed to dodge, sensing a threat, and decided to attack from behind. While the boy is trying to understand what is happening, he heads towards him. Kazuro, realizing that he didn't have time, decides to push the limits of his powers by casting another spell. His red eye didn't work on such a fast monster. The monster has almost reached Kazuro, extending his hand with huge and sharp claws. The speed was incredibly fast and the agility was amazing and resembled animal instincts. The guys couldn't look at it and, realizing that this was the end for Kazuro, they closed their eyes, realizing that it was the end for them too. Look, a classmate exclaimed. There was fear and hope in his eyes. Cleaning his hands from his face, the blonde boy notices what is happening and tells his classmates. The guys see Kazuro summoning a monster whose abilities can be compared to the invisible monster. The bespectacled boy is very surprised and a little jealous that he didn't get such a monster. Suyuki clenches her fists as she watches what is happening and is a little nervous. Having used a spell on the busty beauty, which affects the brain and fears, he managed to make the creature freeze at the last second. The melody of the busty monster was played on a zither musical instrument, which, coupled with her abilities, only enhances the effect. The monster, frozen in the attack pose, could not move. Shocked that Kajuro had another monster, they wondered where from. It was written in the school cards that he had the weakest level and could not absorb more than one half-monster. The blonde man began to suspect that Kajuro had forged his profile. The bespectacled boy looked, not understanding how this was possible. Had he really been hiding his powers since entering school? Sweat ran down his face. Thoughts of why he was hiding his potential and strength haunted him. Finally, 
Kazuro gives free rein to the monster with a chainsaw so that he can deal with the six-eyed degenerate and releases him by clicking on the saw symbol on your left hand and summoning a monster. The entity that emerged from Kazuro's mana was huge and resembled a monster with a chainsaw. The massive and terrifying monster was a warrior under Kazuro. Six-eyed, seeing a monster with a chainsaw was pretty frightened. Realizing that he could not withstand so many strong spirits, he began to try to break free and run away. The attempts of the six-eyed man were even. The monster with the chainsaw, getting closer, wound up his chained beast and launched it with all his might to cut the six-eyed monster into pieces. The saw began to cut the monster and splash its blood all around. Strong cries of pain and suffering rang through the hospital corridors. Entering the body of the six-eyed man, the saw made him feel pain and fear of imminent death. The disobedient body from the spell could not move and create barriers before attacks. The busty beauty begins to play a different melody using a destruction spell when the enemy has little blood left, finishing him off with her explosive impulse. Blood splashes in all directions, and all that is left is a stain of dirty red substance on the floor. Having defeated such a fast and nimble monster, Kazuro was glad that everything was over. The monster with the chainsaw was pleased with such an epic battle. On the floor, a round stone fell out of the six-eyed one, similar to the goblin stones, but larger. Such a huge stone probably costs a lot of money. By collecting such a lot, you can arrange a comfortable old age, Kazuro thought, holding such a treasure in his hands. After finishing the fight, he returned all the monsters back to himself. Now he wanted to rest and think about what to do next when the exam was over. Realizing that his classmates saw that he had several high-ranking monsters who could tell the director and punish the guy. Watching our hero from around the corner, the three guys had a lot of questions and did not understand how such a weakling and incompetence could absorb three monsters at once, and two of them were the highest. The school beauty Suyuki imagined a pedestal on which she stood only in second place, it was humiliating for her. She was from a family of high-ranking officials, and such a shame would simply finish her off. She thought about how to prevent Kajuro from absorbing anyone else and try to find monsters herself to defeat him. In her eyes, other plans were being drawn up, more cruel as a last resort. Kajuro looked quite mysterious, since everything they knew about his abilities was not true. Watching what was happening on camera, the heads of the power absorbers looked at Kajuro and were pleasantly surprised. They had not had such a strong absorber for a long time. He still had a lot to learn, but what was visible? This is his talent and power of absorption, the last one they remember with similar abilities. There was one little girl with a rabbit and a blue bow on her golden hair. The small and seemingly innocent girl turned out to be a strong and dangerous monster absorber. Suddenly, a man in black shoes enters the applicant observation room. Everyone greeted him politely and waited for what he would say. They understood that everything depended on the decision of this person. He was a smiling, elderly man with glasses and gray hair. He was interested in how you are progressing the exam and whether there are any candidates. He was dressed quite simply and did not stand out with expensive outfits befitting his official. The manager of Zone A replied that she had found a suitable candidate and he had incredible abilities to which the director replied that she would supervise his training and provide him with everything necessary. She stood quietly with her coat draped over her shoulders and listened to the order. Meanwhile, Kajuro stood on the roof of the hospital and looked at how beautiful it was around. A plan was emerging in his head to climb to the top of the absorber's career ladder. There are still too many monsters in the world that haunt people. Fighting them is a priority goal and at the same time will help rise to the top. Monsters have captured quite a few cities and continue to rampage, killing and destroying everything around them. Knowing that he could absorb an innumerable number of monsters and use their power, he began to imagine what powers could be useful in his difficult path of becoming the ruler of the absorbed monsters. The types and powers of monsters are varied, and in order to understand which ones are suitable for him, he must absorb as many as possible. And then the army of monsters with their abilities in the power of Kazuro will be invincible. Then he will be able to become an invincible fighter of humanity who will stop extinction. The examiner looked at the time, which was only seconds away. 
He already wanted to give a command to the exam participants to stop searching for monsters. Hearing over the speakers that the exam time has come to an end, the examiner asks the participants to gather before leaving the hospital and announce the results. The exam was passed for all survivors, but based on the points scored in battles, we will determine the winner in an additional condition. The tall blonde man scored points for only one absorbed monster and did not participate in battles and takes last place. He spat on that stone from the examiner. He was glad that he survived. The bespectacled boy was in one battle and absorbed one monster. He comes out in third place. He was not happy because he could have done more, but there were three of them and they had to share. Our beauty, Suyuki, also absorbed one monster, but killed two and takes second place on the podium. She was happy in her heart, but she didn't yet think about who would take first place. The examiner, focusing on Kajuro, began with great pleasure to list the guy's merits during the exam in the hospital. The one who killed six regular rank monsters, one high rank monster, and also absorbed two high rank monsters and one medium rank monster, was recognized as the best student who passed this exam. Since the additional condition was met, the examiner gave Kajuro his well-deserved reward, a high rank monster stone. The examiner asks the children to stand in a circle and send them back to school. I use my abilities, the examiner flashes with a fiery aura summoning a teleportation circle. Children stand in a circle and prepare to meet their classmates and teachers to talk about what happened. We are transported to the school from where Kajuro was successfully transported to the exam. The sunny day outside lifted my spirits. In a normal world, the exam lasted only 40 minutes while on the exam day. The teacher nervously prayed that her students would be alive and well. Finally, the children began to teleport back to the classroom. The teacher was obviously happy not realizing what was happening to the children. Her face was covered with horror from what she saw. Tears in her eyes were running in dense and large drops. The children that emerged were severely mutilated. Some were missing limbs, others were holding broken arms, some had vision problems and many mental injuries. They stood near their desks and begged for help, screaming from the pain and fear that they saw during the exam. In front of the teacher lay her student in torn clothes. His torn shirt was covered in blood, and the guy's tears from pain showed horror at what he saw. He begged the teacher to help him and take him to the hospital. The teacher ran to the first aid post to call doctors for help. The hysterical state forced him to act very quickly, and the endless crying from what he saw gave no rest. The doctors who came to the rescue began to quickly examine the children and try to save them. The wounds received during the exam were terrible. Many would be crippled for life. Many people in medical suits carried wounded children on stretchers and bandaged their bodies, trying to stop the bleeding and treating the wounds. Kajuro, having teleported to his place, saw how badly the exam went for the others. He had never seen so many wounded. There was a silent question in his eyes. Why is all this? The teacher saw Kajuro standing safe and sound. She went up to him to find out how he was feeling and whether he needed medical help. The guy stood in shock and could barely answer the teacher. The teacher came up to him in tears and hugged him, stroking his head, reminding him that why he didn't listen to her, go for the weakest exam, but chose the most difficult one. Fortunately, at least he returned alive and pressed him to her chest. This made Kajuro come to his senses a little and became a little embarrassed. He had never felt such beautiful and soft breasts so close. The teacher was clearly concerned about the children's well-being and did not think it was inappropriate. The teacher asked how his exam went, to which Kajuro pointed to the monitor screen. Seeing the results, the teacher was surprised since the guy did not stand out in any way and was even weak compared to the rest of the students. With a big smile on her face, the teacher began praising the boy for his great achievement. Kazuro was very surprised by her actions. She constantly just shouted at him and reminded him how stupid he was. He looked at the teacher and was glad that he was finally praised. Kajuro had only modest joy on his face, but the awkward situation did not leave him. She also noticed that Kazuro had a bag of decorations on his table. Having asked where he got them from, she only heard that he came across dead bodies and removed them, as well as from defeated monsters. The package contained a variety of jewelry and stones, you could get good money for them on the black market if you tried to sell them or exchange them for something more valuable to the boy. 
The teacher looked at him and was surprised that he took the time to loot while there were monsters walking around. But judging by the maximum number of points scored, it was not so simple. She saw in him a future fearless hero. This was hope for humanity. His aura was sunny and his hair was long and his clothes were like royalty. This is how she imagined Kazuro's future. While the teacher stood, flying in the clouds, Kazuro looked at her in bewilderment as to what she was up to. There was admiration and joy on his face. Maybe she wanted to invite me to a cafe, Kajuro said. Throwing away these stupid thoughts, Kazuro notices that a teleportation circle begins to appear near him and is supposed to transport his best friend, Poe. Kajuro hoped that he was okay and wasn't hurt. Having appeared, the fat man slept soundly, not giving the appearance of being alarmed. There was not a scratch on him because he chose the weakest level of the exam. There were almost no threats there. He didn't even pay attention to the great commotion and many cries of pain around him. His sleep even made saliva flow from his mouth. Kajuro tried to wake him up and ask how he was. How was the exam? But the fat man didn't even show that he was waking up. The sleep was sound and undisturbed. Seeing the bubble sticking out of his nose, Kazuro wanted to burst it. But that didn't help. Rushing with bills and words that he would feed the fat man delicious food, Poe opened his eyes. Seeing the money and words of treat in front of him, Poe could not refuse. How mercantile and hungry you are, Kajuro said. The fat man, stretching and yawning, had not eaten anything for a long time, and the words about food woke him up. After school, the guys went to their favorite cafe, where they served their favorite dishes. There were always a lot of people and a lot of office workers near the restaurant, since there were large office buildings nearby. Suddenly, Kajuro's phone rang, seeing that his parents were calling. He picked up the phone without hesitation and heard his father's voice. He had not seen them for a long time since they lived far from the city. The parents were extremely happy for their son that he passed the exam. The teacher had already informed them about this. Tired of the farm work, they really wanted to hear their son's voice and get distracted. Kazuro was pleasantly surprised by this call and was glad to hear from them. Joyful, he told what he saw during the exam and that he discovered new abilities in himself. The parents were very proud of their son and rejoiced at his success, encouraging him in every possible way that he had now become so independent and could achieve a lot. Having said goodbye to their son, they stood with bloody sickles. The joy seemed a little crazy. Standing against the backdrop of sunset in a cornfield, they clearly were not telling their son something. Dead bodies lay at their feet, some were still alive and in fear tried to beg to let them go. The father stood holding a sickle in his hands with blood flowing down it. Many soldiers of the head of the absorbers were killed and only their heads lay. Kazuro's parents. Apparently, they won't just leave them and others will come. The parents' secrets about their lives and what they really do have not yet been revealed. Without a twinge of conscience, the father went through the neck with a sickle. They left no one alive. Praying for mercy and leaving them alone yielded nothing. After all, this was not the first time. My father's eyes showed anger and contempt for the attackers. He understood that he had to do something quickly. Otherwise, these mercenaries would drive them in and finish them off. Standing in front of a pile of headless bodies, the parents began to think about what they should do to protect themselves from the regular influx of mercenaries trying to kill them. The mother also noted that if these mercenaries find out that they have a son, then this will bring great danger to Kajuro. She had to act immediately. The father, with a maniacal smile, imagined what he would do with these scum in suits. If they only try to get closer to their son. Sitting in a cafe, the guys ordered the largest plate of hot appetizers of meat and fish. It looked like a salad of delicious ingredients. The fat man from hunger grabbed the meat on skewers in two hands at once and with a huge smile and joy thanked Kazuro for such a table. He wanted to quickly taste the most delicious snacks and enjoy such a lunch. Kajuro looked at the pleased Po and was glad that his friend was healthy after the exam. Seeing how much this dish cost on the menu, Kajuro sweated a lot. He had enough money. He earned a tidy sum for the jewelry from the testing zone, but he didn't want to spend it so thoughtlessly. But when else will he be able to see the happy fat man with whom he sat at the same desk?
Kadzuro understood that after the exam, their paths would diverge to different educational institutions. It wouldn't be a shame to spend money on this, Kadzuro said. While they were eating, the fat man began to tell him that he had found himself a smartly protective monster who saved him from a monster with a hammer and a bandaged head. Without realizing it, he climbed straight into the mouth of the trash can monster, and after some time they agreed to work together. Kazuro now understood why he was haunted by the disgusting smell of a garbage dump, and he was thinking about himself. Poe behaved quite normally and did not pay attention to the smell. After eating some tasty snacks, Poe remembers that Kajuro went to take the A-level exam and came back safe. He wanted to know how this happened and how he survived. Kajuro began to tell that he was able to absorb several monsters and fought with very dangerous monsters. Some students from their school died or were left disabled after brutal battles with monsters. He recalled that their classmate was torn apart before his eyes. Suddenly, their gaze turns to the TV, which was broadcasting battles with monsters. The fat man looked at the participant with admiration and said that this was the strongest girl he had ever seen. This was the same girl that the board members of the monster power absorbers were talking about. Her abilities were strong and may even surpass those of Kajuro. She could easily fight strong monsters and kill them with her strength alone. The fat man admired this beauty with a bow. He always dreamed of seeing her live and shaking her hand. She was like an angel, modest, quiet, and very beautiful. Her bow and white dress made her look like a completely innocent child. Kazuro looked at her and did not find her attractive. Such a quiet woman was clearly not so simple in character. Usually quiet people are very dangerous, said Kazuro. The fat man began to defend the girl, saying that Kajuro simply does not understand anything about women. No one would even look at him with such judgment about people. Kazuro, after such words from his best friend, was a little offended, but understood that Poe was right about something. Smiling, Kazuro said that the fat man was not much more handsome than him and also did not feel female affection, to which the fat man sweated quite a bit and fell silent with a downcast face, realizing that Kazuro was right. Kazuro loved to play tricks on the fat man, since he was naive and gullible, and he added that when he gets to university, he will definitely find a girl he can only dream of. Of course, Kajuro lied a little, trying to calm his comrade down by saying nice things. Having eaten his fill of food and having a pleasant evening in the company of a classmate, Kazuro called a taxi and said goodbye to the fat man. While he was waiting for the car, there were thoughts in his head about what that same girl should be like. After waiting for the car, Kajuro walked over and opened the door and sat inside. It was already dark outside, and the way home was not close, pretty tired. He already wanted to quickly get to bed and get some sleep. In the background, the city was illuminated by many lights, and even in the evening it was very light. The yellow taxi drove quite quickly through the city at night, passing many buildings, but Kajuro did not pay attention to it. Thoughts about rest did not leave him. He looked at his phone, looking at his classmates' stories on social networks. Remembering how terrible it was in the class, he was a little worried about them. Suddenly, the taxi jumped on a bump and Kajuro almost let go of the phone from his hands. He immediately began to pay attention to what was happening around and suspect something bad. Looking out the window, he noticed that the houses along the road were completely different from the ones leading to his house. The driver was taking him in a completely different direction. But Kajuro realized this too late. He looked at the driver with great fear, something he had only seen in films about kidnapping. The driver did not pay attention to the guy's words and only accelerated the car to get to the desired point faster. Suddenly, the car began to drift at high speed and turned around and stopped near an abandoned construction site. It was dark and not a single person around. Horrified by what was happening in front of him, the door opened. It was a taxi driver. He asked Kajuro to get out of the car. Kajuro, fearing for his life, begins to suspect and closely monitor his actions. Kajuro did not move. Then the driver threw him out of the car. In front of the construction site stood a girl with her back turned and a huge pumped-up man sharpening his blade. They sat near an abandoned building and waited for Kajuro to approach them. Kazuro stood up and shook himself off from the fall, raised his head, 
and saw a girl in an outfit that looked like a clown, Harley Quinn style, thought Kazuro. Turning around, her face was indeed painted like a clown, and her hair was multicolored. She was quite serious and very suspicious. Kazuro looked at her and said that he had never seen such a creepy clown. Usually they should make you smile, but here it's just a shame for inept makeup. The boy tried in every possible way to laugh it off and cause a storm of indignation among the kidnappers. Hearing a caustic joke from a guy, she got pretty angry and decided to start right away with why he was brought here. Her angry gaze and dissatisfied face only showed that she could be hurt by words. Kazuro, hearing her voice, added that she also needed to work on her voice. Otherwise, he is somehow brutal, even slightly masculine. Realizing that he might be going a little overboard, Kajuro tensed slightly and hoped that he could create a distraction, being at a loss at such impudence on the part of the boy. She began to approach him with a very aggressive step. Kajuro was slightly tensed by this, but he could not do anything. The taxi driver stood nearby and watched the boy so that he would not go anywhere. Approaching him, she hit the car hard with her foot, showing that there was no escape from them and he was behaving very impudently, not understanding who was in front of him. Kazuro began to understand that he would now be interrogated and tried to act calmly. Her gaze was aggressive, her grin showed anger and a desire to teach the guy a lesson. Having pressed him to the car, she began to threaten the guy so that he would give her all the loot from the hospital exam. She knew about the exam and what he learned from it, which means she has accomplices who gave her such information. The maniac's gaze looked quite frightening. Kajuro was confused, because almost no one knew about his prey in the exam area. He began to suspect that there was a spy among his classmates or someone else. But trying to behave naturally in such a situation, he decides to tell the truth. Having told her that he had already sold everything and had no jewelry, he hoped to simply pay off with money and leave alive. Kazuro tried to act calmly and, looking at the car behind, wanted to wait for the moment to escape. The clown was terribly upset and started shouting at him that he was a fool and didn't know how to use the monster stones. He just took them and sold them. Kazuro, rubbing the back of his head with his hand, begins to act stupid and say that he does not understand what she is talking about. People like her can kill him without any hesitation, and the creeping doubts that the guy lied to her and did not sell the jewelry began to creep into her head. Kajuro looked at her tensely. Kazuro began to convince him that he had sold everything and did not have any precious stones. He can pay them for a taxi to take him home. An absurd conversation with stupid jokes from a guy makes a girl in a clown outfit lose her temper and makes her start being very rude to the guy and threatening his life. Listening to the conversation between the clowns and Kazuro, her henchman stands up to help and intimidates with his sharp blade to say that he will not leave here alive until they get what they want. Realizing this, Kazuro breaks away from the distracted clown and begins to run away from them. While the fear of death is in my head, he can't think straight and is just trying to buy time. The clown realizes that she was fooled and did not keep track of the boy and begins shouting at him to stop. Running across the road, hoping to get away, he notices while alive that something is wrong and looks around. They didn't even think about running away, confident in their monsters. They would simply activate them to capture Kajuro. They were a huge, pirate-like monster with a barrel and a ghost with half a body and a face. They rush to catch up with Kazuro, attacking from above. Kajuro manages to notice them. The terrible monsters were controlled by other absorbers, which means they were not so stupid. I haven't fought Kajuro yet. Having hit him with his barrel from above, the pirate thought that he had finished off the guy. Fragments of asphalt scattered in different directions. Kajuro managed to jump away at the last moment. He was trying to understand the abilities of the monsters in order to assess his chances in the fight. Strategic thinking made it possible to defeat any monster by finding an approach. Looking at these two monsters, he wanted to see what they were capable of, but they had not yet used their magic. Kazuro had never fought two monsters at once, and it scared him a little. Standing in a defensive stance, he waited for the right moment and tried to find opportunities to attack. There was a certain uncertainty in the look, but there was more than enough determination to act. 
He looked at the monsters and clown girl with his minions, waiting for an attack. Remembering that while he and the fat man were sitting in a cafe, there was news on TV that talked about a gang of robbers and murderers attacking the absorbers. While Kajuro was distracted by thoughts of what he saw, the monster pirate used his power and began vomiting his incomprehensible substance at the guy. The terrible stench was unbearable and began to spin the head and cause a state of intoxication. Such Kajuro didn't expect it. It was one of the types of stun magic. While Kazuro was staggering in all directions and could not collect himself, the clown decided to use her strength and finish off the little brat. She summoned two high-rank monsters at once. Her strength was high. Kajuro clearly did not expect this. They looked like a mummy and a demon with wings. His facial expression spoke of inability to act and helplessness, realizing that while he is under the camp, he cannot act, and he must at least block their attacks and hold out. The clown girl orders her monsters to attack Kajuro while he is in the camp. Her sinister look says that she intends to kill the guy. The mummy monster uses its magic by kneeling down and sending its hands underground. Kajuro understands that now he will be attacked, tries to somehow group himself and squints his eyes. Sweat begins to run down your face in anticipation of pain. The blow to the face was so fast that you couldn't see where it was coming from. This took Kajuro a little by surprise, since he did not see the blow itself. It is followed by another blow, and another. Finally, the feelings from the camp begin to return, and Kajuro comes to his senses. Now he manages to jump away. These were the bandages of a mummy monster moving at great speed from underground. The clown girl began to get angry that the guy was not dying for so long, and began indignantly shouting to her monsters and comrades to quickly deal with him. Kazuro skillfully recovered from the mummy's attacks. Trying to find the right moment to attack, he waits for the enemy to make a mistake. The bandits begin to get nervous and tell the monsters to attack together and quickly deal with the guy. While the mummy was attacking the guy, the other monsters began to come closer to attack together. Seeing that the monsters began to gather, Kajuro realized that this was the right moment to attack and began to use his power. Being in the air at the time of the attack, the monsters did not suspect the guy's strength and did it thoughtlessly without fear of anything. Kazuro uses the powers of the previously absorbed Busty Beauty and activates her. Emerging from his mana, a Busty Beauty plays a melody on her zither, blocking movement and causing anyone to plunge into fear. From what they hear, the monsters begin to fall into a stupor and plunge into their fears. The waves act on them with great force. This took them by surprise. The bandits also hear this melody and try to close their ears not to fall under the influence of the magic of the stun. They try their best and writhe from trying. Kazuro, realizing that the monsters will not stand in a stupor for a long time, decides to quickly kill them using a monster with a chainsaw. A monster with a chainsaw appears, seeing the monsters, and begins to run towards them with a thirst for murder. His eyes are full of abnormal joy from the upcoming battle. Kajuro yells at him to deal with them quickly and have fun. Encouraging the monster with the chainsaw in every possible way, he hopes to quickly deal with the monsters and their owners. A monster with a chainsaw, already in anticipation of a brutal massacre and a lot of blood, is preparing to attack and begins to start its saw. Kazuro sees that stun magic also works on absorbers. Standing in a stupor, they cannot control their monsters, and this is the right time to take them out of the battle. Reflecting, he thinks that this is the only chance to win. His look is filled with determination, and after what they did, he is ready to take extreme measures. Kazuro orders a monster with a chainsaw to attack the absorbers because they are more dangerous and then deal with the monsters. Reluctantly, the chainsaw monster agrees and attacks Clown Girl, swinging a chainsaw in flight, ready to cut it down. Hitting with all his might, sparks flew in all directions. After such a blow, there would be nothing left of her. Unexpectedly for Kazuro and the monster with a chainsaw, she is saved by a demon monster with wings. Apparently, the magic of the stun has a very weak effect on him. Having jumped a decent distance with the girl, they were safe from unexpected attacks. The monster with the chainsaw got up after the blow and began looking for a target. The clown, standing in the arms of her monster, with an ominous grin and gaze, she said that her top-rank monster and Kajuro's pathetic attacks would not help him in any way. She was stronger than him. Chainsaw notices Clownshaw's associates, who while they were under the camp, 
Vulnerable targets stood right in front of him. Without thinking twice, he attacked them. The thirst for blood again took over the mind of the monster with a chainsaw. The girl in clown makeup was scared for her partners and started screaming at them to come to their senses. Her eyes showed the horror of accepting the worst. From a strong blow from a chainsaw, a fan of sharpening his maple loses his leg. Being stunned by the magic of the zither of a busty monster, he does not yet feel pain or awareness of what happened. Kazuro shouts at the monster with the chainsaw to not lose control and finish them off quickly. The risk of losing began to increase. The stun time is not unlimited. Seeing a severed leg on the asphalt, the chainsaw begins to salivate and the thirst for hunger awakens. He looks greedily at the leg and cannot help himself. Throwing the chainsaw on the ground, the monster begins to greedily eat the leg, loudly slurping and not paying attention to anything. Kajuro doesn't like this. The level of control over the monster is too low for him to listen to him unquestioningly. The busty monster's magic was coming to an end. The monsters began to come to their senses and are preparing to attack. They were very angry and mercilessly wanted to deal with Kajuro. The pirate with the barrel came to his senses, heard the loud cry of the owner and turned around to look. The owner came to his senses and saw that he had no leg. The wound was bleeding heavily. A monster with a chainsaw sat next to him and ate his leg. Screams of horror could be heard tens of meters away. Seeing that the chainsaw was still distracted by eating his owner's leg, the pirate decided to jump on him from a height and hit him with his barrel. Hitting his back with all his might, the saw drops his leg, which he chewed so deliciously, and falls to the ground. By interfering with the monster's meal with a chainsaw, the pirate incurs the wrath and fury of the chainsaw. The loss of a fresh piece of flesh greatly angered the chainsaw monster. Grabbing the pirate's face with his hand, the monster with the chainsaw hit him on the ground with all his might. Such a blow was fatal for the pirate with the barrel. Everyone around was horrified by what they saw. The strength of the monster with the chainsaw was incredible. While Chainsaw was distracted by eating the pirate, the others decided to run and, controlling their bandages, the mummy began to envelop the guy without a leg. Worried about their comrade, the bandits quickly began to wrap his leg with bandages. Writhing in pain and blood loss, he tried to stay conscious. They grabbed him by the shoulders and began to drag him into the car. The clown was very worried about what had happened and looked tensely at her comrade. Having put him in a taxi, it was time to quickly take him to the doctor. The pain from the loss of his leg and blood made his body go numb. He fought with all his might not to pass out. Having sent her partners to the doctor, the clown girl was very unhappy and wanted to take revenge on Kazuro by taking his life. Climbing onto her monster, Clownshaw wanted to attack Kazuro, but gathering her thoughts, she realized that by succumbing to emotions alone, she could lose. Therefore, I decided to retreat. Seeing that the bandits who had kidnapped him were retreating, Kazuro was glad that it was all over. He was able to win the fight. He looked at the departing silhouette of a demon with wings carrying Clownshaw, and the thought did not leave him that this would not be their last meeting. Suddenly, the thought comes to mind that while he and the fat man were filling their bellies, eating all sorts of goodies, a girl was shown on TV destroying monsters. She looked a lot like the clown. The facial features were very similar. On TV, they showed a girl with a bow and a teddy bear. She didn't look like a child, but very dangerous. Then he remembered her appearance. Looking at the phone, he saw how late it was already. He wanted to quickly get home and go to bed. A red eye appeared and began to ask Kajuro why he didn't use it in the battle. Kazuro said that he was ashamed to release such a cool monster against such petty monsters and would wait for a more opportune moment. Red Eye's ego was boosted, and he wasn't angry at the guy. Realizing that there is a long road ahead of him home, he thoughtfully remembers that the monster with a chainsaw is still having fun with the corpse of a pirate. Chainsaw sat cross-legged. He was sad that all the opponents had left and left him without a brutal, bloody battle. After absorbing the monster back, Kazuro notices a large yellow stone remaining in the place of the pirate's corpse. Picking up the stone, he was already glad that he did not leave the battle empty-handed, and the monster with a chainsaw quite easily dealt with the pirate. Looking at the new stone, Kazuro already had an idea of how much such mining could cost. But remembering Clownshaw's words that the stones could be used somehow, he thought about it. It was dark and various sounds began to appear around. Annoying the boy, 
he began to look around and start walking home. At that moment, the bandit's car parked near the abandoned hangar. A nurse was called in to try to put stitches on his leg to stop the bleeding. The guy was in pain, clenching the stick with his teeth so as not to scream and give away their location. He endured the torment. Having stopped the bleeding and placed dense tissue on the cut site, the nurse sutures with a needle with a thick and dense thread. The girl in clown makeup supported her partner in every possible way and tried to distract him from the pain. The car driver and the mummy monster standing next to them also supported the guy. The mummy had a basin with bloody bandages that needed to be disposed of. The girl crying into a basin of water understood that she was to some extent to blame for what had happened and blamed herself. After removing her makeup, she promised to get even with Kajuro and kill him. While he is alive, she will not calm down to finish what she started. Finally, Kajuro reached home. The lights were dim and in need of replacement, but the homeowners didn't care. Entering the room, he looked at the bed and longed to go to bed quickly. My legs were so heavy from the long walk that they needed a massage. Falling onto the bed, he could barely force himself to undress and lie down in the soft and warm bed. Kajuro yawned heavily. He had an exhausting day with adventures that made him shiver. Silence and tranquility were all that interested him now. Hearing loud screams from the top floor, Kazuro was irritated and was willing to go to great lengths for silence and deep sleep. Eyes covered with bloody wreaths and bags under the eyes confirmed the extreme fatigue of our hero. I was surprised at the impudence of the homeowners, who forbade everyone to make noise after eleven, and they themselves organized a karaoke party. A brilliant plan matured in his head on how to teach the homeowners a lesson, calling on a busty beauty. With a grin, he imagined the owners' faces when a monster appeared in their house. Initiating the busty monster into the insidious plan, he anticipated the joy of finally teaching these greedy house owners a lesson. Meanwhile, the boy sang into the microphone with all his voice, and his parents applauded him. The guy was not gifted with a voice, but his parents supported his children's joy. Trying to outshout himself, the boy shouted to the whole house, and the parents, not paying attention to this, rejoiced at their son's musical skills. The boy sang a song from his favorite anime, and there was no limit to the joy. The parents, applauding, tried in every possible way to sing along with the baby. Suddenly, the mother felt goosebumps run through her body from the cold and was a little distracted from her son's performance. Having told his husband about this, he decided that it was probably getting cold outside and suggested closing the window. Enjoying his son's performance and the way he sang, he did not notice anything around him and simply enjoyed the evening. Continuing to shout into the microphone, the boy began to dance to the beat of the music. The parents applauded all this time without distracting the baby. Suddenly, the lights went out in the apartment and the music stopped. Everyone wondered what was happening. Mom, with a trembling voice, says that the TV is still working and there's a woman in a pink outfit on it. The busty monster played a melody that instilled fear in the listeners. Parents didn't understand how this was possible. They looked with apprehension and were pretty frightened. The boy began to cry in fear, thinking that it was a monster. The father grabs the remote control and, in an attempt to press some button with trembling hands, switches the channel. The picture disappeared, the disgusting hiss of the disconnected antenna. It wasn't particularly calming. The father begins to reassure his family that everything is fine. It's just a glitch in the TV program. The mother, exhaling calmly, hoped that this was so. Opening their eyes and looking at their husband, mother and son were horrified to see behind him a terrible monster appearing from the TV. Raising his head slowly, the man saw a creature with huge eyes and a big toothy smile eager to kill them. Kajuro, already lying in bed, hears screams of horror and tries to sleep with a calm, light smile. Along the way, remembering that she had to absorb the monster back, no matter what she did here, realizing that now no one will bother him, Kazuro tries to sleep and rest. A warm blanket envelops him and helps him fall asleep faster. Waking up in the morning cheerful and in a good mood, Kazuro went to the store to buy food. The same homeowner and his son were walking towards him. Kajuro greeted them, realizing that he had given them an unforgettable evening yesterday. He, smiling, notices that the boy is holding his cheek and is very dissatisfied. Kazuro is tempted to make fun of the boy, but barely restraining himself, he doesn't do it. The father, with a very tired face, sighing tiredly, tells Kajuro that they were attacked by a terrible monster yesterday. 
while they were having a cultural evening. Kajuro points out that they could summon the music monster with their singing. Trying to hold back his laughter, he tried to speak seriously. The father hit his son on the butt and said that he had brought this fate upon them. There will be no more singing. The boy falls to the floor screaming and agrees to never sing again. Seeing how the boy got it for his passion for music, Kazuro, feeling guilty, offers to help and deal with the monster. The landlord looks at the guy and thinks he's lucky they're renting to a monster eater. Kazuro, trying to figure out how to pretend to destroy monsters, suggests using a ritual to provide them with protection and a shield from monsters. The boy's father agrees with everything Kazuro says and suggests not to hesitate, but to carry out the ritual as quickly as possible. Kazuro, blushing with joy and the opportunity to mock them, pretending to be doing something important, happily agrees. He takes water with salt and, pretending that it is a magic potion, begins to spray the apartment, not missing a single place. The family looks at what is happening with a slightly surprised face and does not interfere. And then Kazuro comes up with a brilliant idea. He takes a mouthful of potion to do another dirty trick on the owners. Having doused everyone with water and salt, they were a little surprised but tried not to show it, thinking that it is necessary. Now Kajuro has finished the process of applying protection to them and their home. The parents rejoiced and thanked Kazuro. The landlord even allowed us not to pay for this month. As I left the apartment, the phone rang in my pants pocket. Kajuro reached out his hand to see who was calling him. It was the chubby guy that Kazuro loved to eat with so much. He offered to play a mobile game with him and have fun. He immediately agreed, because it was his favorite MMO. Arriving home, Kazuro sat down at the table and, saying that he would now create hell for the enemy, launched the game. Having joined the composition of the puffball, they began to wait for opponents for battle, simultaneously discussing and selecting a character for the game. The fat man told Kajuro that there was a new update recently, and new characters were added. Seeing that the red voice character had appeared, Kajuro was very happy, because now he would be able to evaluate all the monster's skills and practice controlling them in battle. While waiting for the players to be selected, Kazuro asked Puffy how his day was and what he planned to do on the weekend. The selection of allies and opponents was completed. Now they could play the game. While waiting for the countdown to end, Kajuro thought through a strategy on where to go to attack. Standing in ambush, he waited for the right moment to attack, and he also saw a familiar character also added to the game. It was a mummy. Paying attention to this, he saw an opportunity to find the vulnerability of this monster so that if he met it again, he would know how to fight against such a thing. After waiting for the mummy to come closer, the red voice uses his ult and tries to destroy the enemy with a horizontal tornado. Seeing that the monster managed to dodge the ult, Kazuro was a little surprised. Apparently the mummy had good speed and guessed that there might be an ambush. After dodging, the mummy decided to attack the red eye. Kazuro expected this and wanted to try another move. Pressing the skill button, he expected it to work as it should and crush the monster. The attack of the bandages was successfully stopped and played a cruel joke against the mummy. This red eye skill is very useful and successfully hit the enemy. The mummy lost. Now Kajuro knew the method of success in front of such a monster. It turns out that Clown Girl also played this game. Sitting on a sun lounger, she screamed nervously from yet another loss to the same opponent. Kajuro, enjoying the game, easily wins every fight and becomes familiar with all the Red Eye's techniques. Each attack of the Red Eye turns into another victory for him. Mummy has nothing to oppose the abilities of the Red Eye. Each attack of the stubborn Mummy was predicted and counterattacked in time. Kajuro tried all the skills and understood how good his monster was. The clown was very upset by a series of lost fights that anger and the desire for revenge did not allow her to think sensibly and retreat. She was very angry with the red-eye player, screaming and writing nasty words about him in the chat. Having won the battle with a devastating score for the enemy, Kajuro threw his hands up with a joyful cry. He hadn't had this much fun in a game for a long time. Seeing insults in the chat, he decided to look at the player's profile as a mummy. Naturally, based on the nickname in the game, he had no idea who it was, but he was obliged to write a couple of caustic words in response. Afterwards. He remembered how good the red voice was with new abilities, remembering the words of the clown that he does not know how to use the stones, 
and only sells them. Kajuro thought about this. Putting his hand in his pocket, he began to look for stones. The red eye skills are strong, but if they can somehow be upgraded with the help of stones, it will be very useful. Having taken out the stones, he noticed that the red ones were starting to glow. Apparently, they were suitable for leveling up the skill. All that remained was to understand how to use them. Bringing them to his face, he felt the stones begin to turn into mana and penetrate his voice. Approaching the mirror, he looked at himself and saw that the red voice had become brighter and emitted a strong glow. Kajuro felt the power of the new skills and the appearance of the eye became more terrifying for the enemy. Realizing this, he quickly wanted to test it in battle. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. The hero was surprised because he was not expecting anyone. Different thoughts began to enter his head, from the worst to the banal distribution of invitations to establishments. A little afraid to walk up to the door and ask, who's there? Kajuro stood there without making a sound. It was a warm summer day outside. School was over, so he had no idea who might be standing outside the door. Having collected himself from bad thoughts, he simply walked to the door and opened it. A bald old man stood on the threshold. This elderly man introduced himself as the director of one of the universities, where they would like to see Kazuro as a student. Kazuro, realizing that this is very good news, shakes hands with the director of the university and invites him to go into the room to discuss the conditions of study. The old man was quite calm and showed some trust and a desire to find out more about which university he represented. Suddenly, the director immediately hands over the admission form and offers to fill it out. Their university is prestigious and very large. The teachers are all qualified monster absorbers. Taking the form in surprise, Kajuro began to closely study what exactly this university was and what chances he had to achieve success there. The name of the university confused the guy a little because he had never heard of it before. The university called F.U. Fell did not inspire much confidence in Kazuro, and he began to ask the director which famous graduates studied with him. How long has this university been around and why hasn't he heard of it before? The director was a little perplexed since he could scare off the guy with his weak group of graduates, and the fact that the university was very unpopular, the weakest people who had not entered anywhere usually ended up there. Trying to come up with strong words for the guy, the director mentioned that his studies were free, and the strongest teachers would teach him. To which Kajuro asked, what are the names of those very strong ones? If so, then they are known, Kajuro said. Indignant at the guy's words, the director very emotionally began to demonstrate his skills, saying that he was one of such teachers. Having calmed down a little, the director began to encourage Kazuro to sign the admission paper, and he himself would provide decent conditions for studying with his own eyes. Standing in the doorway for some time now stood a charming lady with glasses and a pendant around her neck. She clearly did not pass by, but came to her destination. Introducing herself as the rector of one of the most famous universities in the country, she greeted Kazuro. Having said that it was sent by the Minister of Education himself, the director and Kazuro's mouths dropped open. They clearly didn't expect this. The director's chances of inviting the guy to his school were fading before his eyes. Coming closer, she, smiling, extended her hand to Kazuro and offered him a place at the best university in the city. Stretching out his hand in response, Kajuro turns his attention to her hand and notices the many monsters that were absorbed. She was clearly very strong and amazingly beautiful. Taking out from her purse an application form for admission to the University of the Supreme Devourers named after Mao Chi. All the cards were clearly against the director of the Fu Fel University. Having taken his form from Kazuro, he lowered his head and realized that there was nothing to choose here. Obviously, he has no chance against such an institution. The old man had already begun to leave. At that moment, the rector of a prestigious university rang. At this time, Kajuro studied her invitation and stood in bewilderment. The call was from the Minister of Education, probably to make sure that Kazuro accepted the conditions and agreed to enter their elite university. Suddenly, shouts were heard from the phone about a ban on Kazuro's admission. Everyone was surprised by this decision, especially Kajuro. The director, stopping in the aisle, began to listen and see a chance to take the boy for himself. Kajuro stood in bewilderment while the rector tried to talk to the minister. 
Her surprise at this statement was understandable because she personally observed Kajuro during the exam and saw potential in him. Shouting on the phone yielded nothing, and all that was said was that the ban came from influential members of the university management. While she was trying to reason with the minister, Kajuro began to understand that the last fight was clearly involved. The girl he fought with looked like one of the strongest students of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers Institution. This means that she influenced this decision. After finishing the phone conversation, the rector said with great regret that the guy would not be able to study with them. This was an order from the Educational Council with the Minister of Education. Kazuro, understanding the essence of what was happening, showing dissatisfaction and awareness of who kidnapped him, stood looking at the table and sighed. The rector patted him on the shoulder and said that he was very talented and his chances of becoming the strongest monster absorber were great. Unfortunately, the Minister of Education can influence all educational institutions, and one refusal may not be enough. There is no way he can get into the world of monsters alone, and he fights there. This right is only given at universities. The ban on this is very serious, and the punishment is very strict. Realizing the seriousness of what was happening, Kazuro began to suspect that he no longer had a chance to succeed. Such powerful people can destroy everything he is so eager to gain. The old man, standing in the passage and hearing the conversation, closes the door, thereby drawing attention to himself. By clapping his hands, he shows pleasure and the opportunity that has arisen. Handing back his admission form in an aggressive manner, he joyfully shouts that Kajuro can enter his university. Being a little-known Fufel establishment, the minister will have little chance of influencing Kajuro's fate. Moreover, the director promises that nothing threatens him within the walls of their university. Kazuro, concerned about the lack of the right to enter the world of monsters, decided to clarify whether the director has such a right. Stroking his beard and grinning at the beautiful rector, the director claims that he is famous for his disregard for the Ministry of Education. And of course, he has the right to get into the world of monsters. Hearing such pleasant words, Kazuro was very happy that he could continue to improve his skills in battles and achieve success, even in such a little-known educational institution. Kazuro an admission form and asks him to sign it. Ego Joy does not leave the face. The gait was as if he was dancing. The joyful couple discussed admission and the possibility of studying to influence the leveling of skills and their use in battles with monsters. The director, with a big smile, promised to help the boy in all matters. Telling how big the park was near their university and a great place to train, he encouraged Kajuro to sign in every possible way. There are large residential complexes and a market nearby. All amenities are within walking distance. Kajuro decides to sign the document. Considering that the Minister of Education can in every possible way interfere with his choice of where to enroll, you have to choose from what gives you at least a chance to become great. Having signed the document, the director thanked the guy and wished him a pleasant rest, because after the holidays, he will study at the most underrated educational institution. The director also suggested that the boy tell his family about his admission, so that they wouldn't worry that the guy wouldn't get in anywhere. Kajuro immediately agreed and began calling his parents. The director was glad that he had snatched such a talent from under the noses of the most prestigious universities in the country. The rector looked at them, realizing that something was not clean here. She looked at Kajuro and didn't understand why such a talent was rejected and forbidden to enroll. Maybe the boy had annoyed someone? After such a day, Kazuro wanted to take a walk around the city at night. The windows were lit up, there were a lot of people walking around, and everyone was having a good time. Passing by the monster seller, Kajuro noticed him. Such merchants can sell quite dangerous monsters with very rare abilities. Moving closer to look at the monster in the cage, Kajuro wanted to evaluate the monster and maybe even buy it. The monster looked like a golem from Kajuro's favorite movie. Saliva dripped from his mouth, torn clothes and bulging eyes did not show the monster to be strong. The cage was covered with special scrolls to block the monster's abilities, so that there was no threat to others. Looking at such a weak monster, he remembered how sellers deceive monsters. 
Without understanding the product themselves, they try to mark it up at three times the price. The seller kindly tried to trick Kajuro into buying a monster with weak abilities, passing them off as very strong. Realizing that the seller did not understand monsters, Kazuro tried to reduce the price to a ridiculous level, telling the seller that the monster was weak and not worth a penny. The seller, without showing his ignorance, simply offered such a reasonable client a good 10% discount on the purchase, and he would give the cage as a gift. Kazuro began to taunt them, showing his reluctance to pay more and offered a 50% discount with a cage and a large pink stone to boot. Showing your greedy gaze and starting to lick your lips, it looked like he wanted to devour them. Seeing this, the seller got scared and, hearing such a proposal, became pretty angry with the guy. The monster was also irritated by the humiliation he heard and expressed his dissatisfaction by shouting. Seeing the boy's gaze, the monster sensed his aura and became quite frightened. After all, the absorbed monsters of Kazuro strengthened the aura, thereby showing the monsters who was standing in front of them. Considering that after improving the Red Eye's skills, it became a high level, then the guy already had three high rank monsters. The seller, seeing how the guy intimidates the monster and scares away the customers, shouts for him to get out. Smiling at the humiliation of these scoundrels, Kajuro began to leave. Throwing his hands behind his head and whistling, the satisfied boy walked away in search of something interesting. The seller, clutching his chest, became very nervous with anger and sat down to rest. At the same time, Suyuki and her brother were walking around the market. After the exam, she could not forget Kajuro's humiliation and kept thinking about how to take revenge on him. Suddenly, anger creeps through her body as she sees a familiar silhouette in the distance. The outline was very similar to Kajuro, whom she hated greatly. Coming closer, she made sure it was him and began screaming in anger. Meanwhile, Kazuro examined the seller's goods and drove him crazy, paying attention to all sorts of little things. Suyuki told her brother Fen that this is the same guy who insulted her, and he needs to be taught a lesson. Fen looked at Kajuro with contempt and a desire to humiliate. While they were talking, Kazuro pestered the seller with low-quality stones. They did not shine brightly enough and were damaged, which means they had weak power. The price that the seller offered was too high. The red price for this was 40 yuan. The seller was very irritated and clutched his heart. They humiliated him and wanted to blame him for the poor quality of the goods. He pointed his finger at Kajuro, saying that he did not understand the product. Unsuspecting Kazuro, holding the stone in his fingers, feels like it is being torn out of his hand. Raising his head and eyes towards the stone, he notices a familiar face. It was Suyuki with some guy. They looked at Kazuro with a contemptuous look. Brother Fen held the stone in his hand, saying that he was not worthy of such a stone, and therefore was not able to buy it. Looking up, Kajuro was angry and wanted to teach the couple a lesson. Considering that Suyuki could influence admission to the university, they were quite famous and would not attack in front of strangers, so we must figure out how to humiliate them, Kazuro thought holding out a card to pay for the purchase of a monster stone, thereby trying to humiliate Kazuro. The seller was glad to finally get rid of the stone and gladly accepted the payment. Suyuki stood behind with a slight grin, agreeing with her brother's words. Kazuro, hinting that the boy is stupid and buys broken stones for a lot of money, makes Fen doubt his choice. Looking at the stone, he became convinced that there were many cracks and the monster's magical power could evaporate from the stone without leaving a trace. Trying not to embarrass himself and keep up the brand of a rich kid, Fen said that he didn't care about the stones, and he just helped the seller with the money. His family will not be poorer because of this. Hearing this, Kazuro had the idea to teach the rich a lesson. He started shouting to the whole market about rich clients buying broken stones. This made the brother and sister feel a little dazed. Their status and fame could be ruined by one awkward refusal or action. Hearing such a wonderful offer, most of the nearby sellers began to bring their broken stones with an offer to buy. Naturally, these scoundrels did not lower the price and tried to scam the client out of a tidy sum, realizing that now the entire market will flock to them. Fen and Suyuki tried to leave, but the sellers who were pursuing them were not far behind and asked to look at their goods. Seeing such an influx of sellers, 
Kazuro decided that this was not enough, and began to shout and point with his finger that a buyer of broken stones had appeared. Going out to the middle of the market, he loudly began to talk and point to the sellers of broken stones, trying to draw attention to them and not let them go so easily. The salespeople standing nearby immediately began to look at potential clients and run to them. Brother and sister, in turn, were very angry at such actions of Kazuro and looked at him with a desire to punish the provocateur and rogue. Before they had time to come to their senses, the family was already surrounded by sellers with their offers to buy stones. More and more people came to look at the buyers of broken stones. The people surrounding them began to irritate Fen greatly. Too many questions and proposals were heard from all sides. The unbearable feeling of being surrounded by amateurs is brewed on the simpletons, but the family's fame does not allow them to set a bad example and lower their status. Taking the card out of his pocket, he agreed to buy the stones, and with great disappointment and anger began to hand the card to the seller. Having applied the card, the machine displayed a huge amount of 800,000 EUR. The salesman's grin was ear to ear with joy. Fen had never experienced such humiliation and setup. In return, he received a box of broken stones not worth a penny. Suyuki told Fen that they had never done such a big waste and her father obviously wouldn't like it. Fen stood there, biting his tongue. His state of humiliation and fear of getting away from his father was visible on his face. Clapping his hands, Kazuro looked at them and laughed loudly, saying that there had never been such clients on the market. They made a splash and monthly profits for sellers. Their family has never been so generous, said Kazuro. Seeing Kazuro again, the incident hit Fen's self-esteem hard, and he decided to deal with the scoundrel. Suyuki, saying that Kazuro was to blame for everything, looked angrily without trying to stop her brother. Approaching Kajuro with great zeal for revenge, he began to offer to fight them in the arena. The guys standing behind watched as the senior student wanted to teach the guy a lesson. Kajuro didn't show any fear or apprehension. He just didn't want to fight. The children were surprised, and the boy was unlikely to agree to this kind of duel against a senior student from the most famous monster scavenger school. Kazuro scoffed that he wasn't going to take part in a fight just like that, but if Fen offered something significant, he would think about it. He won't attack Kajuro in front of all strangers and disgrace the honor of his family. Fen then decides to offer the stones that he bought through Kazuro's vein. Looking angrily at the guy, the sister and brother were already on the verge of losing their tempers and just didn't want to screw the guy over. Kazuro looked in surprise at the box of stones. There was a thought in my head that even if they were cracked, there might be some kind of power in them, especially for free. This amount of stones will completely replenish the supply and will be very useful. After thinking carefully, Kazuro agrees to duel in the arena with Fen. The arena was located near the bazaar and in the open air. A lot of people came to watch the duel between the two absorbers. Usually athletes fight here, but today is a special evening. Walking past the market, Hanami the clown heard a noise near the arena and came to look. Among the crowd of screaming people under the arena, she approached the arena and saw Kajuro there. She was delighted to see her opponent in the arena. Hoping that the enemy is very strong and will teach Kajuro a lesson would be very helpful. Removing the bandages from his hand, Fen looked at Kazuro and was determined to deal with the impudent scoundrel. Senior students were famous for their skills and frequent trips to the world of monsters, where they honed their skills. Kazuro had little chance against such a master. While Kajuro pretended that he was not in the mood for a serious battle and continued to joke, Fen, with his proud grin, was preparing to strike. As soon as the gong for the start of the fight rang, Kajuro immediately used a monster with a chainsaw to attack. With his behavior, he only tried to distract attention and show that he was weak. Summoning a monster with a chainsaw, he immediately began to run towards Fen to attack and end the battle with an easy victory. The monster's speed was high, as was its strength. Having barely dodged a chainsaw attack, Fen was surprised by the monster's power. The idea that Kazuro deliberately wanted to lower the guy's vigilance was already obvious. Having managed to jump away from the chainsaw attack, Fen begins to activate his monsters for battle. Rolling up his sleeve, he revealed that he also had three monsters, just like Kajuro. Standing in a fighting stance, he summoned two of his monsters, a swamp 
and an electric one. These were quite dangerous creatures. Their power exceeded that of a chainsaw. Hanami, who was watching what was happening, looked thoughtfully at the duel. She began to worry that Kajuro might be killed, and she would not be able to take revenge on him herself. Noticing a thoughtful girl nearby, the man next to him said that she reminded him of someone. Confused that she might be found out, she said she had been filming a food commercial on TV in order to divert suspicion from the criminal world. Fen orders the swamp monster to attack Kajuro using dive magic. The power of such a monster was capable of inducing a prolonged stun on the enemy from which it was impossible to escape. The magic of immersion meant that the sensation became as if the opponent was underwater and could not breathe. Movement was also constrained, and it was easy prey. Kajuro didn't expect this, but he didn't plan on being strangled either. Being in a state of immersion, he tried to calm down and hold his breath as long as possible. Trying to figure out how to get out of the camp and win the fight, he tried to focus on his breathing. Fen stood opposite and watched Kazuro suffer. He thought that it would be an easy victory and there was no reason to worry. Self-confidence was high, and training in the world of monsters was not in vain. Pointing his index finger at Fen, Kajuro directs the monster with a chainsaw to deal with the enemy, thus hoping to free himself. Being distracted by Kazuro, Fen, out of the corner of his eye, notices how a monster with a chainsaw is trying to attack him, and swinging its chainsaw is ready to cut the guy. At the last moment, he manages to summon his third monster for protection. Confident in his defense, Fen realizes with a slight grin that Kajuro's attack failed, and now he definitely has no chance of winning. Having dug into the body of a huge and slippery monster, the saw could not cut the body. The monster was like a huge pile of dirt that could control the density of its body. Fen looked at Kajuro's futile attempts to defeat and damage his monster. This look spoke of complete control of the situation and extensive experience in battles. While Kajuro was fighting the water trap and was focused on survival, he closed his eyes and remained calm. Fen decides to end the fight with a lot of fun. He orders another monster to attack Kazuro. Full of confidence and the desire to teach the guy a lesson, he spares no effort in attacking. The electric monster begins to summon a bolt of lightning to strike the target. Opening his eye, feeling something not good, Kajuro tries to gather his strength. You can see the image of an approaching lightning strike in your eyes. Having managed to jump away in a water trap, Kazuro saves his life for now, but with the lack of air, it won't last long. Kazuro notices that the monster with the chainsaw is losing its power against a monster of a higher rank and is beginning to lose ground. Trying to somehow help, he activates the passive saw skill. This skill allows you to attack a monster of any rank twice as strong, but for a very short time. This should work and give you a chance to win. Enraged, the chainsaw-wielding monster begins to attack the mud monster. He was fierce, and the thirst for blood awoke in him and his eyes shone even brighter. The feeling that the saw began to spin twice as fast and became sharper. The mud monster began to feel severe pain and scream. There was fear in the eyes. The incredible power of the chainsaw began to break through the monster's defenses and cut him. Fen, standing behind, saw how the saw began to cut through his monster. The monster's durability and likelihood of death began to increase. Trying to escape and realizing that his plan for an easy victory is already in doubt, Fen orders the electric monster to attack Kajuro with rapid lightning attacks. Accumulating its power, the electric monster began to attack the guy. Turning away from the discharges, Kajuro tries with all his might to survive and wait for the right moment to attack. Making incredible somersaults and bounces from lightning, people around the arena rejoice at what they see. Such an exciting fight will not leave anyone indifferent. Fen begins to get nervous and asks the electric monster to strike with lightning more often and finally finish off the guy. Fenny really didn't like this situation in the battle, that some boy who had just graduated from school could dodge lightning bolts like that and could even harm his highest-ranking monsters. Breaking through a huge number of discharges, Kajuro tries to get to Fen and attack him. The power of the water immersion camp had already subsided, and it was possible to operate at full strength. Showing their incredible healing reaction, the crowd cheers and begins to support the guy. He received such opportunities from absorbing a red eye and pumping it up with stones, brought it to perfection. 
The crowd rejoices at what they see. Even Hanami begins to support Kajuro by shouting forest words at him. The man behind was a little embarrassed and looked a lot like the chairman of the board of absorbers. So it was. He was passing by when he heard a noise and decided to see what was happening there. He didn't feel very good from the surrounding noise of the battle and the screams of people, but he continued to watch. Chi Supreme Devourer School, Fen, and the new talent from the A-rank exam, Kajuro. Looking at the skills of the young talent, he did not understand why he was denied entry Kazuro to their university. Deciding that Kajuro was too inexperienced against an older student with more experience and skills, the head of the board came to the conclusion that he would lose. The class gap is too big for such a battle. Hanami heard the man's words and thought. She said that he doesn't know well what Kajuro is capable of, and there's no point in drawing premature conclusions to which the man was quite surprised. For his work as the head of the board, he could always determine the winner in advance based on his skills and experience. He laughed at the girl's words and said that he was not mistaken in his decision. He had seen too many battles to be unsure. Hanami looked at him with a grin, knowing what Kazuro was capable of. Continuing to support Kajuro, she hoped that he would win and they would fight on equal terms with her. Muskina looked at the girl, thinking that she was simply carried away by the boy and was not thinking sensibly. Meanwhile, in the arena, Kazuro, having dodged all the attacks of the electric monster, was already close to Fen and could attack him. Fen, being a little confused that everything is not going according to plan, orders the swamp monster to cast a binding spell and quickly. Kazuro was already running up to him and was ready to strike. Suddenly, Kazuro notices a large amount of green algae reaching towards him. If he doesn't have time to attack Fen, then it's all over. The swamp monster's magic was quite strong, and the amount of algae was innumerable. The ability to both stun and bind together was Imba. He looked, realizing that such a monster would catch him now, and he had to urgently come up with a plan. Determined, he ran towards Fen to attack. Having reached him, Kazuro grabs him and throws him to the ground. Meanwhile, green algae was already approaching Kazuro's body. There was no way out. It was necessary to apply one technique to win. Opening his red voice, Kazuro looked at Fen, introducing him into an illusion and deflecting all attacks from himself. Fen looked into his eyes and sank deeper into everything. Sweat appeared on his face. Fear began to consume him. Fen sees the seaweed grab Kajuro and begin to envelop his body. There was no way out of such a trap, and he was confident of victory. A slight smile appeared on his face. The guy had no chance. Enveloping his legs and almost his entire body, Fen looked with pride that he had won. He said that no one who falls into their trap can be saved from algae. Fen owns three of the highest monsters, and some guy couldn't resist him. It was in vain that he agreed to the fight. Now he is humiliated and defeated by the most gifted student of the University of the Supreme Devourers, named after Mao Chi. Kajuro looked at him with a calm gaze, enjoying the confidence of Fen, who is unaware of anything. Such a narcissistic upstart was bewitched and did not realize it. Having removed the illusion spell from Fen, he was very scared. Fen's body was shrouded in seaweed, and he lay on the ground while Kajuro stood over him proudly with his hands in his pockets. The shock of surprise was strong on Fen's face. For a long time, he did not understand what was happening beginning to realize that at the moment when Kazuro grabbed him, he was looking at him with a red eye. Apparently, this was the moment Fen plunged into illusion. Realizing his failure, Fen was very angry and agitated. Kajuro looked at him with a smile, telling him how Fen looked foolishly believing that he had won while tied up, and he reminded him that he owed him a box of stones. The chairman of the school's board was extremely surprised by Kajuro's victory. Everyone around was happy about such a show, Especially Hanami was pleased that the winner was Kajuro. Due to such noise, even television came to film the battle for a new news release. Kajuro stood in the arena surrounded by many people cheerfully shouting and supporting him. They haven't had a show like this for a long time. Kazuro's calm face spoke of his steadfastness and desire to quickly get the prize and go home. Hanami began to tell the man that he was wrong and was in vain to reason so superficially, not knowing the full power of the guys. The chairman felt that he was wrong. This was the first time for him. 
He began to wonder if Kajuro really was a gem like none of them had ever seen. While everyone was rejoicing, Suyuki's sister shouted to her brother to get ready, because he can win by using all his abilities, regardless of safety, in order to defeat this arrogant idiot. Fen heard her and decided to try it in order to preserve the honor of the invincible family. Tensing her entire body, Fen begins to glow with the blue light of mana and exude incredible energy. The algae that were holding it together begin to burst and fall. He started shouting that the fight was not over yet and was drawing Kazuro's attention to himself. Having summoned his monster from the mud, he casts a powerful spell, delighting everyone. The monster begins to inflate and scream loudly. A blue aura flies around him. Having inflated itself to the limit of its strength, the mud monster bulges, scattering its dirt across the arena. Kazuro is confused about what is happening and tries to dodge. Having covered the arena with a layer of his dirt, Kajuro began to suspect something was wrong. The blue aura flying over the arena haunted him. He tried to understand what Fen was up to and what his next step would be. Suddenly, Kazuro feels severe pain in his arm and is overcome with fear. He can't understand what's happening. It felt like he was standing in dirty water, out of the huge puddle in which Kazuro was located and tries to grab the guy. He tries to run away, realizing that the monster can pull him underwater, but it was impossible to escape. The water was viscous and it was difficult to move in it. The monster grabbed Kajuro and wrapping his arms around him, tried to pull the guy under the water. Attempts to get out of the viscous substance were even. The monster grabbed onto Kazuro and did not let go. Tensing his body, he tried to fight the pestering monster and throw it off him. While trying to get out of the monster's clutches, Kazuro's gaze falls to the other end of the arena, where, on Fen's orders, the electric monster is preparing to strike with a lightning bolt. Knowing that he has little strength, he resorts to a desperate step and calls for a busty beauty. Hoping that there is enough mana, he wants to use an attack on Fen and incapacitate him. There was enough mana to summon a busty beauty. Starting to cast a magic spell on your zither, playing a certain melody, captivating those around you with the beauty and sound. Surprised that the guy still had the power to summon monsters, Fen was scared. He didn't know what the busty beauty was capable of. His gaze was frightened and cold sweat ran down his face. A strong blow from a magical attack was aimed at Fen's feelings and consciousness. The body was very tense and could not move. He started screaming in pain. Being motionless, he was an easy prey, and Kajuro ordered the monster with a chainsaw to attack Fen. A running mountain with a hungry look and a screaming chainsaw greedily devoured the guy with its gaze and wanted to cut him into small pieces. The mud monster, which managed to help its owner, tried to cover him with its body. Chainsaw, jumping up to intensify the attack, attacked him with all his might. From the damage received, the power of the chainsaw only increased, and now cutting the monster from the mud was not a problem. Fen's look of surprise that his strongest defense monster had been defeated was great, and standing under the spell, he could hardly move. The spell was slowly fading away. Kicking off the stricken monster, the chainsaw finally rushed to taste Fen's flesh and kill him. Horror rolled over his face. Cold sweat flowed from fear. The thought of an imminent loss from a schoolboy was humiliating. But an attack from such a monster could kill. This had to be avoided. The gaze of the bloodthirsty monster was moving closer and closer with great speed and power. The desire to kill was visible on his face. The terrible roar of the monster and the sound of a sharp chain spinning on a saw instilled fear only more with each approach. Fen saw the determination in Kazuro's eyes, and he began to think that it was in vain that he got involved in this squabble between his sister and this rogue. The fear that the plan was beginning to collapse forced Fen to act without caution and change the battle strategy. Trying to drown out the roar of the surrounding spectators, Fen began shouting in fear to the electric monster to attack the monster with the chainsaw as quickly as possible. At the moment the monster swings with a chainsaw, the electric monster hits him with a strong electric shock. Fen stood in fear that he would not have time to save Fen and thought that this was the end. Struck in the back by lightning, the monster with the chainsaw began to scream in pain. His legs began to give way, and he could barely stand. 
Leaning against the running chainsaw, the monster could barely hold on. Having received such a strong blow, he should have died. But the saw's passive abilities were much stronger. The smoking wound on his back and heavy breathing greatly weakened the monster. But he did not give up. Fen had already completely freed himself from the power of the busty monster's magic and watched as the monster with the chainsaw was amazed. Now nothing threatened his plan, and the confidence in his gaze returned again. Kazuro, aware of the passive skills of his monster with a chainsaw, begins to shout at him to use them and finally deal with Fen. The chainsaw's passive skill doubles strength and speed with a low health margin. The monster now begins to use its most dangerous attack while screaming at the top of its lungs. Spinning his chainsaw at great speed, Fen begins to move away and is angry that he is not succeeding. Such enormous speed cannot be easily dodged, and barely having time to lower his head, Fen manages to delay the time of death. Having fallen to the ground, he tried to crawl to the side to avoid being attacked. The incredible power of the monster with the chainsaw forced him to retreat. Looking around, Fen sees how a bloodthirsty monster waving his chainsaw begins to approach him. Fen, lying on the ground, was frightened and was already aware of failure and death approaching again. The electric monster, who made it in time at the last moment, covers Fen with its body and thereby sacrifices itself, saving its owner. Seeing how the electric monster saved him, Fen begins to try to gather his strength and get up. Seeing how ruthlessly the monster with the chainsaw dealt with his monster, there were very few options for victory. Unexpectedly for Fen, he receives a glancing blow to the face with a saw and with cries of pain he falls to his knees. Lowering his eyes to the floor, he sees drops of blood flowing from his face and a severed ear. Being in a state of shock, he tries to collect himself. Finally, the enormous speed and strength of the monster with the chainsaw ended and he was exhausted now, holding the bleeding wound. Fen rises. The anger and hatred on your face prevents you from thinking normally. The desire to defeat and kill Kajuro was too great. Having lost two of his loyal monsters, who fought to the end to protect their master, Fen understood that he only had one left, but he was still holding Kazuro, preventing him from entering the battle. Fen summons his swamp monster to himself, thereby freeing Kazuro. Now, after being freed and having accumulated a little mana and strength, Kajuro rises, rising from the water, stretching his neck and clenching his fists. Kazuro prepares to finish off Fen and take his stones as a reward. The crowd jubilantly shouts words of support to the boy. The head of the Absorbers looks admiringly at Kajuro and understands that the boy is no mistake, and he underestimated him in vain. Such talent should not be wasted. The crowd screamed in delight. Everyone was glad to be present and see the battle of the two Absorbers with their own eyes. Hanami looked at Kajuro with a joyful look. It was no longer clear whether she wanted to kill him or make friends. Suyuki, who was standing next to them, looked at the beating of her brother very upset, and not at all good thoughts were ripening in her head. Tired and crippled, Fen stood with his surviving monster. In front of them lay a heavily wounded mud monster and an electric one. Their bodies needed restoration. On the contrary, Kajuro stood with his almost exhausted monsters. Assessing that the busty beauty still had the opportunity to deliver one blow, Kajuro began to wait for the moment of attack. Clenching his fists, he tried in every possible way to persuade Fen to give up and leave alive with at least one monster. Assessing his chances, Fen understood that they were few, but he did not want to give up. Looking at the confident Kazuro, a little afraid of what he might do, Fen stood waiting. Kazuro asks the buxom beauty to use a supersonic note and end the fight. As she began to cast the spell, she began to select a melody on her zither to strike. The approaching sound waves had a strong effect on the enemy, especially the seriously wounded, and could even kill them. Fen and his monsters began to cover their ears, trying to withstand such a blow. With all the remaining villages, Fen continues to stand and barely restrain himself so as not to scream in pain. Looking down at his lying, wounded monsters, he is horrified by what he sees. From the force of the supersonic impulse, they cannot stand it and begin to die, turning into dust. Fen is also at the limit and, in order not to die, absorbs the swamp monster back into himself. 
After the supersonic strike ended, Fen fell to his knees with a look of horror on his face. Tears rolled into my eyes. He looked at the ashes of his monsters, crying, remembering how long it took him to receive them and raise them to complete control. The highest level monsters were destroyed by ordinary top level monsters. From multiple wounds and overload, Fen's body can't stand it. Starting to feel unwell, he feels pain in his lungs and begins to cough up blood. Falling to the floor, unable to move, he admits defeat. Kajuro stood calmly looking at him with his hands in his pockets, while the crowd shouted his name and made noises of joy. As he began to descend the stairs after a very difficult and lengthy battle, he was greeted by a cheering crowd. Camera flashes and many lenses were pointed at him. He already understood that such an event would be shown on TV. Approaching a very aggressive Suyuki, he asked to give him the box with stones, because he had won. People behind took selfies in front of our hero and rejoiced in every possible way. She looked at Kajuro with contempt, but tightly squeezing the box, she still gave it to him. Leaving with the box, Kazuro smiled and said that it was a pleasure to deal with them, thereby causing a storm of anger from Suyuki. She was greatly irritated by such an arrogant command. No one has ever treated her like Kazuro. The head of the board of absorbers, passing by the arena, looked at Fen, who was lying unconscious. The thought that some high school student could defeat a more experienced senior student from the most prestigious university was incredible. And such talent being banned from entering universities was very strange. Kazuro's victory, Hanami decided to approach the man who believed that Kazuro had no chance and say that without assessing all the skills and abilities, it is impossible to predict the winner. Accepting his defeat in the conclusions, the chairman decided to give a large green stone to the girl for a valuable lesson and opening his eyes, show real talent. Hanami was very pleased with this gift. She didn't even have to kill or steal anyone to get the valuable stone. The man stood and looked at the happy leaving girl and smiled a little himself. Walking through the market after a gorgeous spectacle and a stone earned for free, she accidentally overheard a conversation between Fen's sister and some guys. Hearing that they were planning to attack Kajuro, she was a little shocked. Realizing that after such a battle the guy had no strength left to fight, he was in danger. Turning around, she saw that the mercenaries were already leaving in the direction where Kazuro had gone. There was anger in her eyes, but she doubted for a long time whether to help Kajuro. He harmed her comrade and lost his leg. She wanted revenge herself. Meanwhile, after the fight, Kajuro decided to go shopping and buy food. He had very little strength and needed to replenish his energy reserves. The monsters following him were very exhausted and also wanted to rest. Seeing the meat in the bag, the monster with the chainsaw was licking his lips about how he could devour such a tasty treat. Kazuro stopped him, saying that they would only eat at home and there would be enough food for everyone. Having decided to give gifts to the others in honor of such a victory, he took out from the package something that would be very suitable for a busty beauty. Embarrassed, she folded her hands, hinting that it was not her size. Red Eye also wanted a gift and acted like a child waiting for something special. His voice shone with curiosity and his mouth showed a desire to smile with happiness. Deciding to troll the red voice a little, Kazuro hints that he will get a bag in which it will be convenient to carry him. The red voice was very angry at such a joke, thinking that the little asshole did not appreciate such a strong monster at all. Kazuro looked at the red eye, realizing that it was in vain that he decided to joke, and began to try to calm him down. Showing his stupidity and lack of respect for red eye, Kazuro began to apologize and give him any gift he chose. Having folded his tentacles into a lock, he looked at the guy not particularly trustingly, but agreed. Kazuro didn't want to quarrel with him, because he is the only one of the three with whom he communicates normally. The others still don't trust Kazuro much. Turning into an alley to shorten the way home and quickly have dinner, Kazuro pays attention to the silence and the absence of people around, but does not give it any importance. Red Eye begins to feel that someone is following them, to which Kazuro agrees with him because he also felt it. Red Eye notices that they are too weak and will not be able to fight. They need to get out of here quickly. Kazuro, understanding this, also agrees, but he has not yet figured out how to do this. A sudden attack from some purple goo catches Red Eye and Kazuro by surprise. 
Having managed to dodge and jump away from the attack, Kajuro rolls to the side. Raising his head, he pays attention to the purple slime, which begins to hiss and melt the asphalt. This was a very dangerous attack, which means the enemy intends to kill them. A guy appeared in the alley with a cigarette in his mouth, looking at Kazuro with a smile. Behind him stood a purple monster, which attacked the guy with the red eye. Hearing other voices, Kazuro raised his head and saw another guy in glasses with a bat-like monster on his back. Kajuro, standing behind with his monsters, was tense. He understood that it was too dangerous to engage in battle now. Another guy appeared behind. Kajuro understood that they were surrounded. Now they couldn't leave so easily. Nada urgently needed to think about something. He looked at his monsters. They were exhausted and weak. Cold sweat ran down his face. While the surrounding bandits did not attack, Kajuro had a chance to think and find an answer on how to escape. The red eye was completely dry and needed drops, and the busty monster was weak. Her mana level was depleted. She needed at least two days to rest. They themselves agreed that they could not fight and would rather give up. For the first time, Kajuro saw their upset faces not causing fear among others. Only the insatiable monster with a chainsaw burned with a passion for battle, and despite his exhaustion, he was eager to fight. Kazuro knew that zeal alone was not enough, and he would simply lose the saw. While Kajuro was reasoning, a monster bat was already flying above them, looking around. A guy with a large bag stood behind, blocking the path. His monster was not yet visible. Reluctantly, Kazuro realized that they had no choice but to surrender to their opponents. Caught by surprise, completely exhausted by strength. If the situation had been different, there would have been a fight. Not knowing what to expect from the attackers, Kajuro was still ready and waiting. Aggressively minded bandits stood, preparing to attack. Their leader held a lit cigarette and looked at Kazuro, noticing that behind him the enemy was also at the ready. Kazuro did not know what to do. He was in a hopeless situation, turning into a dark alley so that a shortcut was not the best decision. Kazuro, with a contemptuous look, the bandit having finished smoking his cigarette throws it towards the boy, deciding how best to attack and kill him quickly. Kazuro comes up with a very stupid but funny idea to pretend that he can pay off in kind and make a loving face, hoping that this would scare them off and they would let their guard down so he could escape. The bandits were offended by such a brazen act, and with strong antics of disgust, showed that they were not interested in this. Unfortunately for Kajuro, they weren't distracted, and it didn't work. Having finally gotten rid of the mercenaries, they decided to attack in order to teach the asshole a lesson. The guy with glasses was already ready to personally deal with the guy. But the chief stopped him, holding his stomach while holding back his gag instinct. Having given the command to his purple monster to attack, the leader of the mercenaries was already ready to have a good time for the rest of the evening in some pub with the girls for a reward from the death of Kajuro. Seeing the monster rushing towards him, Kazuro thinks to take a risk and release the monster with a chainsaw. He did not plan to give himself up to death so easily. The evil look was determined not to give the enemy a chance for an easy victory. Suddenly, someone intervenes in their mess by throwing tear gas grenades from a height. Having fallen to the ground, they exploded and enveloped everything in thick gas. It was impossible to breathe. My eyes were watering and I wanted to run away. The bandits were at a loss and did not control after the explosion where Kazuro was. But the boy was not at a loss, taking out from the bag a bra that he had bought for the busty monster, pulling it over his face. Unexpectedly for him, there is a rope in front of him, hinting that he should climb along it. Starting to rise from the thick fog, he looks at the bandits so that they do not pursue him. While they were at a loss, Kajuro did not lose the opportunity and rose higher and higher. Suddenly the rope began to rise on its own at high speed. Rising above the cloud of tear gas, Kajuro took off his bra from his face and breathed in fresh air. Raising his head, he leads in front of him the same clown who kidnapped him then. She smiled and tried to help Kajuro by extending her hand. Opening his eyes, standing among the dissipating cloud of gas, the leader of the mercenaries notices that the target is running away from them through the air and orders his minions to catch up with them. Having come to their senses, the bat with its owner on its back rushed in pursuit of Kazuro. Rising through the cloud of gas and weaving between buildings, they approached their target. 
The bat was a very fast monster in the air, and the guy with the glasses had no doubt that he would catch them. It was already a matter of revenge to finish off Kazuro. Seeing that they were approaching, the clown was absolutely calm, and putting her hand into the inner pocket of her jacket, tried to find something there. Having found pepper spray in my pocket, it was clear that this method would stop the enemy for a long time. The only important thing was to hit it. Having walked right into a monster with a guy in glasses, they at first did not understand what was happening. They were focused on the goal and did not notice such a dirty trick. Feeling an eerie burning in their eyes and breathing, they realized what had happened. The intense burning sensation made it impossible to continue the chase. Losing balance and suffering from pain, the monster and its owner fell back to the ground and disappeared in a cloud of gas. Only a smoking silhouette was visible and screams of pain were heard. Having dealt with their pursuers, they sat on the monster and flew to a safe place. It was light outside and a beautiful starry sky. Flying through the sky, Kazuro was a little scared, and he grabbed Clown Girl by the waist. She was a little confused and asked to remove her hands. She was a little embarrassed because no one touched her. Embarrassed, Kazuro had also never been so close to a girl, not taking into account the busty monster beauty. Kazuro stupidly blurted out that the clown girl saved him since he probably interested her. The girl was embarrassed and showed her disinterest. Having invited Kajuro to her hideout, she wanted to talk to him. Why was he fighting with the son of the head of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourer School, Fung? Looking gray at the table, the clown girl introduced herself to Kazuro with the name Hanami. She was the leader of a group of mercenaries who are fighting against rich and dishonest families who stole and deprived ordinary people of a normal life. Kazuro was pleased to meet her and experiencing some strange feeling, he was pleased to spend time with her. But realizing what he did to her colleague, he was a little ashamed and wanted to apologize. Hanami said that everything was fine, but he wouldn't get away with it so easily with an apology. She wanted to quickly return to the issue of the duel with Fen. Sitting down next to Hanami, Kazuro began to say that the fight happened because of Suyuki, Fen's sister. Hanami's surprise that the fight was caused because of a girl raised strange questions. Hanami jumped off the table, thinking that Kajuro was Fen's sister's boyfriend and seemed to have offended Suyuki, who decided to teach Kazuro a lesson by challenging him to a duel. She looked at Kajuro, thinking that it was a waste of time to bring him here and that he was clearly somehow connected with the Lin family. If he told the police where she was, she would be caught and punished. Kazuro assured her that he had no good feelings for Fen and Suyuki's family. They wanted to kill him and influenced his ability to enter a prestigious university. Such bad people should be punished and stop influencing the destinies of other people. Hanami, recalling her childhood, said that her family also suffered at the hands of a similar family. The man who came to their family with his mother was the head of the absorber's department. He was a normal man, and my mother liked him, but after a while he showed his true nature. Once upon a time, Hanami had a strong monster that defeated everyone existing at that time. The man who came wanted to kidnap the monster and take it for himself. He showed his essence. He was not interested in his mother. He just wanted to kill them, taking the monster for himself. At that time, he had a daughter to whom he could give the monster. Then, Kajuro remembered the girl from TV, defeating all opponents. He noticed that Hanami was similar to her. This was the work of that monster who was kidnapped by the man. It copied the owner's appearance and made the owner look like a doll. Kajuro listened to Hanami's story and sympathized with her. He thought about how to help her, Timolol, when they had so much in common. Kajuro told Hanami that his parents also left the city. They wanted to move to the countryside and start their own business there and thought that Kajuro wouldn't understand anything. But they were wrong. Kajuro became angry. He said that he wanted to deal with these scoundrels and did not want them to harm anyone else. Hanami looked at Kajuro. There were tears in her eyes from the memories, but he gave her hope for a bright future. This made her a little embarrassed and she was pleased to hear such words. Realizing that words alone are not enough and such people have many strong absorbers under their command, there is very little chance of winning. And she laughed a little. This made Kajuro feel a little uneasy. Kajuro said that he is very selenium and they cannot defeat him. 
He is sure that Fen lost to him because he did not know his abilities and his arrogance ruined him. Hanami looked at him embarrassed. She didn't want to offend him and was simply encouraging his self-confidence. Kajuro unconsciously lifted her spirits, even though he looked stupid. Unable to resist, she laughed and agreed to defeat these criminals together. Kajuro gave him a thumbs up, realizing that he now had a strong ally and a new friend. Noticing that her jacket was torn and she looked like a beggar, he wanted to help her. Torn sneakers lay on the ground. They looked like they had been running in them for years without taking them off. Kazuro understood that she didn't have enough money and that she was obviously spending all her money on something else. Kazuro's offer of financial assistance, she became embarrassed and said that she did not need anything. She spent her money on her mother's treatment after the attack by that man. She doesn't need anything from ordinary people. He handed her a bag of groceries as a thank you, but Hanami refused and didn't want to take it. Kajuro pressed with his proposal and did not accept refusal. Unable to hold the package, it began to fall and the contents began to appear from the inside. The guys looked at the falling package and watched in embarrassment as it fell. Hanami looked at the contents of the package with surprise. Kajuro watched as the pink fabric with suspenders lay on the ground. He felt awkward and was afraid of the girl's reaction. A large bra lay on top of green stones and a box. A beautiful flower connected the two cups, and the lace around it was very seductive. Hanami thought he was a pervert and was very embarrassed. Kazuro understood that the worst had already happened. He began to think about how to justify himself. He decided to tell the truth and that this was a gift to his busty monster in order to raise the level of trust. Hanami, with her hands clasped, didn't quite trust the words, but it was quite reasonable. Stretching out his hand with the box, Kazuro invited her to take the stones one for defeating Fen and sell it. She would make very good money, and her mother would not need anything. Hanami refused, saying that she herself was able to earn money for treatment and that she did not need his handouts. Kazuro said that this was a sign of reconciliation, and she saved his life. This is a worthy reward for such a thing. Pulling herself together, she agrees and offers her strength to help in the battle with people like Fen. After bumping their fists as a sign of reconciliation and friendship, they decided to go their separate ways and go about their business until their next meeting. Coming out of the shelter, Kajuro sees heavy rain falling outside. There was a river around and he could not leave. Embarrassed to ask Hanami for help getting to land, he stood with his hands in his pockets and hoped that she would offer it herself. He looked at her with a confused look and did not know what to do. Hanami, realizing that it was raining heavily outside, decided not to let Kajuro go. Hanami suggested that he stay while it rained and find something to do to amuse himself and kill time, squinting one eye. In his confusion, Kajuro began to have too many thoughts, and not all of them were decent ones. He didn't know how to react, because it was his first time alone with a girl. Sitting down on the sofa, she suggested playing a mobile game with an enthusiastic look at Kazuro. After calming his feelings and hearing about the game, he was a little surprised and agreed. She said that she was playing one game, but she couldn't win because she was losing to some player who was constantly killing her monster. Hanami really doesn't like this and wants to teach him a lesson. Seeing Hanami playing the same game as him, he was happy because he was the best player and would be able to help her. Kajuro was happy that he would be able to spend more time with her and show off his talent in the game. Having received an invitation from her to fight together, his face began to cover with cold sweat. He noticed a familiar nickname and began to remember when he saw it. It was already late. Hanami was the first to remember that it was Kajuro who constantly beat her and killed her monster. Anger overwhelmed her, and the realization that this scoundrel was in front of her greatly strained her. Grabbing Kajuro by the jacket, she began to throw him onto the sofa and strongly scold and shout at him. Her desire for revenge burned with hatred and anger. Throwing him onto the sofa, she sat on top of him and began to mercilessly beat Kazuro, not giving him the opportunity to defend himself. The blows were fast and strong. Her hair developed from the speed of her movements, and when jumping on Kazuro, he felt no pain at all. Having calmed down and stopped hitting Kajuro, he offered to get off him and promised to achieve many victories by playing with her in a joint game. The face showed awkwardness and a desire to sit down quickly. Hoping that this would be the case, 
Hanami climbed off him and sat calmly from the awkward situation. Kazuro, sighing with relief and the end of the beating, began to rise to sit down and begin the game. That same day, screams were heard in the office of the head of the monster absorbers, and the sunny day was broken by bad news. After hearing the bad news, the head of the scavengers was very angry, disappointed in the weakness of his charges that they could not cope with two people. The head of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University, Wang Lin, came with a report on the failed mission to capture the two fugitives. The head, out of anger, threw the ashtray lying on the table into the wall where Director Lin was standing. With great disappointment, he screamed in anger and did not understand how the nine masters of the absorbers could not kill the two fugitives. Director Lin was very worried and barely dodged a flying ashtray, which broke into small pieces on the wall. Having calmed down, the head of the absorbers leaned on the table and began to talk out loud about how to correct the mistake of the incompetent Director Lin. To which the director said that apparently they underestimated the enemy, and in vain, the head rushes at the director. The report said that nine heads were found in the cornfield. There were no bodies nearby, so it took them a long time to find the missing agents. Most likely, after the murder, these two refugees fled to another city. So far, the whereabouts of the fugitives have not been revealed. Realizing that the enemy is very cunning and selenium, the head proposes to expand the search and hire bounty hunters. Give a reward worthy so that everyone will look for them. During the decision-making process, Director Lin's secretary knocks and enters the office. Before she could say a word, the director attacked her, shouting that he was busy and she was out of time now. Very frightened, she apologized and said that Director Lin's son was severely injured in the battle in the market arena. Fen lost a lot of blood and two of his monsters. Director Lin and the head of the absorbers were shocked by what they heard. Fen was a very capable and strong absorber. He could become a strong absorber and chairman of the board. The father, having learned that his son had been severely beaten and had lost a lot of strength, grew worried and stood with a gloomy and nervous face. This news greatly crippled him. His son, the heir of the family, is now weaker than his sister. And what will happen now? The head of the absorbers, after hearing the tragedy of Director Lin, looked at the joint photo with his daughter. He was proud of his creation giving it incredible strength. He looked at the photo and was sure that this would not have happened to his daughter. She was too strong for any opponent, thanks to that monster doll that he took from the girl a couple of years ago. Having played enough of her favorite game, Hanami remembered that she needed to visit her mother and decided to say goodbye to Kajuro. She said they had a good time and he should go. Having shown where the exit to Rusha was located, she flew on her monster. Kajuro looked at Hanami flying into the sky. Hair fluttered in the wind. She was happy to spend time with a person who understood her. A beautiful starry sky, passing clouds, and Hanami flying on her monster. Kazuro will remember such a sight for a long time. He had a good time with her, and he will look forward to meeting her soon. All the time spent together caused a storm of emotions. Kajuro's eyes sparkled with happiness. He went home in a good mood under the bright sky. In a couple of days, the holidays end and I have to go to university. Having collected his things, Kazuro waited for the bus to Fu Fell University. Going inside, he saw the fat man Po, who waved to him and invited him to sit next to him. The road was long, since the university was located outside the city. Towards evening, when it began to get dark, Po notices that there is a cemetery around and they will soon leave. The horror of not knowing what kind of university Kazuro advised him began to show on his face. Kazuro began to reassure Po, claiming that these were probably training locations. The gloomy atmosphere was a good reason to prepare for battle. Po, gathering his courage, agreed that such a place really looked like a training ground. He had never seen anything like this anywhere. Apparently, Fu Fell University is very cool, Po said. Having got off the bus, he drove as quickly as possible and our guys stood near the cemetery alone and in the dark. Realizing that the place is quite creepy and the first acquaintance with the area was not pleasant. There were only coffins around and a dense fog, rolling shivers through the body. The guys stood and did not move. They did not yet realize where to go. A suddenly rising wind knocked an ornament from a nearby grave straight onto Poe's head. 
he screamed loudly out of fear and began to think that a monster had done it. While Poe was terrified of the place, Kajuro tried to remain calm and going into his phone, wanted to look at the map where they should go. There was no network here, and the guys decided to look for a road. Maybe it would lead them to the university. Having found a path between the graves, they followed it. Kajuro was also calm and tried to maintain his composure. But on the contrary, he kept turning it from side to side and was frightened by every rustle. Hearing another suspicious creaking, he noticed a huge crypt. His eyes immediately began to water with fear. Horror rolled over his face. Seeing what was inside, Poe became very frightened and jumped away. Kajura was surprised and looked into the coffin. In the middle of the cemetery, it was scary, but there was an open grave. This was already suspicious. A vampire slept inside. His green glow was very strong, and his robe said that he was more than 200 years old. This was clearly not a weak monster, thought Kazuro. He looked at the monster, who was still sleeping, and really did not want to meet in a duel with such a thing. But behind him, he could already hear the sounds of heavy steps and breathing. These were zombies. They approached the guys slowly, but with a great desire to devour them. Kajuro saw several dozen zombies, and knowing that they were weak, was not particularly worried. When he saw the zombie, he tried to hide behind a suitcase, crying and shouting for help. He was confused and didn't know what to do. He was weak and cowardly, and had never seen such monsters. Showing determination to act, Kazuro decided to call on monsters for help and fight the damned souls of the dead. He also reminded Poe that he too must have a monster to fight. The time was right to use it. Having collected himself, the fat man began to call upon his monster for protection. After using the summoning spell, the silhouette of a huge monster began to appear from his mana. It was the ghost of a smelly garbage container. The smell wafting from him could wake anyone up. Smelling the stench of the tank, the ghoul in a monk's robe opened his eyes. The fierce look from the unwanted awakening wanted to punish the culprit, and the whole glow in the grave only intensified. Poe notices that zombies are starting to surround them and decides to climb inside his monster and wait it out. Kazuro, noticing that Poe was scared again, understands that he will have to fight alone. Poe suggests that he too can climb inside and wait out the attack. Suddenly, a hand comes out of the ground and quickly tries to grab the fat man while he is trying to climb into his monster. While trying to get inside the monster, Poe feels something holding his leg and begins to scream and cry loudly out of fear. Having fallen to the ground, he begins to be pulled under, and the tank monster is unable to help with its short arms. Poe starts screaming, thinking that he is going to die. Kajuro saw this and asks the monster with a chainsaw to pull him out of the ground. Approaching Poe, the monster with a chainsaw grabs the boy by the head and pulls him out. In mute silence, they look at each other, and the monster with the chainsaw awakens a thirst for hunger. He looks at Poe as if he were a tasty piece of fresh human flesh and licks his lips. Saliva runs down his face, and his eyes glow with the desire to devour the boy. Kazuro shouts at him to let the guy go and not dare to eat him. He is a friend. The monster with the chainsaw reluctantly lets go of the boy, but when he falls to the ground, Poe feels like a couple of small monsters have grabbed his legs and want to bite him. The monster manages to cut off the insatiable zombies with his saw. Poe, in horror and fear, no longer knows where to go to escape. He had never experienced such a prolonged nightmare. After death, stones also fall out of zombies, this time small and yellow. They have little strength, but enough to enhance skills. Poe notices them, but fear does not allow him to take the stones. A vampire in a sacred robe decides to join the battle, calling his servants to fight. He enhances the effect of the fog and casts a control spell. Such power is capable of controlling others. Kajuro considers this ability to be very promising, and he would like to possess it. Unexpectedly for Kazuro, the vampire begins to attack at high speed, flying towards the guy. His eyes sparkled like neon, and the sharp claws just wanted to dig into the guy's face. Barely having time to dodge the sharp claws, Kazuro shouts to the busty monster to use a binding spell. Taking out her zither, she begins to play a paralyzing melody and tries to drive the vampire into terror. Kazuro notices that she didn't wear the guy's gift and apparently doesn't trust him yet, 
even after past battles. This makes him a little sad. Having succumbed to the magic of hypnosis of a busty monster, the vampire freezes and cannot do anything. His power is stronger than Kazuro's monsters, so there is no time to hesitate. Kazuro shouts at the monster with the chainsaw to attack the vampire and quickly. Having already acted according to the well-established scheme of stun plus attack, Kazuro was sure that there would be at least some damage, and whether it would force the vampire to retreat or surrender would be seen later. The monster with the chainsaw, having finished killing the zombies, turns around to attack the vampire. Loudly accelerating his chainsaw, he rushes into the attack. With a strong blow at full speed, the monster with a chainsaw kicks the vampire off his leg, throwing him back tens of meters. Then he starts running at him to cut him. Poe, having opened the lid of the tank, began to shout to Kajuro to get into his tank. There were more monsters, and his monsters could handle it themselves. Kazuro, hearing Poe's words, doubts a little, but realizes that it will be safer this way because he won't do anything to the monsters anyway. Garbage Can apparently does not have offensive skills, but he does have damage blocking and defense skills. The choice may not be the best, but the guys have no other choice. Jumping into the tank, Kazuro watches the progress of the battle and hopes that the monster with a chainsaw and the busty beauty will cope. Although the figure of the busty monster influenced the vampire, he was still able to defend himself and stopped the chainsaw flying at his face with his bare hands. Such a monster was clearly stronger and could, albeit weakly, counter the attacks of a monster with a chainsaw. Chainsaw tried his best to cut the vampire. They looked at each other with angry looks, but the vampire was stronger and this slightly tensed the monster with the chainsaw. Uncertainty about his victory flashed a little in his eyes. While the saw was fighting with the vampire and the busty beauty was trying to restrain him with her waist charms, Kazuro notices an unpleasant sight. A crowd of zombies began running towards the trash can with the desire to devour them. The trash can monster's legs began to give way. He was no longer entirely sure that he could withstand so many attacks. The dead souls clung to the container and began to try to gnaw and break through. The evil and hungry look of the thoughtless creatures forced them to act as aggressively as possible without sparing themselves. Without withstanding a large number of attacks, the container's strength begins to weaken. At some point, the zombies were able to punch the wall of the tank with their fist, thereby scaring the guys. The fat man began to tremble with fear. His eyes looked like an endless stream of tears. He prayed to all the gods to survive and escape from this nightmare. The lid of the tank began to open slightly. Kazuro was ready to somehow fight off the zombies just to survive. Our hero's tense face and aggressive gaze showed determination. The head of a zombie appeared in the crack of the slightly open lid, screaming from hunger and a desire to taste the internal organs of the children. At that very second, something very fast takes off half the zombie's head. Not understanding what happened, the guys looked silently in bewilderment. The zombies notice that their comrade has been killed and begin to look around. The trash can monster, standing in fear, notices a creature in the sky, rapidly flying towards it. The flying monster cuts off the heads of the remaining zombies at great speed, thereby helping the stinking tank. Having deprived the vampire of his servants, it was now possible to attack him. A vampire, in the heat of battle with a monster with a chainsaw, notices that a new enemy has appeared and destroyed his servants. Throwing away the monster with the chainsaw, he tries to attack the attackers. Making the most terrifying face possible, the vampire jumped up to strike from the air and finish off the monster standing motionless in front of him. A girl's voice from the side, appearing out of nowhere, began ordering another monster to attack the vampire. The vampire realizes that it was a trap, but it was already too late. Behind him stood a huge monster, already raising his hand to strike. Fear ran across his face and passed memories from life. The vampire fell. Next to him stood a monster without a head and with a face on its torso, which dealt a powerful blow. This did not kill the vampire, but knocked him out for a long time. Opening the lid of the garbage can monster, Kajuro sees a girl standing in front of him and looks around in surprise. A friendly and rather pretty girl introduces herself as Sarah and declares that she is a senior student at Fufel University. She has come to take the guys to their dormitory. Kajuro was very happy, but said that she was a little late. 
Another couple of minutes and there would be no trace left of them. Smiling, she said that she just wanted to see what they were capable of and watched from the sidelines. Having clarified that Kajuro held up quite well and skillfully controlled his monsters, Kazuro thanked Sarah for his kind words and added that his monsters are capable of more. I just don't quite trust him yet. The busty beauty and the monster with the chainsaw standing behind appreciated the guy's words and smiled slightly, calling them back to let them rest and gain strength. Kajuro decides to ask about what happened. What kind of place is this? And why are there so many monsters here? Sarah replies that they took the most dangerous route possible, through the undergrad proving grounds. Only strong monsters live here. And they came across a vampire capable of summoning zombies. Kazuro was a little surprised by what he heard and was glad that everything ended well. Finally, Poe came to his senses and opened it to see where Kazuro had gone. He was scared and afraid to climb out of the garbage can monster. Seeing that there were no monsters around and Kajuro was standing in some company, Poe felt better. Kajuro told Poe that they were safe and that upperclassman Sarah had come to take them to the dorm. When he heard that a girl had come for them, he began to climb out of the tank. Seeing what a beautiful girl came to meet them, he immediately tried to make a good impression and act as charming and confident as possible. Running up to them, Poe immediately extended his hand to meet the senior student. Seeing up close that she was even more beautiful, he began to show off his advantages and say all sorts of untrue things in order to impress the girl. Telling how he bravely fought a horde of monsters and trying to save Kajuro, he hid him in a trash can. After a long battle, exhausted, he climbed into the tank and tried to rest. And then she came to the rescue. Poe stated in an affirmative voice, Kajuro, smiling at Poe's words, began to hint that she had been nearby all the time and had seen the fight how Poe was crying and screaming for help all the time. Hearing this, Poe immediately grabbed Kajuro's face and said, Why didn't he say it right away? At the same time, blushing deeply with shame. Laughing, Kazuro said that everything is normal, and there is no need to worry so much. Fear of such monsters is normal. Sarah also started laughing at Poe's awkward situation. The laughter was pure and non-judgmental. After a couple more compliments from Poe and an apology for what happened, the guys began to pack up and hit the road. Having summoned her monsters, Sarah did not finish off the vampire. She knew that this was a training ground, and the guys would train here just like her. But she didn't want to kill a high-ranking monster and deprive others of training. After summoning her monsters, Sarah looked at the guys. At that moment, Kazuro noticed that the vampire began to rise and tensed a little. He saw the vampire start to run away screaming. Kazuro was surprised, to which Sarah told him that this was not the first time she had knocked him out, and he remembered her. Sarah clarified that she just trains a lot on this site, and all the monsters already know her, so they run away knowing that they cannot win. At the same time, he winked at Kazuro, realizing how strong she was, that she was able to bring such a vampire to the highest level. I began to feel a little awkward. Then she added that over time, they too would be able to terrify the local monsters by training hard. Kajuro looked at her, seeing a worthy monster slayer and wanted to learn more about her techniques and monsters. The guys looked pretty tired, and they wanted to eat delicious food and go to bed. Remembering how many monsters they saw today and barely survived, they needed a rest. Kajuro notices the green stones and asks Sarah if they can take them. Or is it the property of Fufel University? Smiling sincerely, she says that it is theirs by right, as it is a reward for killing monsters, so they can earn stones for themselves. Overjoyed, the guys began to collect stones, already imagining how much money they would get for them on the black market. This is quite a profitable business. By training to earn stones, and then exchange them for money. Kajuro liked this. Seeing that it was already late, Sarah pointed to the path where to go. They had to hurry, otherwise the guys would be left without dinner. Grabbing their suitcases, their stomachs growling, they looked at the girl as if in slow motion. Her skirt fluttered in the wind, revealing her long and smooth legs. She was calm and joyful, and her gait was as if she was dancing. The guys were a little surprised by such calmness, especially being in the middle of a cemetery. It looked strange. Finally, the guys reached the entrance to the campus. 
The view was a little scary. There were cobwebs everywhere and no lights. It felt like it was just another training center. Kajuro raised his head and saw the university sign, Fufel, and smiled. Finally, he has entered and will be able to study and upgrade his abilities as a monster absorber. Walking into the campus, the guys saw a crowd of guys who also came for admission. The guys were surprised that Kazuro and Po were accompanied by an older student. One of the guys shouted indignantly, Why are these guys accompanied by such a beauty? But no one accompanied them, but were met only at the entrance to the town. Having received a slap on the head from the person greeting him, the boy almost fell. The greeter, holding the list of students for admission, was very unhappy with such indignation and decided to explain. Pointing his finger at Kajuro, the greeter said that this is the strongest of the applicants and is capable of fighting on equal terms with many experienced absorbers. The boy is just one of the weakest and was surprised by the presence of the strongest in such a weak university. Kajuro stood in the middle of the crowd, a little shy. Everyone around looked at him and admired such a classmate. Some wondered why he entered the least popular university. It was already quite dark outside. The atmosphere was gloomy, crows were flying around, and the fog was thickening. Some had already checked into the dorm, while the rest were still waiting to receive the key to the room. Senior student Sarah approached Kajuro and handed him the keys to the room. The guys stood in front of the dorm and acted a little embarrassed. As she prepares to leave, she remembers to give instructions to the boys before going to bed. Firstly, you need to close the doors to the room. Monsters walk here at night and can attack. She especially looked at fat Poe so that he would not forget her words. Poe was very happy that Sarah turned to him. He fell in love with this beauty. He was happy that she was so nice to him that he thought she liked him too. Kazuro watched Poe fly in the clouds and wanted to bring him down to the ground, saying that he was too cowardly and inexperienced, that she did not want Poe to die in the first days from a monster in his sleep. Poe was greatly hurt by this, and he began to object, waving his arms, that he was not a coward and was able to cope with the enemy. Walking into the dorm, they went up to their floor and began looking for a room. Approaching the desired door, they heard strange sounds coming from the room. Poe was a little scared and asked Kajuro to check. Kajuro, without showing any concern, opens the door to the room. The lights in it were turned off, but the sounds of grinding metal could be heard very clearly. Fearing what was there, I decided to take a look too. Opposite the balcony, a guy was sitting on the floor sharpening his sword on a whetstone. It was dark around, but this did not bother the unknown guy. The guys looked at the guy sharpening his maple a little with a sharp edge. Poe was afraid that it was a murderer or some kind of maniac. Kazuro, having calmed his feelings, decided to talk to the guy. Turn on the light. He turned to the guy. Why is he sitting in the dark? This environment is quite creepy and can scare your roommates. Kajuro looked at Poe and said that he would take the top bunk. Poe stood at the entrance and was a little afraid. His uncertainty was a weakness that greatly exposed him to his opponents, climbing up onto his bed. Kajuro began to cover it. While Poe was fiddling with his suitcase and looking for something to eat before going to bed, the guy with the blade continued to sharpen it and did not pay attention to the guys. Kazuro decided that it would be okay for him to get to know his roommate. He sat on the floor working with his blade, silent and focused on his work. His behavior was a little suspicious, but they will have to study and live together, so they have to come up with something. Paying closer attention to the sword, Kazuro drew attention to the unusualness of the blade and why a monster absorber would need such a sword if he had the abilities of monsters, he did not understand. The red voice turned to Kazuro with the words that this is not an ordinary sword. People used to be executed like this for disobedience to the shogun in ancient times. Apparently, this is a family heirloom, and the guy inherited it. Kajuro decided to ask his roommate directly what kind of blade he had, and why would a monster absorber need such a weapon. Testing the sharpness of the blade without taking his eyes off the maple, he replies that it is his family's heirloom passed down as an inheritance for passing the tests. The red voice showed his concern by telling Kajuro that this is a very dangerous guy. Apparently, he has strong fighting skills and is capable of destroying any enemy without being absorbed by the monster. 
Red Eye recalled that once, when he was a man, he was killed by a man with the same sword. It really frightened my eyes looking at the boy. Kazuro thought, apparently the Red Eye is already many years old. If he remembers the ancient events of Japan, maybe he will improve his knowledge of history if asked, Kazuro thought. The boy with the blade decided to introduce himself as Han Goku. He entered Fu Fell because he was offered a very low price for studying, and here he is. Kazuro was glad that they finally started a conversation. To celebrate, he jumped out of bed to find out more about Khan. Kajuro wanted to know why he uses the sword and what tests he went through to receive such an inheritance. Khan began to tell that there were not many people in their village, and nearby, there was a mountain on which very strong monsters lived. Every year, when a guy or girl with the power of absorption wanted to achieve more in life, they had to go to the mountain and fight monsters. If you defeat the monster and can absorb it, then you deserve to achieve more and leave the village. Each of those who come after the test receives a family weapon from the family and leaves. Kazuro decided to ask, what happens to those who were unable to absorb the monster? To which Khan replied that no one else saw them. It's a one-way path. Either you win or you die. The guys looked at Khan with surprise and realized that he was very strong and it was better not to quarrel with him. After his story, Khan asked the guys how they got here. Kazuro replied that the director of Fufal, Mr. Sota, came to his home and offered to enter his university for free. Since he had no other choice, he agreed, and Po did with him according to Kazuro's wishes. Po listened to the boy's conversation in silence and did not interrupt. Khan was a little surprised at Director Sota's generosity in taking someone for free. Kazuro began to tell stories about how he fought with a boy from the Mao Chi Supreme Devourer's School and won. He was even shown on TV. After long conversations and funny stories, the guys were very tired and planned to get ready for bed. Outside, the fog had already cleared and the moon was visible against the background of the starry sky. After long conversations, Poe felt the urge to go to the toilet, and he asked Khan where he could relieve himself. Showing the guys where the toilet was, Poe tensed up a little, because there's a lot of chemicals to pour in and clean up. The picture was unpleasant. Night came and the only thing you could hear along the corridor was the snoring of students from their rooms. Moonlight comes in through the windows and illuminates the room. The slightly open door to the room made it clear that the guys did not understand Sarah's words well and did not lock the door. The guys slept and didn't hear anything. A sweet dream after a difficult day was very welcome. Kazuro snored and did not pay attention to suspicious sounds. Suddenly the sounds became very suspicious and were coming from Poe's bed. Kazuro tensed up greatly and saw the door ajar. Remembering Sarah's words about monsters, he decided to check. Moving quietly to the edge of the bed, he lowered his head to see what the noise was on Poe's bed. From what he saw, the boy was very tense and understood that he had to act quickly. They wrapped some strange threads around him and began to choke him. Poe was very frightened and tried to free himself, but the thread squeezed his throat not allowing him to even call for help. My face was already starting to turn blue. I had to do something. Kajuro quickly starts jumping off the bed to help. Poe was already beginning to kick his legs from the lack of air. His eyes were bulging. Landing on the floor, Kajuro notices how a sharp and shiny blade flies near his head at high speed. He cuts very easily the threads from the door crack that grabbed Poe. Kajuro turns on the light in the room. Poe tries to catch his breath and thanks the guys for their help. Khan points out that among the monsters roaming the corridors, there are no ones who can control the threads. Barely breathing, trying to catch his breath, he remembers that Sarah said to lock the door before going to bed. He won't make such a mistake again. Kajuro looked at him with relief. Kajuro decided to praise Poe for being able to hold his breath for so long, trying to lift his spirits and dispel the tense situation. Poe was perplexed because these threads could kill him. Could something like this really happen here? Poe spoke in surprise. Poe looked at his trembling hands, on which particles of thread remained. He suggested that these are not simple threads. They are similar to the puppeteer's threads. He saw these on the internet on an underground fighting website. Kazuro took the thread and began to examine it. Apparently, this is the work of senior students. They wanted to teach the new students a lesson. But with these methods, they could kill. 
Khan suggested going and checking who these threads belong to. If these scum can harm people, then they need to be taught a lesson. Kazuro was sleepy, but the fear that the attackers might harm the others did not leave him. He agrees with Khan to go and find out who owns this power to control the threads. Leaving the room, Kajuro asked Po to stay here and close the door. When they return, they will say the code word Tuna, and Po will open it for them. Leaving the room, Han took his maple, and Kajuro, as always, put his hands in his pockets and observed his surroundings. They walked along the corridor under the rays of the moon, expecting to meet and teach the scoundrel a lesson. Po agreed with the guys and wished them luck. He was scared, and he definitely wouldn't go anywhere so he happily stayed in the room. Watching the guys disappear into the shadows of the dark corridor, Poe closed the door and crawled under the blanket. Meanwhile, a group of senior students stood on the roof of the dormitory, laughing loudly and rejoicing that they had caused a commotion for the newcomers, and now they would lock the doors and not leave after midnight. The guys were happy and laughed. They loved to meet newcomers, putting them in danger and did not worry since no one suspected them. The guy in the blue jacket with blonde hair turned his attention to his monster, who felt that the threads had been cut and no longer obeyed him. Throwing the cigarette on the floor, he could not believe that someone had managed to get rid of the monster's shackles. Really among those admitted? Are there any absorbers with monsters and experience in battles? Mostly scum and hooligans enroll in this university. There are only a few normal people here. Unexpectedly for the guys, a door on the roof opened, and two guys came out heading towards them. The company was angry with the insolent people and demanded that they get out of here. Kazuro and Han, going out onto the roof, decided to ask if it was their monster that attacked the first-year students. Such actions could lead to the death of one student, and they did not like such a warm welcome. So Kajuro asked, who is the owner of the puppeteer monster? The company was irritated by such impudence. Will some freshman tell them what to do? Do you want to die? The group said. The guy in the blue jacket said that he is the owner of the monster puppeteer, and that is the last thing they will know. Angry at the impudence of the two first years, he orders his comrades to attack and teach the scum a lesson. Having activated their abilities, the bunch of hooligans were ready to see fear and tears in the brats. Showing their abilities by summoning a blue monster and a fiery hand, they are ready to teach a lesson. Kajuro, seeing the monsters summoned by the bullies and the half-monster with the fire hand ability, laughed at their weak skills. Having heard humiliation from the freshmen, they were sure that he didn't even have such and he was showing off in vain in front of them. Kazuro picked his ear, not attaching importance to the words of the hooligans. He decided to troll them with words that it was already late and they should go to bed. Otherwise, the children would not get enough sleep and would not be attentive in class. This only infuriated the hooligans more, and they decided not to spare Kazuro and Han. Accidents happen everywhere, and on the roof of the hostel is no exception, said the guy in the blue jacket. Kazuro's caustic jokes even smiled and thought that the boy was not as simple as it seemed at first glance. The monsters began to attack our guys, they fled with the desire to kill the small parasites. The chief and his comrades stood behind and looked at the lesson to the insolent people. Fen suggested splitting up and taking on the blue monster, while Kajuro would take on the guy with the monster's arm. Having agreed, the guys began to act. Kazuro, realizing that this was a man, did not want to kill him. Han's very fast speed surprised Kazuro. He knew that he skillfully wielded a sword, but he had no idea that his abilities were so enormous. Standing in surprise, Kazuro doesn't even have time to notice anything. The blue monster's head was cut off. The speed of the blade and Khan were elusive to the eye. Nobody expected this. The owner of the monster coughed up blood and felt sick, all because of a side effect of the absorbed monster. The girls behind were surprised and did not understand what had happened. The guy with the monster's hand was already approaching Kajuro and stretching his hand to a huge size, swung to hit the guy. Activating his red voice, Kazuro puts the guy into hypnosis and makes him fall asleep. Feeling a trembling in his body and a state of sleepiness, the guy tries to fight the hypnosis and resist, but the power of the red eye is too strong. Having fallen exhausted and drooling from deep sleep, the boy began to snore heavily. Kazuro stood and looked at the stupid attacks 
realizing that he and Kazuro could not cope. The guy in the blue jacket, realizing that the enemy was not stupid and had experience in battles, became a little worried. The girls sitting on their knees behind him were trembling violently for fear that they might be punished. He started shouting to Kajuro and Han that how dare they attack the senior students. They wouldn't get away with it so easily. They don't even know what they've gotten themselves into. Listening to the pathetic threats of the guy in the blue jacket, Kazuro and Fen stood in bewilderment. They didn't care about punishment. They just wanted to teach the senior students a lesson for mocking the weak. Having interrupted the guy in the blue jacket, Kazuro decided to continue the fight and tell him to talk less and engage in battle. Otherwise, it's somehow boring with them. Kajuro hasn't seen such weaklings who think they're tough for a long time. The girls, out of fear, grabbed the legs of the guy in the blue jacket and began to ask him to help and save them. The tears in their eyes and the fear that they would tell the director everything and they would be expelled was very strong. He lifted them from his knees, grabbed them by the shoulders, and pulled them closer to him. He whispered that he would deal with the scum. It was clear in his gaze that he was planning something. Hugging the girls, the guy in the blue jacket looked at his monster puppeteer with one eye and came up with a way to win. He forced the monster to wrap control threads around his girlfriends. They screamed in pain in the realization that their body was beyond their control. This was a very dirty act by their leader of the student group. He became like a puppeteer and could control the girls. Such actions are very dangerous, and the guy's psyche is clearly disturbed. Realizing this, Kajuro began to come up with a plan to free the girls and a way to capture the guy in the blue jacket. The girls began to say that they were in pain. They couldn't control themselves and they wanted to go home. Kazuro thought that Han, with his blade, would be able to cut the threads, as he did with Poe, and save the girls. Suddenly, the girls began to attack Kazuro and Han. There was fear on their faces, and they did not want to die. The guy in the blue jacket turned around and began to run away in the opposite direction in order to complicate the task for our heroes. Having managed to dodge the attacks of the girls' uncontrolled movements, Kazuro tried to come up with a plan and wait for the moment. Their movements were very fast and did not quite match their outfits. Khan was also attacked by a girl, although she moved quickly, but with a guy who has the skills of his ancestors, this will not work. She was ashamed and scared to fight with such guys, but she could not resist the skills of the puppeteer. With their backs pressed to each other, the guys stood waiting for the next attack. Kazuro suggested splitting up. Kazuro will take charge of the girls, and Hanu will have to deal with the guy in the blue jacket. The girls begged to be saved. They were in pain, but they could not control their bodies. Kazuro decided to summon a chainsaw monster and deal with the problem. The monster with the chainsaw wanted to cut and devour the girl's flesh, but Kazuro forbade him to attack the girls. They only had to cut the threads. Chainsaw didn't like it, but he did it. Having fallen from the release of their bonds, the girls were very frightened by the monster with a chainsaw. He looked at them with a hungry look, but Kazuro forbade them to eat. The guy in the blue jacket was very scared that now they could deal with him too. The path to the stairs was blocked, and they will be able to catch up with him with such and such skills. An emergency decision had to be made. Having wrapped his body in the monster's threads, the guy in the blue jacket decided to jump off the roof. Finally, he told the guys that he would take revenge on them later. Jumping from the roof, the guy in the blue jacket only laughed in response as he descended. His monster controlled the flow of the thread and watched its master's descent. Han and Kazuro try not to let go of the guy in the blue jacket and try to cut the threads in time. Khan jumps up to enhance the effect and cuts the threads. The blade is very sharp and cuts everything that comes under it without any difficulty. Before he can get down, the guy in the blue jacket falls from a height and breaks his leg. Screams of pain come from him. Raising his head, the guy in the blue jacket was very weak from his wounds and tried to climb out of the dorm with his own hands and call an ambulance. Kazuro and Han looked at the humiliation of the guy in the blue jacket and thought that if they finished him off, it would not be entirely humane. Such a bastard could return in a couple of weeks and catch him in surprise and attack. Noticing that the monster of the guy in the blue jacket is still standing on the roof, 
Kazuro decides to teach the guy a lesson and kill his monster, simultaneously ordering the monster with a chainsaw to deal with the puppeteer. Mercilessly, the chainsaw monster cuts off the puppeteer's head with its razor-sharp saw chain. From killing an absorbed monster, the owner suffers severe pain from the loss of the monster. It is believed that this is how a part of the soul dies. If the devourer loses too many of his monsters, he may even die from the pain. While the monster with the chainsaw enjoyed the meat of the killed monster, the girls were afraid of fear, looking at such a terrible sight. Kazuro approached the monster with a saw and began stroking it on the head, telling the girls that they should not worry, no one would eat them. Leaving the roof after an easy victory and solving problems, the guys approached their room. Khan opened the doors and was a little scared. Kajuro looked at him and began to suspect something was wrong. He was afraid for Poe and ran to the door. Seeing a huge trash can in the middle of the room, Kajuro calmed down and told the Khan that this was Poe's protective monster. There was no need to chew it. Khan thought that this trash had eaten Poe since he had not seen him anywhere. Having opened the container, Kazuro looked at Poe, who was sleeping without his hind legs, drooling in the middle of a pile of garbage. Khan was very surprised that someone had swallowed up a trash can monster. He couldn't even wrap his head around how disgusting it was. Apparently, Poe is generally fearless if such a stench doesn't scare him. Morning came. The sun's rays made their way through the windows and warmed us. The alarm clock on Kazura's phone rang and the guys began to wake up. Waking up from yesterday, Kajuro had a great night's sleep. Now he wanted to quickly start studying abilities and ways to improve them. After wiping, he saw Khan sitting in front of him on the next bed, holding a magical yellow stone. It felt like he was in a trance and meditating like a monk, Kazuro thought. Khan sat motionless and held the stone. His shadow on the wall looked like a burning fire. Apparently, this is how he fueled his powers with the help of the stone, Kazuro thought. During the morning formation, they were lined up as if in an army. After welcoming the new students, the teacher sent everyone out for a run around the university. After jogging, stopping under a tree, the guys looked for water and decided to ask Kazuro. They were thirsty from the marathon they ran. It was very hard for them. Some didn't even reach the finish line. Kazuro said that he doesn't have water, but he has wet wipes if they want. They can twist out a couple of drops for themselves, Kazuro joked. The guys were a little confused and did not appreciate the guy's joke. Suddenly, a very feminine guy approaches them and hints that they will soon bring him water. And if they agree to do something for him, then he will give them water. Stroking his silky, long hair, he winked at the guys. Kazuro listened to this nonsense and just grinned, leaning against a tree. The guys, a little doubting the normality of the long-haired guy, wanted to ask if he was deceiving them. The long-haired man looked at Kazuro and offered him water in return for the favor, which the boy refused, considering it stupid. There wasn't much left until the end of the lesson to owe someone on the first day at the university. The long-haired man simply offered to make friends and, if necessary, help in a scrape, if such a thing happened. Kazuro looked down on him not willing to drag himself into friendship with this suspicious guy. His girlfriend appears behind the long-haired man and brings water. She looked quite pretty and happy next to such a feminine guy. Kazuro tried not to pay attention to the vulgar attacks of the long-haired boy in front of them. He licked the neck of the bottle too vigorously and drank the water with great pleasure, trying to piss off the guys and ask for a sip. Poe turns his attention to someone very handsome in the distance walking towards them with a bottle of water. Poe recognizes her and screams with joy, prompting the others to take a look. It was Sarah, modestly walking with a bottle of water to give to someone. She felt awkward, because too many guys were looking at her and smilingly shouting compliments to her. She walked to Kazuro, embarrassed, and when she saw him, she called him. The surprise of those around was very strong. The person standing next to him was also surprised because he fell in love with Sarah. Kazuro, opening his eyes and hearing that Sarah had approached him, felt a sea of evil glances and hatred on himself. They didn't understand what the senior student saw in him. Embarrassed, Sarah gave a bottle of water to Kajuro with words of gratitude. They stood there, embarrassed by the looks of others. They were shocked that such a beauty gave water to some freshman, confused. Kazuro took a bottle of water, 
Not understanding how to act in such situations with girls, he scratched the back of his head and looked at her in surprise. Coming closer, high school student Sarah thanked Kazuro for his help in dealing with the local hooligans and a bottle of water. This is a small thank you from her. Kazuro felt his heart begin to beat faster, and he stood rooted to the spot, not understanding what to do. She asked not to tell anyone about what happened, so as to avoid punishment, and it would remain their secret. Kazuro silently rolled his eyes, agreeing with all her words. Indignant faces looked at the behavior of the couple and were very jealous of Kazuro, saying that the first year had just entered and had already got his hands on the most beautiful girl in the university. Another guy, looking away, notices another beauty walking in their direction. The boy blushed from such beauty. His comrade had not yet noticed the girl. He was focused on another lucky guy with a very beautiful girl. It was Hanami. She didn't look like a thief at all, but like a very beautiful girl. Her green eyes were very beautiful, and her multicolored ponytails fluttered in the wind. She walked towards Kazuro, holding a bottle of yellow liquid in her hands. Approaching him and taking him by the shoulder, she greeted him and offered him a drink. Kajuro was so surprised by the appearance of the Hanami that he was speechless. He was glad to see her. The guys standing around began to cry with grief that the freshman had so many girls and they were so pretty. He doesn't do anything and they just stick to him. Why is the world so unfair? They shouted. Others, seeing how lucky Kazuro was, began to leave with their girls so that they would not be jealous of such beauties. Hanami notices that Kajuro already has a bottle of water and is leaving. It was a waste of time to come. Realizing his failure, Hanami becomes a little angry. At this time, Kazuro thinks that if he introduces them to each other, maybe they will become friends. While Kajuro looked at Sarah telling her about Hanami, what a beautiful girl she was, Hanami herself turned around and decided to leave without disturbing them. Noticing that Hanami began to leave, throwing a bottle of something yellow over her, Kajuro was surprised and did not understand what to do. Hanami was upset and thought that Kajuro was a creep and was clearly interested in other girls. Kajuro stood there not understanding what to do. He didn't know what the problem was because he had never been in a situation like this. There wasn't even a thought in his head that he had done wrong, that he had offended Hanami. Sarah decided to cheer up Kazuro by saying that he needed to catch up with the girl and explain everything to her. Otherwise, he would lose her and the friendship would end. Kajuro decided to listen to Sarah's words and talk to Hanami. Picking up the bottle from the ground, he began to catch up with Hanami to talk. Hanami was already terribly annoyed and thought only about all sorts of nasty things about Kazuro. Having caught up with Hanami, he began to drink her drink with great pleasure, not knowing what it was. In his head, he only thought that he wanted to see her smile and joy. Hanami stood very tense. Steam was coming from her head. She was very unhappy with Kajuro and wanted to hit him hard. Kajuro looked, not knowing what to say and just stood behind. Sarah looked at Kazuro's pathetic attempts to apologize, and she felt ashamed. She realized that the boy had no idea how to care for girls, and apparently this was their first fight. Hanami remembered her mother's relationship and was afraid to repeat it. Hanami thought that Kajuro was a very good person and would not betray her, but she could not see other girls next to him. Although she understood that they were not boyfriend and girlfriend at all, she was still hurt. Grabbing Hanami's hand, Kajuro began to try to apologize, not understanding why. He began to explain that Sarah was the senior student who had met them upon arrival at the university and given them a tour. Hanami was not satisfied with this answer, and she only took her hand back, thereby making Kajuro think, and he told about the evening story with the hooligans, and that Sarah simply gave him water in gratitude for his assistance in catching the criminals. After Kazuro added that the drink is very tonic and quickly restores strength, he wondered what it was. With great pleasure, Kajuro began to finish the bottle of cool drink. Enjoying every drop, he was very grateful to Hanami for such a gift and thanked her after every sip. Looking at the insatiable Kajuro and apologizing after every sip, Hanami was annoyed by this, and she began to shout at him to stop, and she would tell him where he got the drink. There is a dragon monastery in the mountains. It is ancient and few people go there. When her mother took her to the monastery to taste the healing drink flowing from the dragon's mouth, 
It increased the power of control and consciousness, made the body more collected and alert. There she took it for Kazuro. Kajuro listened carefully to Hanami's words, and he was pleased that she did so much for him, that she treated him so well, and he wanted her to stay. Hanami puffed out her cheeks and looked to the side, pretending to sulk at him. Kazuro decided to ask Hanami to take him to the monastery and show him that place. Hanami had doubts and decided to refuse the guy, hinting that he would not receive anything else. Kajuro started looking at her with puppy dog eyes and begging Hanami. The girl began to understand that she was probably too hasty with her conclusions because he was just her friend. Taking the bottle from his hands, Hanami agreed to bring him another drink later and suggested meeting him in the evening after school, near the exit from the campus. Kajuro agreed with great pleasure because he already wanted to spend more time with her. He waves after her and is glad that she smiles. It was a nice feeling, hearing from the outside how they were making fun of him they started laughing that he didn't even know how to talk to girls, much less express his feelings and give compliments, that Kazuro felt ashamed, and it felt like they started throwing stones and shooting arrows at him. He walked past the guys, who were filled with envy and a lack of understanding why. They all wanted to be in his place and would know exactly what to say to such beauties. Kajuro looked at the reactions of his classmates and thought that he could ask Hanami not to come during lessons there would be less risk of being discovered and arousing suspicion. Moreover, someone might recognize her, since she is a criminal. Evening has come. Kazuro with Hanami and her monster are flying to a new, interesting place that Hanami has found. The place did not look romantic, more like a cemetery or ruins. Kazuro looked a little apprehensive. He thought that they would somehow spend the evening more romantically. Hanami was having fun and was looking forward to arriving at the place. Hanami finally saw a suitable landing spot and told her monster to sit down. Kajuro, not understanding where Hanami had led them, looked in surprise and in anticipation of something abnormal. Landing in the middle of the swamp, Hanami approached a huge tree entwined with vines and dry branches. Kajuro stood behind, not understanding why they were here. While helping clear the branches of a tree, Kajuro and Hanami see a cave with bats flying out of it. The guys got a little scared and started covering themselves with their hands. Hanami looked contentedly into the cave and enthusiastically prepared to go there. Kajuro looked at what was happening, not understanding what they forgot here. But he could not dispute Hanami's desire and simply wanted to be with her. Kajuro didn't understand where Hanami was leading him, but he followed her. The surroundings were damp and slippery and they began to descend down the slippery slope. The descent ended with a hole in the wall, into which our guys successfully flew and ended up in the room. It was a very fun trip. Kazuro notes that the room they found themselves in was furnished. In the middle, there was a large tent. Next to it, there was a cooking table and a tripod over the fire. They were met by old acquaintances who kidnapped him. The driver sat near the fire, and the pumped-up guy who had lost his leg in the battle against Kazuro stood on crutches. They looked at the guy with apprehension, but accepted the decision of their leader. Kajuro felt a little uncomfortable, since he was responsible for the loss of the guy's leg. Now they were allies with a bad history together. He thought that they would not accept him and would avoid him or even betray him. The pumped-up guy greeted Kajuro with the words that he lost honorably, having underestimated his opponent. Kazuro felt relieved and responded with mutual respect and an apology to make up for the guilt he felt. Kazuro was surprised to hear a familiar voice from the tent. Turning to it, he saw his classmate, who had lost his arm while fighting a monster with a chainsaw. Kajuro was surprised to see him here and began to ask how he got here. The boy began to tell how after the exam, his life went downhill and he wanted to commit suicide. But at one point, Hanami met him and saved him. Having accepted into her team, she promised to help and channel her strength in the right direction by helping others. Kajuro looked at Hanami and realized that she was doing a very important job, saving people. Her kind heart only made her fall in love with herself more. After the heartwarming story of classmate Hanami giving a tour to Kajuro shows where she collected water. Kajuro looked at the dragon head statue and noticed that it was strange. Hanami said that this dragon head serves not only as a water channel, but also as a lock on the huge doors of the tomb. Kajuro was shocked, 
realizing that he had been drinking water from the tomb. There were thoughts in my head to at least not catch some infection from the past. The guys said that the tomb had been found a long time ago, but no one managed to open it. Apparently, she was under the strong effect of protective magic, and it was impossible to get there. Kazuro, activating the red-eye effect to explore and identify weaknesses, began to roll up his sleeve to summon a monster with a chainsaw. He expected to open the tomb and explore. He was haunted by the desire to see what was hiding behind the doors. Using the monster's strongest attack with a chainsaw, the power level increased tenfold for a short time, but it didn't help at all. Sparks shot out in all directions. Incredible power fell on the statue. After such a powerful attack, Kajuro and the monster with the chainsaw looked at the statue in surprise. There wasn't even a scratch on it, apparently. The protective magic here was of the highest level and was not subject to attacks. Kazuro's stupid attempts and said that they themselves had tried everything before him. No one will be able to open this door with attacks. All that is needed is magic of the same level as the protection spell on the door, realizing that they are most likely right. Kajuro reabsorbs the chainsaw monster. He begins to think what to use in this case and begins to examine the statue. Feeling a strange feeling from the statue, he decides to touch the statue with his hand. She looked so familiar, and Kazuro thought that he had seen her somewhere in his childhood. Unexpectedly for the guys, the bolts on the door began to move and the door opened. Stale air and dust immediately began to escape from the long, closed room. Kazuro was extremely surprised that he could open the door with one touch. This greatly surprised him. The guys behind were shocked that the boy managed to open the door. Without thinking twice, the guys decided to go into the room to be the first to see the secrets of the tomb. There were many statues of old world knights around. The size of the room was amazing. It was dark inside, but the light from the huge open door illuminated a huge corridor between the statues of warriors. The guys stood near the door looking around the room. At the end, there was a tall staircase leading to a pedestal under a huge engraved arch. On that pedestal stood what looked like a coffin. The guys saw a huge number of warriors guarding the room and decided that this was the tomb of some ruler or commander. Looking at the warriors and the room of the tomb, Kazuro decided to go to the stairs to the top and see who was lying in the coffin. After the first steps, goosebumps ran through Kazuro's body. He heard strange sounds coming from the statue warriors. There was a thought in his head that it was a trap, and he was caught. Hanami was scared for the guy when she also heard strange sounds. She started screaming for him to retreat as quickly as possible. Her heart began to beat faster, because she had not yet told Kazuro about her feelings. She really didn't want something to happen to him, fearing the worst. Kajuro narrowed his eyes and stood frozen in place. The statues, making terrible creaking sounds, sat down on one knee in front of the guy, showing their respect to him. The surprised expression on Kazuro's face at what he saw showed his confusion at the situation. He didn't understand what was happening. Why did the statues start bowing to him? Red Eye began to suspect that the boy was not as simple as he seemed, and maybe he had strong ancestors with incredible abilities for absorber magic. The guys stood behind, not understanding what was happening, why the statues suddenly came to life and bowed to Kazuro. Hanami, worried about the boy, held on to the pendant that her mother gave her. The guy in the suit decided to go too, but the statue reacted by getting up from his knee and pointing a spear at him. He was very scared and did not move. They realized that the statues would not let them through. Apparently only Kajuro was allowed to enter. Having blocked the road with spears, the statues stood quietly and controlled the actions of the children. Hanami, worried about Kajuro, asked him to be careful and not do reckless things. Kazuro begins to notice that there were murals around with the history of the great man. He began to guess that the guy's assumptions were true and that a very influential man of the old era really lay here. Kazuro began to tell the guys what was painted on the frescoes and paintings around them. A warlike and strong warrior leading a huge army of warriors. The shiny blade and furious gaze caused only fear in the enemies. In another picture, it was clear that, having gone through hundreds of warriors, he defeated thousands of warriors and fought very fiercely, leaving no chance for the enemy. His actions before the enemy were ruthless. 
he cut off the heads of their commanders in front of the warrior's eyes, forcing them to fear and bow to the greatest warrior. Years later, he sat on a hill, leaning against a tree and enjoying the greatest country he served. Having defeated so many warriors, he saw the dawn of an empire and pride that all this was not in vain. Climbing the stairs, Kazuro was amazed at such a great man. The huge tomb was worthy of a great warrior. But why was it closed with high-level magic? Kazuro thought as he stood up. Rising, Kazuro saw a coffin in the middle of the pedestal. There was nothing around, no offerings or weapons or decorations. Just a coffin and that's it. Approaching closer, a blue glow and a menacing voice began to be released from the coffin. Kazuro became very tense because the ghost of such a great man could have unimaginable power. A huge blue ghost rose from the grave. He looked at the boy with an aggressive look. His soul did not realize that he had already died and was looking for his home, asking the guy where the city of Fuji was and was it safe. The city that the ghost asked about was a beautiful provincial town, famous for its rice fields. But once, it was a large and beautiful city. About a hundred years ago, the ruling clan of the Crow at that time attacked the city of Fuji and burned it. The entire history of the city was lost under the houses burned to ash. Kazuro read this in 10th grade history class. The ghost who learned about this was very upset. He lived defending his beloved city from enemies, but it was burned and a small village was built in its place. Emotions of anger were overflowing. Unimaginable power began to be released from the ghost's soul. It was very difficult to resist the power of the ghost's magical power. Rays of power began to hit in all directions and blind with their sewing. The guys standing at the entrance could not stand on their feet because of what they saw and began to fall. They had never seen such power and were afraid that it would break out and discover them. Having pierced the mountain and formed a huge hole in the ceiling, the enormous power began to illuminate the night sky and was visible for a very long distance. Nobody expected this. Meanwhile, in the office of the head of the absorbers, there was a serious conversation with Director Lin about the missing couple of escaped absorbers. Suddenly they were interrupted by a pillar of light rising in the sky. Feeling the enormous power of the force from the radiance, the head of the absorbers was extremely worried that such a force had appeared in the world and began to think about doing something. Director Lin was also surprised. He began to remember that he was in that direction and guess where the light came from. The head of the Absorbers orders to send all people to the place of power and find out the source if possible, remove them, and not leave witnesses. Director Lin agrees with the order and begins execution. Kajuro's parents saw a bright light in the sky and suspected that it might be their son. They knew what was in the tomb, and only their son from their ancestors had access. The father was very glad that his son finally matured and found the entrance to the tomb. Mom, realizing that if their son was able to find the tomb and open it, then not only they saw such power, now Kajuro will be in danger if he is found and finds out who his parents are. The father gradually began to lose joy from his face and concern for the safety of his son. He decides to act. Taking his sickle from the stump, the father already imagined what he would do to those who would harm his son. His gaze expressed an abnormal attitude towards people who prevented them from living in peace. His straw farmer's hat looked a little shabby, and the towel around his neck showed his hard work and dedication to his work. In the tomb, the guys were very worried about what was happening. They looked at the beam, knowing that Kajuro was there. Realizing that such a glow would be visible far away, they decided to hurry Kajuro and run away from here. Hanami tried to see Kajuro through the bright beam and make sure that he was not hurt. Understanding the concern of her comrades, she agreed to hurry the guy and run. Kajuro stood in fear, not understanding what to do. Such power is probably beyond anyone's control, Kazuro thought. Red Eye stood behind, clinging to the guy. He had also never seen such power. Having collected himself, the Red Eye told the guy that the spirit belonged to the object inside the coffin. Kazuro, fearing, began to understand the red eye, but it was very difficult to get closer. Near the skeleton of the deceased ghost lay a sword exuding unimaginable power. This was the ghost's object. If you take possession of it, you can subdue the ghost, said the red eye. 
Being next to the body of the dead man, Kazuro and the red eye, afraid, decide to act. The power of the glow began to increase. It was necessary to act urgently. The red voice said that a drop of blood was needed to subdue the ghost. Being very worried and unsure of his actions, Kajuro decides to bite his finger to draw a drop of blood. Looking at the sword with beautiful designs and gems, Kajuro brings his hand to it and applies a drop of blood. The enormous power of the ghost begins to weaken and thicken over Kazuro. The guy, realizing that something was going wrong, became very tense and began to move away. Enormous power begins to fly into Kajuro's body at great speed. The guy, feeling the horror of what he saw, begins to feel severe pain in his body. The disappearing ray into Kazuro's body knocks out the guy and he falls into the coffin. Hanami, seeing what happened, was very scared and decides to do something. Realizing that the guy needs to be saved and get out of here, Hanami decides to use her monster. The guys standing behind her begin to encourage her and remind her that they don't have much time. Hanami begins to summon a flying demon-like monster to fly over the crowd of warrior statues and save the guy. Climbing onto the monster's back, Hanami, worried about Kajuro, orders the monster to fly faster to help. Dodging the attacks of the warrior statues, the monster with Hanami begins to approach the pedestal with the coffin where Kazuro fell. Having spilled over the last soldiers, the monster and the Khans began to fly along the stairs, rising towards the guy. The soldiers did not pursue them. Apparently, they were tied to the place and could not get up. Rising to Kajuro, Hanami jumps off his monster and rushes to the rescue. She is very worried about the guy and wants to scold him for his stupid actions. She saw Kajuro lying inside the coffin in a state of shock. His eyes were wide open, as was his mouth. He was breathing, but was not conscious. Hanami looked at the guy with horror on her face, afraid that everything was very bad. Understanding that she needs to leave quickly, she begins to try to lift the guy up. Grabbing Kajuro by the hand, Hanami tries to lean him on his back to make it easier to drag him. Using all her strength, the girl tries to save the boy. While the guys are trying to get out of the tomb, Mercenaries of the head of the Absorbers have already gathered on the street to catch or take away the light source. While going down the stairs, the monster held Kajuro's body in his arms. The soldiers did not block their path, but knelt and bowed. Hanami sat on the monster's back and told him to hurry up. The guys began to get out of the tomb in their cave together, hoping to escape the pursuit of the mercenaries of the head of the scavengers. Meanwhile, the mercenaries of the head of the Absorbers were already beginning to divide into groups and inspect the entire territory in search of suspicious individuals. Parking your cars almost throughout the cemetery. Rising outside, the guys saw that they were already looking for them. Hanami kept Kajuro in an incomprehensible state and was very worried. The guys looked around and thought where to go. Sitting near the high slab of the grave, the guys noticed the glow of a flashlight and a crowd of people walking in their direction. The guys began to urgently think about what to do. One of the guys looked at Kazuro and realized that it would be difficult for them to leave with such a load. There will be little chance of salvation. He wanted to leave the guy, but he understood that there would be many who disagreed with his decision. Hanami realized that it would be difficult to escape, but she could not leave Kajuro. His condition frightened the girl very much because she didn't know how to help. Classmate Kajuro agreed with Hanami's words that they were not going to abandon anyone. He decided to divert the attention of the police and give his comrades a chance to escape. He stood proudly, looking towards the enemy, realizing that this could be their last meeting, and wished them good luck in their rescue and achieve their goal in saving people from injustice. The guys decided not to leave their partner to the mercy of fate and help him. The goal was to save Hanami and Kajuro from the enemy by allowing them to escape. Hanami was greatly concerned by the devotion of her comrades that tears began to form in her eyes. She thanked them for such a chance and asked them to be careful and not get caught by the enemy. The guys with a proud smile, realizing their choice, rushed to distract the enemy. Each of them set themselves the goal of helping the weak and wounded. Stop bad people from continuing to rule the system and the world, running in different directions to distract as many policemen as possible. Hanami told them after them that she was worried about them and in tears begged them not to take risks and to save themselves. One of the guys had already approached the police and began to run, distracting them further, falling under the flashlight beam and provoking the cops. 
A classmate who had lost his arm also found a group of cops and began to distract him by running and insulting those who were not competent. Unable to withstand criticism, they rushed to catch up with the impudent boy. Realizing that the enemies were distracted, Hanami, calling on her flying monster, quietly began to leave, observing the situation. She looked at the many beams from the flashlights and hoped that her friends would be able to escape and not get caught by the enemy. Hanami was very worried about them and prayed all the time for their lives. Meanwhile, Director Lin sat in the car awaiting results from his men. Calmly observing the situation, he was not worried because his people had cordoned off the entire territory and would not let anyone through. Noticing the glow from the monster's mana in the sky, he ominously looked after them and decided to take action. This time he didn't want to let anyone go, so as not to embarrass himself in front of the head of the absorbers. Rolling up the sleeve on his arm, he decides to summon his monster so as not to let the fugitives go. His consumed monster was a pack of high-ranking wolves, capable of catching up to anyone and even in the air. The ominous appearance of their huge mouths and bluish radiance made everyone who caught their eyes terrified. The flying monster with Hanami and Kazuro in its arms did not feel any threats and flew calmly, trying not to attract attention. Behind them, a pack of wolves was approaching them to attack. Sensing the ominous presence of another monster nearby, the flying monster turns around and notices that it is being followed. Hanami also pays attention and, realizing that her monster will not be able to fight while carrying the two of them, begins to think about what to do. The wolves were very fast and having caught up with the monster and the guys, they hit him hard in the back. The flying monster almost missed Kajuro, and Hanami, out of fear, began to try to pick up the boy herself. The flying monster, trying to protect the guys, grabbed them tightly so that a pack of wolves would not get to them. He couldn't fly faster yet, unless his owner asked him to. Suddenly, one of the wolves slips past the flying monster's defenses and bites Hanami's barrel. She screams in pain and is afraid that they will not be able to escape. It was too far to the shelter and she had to make a decision very quickly. Director Lin, smiling insidiously that his monsters are coping and won't let the guys escape, decides to quickly finish off the monster and drive the guys into a remote corner to grab it. The flying monster uses its clenches to fight back, and not letting the enemy in, fights with all its might. He can't stand being surrounded by a pack for long. Having bypassed the flying monster on three sides, the wolves prepared to attack and finally land the fugitives. Hanami, having received a severe wound and trying not to lose consciousness, tells his monster to fly to the Fu Fell University, hoping to take refuge there. Realizing that they have no other choice, she asks the monster to channel its remaining power into speed and quickly. Agreeing with the owner, the flying monster channels its power into speed and dash. Catching the wolves by surprise with her sudden movement and starting to break away, Hanami hoped that this would help and they would leave. Director Lin sees the monster's actions and, without worrying, knows that the wolves cannot be easily escaped. They are also fast and will find the target by smell. Having caught up with the flying monster very quickly, a pack of wolves immediately attacked the monster, tearing off pieces of glowing flesh. Finally, Fufal University appeared. Its buildings stood in pitch darkness as it was deep night outside. The hope that someone would come to help was very dim. Receiving another portion of blows from a pack of wolves, the flying monster, hugging the guys, begins to fall from powerlessness. Having fallen to the ground, Hanami was already too exhausted to do anything. The wound was deep, and she urgently needed to see a doctor. Kajuro was still unconscious and unable to help. Holding on to the guys with all his strength, the monster prepared for the last attack of the wolves and understood that he would die. Suddenly, Another monster appears above him and saves him, repelling the attack of the wolves. It was the headless monster of high school student Sarah. The wolves retreated, sensing the superiority of the enemy and did not attack. While on patrol around the university, she noticed monsters fighting in the sky and hurried to check, seeing the familiar faces of Hanami and Kazuro in the arms of the fallen monster. Sarah was worried and horrified by the injuries and understood that they needed medical help as soon as possible. Sarah stood in horror and didn't know where to start. It was too dangerous for her to leave the guys alone for help. But without help, they would be finished. She was frightened and didn't know what to do. 
The sound of police car sirens could be heard in the background as they drove up to the main entrance to catch the fugitives and interrogate them. Sarah, realizing that no one has the right to enter the university without the director's permission, decided to cover her comrades by standing in front of them. She looked at the crowd of cops near their cars and did not understand what was happening. Sarah stood in front of the entrance, preparing to fight back, but realizing the numerical superiority of the police people, she tried to negotiate. The policeman rudely ordered the fugitives to be given to them and not to interfere. Otherwise, she would marry an accomplice and would also be caught. Sarah, realizing that something is wrong here and the cops are not so rude, decides not to hand the guys over, but to advise them to get out of here for the good. The territory is closed to outsiders, and they have no right to enter here without the permission of the director. The suspicious men took a fighting stance, and threatening Sarah that she would be in trouble, began to roll up their sleeves to summon their monsters. Meanwhile, Sarah has already stood behind her headless monster to repel the enemy. Too confident in their abilities, the guys begin to call upon their monsters to teach the impudent girl a lesson and take the suspects in the situation to the cemetery. A crowd of monsters rose above dozens of suspicious people to attack the girl and her monster. Although the monsters were not of high rank, there were too many of them. Suddenly, Director Soda stands in front of Sarah and, with his confident appearance, decides to help and repel the attack on his students. Using a top-level spell, Director Sauta creates a solar whirlwind in an attempt to force the enemy to retreat a little and regroup for further action. But the power of his technique will scatter enemies in different directions, leaving them no chance to win. With an incredible move, he caused the attackers to become frightened and retreat. The incredible force of the whirlwind even overturned cars. Director Sota himself stood with his hands behind his back and looked at the actions of the attackers. Director Soda asked Sarah to urgently deliver the victims to the infirmary and ensure safety, and he would try to deal with the enemies himself. Without any indignation, Hanami immediately agrees with the director and begins the task. Sarah and her monster grabbed Kajuro and Hanami and quickly moved to the infirmary. Because of the noise, the lights in the dorm began to turn on, and the children began to leave their rooms on the balcony to find out what was happening. They were surprised to see the principal standing against a crowd of police officers and an injured classmate. The children continued to go out and go out to the balcony to see what was happening, and Han's roommate also came out to the balcony. He leads the wounded Kajuro, who is being dragged by Sarah, and senses a strong aura from the guy. It was familiar to him, as such power usually belongs to warriors, but Kajuro's power was much stronger than Han had ever felt. Finally, Director Lin approaches the attackers to look at the one who dared to interfere with them in capturing the criminals. Principal Suda suggested that the attackers leave on good terms and not approach his students again, otherwise they will be severely punished. Director Lin was surprised by such arrogant impudence and suggested that the old man go aside and not disturb him, otherwise he would be arrested for attacking the absorbers and sentenced to execution. Director Soda responded to the threats with a calm phrase and an expression of concern for the attackers, as they did not stand a chance. Director Lin, hearing the old man's confident words, only made him angrier and ordered his men to release the monsters and attack the arrogant old man. Rolling up their sleeves again and starting to summon the absorbed monsters, Director Lin's mercenaries prepared to attack with all their might and teach the old man a lesson. Director Sota realizes that his opponent has chosen the worst option and begins to roll up his sleeves and remove the bandages from his arms. Director Sota owned many powerful monsters and was once a very famous scavenger, but now he is a simple director of the little-known Fufal University. Director Lin's mercenaries summoned their monsters and prepared to attack. Looking at the old man's enormous strength, they tensed a little, but realizing that there were more of them, they were ready to attack and waited for a command from Director Lin. Dozens of mid-level monsters, after Director Lin's order, rushed to attack the old man with the desire only to kill. Director Sota, having summoned his high-level monsters to intimidate the enemy and leave without a fight, realizes that they do not realize their mistake in engaging him in battle. Seeing the crowd of monsters running, Director Sota uses his Monster Sage. The Monster Sage was a monster of the highest level and possessed incredible powers. 
He was able to use his ink brush to cast spells on the enemy, thereby stopping or increasing the damage to them from his allies. This is what old Sota took advantage of. Swiping his huge brush through the crowd of fleeing monsters, he casts a spell of vulnerability on all enemy monsters. The Scythe Woman monster is ordered by Director Sauda to use the cutting mill attack. The sight of a skeleton in a dress and hair with a braid began to glow, using a strong attack move before attacking. Having rushed at great speed, cutting through all the monsters like paper, the monster with the scythe was very strong, and it was impossible for such mediocre monsters to repel her attack. Seeing the crowd of hacked monsters, the attackers were shocked and feared that they were finished. Some began to run immediately after what they saw. The rest had not yet recovered from what they saw. Director Lin was shocked that so many monsters were killed by only two monsters. His gaze was filled with fear because he had never seen such strong absorbers. Deciding that they don't stand a chance, Director Lin orders everyone to retreat and escape from here. Nada would come up with another plan for attack. At least they knew where to look for the fugitives. Director Sota, realizing that the enemy was retreating, did not pursue, but wondered why they were pursuing Kajuro and the girl. Something strange happened, and it was necessary to check the condition of the guys. Meanwhile, the mercenaries got into their battered cars and began to retreat, leaving a huge, dark trail of ash on the asphalt from the dead monsters. Making sure that the enemy had retreated, the director turned around. The entire dorm stood on the balconies and loudly applauded and shouted to the director. Seeing how strong and powerful he was, the guys were glad to learn from such a master absorber and director of the Fufel University. Meanwhile, the cars with the mercenaries raced further to quickly return to the main headquarters and think over a plan for further action. Director Lin decided to call the head of the absorbers and tell him what happened. The situation got out of control once it entered the university territory. The head of the saddle absorbers is sitting on a chair in his office. Picking up the phone from Director Lin's call, he was surprised that they were again unable to capture the fugitives. He began to doubt Director Lin's competence again and show his dissatisfaction. Director Lin began to make excuses that they were prevented by a very strong absorber, which he had not heard of before. It was the director of the Fufel School, and he had many absorbed monsters, about eight. His people were not prepared for such an enemy, which is why they lost. The head of the absorbers, hearing that Director Soda had interfered with them, smiled. He remembers him in his youth, because they fought together against monsters. The mighty Soda was the most powerful warrior and absorber at the time of their joint study with the head of the absorbers. Once upon a time, Soda could fight any monsters alone, and always won. Even the other absorbers were afraid of him, because when they challenged him in the arena, they always lost. Director Lin, hearing that the head knew the director of Fu Fel, was surprised and shocked that such a powerful man became the director of a little-known university. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, the head of the absorbers orders Director Lin to retreat and infiltrate his people into the university system in order to trace and find out where the fugitives are being kept and kidnap the target. Director Lin, having heard that undercover students would be infiltrated, offered his children as candidates as an apology for the failure of the operation. To which the head of the absorbers replied that he had already done this, supporting their duo with his daughter so that she would look after them. The head of the absorbers sat in his chair with his phone down. His face showed concern, and the flooding memories of Director Soth were also the reason for this. Kazuro's father, meanwhile, was already at the station to get to the city and keep an eye on his son. Walking down the corridor, he wanted to sneeze. It was a strange feeling, as if someone were remembering, the father thought. Sarah had already taken Kajuro and Hanami to the infirmary, where they were receiving medical attention. She was worried about Kajuro because the boy was frozen in a state of shock and did not wake up. Director Soda came into the office to make sure the guys were safe. He began to suspect that Kajuro had an excess of spiritual power and needed to release it a little to help the boy. Taking the sacred needle out of his pocket, Director Soda recalled how he had used such a thing before. He hoped this would help the guy. Having inserted the tip of the needle into a certain point on Kazuro's face, power began to ooze from the wound in blood-red waves, freeing itself from the body. After the procedure, Director Soda began to leave, 
saying that now he had to wait. Sarah decided to cover the guy and pulled the blanket. The director notices the logos of the absorbed monsters on Kajuro's hand and sees a very strange monster mark. This frightened him greatly, and he automatically attacked Kajuro, not paying attention to his surroundings. Sarah was afraid that the director attacked the guy without any reason. Director Sota was horrified by what he had done and removed his trembling hand, having not managed to commit the terrible thing. He decides to leave. Turning his head to the surprised Sarah, the director apologized for what he had done and said that it seemed to him that the boy had been captured by something and that he wanted to test this theory. Director Soda looked at the guy with caution and felt a very powerful force in him that was beyond anyone's control. He was afraid that the boy would not survive, but for such a long time, the monster did not manifest itself, which means that the guy might be able to subjugate him. Such a creature. Warm, sunny day. Children are running and having fun while their parents are working in the field. The village is surrounded by high mountains and protects from strong winds. The village was attacked. Many houses were burned to ashes. All residents were killed without pity. The valley was filled with thick, acrid smoke, saturated with blood. The palace was attacked. All the warriors were brutally killed, and the armed attackers entered the main hall of the palace. In front of them stood a woman with a baby and a boy clinging to her dress. They looked like royalty. They stood near the throne of the village governor and showed no fear. The woman was very beautiful, with a large gold necklace and a majestic dress. She stood proudly with her children and awaited her imminent death without showing any fear. Suddenly, Kazuro opens his eyes. He is scared because he doesn't understand what kind of dream it was and why was it so real. When he saw that his friend woke up, he was happy and cried with happiness. He was glad to finally be sure that Kajuro had woken up when he was nearby. He jumped to hug his best friend and cry with happiness. Kajuro was shocked by his friend's strong affection and expression of emotion that he tried to stop him and ask him to calm down. Po began to say that Kajuro slept for about two days in the infirmary. Everyone was very worried that he would not wake up, and Po came every day and told how his day went. Hearing coughing from the next bed, Kajuro notices a guy covered in bandages. Poe says that this guy has been here for a week. Someone severely maimed him by throwing him off the roof. The bandaged guy with a bad mood remembers Kajuro because he and his partner beat him up like that. Kajuro remembered that this was the guy in the blue jacket who forced his girlfriends to fight them, and he tried to climb down from the roof and fell when Han cut the monster's threads. Poe looked at the bandaged man and remembered that he had been strangled in his sleep with some threads and that he was probably involved. The bandaged guy became a little nervous, realizing that they could do something else with him. Kajuro remembered that he was with Hanami in the cave then, but she was not nearby and he asked Po where she was. In the background, the door to the room opened and Sarah stood at the entrance. She came with a bottle of water. Hearing Kajuro's words, she said that Hanami had suffered greatly while saving him and she was lying in a separate room under a life support system. Kajuro was very scared for Hanami and decided to get up and check on his friend. His legs did not listen to him, and he fell. Sarah told him not to rush so much and better lie down. He still wouldn't be able to help Hanami yet. The bandaged guy, seeing Kajuro fall, began to laugh loudly at him and say that he was also weak. Kajuro turned to him, rising with Sarah's help, and said that he had simply been lying there for too long and his legs were a little weak. Already standing on his own two feet, Kajuro, not listening to the advice of his friends, decides to go to Hanami. Passing by the bandaged man, he gives him a slap on his broken leg. In pain, the boy begins to scream. Po stands there, smiling maliciously with the words just right for him. Sarah is concerned about Kajuro's condition and stands watching in surprise. Walking into the next room, behind the glass of which lies Hanami. Her condition is stable and serious. Kajuro is worried about her and wants to help in some way. Sarah followed him and stood behind him, watching and realizing that they could not do anything yet. Sarah reveals that Hanami dragged Kajuro to the university and received severe injuries. Doctors are doing everything possible to save her, but for now, she must fight for her life herself. The wounds were very severe. 
Apparently, she was bitten by the wolf that Sarah was able to drive away when they set foot on the university grounds. Kajuro stood, holding back his anger that he could not save her. He decides to take revenge on the mercenaries for the harm they caused to his friends. Realizing that they suffered while saving him, Kajuro did not want to remain in debt and deal with the damned mercenaries. Walking down the corridor, reflecting on his actions, Kajuro stumbles upon Director Sota. He offered to follow him and discuss what had happened. Kajuro was too overcome with emotions and said that he did not have time to talk. He had to quickly find a way to save Hanami. Director Sota followed the stairs to the top and said that he was waiting for him on the roof. Kazuro looked at the old man leaving and thought that he did not hear him. Sarah approached them from behind. Trying to convince Kazuro that now is not the best time for thoughtless actions, she advised him to follow the director and discuss everything, especially since he saved them all from the enemy by fighting them. Having calmed down a little, Kajuro agrees to talk with the director and goes up to the roof. The director stood near the edge and looked at the beautiful view of the surrounding nature. Turning around, the director said that he was glad to see him here and wanted to talk to him about what happened. Director Soda asked the guy what they were doing before he passed out. Kajuro was afraid to reveal all the secrets since it was Hanami's secret place and he didn't really trust the director to reveal all the secrets. Director Sota, realizing that the boy did not trust him yet, decided to give advice. If Kajuro wants to deal with the attackers, then he will have to undergo a test in the mountains to prove his ability to fight and survive. The director, showing the direction of the test, told the boy that he would have to fight very strong monsters. If he defeats them, he can achieve greatness and fight those mercenaries who harmed his girlfriend. If Kazuro agrees, then the director will help him master his powers. Kajuro agreed with the director's words to pass the test, but helping Hanami was more important, and he asked the director to give him advice on how to do this. Director Sota was glad to hear the agreement and promised that Hanami would not be in any danger under his supervision. The director said that he would teach Kajuro how to deal with his monsters and how to properly control them for defense and attack, and also teach him how to control the flow of mana for long-term use. Kajuro looked at the old man and remembered that he had already had moments, that he no longer had the strength, but the battle continued and it would be very useful for him to manage his strength correctly. The old man was clearly wiser. His wisdom was great and worthy of a teacher. Kazuro bent down on one knee and promised to cope with all the tasks that the teacher set for him. He wants to take revenge on all enemies who can harm him and his friends. Director Sota stood calmly. But inside, he was glad that he would have a worthy student who could cope with everything. After the conversation, the director asked the guy to come to him in the evening after classes. Kajuro and Po went to the training center for lessons. Kajuro held his head with the thoughts that he had slept through the first couple of days of the initial course of familiarization with the material, and it would not be easy for him. Walking through the corridors of the training center and reaching the office, cheerfully talking about their admission. Kajuro was a little embarrassed that he had missed a lot and didn't know how to catch up with the others now, to which Po told him not to worry and everything would work out for him. Listening to Po's words of encouragement, Kajuro opens the doors to his office. There was noise and commotion in the class, and he hoped that no one would pay attention to him or focus on him. Seeing that all the boys surrounded the girls in the class and tried to please them, giving gifts and compliments. The appearance of his classmates was not entirely attractive to Kajuro, and he did not understand what the boys saw in them. The reaction of surprise was strong. He was afraid that everyone was acting very strange towards such girls. When he lowered Kazuro to the ground, he said that the guys, seeing him with two beauties, became very jealous and began to look for a mate for themselves, not paying attention to their shortcomings. The girls felt very proud that so many guys were courting them, but they did not show any response. Every guy in the class treated the girls courteously and gathered in groups near each one. Kajuro looked at all this shame because of the appearance of Sarah and Hanami on the sports ground, which he was even ashamed of. He and the fat man sat down in the empty seats and prepared for the first lesson. Remembering what happened in the crypt, he notices the sign of the consumed ghost of a warrior on his hand. Kajuro was surprised but did not feel the power of the ghost. 
Apparently, he was so strong that he was knocked out from absorbing such a huge amount of the monster's mana. Finally, the bell rang for class, and all the children began to take their seats and wait for the teacher. The class sat quietly, and Principal Soda, who would be teaching the lesson, walked through the door. The children in the back rows greeted the director with admiration, remembering his fight with the police. Principal Soda greeted the students and asked to welcome the new exchange students from Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University. They will study with them for a whole semester and take part in joint training. Three children entered the class. These were Suyuki Lin and her brother Fen, as well as the daughter of the head of the Absorbers, Yui Aragaka. Director Sota greets the new students and introduces them to the children. The guys in the class immediately paid attention to their new classmates. They were so beautiful that the guys in the class lost their heads and fell in love with them immediately. The trio stood in front of the class and greeted all the students. They were glad that they would be able to study with them and train together and learn something new. Yui looked into the classroom and noticed Kajuro, who was very interesting to her father. Director Lin's children also knew him and said that the guy was not as simple as he seemed. She looked at the guy and thought to win his trust and find out all the secrets he was hiding. Maybe he is the one who his father needs so much, Yue thought. The director asked the children to sit down in the empty seats and get ready for the lesson. Yui, noticing an empty seat near Kazuro, immediately went to sit next to him, not paying attention to the loving glances of the guys. Sitting down next to Kazuro, she began to take off her backpack and prepare for the lesson. Po was surprised that another beauty was sitting next to Kazuro. Kajuro knew her from Hanami's stories. He didn't pay attention to Yui's words and was angry at her family for what they did to Hanami and her mother. He looked at her and realized that she had come here for a reason. Her father had probably sent her to find the one who had opened the warrior's tomb. Kajuro did not want to be near the enemy, who caused a lot of pain to his friends. So he stood up and asked to change places. Yui was surprised that he was so rude to her, but trying not to attract attention, she agreed. She started to get up from her seat, thinking that he just wanted to sit near the exit, but his gaze and rough voice showed an incomprehensible anger towards her. Kazuro walked past her and sat not next to her but on the first desk. Yui was surprised by this behavior because every guy would dream of sitting next to her, but Kazuro ignored and tried to avoid talking to her. The guys were surprised that Kazuro refused to sit with such a beauty and decided that apparently his girlfriend was very jealous and forbade him to sit with other girls. The other guy said that maybe he knew the new girl and he knew her better, so he moved. The guys began to suspect that the girl must have a very bad character, that Kazuro was running away from her like that. Yui sat with her eyes downcast, not understanding why Kajuro did this. The director said that enough talking and let's start the lesson. He asked to get textbooks on spell control and open the second chapter. After class, Kajuro went to the library. He was haunted by the dream that he had. It was very familiar, and he had seen it somewhere. Approaching a shelf of history books, he began to look for a suitable book that might contain this story. Having found suitable books about the history of the ancient world, he began to take them out from the shelf. After going through several books, he finally found the one that reminded him of the dream. Opening to the page that depicted the house and throne that was in the dream, he began to read the story of what was happening on the pages. It was a legend about a hero who saved the country from monsters and stood guard over the city of Fuji, named after the mountain. The warrior was a powerful swordsman and was able to control his blade with magic. Many warriors and monsters fell to his blade. Kazuro remembers that the tomb was opened only to him for a reason. Apparently he had the blood of that very hero in him, or he was a close relative of the one who was connected with that swordsman. Realizing this, Kajuro decides to call his father to ask him about it. Maybe he knows something. Although this is strange because he is a simple farmer or is hiding something, Kazuro thought. The father didn't pick up the phone for a long time and Kazuro became a little worried. If the mercenaries are looking for Kazuro, then maybe they are looking for his family. Such thoughts only made the boy more worried about his family. The father calls back and begins to greet his son in a joyful voice. He said that he was on a train and was passing through a tunnel and there was no network there. But when he left, he saw that his son had called and called back immediately. Kajuro said he was worried and asked why he was on the train 
and the guy had some questions about who his ancestors were. The father laughs and reassures his son that he is going to visit him to bring some vegetables that they grow. Otherwise, in the city, you eat only chemicals. Father will arrive soon, and he needs to hang up. Kazuro, hearing his father's voice, calmed down, but he did not answer the question about his relatives. Maybe when he arrives, they will talk about it. Suddenly, Yui appears near Kazuro and asks what he is reading here. Kazuro, frightened, immediately turned away from her and refused to discuss anything. She tried to behave tactfully and with her beautiful eyes trying to get the guy to talk. He refused to talk to her about anything and asked her not to get in his way. He was not interested in her, Kajuro said. Yui was very surprised because she had just come to their class and he was avoiding her. Yui starts screaming from not understanding why he treats her like this and avoids her. Kajuro replies that he doesn't want to have anything to do with people like her. Having caught up with Kazuro and standing in front of him, not allowing him to pass, she begins to ask the guy why he treats her so badly, why he doesn't want to talk and make friends. Pushing her aside with his hand, Kajuro said that he had never seen such cruel and ruthless people as her family. Yui stood confused and did not continue to pursue the guy. She began to understand that the boy might know her father and therefore was avoiding. Meanwhile, behind Yui there was a group of guys who were watching her and wanted to get to know each other, they saw Kajuro send Yui and were surprised. The strong surprise of one guy forced him to go and teach Kazuro a lesson for such behavior with a girl, while the other looked and admired Kazuro for being able to refuse such a beauty attention. After classes and visiting the library in search of information, evening came. Kazuro prepared to go to the director's office for further instructions. Having reached the office, Kajuro knocked. The light was not on inside and the guy thought that the director was not yet there. After trying to turn the handle, the office opened and Kazuro came in to take a look. Unexpectedly, Kajuro is attacked in the director's office with a dagger in his hands. This was very unexpected, and the guy did not have time to react. At high speed, the dagger, fueled by mana, approached Kazuro's chest. All life and fear begin to flash through the guy's eyes. Kazuro's chest cavity. The guy in a state of shock does not feel pain but realizes that the wound is very deep. The sensations of pain disappeared. The body began to emit an aura like that of a ghost. Opening his eye slightly, Kazuro begins to feel a surge of strength and incredible power in his body. The guy's body changed. His hands turned into bone and a blade appeared in his hands, exuding enormous strength and power. The attacker turns out to be Director Sota. He was very surprised by Kazuro's changes and the fact that the ghost is able to control the guy's body surprised him. Managing to block the blow from the boy's bony body, Director Sota uses enormous force to resist the blow. The ghost swordsman's power was very strong, and Director Sota was unable to resist it. The blow was so powerful that he simply flew away with one swing of the sword. The director flies into the wall from a strong blow. The mark in the wall spoke of great strength, and the cracks and crumbling of the wall spoke of power. The swordsman's power completely restored Kazuro's body and saved him, but after being reflected, it slowly began to fade, and the boy became the same. Director Sota, after a strong blow to the wall, stood on one knee leaning on the floor. The director apologizes for his actions, explaining that he saw the guy's mark as a swordsman and wanted to test what he was capable of, and the fact that the boy was filled with power spoke of the great power of the ghost. Kajuro draws attention to the hand and says that he himself saw the sword's sign, but did not feel the presence of the monster and could not summon it. Director Sota rose to his feet, walked to the wall and turned on the light. Kajuro stood and looked at the director in confusion. The director with a serious face tried to explain to the guy that his swordsman has enormous power, but so far he does not know how to control the monster. The director attacked the guy to release his strength to improve his condition. Kajuro stood scratching his head and told the director that he attacked him with a dagger and hit him. And if the monster had not appeared, then what? The director replied that he hit a vulnerable area without touching the organs, so the boy would simply get stitches and that's it. Suddenly, the director's confident stance turned into a hunched old man who was coughing from chest pain. Such a strong blow definitely left marks after hitting the wall. Kajuro was a little frightened by the teacher's condition. Realizing that it was he who hurt him, the boy felt a little ashamed. Hiding his injuries, 
The director told Kazuro that everything was fine. He was just getting old and his body was failing him a little. Kazuro ran up to the teacher and grabbing his hand, led him to the sofa and sat him down. Fearing for his condition, the guy was worried that he could seriously harm the director while being out of his mind. Sitting down on the sofa in the office, the director smiled and said that the boy should try to find an approach to the swordsman's monster, and then he would be able to fight with anyone with such strength. But this could take a lot of time. Kazuro, fearing for Hanami's life, remembers that she is now lying in the ward because of him, and he doesn't have time to master and prepare. He needs to act faster. The director. Understanding the boy's words and his bitterness, suggests trying to repeat the murder attempt, but only if you have to get into a fight with the monster and let him kill you, then the swordsman's soul will appear to save you. Kazuro was glad that Nada would just fight the monster and die. Then he could call the swordsman again and try to subdue him. To celebrate, Kazuro decides not to hesitate and go to the cemetery, where he fought monsters as soon as he arrived. Director Sota was surprised by the boy's strong desire to die that he didn't even know what to say. Trying to stop the guy, the director stood up and asked Kajuro to think it over carefully. Here you have to be ready to give your life and it's not that easy to do. Kajuro, smiling, said that in principle, he was ready to die if it would help subdue the swordsman and save Hanami. Then the director had nothing more to say, and he asked the guy to be careful and choose the enemy as strong as possible so that the swordsman's monster would definitely help. Having heard the director's advice, Kazuro agreed and joyfully went to look for adventures, waving to the director along the way. After leaving, the director stopped holding back the pain and relaxed. The body was buzzing and there were many fractures. Judging by the coughing up of blood, the ribs were in splinters. Director Sota felt hellish pain and understood that the boy possessed a unique monster that he had always been looking for, but only a chosen one could possess such a thing. Hoping to quickly meet a strong monster and fight, Kazuro ran as fast as he could toward the cemetery, not paying attention to Nina. Three exchange students were standing near the school late in the day and saw Kajuro running somewhere. Fen was glad that the time had come to avenge his humiliation and fight him. Suyuki also wanted to teach Kazuro a lesson and agreed with Fen to follow the guy and finish him off. Yui understands their feelings, but forbids them, since they have not yet found the one who opened the tomb. And if it is Kajuro, then even more so, they cannot kill him yet. Having decided to follow where Kazuro was going, the guys began to run after him without attracting attention. Yuya had her own interest in not killing the guy, because he knows something about her family. Kazuro ran out of the university grounds for now, not suspecting that he was being pursued. The guys behind tried to keep their distance and keep an eye on him. Kazuro ran in search of a strong opponent, running through crowds of weak zombies he rushed without stopping. A company of pursuers had already appeared behind. Fen begins to notice the monsters around and got a little tense. He was weak and lost two monsters when fighting with Kajuro, so it would be hard to get caught by the monsters. Suyuki also sees crowds of low-level dead, but the enemy's numerical advantage can take him by surprise. Kajuro runs in search and turns his head. Suddenly he notices that three exchange students are running after him. He hopes that they will fall behind run into a crowd of monsters, and lose him. Seeing in front of him the same vampire who had greeted him and Poe so cordially and wanted to kill him. Kajuro decided that this was a suitable monster to fight and ran towards it. He began to greet the monsters in an attempt to stop them and draw attention to himself. The vampire, accompanied by two of his servants, walked with a human leg on his shoulder. Overtaking the monsters, Kazuro stands in front of them and begins to ask the vampire to fight him. The monsters were surprised by such fearless impudence. Kazuro begins to invite the vampire to throw away the rotten leg and fight him, and also to taste fresh human flesh, taunting him. This greatly irritates the vampire. Such impudence and stupidity for an ordinary boy to jump in front of such a ferocious high-ranking monster. Upon closer inspection, the vampire senses a strong aura and becomes frightened. He remembers that there was once a warrior with the same strength as the guy. Kajuro, without hesitation, takes the vampire's hand without showing fear. The monster thinks that the boy has completely lost his sense of self-preservation, which is why he so brazenly pesters the monster with a request to fight. Kajuro puts the monster's hand on his neck and asks him to kill him. The monster begins to think that the boy is crazy. 
A normal person would not react so joyfully to the desire to die, or the power that the vampire felt was real, and it was better not to confront this guy. The vampire again feels a strong aura when he touches the guy and jumps away from him. Now he is sure that the guy just wants to test his strength and is mocking them. The vampire said that he had too important a meeting to stain his suit with the boy's blood and refused to fight. Kajuro, surprised, does not understand why the monster refuses. Is this possible? They usually attack without hesitation, but here he even put his neck in his hand, and he jumped away. Kazuro decided not to give up, and began to catch up with the monsters. Clutching the vampire's hand, the boy began to beg him to fight or just kill him. The vampire no longer knew how to get rid of the guy, and began to come up with excuses to get rid of the guy. The vampire said that the boy had a disgusting smell, and that's why he didn't want to eat him, and he didn't want to go to the wedding after eating stinking meat. It will also scare away the guests. Kazuro began to sniff himself and was surprised. Raising his head, he noticed that the vampire and his servants began to run away very quickly. Apparently, they wanted to get rid of the guy this way. Kazuro realized that the monster had tricked him and decided to catch up. The vampire was sure that he had broken away from the boy. Suddenly, Kazuro catches up and matches the monsters. He begins to ask the vampire to take him at least to someone who can kill the guy. The vampire can no longer withstand such persistent requests from the boy that he begins to beg him to leave them alone. Kajuro says that he will leave behind when they kill him. Suddenly the vampire stops and begins to beg on his knees for Kajuro to leave them alone. They can't kill him because he scares them. Fen and his sister, hiding behind a stone, see how the monsters begin to bow to Kazuro. Standing in the cemetery, Kazuro was very surprised by the reaction of the monsters that he did not know what to say. The surprise of the brother and sister was incredible. They had never seen anything like this, for a monster to worship a person without being absorbed. They began to suspect that Kazuro had greatly progressed in absorbing and controlling monsters, that he was able to control their minds and force them to do anything. Yui began to calm the guys down by saying that there was no need to push things. We were just keeping an eye on the guy, and, if necessary, using force. And with Kajuro, Yui will figure it out on her own. Meanwhile, Kajuro lifts the vampire from his lap and asks him to take him with him. Maybe there will be that monster that is capable of killing the boy. The vampire reluctantly agrees, but warns that he is not a welcome guest and may simply not be allowed in. Kajuro decides to try and follows along with the vampire and his servants. Fen, his sister, and Yui watch the guy and decide to follow them. As you get closer to your destination, more and more monsters begin to gather around. Some people stare at Kajuro and don't understand why he's here. The vampire accompanies Kazuro along the way. And around there are only more hungry glances wanting to taste the boy's flesh. One monster comes closer and asks the guy why he's walking so calmly with the monsters. Will he really be the main dish on the table? The monster joked. Kazuro, without being at a loss, invites the monster to try his hand and give his opinion about the main dish. The monster tensed a little and looked at the hand with a hungry gaze. Sensing a strong aura from the guy, he jumped away, just like the vampire. Realizing that something was wrong with the boy, he decided not to come close and go further away. Kajuro was again surprised that no one wanted to attack him. Seeing the bright light, Kazuro turns his attention to a beautifully decorated house located deep in the forest. Dozens of monsters converged on him. The vampire remembers that Kajuro was not alone when they fought, and asks where the plump bun that was with him when they first met. Kazuro replies to the vampire that he had some plans for Poe, to which the vampire says that he must be very tasty, and Kazuro retorts by saying that he sleeps in a trash can and smells disgusting. The vampire began to laugh loudly at Kazuro's words and pull him along. Suyuki and her brother looked at the joyful vampire and Kazuro, and were surprised at such a relationship. It all looked somehow suspicious, Suyuki said. There were dozens of monsters around, heading into one building, and Kazuro was walking there, accompanied by a high-level monster. Fen was confused and didn't understand what was happening. Yui suggested staying calm and sticking to the surveillance plan. We need to figure out how to get inside the building and find out where Kazuro was taken. 
Taking out three magic stones from their pockets with the ability to hide their identity, they planned to enter the building and reconnoiter the situation. After looking at the stones and then at each other, Fen agrees and accepts the stone first. The task that the head of the devourers entrusted to them was very important, and it was impossible to fail. Throwing a stone into himself, Fen began to feel changes in power and waited for the result. Suyuki also made up her mind and threw a stone into her mouth. Walking inside, Kazuro notices a huge line of monsters bringing donations and gifts to their mistress. Kazuro suggested to the vampire that he present it as a gift. Finally, the vampire's turn has come, and he offers a living guy as a gift, trying to behave naturally. Kazuro, on the contrary, shows absolute calm and joy. The recipient of the gifts asks his colleague to take Kajuro to the room where he will be handed over to the main one. Such a gift from a vampire is very valuable, said the butler. Pushing the boy into the gift room, they closed the door and continued to do their work. The room was ordinary and even decorated, reminiscent of a person's home. Kazuro begins to look around the room and hears everyone in the next room making noise and rejoicing. The guy begins to think that he is at some kind of monster drinking party. Kajuro starts kicking things around in anger. He needs to quickly test his monster swordsman and save Hanami. But here he doesn't understand what's going on. Red Eye senses a strong monster at the top and suggests to Kajuro that he should act faster and there was no time to wait until he was brought to the main one. Seeing the window, Kajuro decides to open the window and climb out through it. While the monsters are hanging out and drinking, they definitely won't notice him. While Kajuro was trying to quietly climb out of the window, two little maids were already watching him. They were surprised by the guy's action, because he was getting into a crowd of monsters, and he was also a human. Jumping out of the window, Kazuro begins to run upstairs, running through the crowd of monsters, trying not to attract attention. Two maids again stand behind him and watch what the boy is doing. The girls had never seen such zeal among the mistress's guests but they had never seen friends among people either. Approaching a large room at the top, Kajuro looked around and immediately decided to go inside. Opening the doors, Kajuro notices a girl sitting at the end of the room with her head covered. Her body looked like a goddess, and her dress was a little vulgar and short. Kajuro decided without losing his head and time to approach the monster. The girl felt the presence of someone strong with the help of her strength. The room was dark, as it was intended for a loving couple. The pleasant voice of the monster girl was a little embarrassing, as was her appearance. Kazuro, a little shyly, came closer to ask to fight him. Raising the veil, Kazuro is convinced of the beauty of the beautiful monster. She is a little embarrassed by such quick eagerness that she does not notice who lifted her veil. Kajuro begins to apologize for disturbing the beauty and ask to kill him, smiling with all his teeth with joy. Seeing that some impudent boy, and not even a monster, had lifted her veil, she became very angry. According to old traditions, the one who raised the veil should be the husband. Kazuro apparently did not know such a custom. Kazuro was glad that she was very angry, which means she could kill him and end the torment of mastering the sword monster. The bride monster calms down and makes a very strange decision, which leaves Kajuro shocked. She approaches the boy and hugs him, resting her body and embarrassed. She agrees to marry the guy. Kazuro was very embarrassed and surprised at the same time by such tenderness. Kazuro begins to get scared and frees himself from the bride's embrace. He was looking for death from a powerful monster, not life together in marriage. The bride monster behaves very seductively and wants to quickly start the newlywed's first wedding night. Kazuro, frightened that everything is not going as he would like, begins to run away trying to get to the exit. The bride uses her magic with the words that the boy will not leave the room until she receives what she has not experienced for so long. The doors closed with a loud slam. There was little chance of salvation. Kazuro felt fear from inexperience and the realization that the monster wanted to sleep with him. Pressed against the door out of fear, Kazuro began to beg to let him go or kill him, but he would not marry. He was still young and irresponsible in relationships, since they had never existed. Kajuro's tense face spoke of fear of what was to come. He wishes with all his heart that he would rather die than make love with a monster, even one so beautiful. Kazuro began to run from the beautiful bride around the table with various goodies. The bride behaved very playfully, 
and allowed slight weakness in front of the boy without using force. From such runs and the guy's cries for salvation, he only turned her on more and made her fall in love with him. The girl, smiling, was just waiting for the moment to grab him and drag him into bed. Red Eye watched what was happening. It was very funny to him that the boy was so unlucky and no one could kill him. He only ended up in surrendered situations, such as this one. Kajuro begins to ask his eyes for help. Red Eye says he will try and starts making jokes about the beauty in the wedding dress. The girl was already starting to get tired of catching up, and the jokes of the Red Eye were no longer necessary. Red Eye with a smile began to tell the boy that he was worrying so much in vain, but he would have something to tell his friends. And at the same time, the first time will be truly unforgettable, the Red Eye teased. Tired of pathetic attempts to stall for time, the girl decided to act more seriously and end this whole performance. Jumping up, she decided to grab the guy and throw him to the ground. Then he will not be able to resist the bride's strength and break free. Here, he will be doomed. Having thrown the boy face down, she pinned him to the floor and began to scold him for taking so long with foreplay. Let's do the main thing now, the bride said. Turning Kajuro onto his back, she began to take off his jacket in order to quickly lie down. Kajuro could not escape and was very embarrassed. He wanted to cry and screamed, begging for help. Meanwhile, the groom whom the bride had chosen was already approaching the bride's chambers. Guests stood around and congratulated him on the holiday. At the entrance to the bride's chambers, her maids stood and greeted the groom. Having opened the doors, the groom sees the bride lying with some guy on the floor and hugging. Kajuro notices a huge monster and begins to rejoice that now he can definitely be killed. To celebrate, Kazuro begins to push the bride away, accidentally grabbing her by the chest. He tells the groom that he came to the bride's chambers and decided to have fun with her, having first removed the veil, pointing his finger at his neck and hinting that he should quickly kill such an insolent person. Kajuro was already hoping that everything would work out and the plan for the death and testing of the swordsman would begin to come true. Seeing the groom's huge cleaver, Kazuro approached and touching the wooden handle, began to ask the groom to quickly deal with it. The monster begins to laugh heartily, holding his stomach. Kajuro doesn't understand what's going on and starts to get nervous. Along the way, taking off the groom's clothes and putting them on Kazuro, the monster with a huge cleaver laughed with happiness. Kazuro begins to realize that something is wrong here. The groom's clothes and the monster's laughter and no aggression towards him. Having thrown off the last headdress of the groom, the monster began to rejoice that now he was free and did not have to get married. Kazuro was amazed that even monsters are not always ready for a serious relationship. Kajuro looked at the leaving monster laughing with happiness and was shocked. The boy clearly did not expect this. Now he had no chance of salvation. He didn't understand why this happened. What could make monsters suddenly treat humans so well? No one even tried to bite him. The bride, sitting down on the bed, began to call the boy to her in a gentle voice and reassure him that everything was just beginning. Their whole life was still in front of them. Such words only made Kajuro more frightened. He stood near the exit and decided to try his last chance to get out and save himself. Using control magic, the bride directs her hair towards Kazuro in order to grab and tie the guy. The hair begins to envelop the guy's arms and legs, preventing him from moving. Just before leaving, she manages to grab Kajuro. Screaming at the closing door and begging for help, he reached out with his hand towards the exit. But the door was closing, and everything was already a foregone conclusion. Meanwhile, three guys who were chasing Kajuro enter the monster palace. Having used the stones to hide their power, they felt like they belonged among the monsters. They needed to find Kajuro and find out why he came here. Walking into the ceremony hall, Yui noticed that the vampire Kazuro had come with was sitting at the table. He sat with some monsters and drank. Yui decides that they should not attract attention and sit down next to the vampire and ask him where Kajuro was taken. Brother Fez and Sister Suyuki are a little nervous, but they agree with Yui and follow her. Noticing that there are three empty seats near the vampire, the guys begin to sit next to him. The vampire notices that three guys who don't look much like monsters sit down next to him. The vampire suspected something and asked where they were from. Fen, a little shyly, said that they came from another city, 
They had mutual acquaintances from the groom's side. The vampire thought that they were very hungry from the road. Having placed a piece of human intestines with gravy on Fen's plate, the vampire invited them to try such a delicacy, especially since they were probably hungry from the road and would not refuse to try such an exquisite treat. Fen immediately almost burned with disgust. He could barely restrain himself from vomiting. With this look, he would betray the boys and expose them to a crowd of enemies. The monsters sat and began to suspect something was wrong. Yui notices that everyone has started to look at them in surprise and suspects that they are not monsters, unless they prove otherwise. Yui puts her hand under the table and begins to pinch Fen so that he would pay attention to her faster. Covering her face with her hand, Yui begins to hint to Fen that he should not give them away and quickly start eating the intestine with a big smile, or his career in absorbers will be over. Realizing that he is at stake, Fen begins to throw intestines into his mouth with both hands and says how delicious it is. Gravy runs down his hands. From the gaze of the monsters, the girls also began to try treats from the human body and, trying not to show their disgust, ate with a smile. Suddenly a strong cry of joy is heard. Everyone turns their attention to the stairs from the second floor, along which a huge monster was descending, rejoicing and laughing. Everyone was surprised, since he was supposed to be the groom. Everyone started asking what happened. The monster begins to say that there was some little man who decided to take our beauty as his wife of his own free will. He saved me from death, said the huge monster. Everyone began to congratulate the huge monster with the cleaver and be happy for him. He did not become a victim of family fuss and remained a normal slacker. The guys, chewing on tasty pieces of human organs, felt bad enough. But when they heard that some guy would become a husband and this was a man, they immediately realized that we were talking about Kajuro. The vampire also realized that Kazuro would become the husband of the monster bride and was a little surprised. But he will get what he craved so much, the vampire said. Yui noticed that the vampire was thinking and asked him what happened to his companion along the way and why is everyone talking about a certain person, a vampire, realizing that they are not local and do not know their main history. He decided to tell them a story. Once upon a time, during the time of the great rebuilding, there lived a beauty. Her parents decided to marry her to a rich man, but at the wedding, someone poisoned him. Everyone thought that the bride did this, since she did not want to marry the first person she met, but only for love. Her family also thought so, and beat their daughter severely. They almost lost their heads for such an act of their child, and they had to give up all their property in order to survive. One day, when the girl was completely tired of the constant beatings of her parents, she dressed in a wedding dress and hanged herself. The parents were frightened by what they saw, but were not sorry. After death, she became a great and strong monster bride, and her only desire was to marry for love. But most monsters refused to marry, but that was no longer important. She was able to force anyone with her power. The problem was not the wedding itself, but the fact that every husband the day after the wedding looked as if he had dried up and was dying. No one knew how the bride sucked out their life energy. The vampire said that the boy who came with him was the bride's new husband. But don't worry, he will die anyway, and she will have to look for a new groom. Fen was terribly surprised that Kazuro decided to do this. If he wanted to experience new experiences in life, then for this, there was no need to stick to a monster. The vampire, smiling, notices that Fen is also attractive and invites him to play the role of groom for their bride next time. Fen was scared because he didn't want to die and tried to refrain from answering, a little afraid. Fen hoped that Kazuro himself would be able to cope with the monster bride and no one would have to die anymore. It's better to let him suffer. It will be revenge for the defeat in the arena and the loss of two monsters, Fen thought. The look of a slightly mentally unstable person and cold sweat enveloped Fen's body just from the thought that he would have to sleep with a monster. Suyuki, hearing that Kazuro will end, invites Yue to leave this place, realizing that he will not survive and they must return to the university. Yui, hearing the proposal, thinks that we'll probably do that, but only if Kajuro really dies here. Yui looks at Suyuki and replies that she agrees to go, but only Nada makes sure that Kajuro does not return. Unfortunately, they won't be able to check since the room is locked and there are too many monsters around. 
one could only hope. Waking up after a long night, Kazuro felt very tired and weak in his body. He didn't understand what happened and why everything hurt. With force, he stood up and noticed that without clothes, a beauty was nearby and hugged the guy, asking him not to get up as he looked very tired. She invited him to rest a little more while she prepared him breakfast. Kazuro, brushing aside the attention of the monster bride, tries to get out of bed and find his things. The girl, continuing to cast her magic on the guy, tries to put him to sleep and force him to stay nearby. Hinting to the boy that he was on top and the night turned out to be very cheerful, she wanted him to stay and they would continue to do family business together. Dressed and refusing any proposal from the bride, Kajuro tries to pack up and leave. His eyes showed apprehension and fatigue, but he felt no fear. He only wanted death. The bride said he was looking for death just so he could become a monster and live with her forever. Kazuro, through tears, replies that he will never live with a monster in his life, and he still needs to finish university and find a job before settling into family life. Having gotten dressed, Kazuro got ready to leave, simultaneously asking the bride not to stop him since he had to study. The girl lay in bed, continuing to inspire with her magic thoughts and desires for the boy so that he would return. Passing by the mirror, he notices that he has lost a lot of weight and is weak. Apparently, she is somehow able to fuel her strength by sucking the life juices out of others, Kazuro thought. Realizing this, Kazuro began to worry that he would not last long with her and would die. The girl, covering her sexy body with a silk blanket, approached the boy and said that he was the only one who lived until the morning. Kazuro was horrified by what he heard. Hugging the boy, she told him in his ear that he was the only one she loved and wanted to live with him all her life, simultaneously using the magic of winding. Kazuro, inhaling vapors of invisible power, unconsciously tries to resist the magic and get away. Showing her feelings and attitude towards the boy, she reaches out to kiss him. Kajuro tries with all his might to prevent her from doing this. Kajuro decides to try to find out through cunning about the monster that can kill him, so that they can always be together. The beauty replied that no one could kill the guy on her territory, but there was a place. In one forest, not far from them, there is a very strong monster, capable of doing what the guy wants. Having heard the information, Kazuro decided to clarify where exactly and where to go. The girl says that there is a forest in the west where he will find that monster. Having heard everything that interested the guy, he gathered the remnants of his strength and rushed out of the room along the way, almost knocking over the mistress's maid. The maid with a delivery and a cup of tea sees the boy running again and asking the lady if she should intervene. Embarrassed with happiness, the bride replies that there is no need to worry. The boy himself will want to return to her. She was confident in her words and looked very happy. Having run through the forest and finally arriving at his room, Kazuro, dying of fatigue, grabs the handle to open the door. Opening the door, behind which Khan with his cleaver swung in a jump to attack. Kajuro was surprised and too tired that he thought it was already the end. Having barely managed to stop the blade near Kazuro's neck, Han was surprised. Kajuro broke out in a cold sweat from fear and did not understand what was happening and why Han attacked him. Han said with a surprised face that he thought there was a monster behind the door. Kajuro's aura was somehow corrupted and looked like a monster. Having woken up from the noise, he draws attention to the very tired Kajuro and asks what happened and where he was all night. Kajuro replies that he was carrying out the director's instructions and cannot say. Feeling very tired that his eyes were getting dark and his head was spinning, Kazuro said that he felt bad and he needed to stay at home. Climbing out onto his bed, Kazuro tries not to fall and go to bed, saying at the same time that he won't go to class today, and asked him to tell the director that he was sick. Han began to suspect that Kajuro had gotten into something bad. His aura was corrupted by the monster's aura, and it was very strange. The power of the shadow monster made it possible to evaluate the enemy's aura, and Kajuro's was very weak. First lesson in class, everyone is having fun and comes to the classroom to take their seats before the lesson. Three exchange students, after a night of shadowing Kajuro, were very tired and sleepy, and when they went to class, they lay down on their desks and fell asleep. 
The weather was sunny outside and the warm rays warmed everyone in the class. Before class, Sarah enters the freshman's office in search of Kajuro, whom she has not seen since yesterday. She was a little worried because she knew that after his conversation with the director, he had run away somewhere. When he saw Sarah, he ran up to greet her and wish her a good day. He was a little nervous because he liked her very much, but he understood that his chances were slim. Sarah asked him if he had seen Kajuro, since yesterday he ran away somewhere after school. Poe said that Kajuro came back this morning very tired and exhausted. He had never seen him like this. The spy school children heard Poe's words that the boy had survived and were very surprised. Was Kajuro able to survive what that vampire told them? Fen said. Suyuki looked at her brother and couldn't believe it either. Apparently it is not as simple as it seems at first glance, said Suyuki. Meanwhile, Kazuro came to the infirmary, asking for some restorative medicine, yawning profusely and suffering from body aches. The doctor looked at the boy and advised him to devote more time to sleep and study, rather than an active and exhausting life while studying. Kazuro agreed with the doctor, but he still received the pills and with great desire began to immediately throw several into himself for a greater and faster effect. Yui and her brother and sister Lin walked past the doctor's office and saw a guy. He stood near the door and greedily ate the pills without leaving. Having thrown in the pills, Kazuro collected his thoughts and came to visit Hanami in the individual therapy room. He chewed on her behalf and wanted to tell her how much he missed her. Entering the room, Hanami was sitting on the bed and was already conscious. Kajura was very happy, but realizing that she was still weak, he did not dare to touch her. He calmly sat down on a chair next to her bed and began a conversation. Hanami said that she woke up this morning. Kajuro acted a little confused and was glad that Hanami's condition was gradually improving. He wanted to tell her so much, but didn't know where to start and was a little lost. Hanami began to reassure the boy with the words that she had received worse wounds in her life and always got out of trouble. She was very pleased that he was so worried about her and embarrassed her a little. Hanami began to ask the boy what happened during the period while she was unconscious. What happened in the tomb before he passed out? Did he find something important there? And what was that radiance of enormous proportions? Kajuro said that she asked so many questions that he didn't even know how to answer. When he woke up, he was told that Hanami was seriously injured and they didn't know if she could survive. Kazuro was very worried and wanted to go to Director Lin to pick up the antidote for the bite of his wolf monsters. Hanami felt embarrassed hearing that the boy was ready to do such an act for her sake. Hanami asked, what about that glow and why did he fall unconscious with a scared face? She was also very worried then and did not understand what was happening. Hoping to save the guy, she almost died herself. Kajuro began to reassure Hanami with the words that everything worked out thanks to Director Sota. He said that inside Kazuro, there was a sword monster with a very powerful force, which caused the state of fainting. Kazuro was not ready for such power, and his body did not obey. But the director was able to extract excess energy and return the boy to his condition. Hanami was very glad that everything worked out, and the condition of both of them began to improve. She was very pleased to spend time with Kazuro, and when he touched her hand, promising never to leave her and put her in danger again, she blushed deeply and realized that she had fallen in love, but she remembered that she needed to check on her mother. But Hanami's condition was still very weak. Kazuro suggested that he go and visit her mother himself, so that she would not worry about her daughter. Meanwhile, Yui and her brother and sister Lin were watching. They wanted to eavesdrop on the conversation and find out what happened in the tomb and who opened it. Trying not to attract attention, they stood neatly at the corners of the door and listened to Hanami's conversation with Kajuro. Yui began to notice that the girl on the bed looked very much like her, and her heart began to beat faster when she looked at her. She didn't understand how this was possible and why something incomprehensible was happening inside her. Suddenly the doll monster began to crawl out of the body and reach out to the girl on the bed, making eerie sounds of sadness. Yui was surprised by this and understood that she had to hide it quickly, otherwise they would hear them. Yui began to suspect that the girl on the bed might know something about her life, since even the monster recognized that girl. 
Yui was a little worried that maybe Kajuro was in the library then and was not saying rude things, but facts about the family. After talking with Hanami, Kazuro went to the hospital to visit Hanami's mother. The weather outside was warm and sunny. The hospital where Hanami's mother was hospitalized was not cheap, but they had no choice, because only there were specialists who could help Hanami's mother. Having walked along the corridors and ascended to the desired floor, Kazuro opens the doors and, a little shyly, greets Hanami's mother and introduces himself as her best friend, Kazuro. Mom was shocked and behaved very strangely. She did not expect that someone other than her daughter, a good person, would be able to come to her. Her eyes expressed concern and surprise, and the cold sweat on her face indicated fear of being in danger. She jumped out of bed in her pajamas and, unable to resist, began to kneel out of weakness and lean on her hand. Kajuro never expected this and hurried to help the woman and ask why she did it. Lifting the woman up, Kazuro sees that she has begun to cry and says that she is very glad that her daughter has a friend. She was afraid that because of her sick mother, her daughter would never be able to live a normal life and would always be alone. Kazuro was very surprised and said that they met under not very pleasant circumstances, but soon became very close and became friends. Mom asked the guy why her daughter didn't come, to which Kazuro replied that she didn't need to worry. Everything was fine with her daughter. She just had a bad fall and was now in the hospital. Mom was very scared and worried. She wanted to leave the hospital as quickly as possible and be next to her smart girl. Kazuro began to stop the woman, saying that if she disconnected from the machine and left the clinic, she might worsen her condition and would definitely not be able to meet her daughter. Trying not to scare Hanami's mother, Kazuro tried to reason with the woman not to do anything stupid and would wait until her daughter felt better and she herself came to visit her mother. Hanami sent him to prevent her mother from doing anything stupid. So don't scare your daughter, Kajuro said, reducing his ambition a little, realizing that he spoke too harshly. Kazuro begins to apologize and politely ask the woman not to do something for which she would be ashamed in front of her daughter. As they helped Hanami's mom to her bed and laid her down, they started talking about their parents. Mom asked Kajuro where his parents were to which Kazuro said that they are farmers and work on a farm far from the city. They used to live in the city, but wanted to move and change their activities. Kazuro stayed because he needed to go and make a career for himself. Kazuro recalled that as a child, she often walked with her mother outside the city, but much of her memory had already been forgotten, even though it was not so long ago. And my father was often not at home and returned late because of work. That's why they wanted to move to be together. The woman listened to the boy and said that his parents were very wise if they decided to make such changes and left this damned city. There are too many people here who can destroy everything that is so dear to you. Kajuro listened and remembered Hanami's story, how a man ruined their lives and brought their mother to such a state. Adjusting the blanket and making the woman more comfortable, he remembered that he would never forget or forgive the act of that man and would take revenge for Hanami and her mother. Hanami's mother looked at Kajuro and saw in him the hope that her daughter's life would be much better and was glad that there was a chance to one day see a happy daughter before her death. Kazuro sat opposite and, feeling the tense situation, decided to somehow influence the conversation in a positive direction. Starting to take out the fruit from the bag that he brought to Hanami's mother, he began to peel the apple and tell funny stories from their university life. Trying to cheer up Hanami's mother, Kajuro said that he lives with a boy who slept in a trash can all night and smelled terribly. Smiling and laughing, Kazuro holds out his hand holding an apple to treat the Mumu and thank her for the time spent with her and for the beautiful daughter who became his best friend. She looked at him, and it seemed to her that he was familiar to her. But without saying anything, she simply took the apple and thanked the boy for the sincere and cheerful conversation. She had surprise and suspicion on her face, but trying to hide her guesses. She decided to turn away. Kazuro managed to notice a strange expression on his face and wanted to ask if something was wrong or if he should bring something, to which the woman said that there was nothing wrong and thanked the guy again. She looked thoughtful and tried to remember where she knew the boy's face from. Having decided to rest, 
She asked the boy to leave since she needed to rest, and she was very tired. Turning to the side of the window, she began to cover herself with a blanket and pretend that she wanted to sleep. Kajuro was a little surprised, but realizing that it was not easy for her now, he agreed to leave. Having said goodbye and wished her a good day and get well soon, Kazuro, realizing that she was hiding something and knew, decided to leave the room. Approaching the door, the thought did not leave him that she might know something that would help him learn more about the absorbers and their main thing. Meanwhile, Yui stood at the hospital reception and wrote a message about where she was and what she had learned. Having followed Kajuro and learned that he had come to visit some woman, Kento Aragak, the head of the Absorbers, having heard which hospital Kazuro had come to, immediately guessed who he was coming to. He was filled with abnormal joy that now he could interrogate his ex-wife and find out something interesting about the boy and how he knew her. Having written to her daughter that she would be there soon, Yui stood in the hall and waited. Suddenly she notices Kajuro, who left the ward and went to the elevator to go down and leave the hospital. Kazuro stood near the elevator and waited for the doors to open. He decided to call his father, since he would soon arrive by train from the village where they work as farmers and grow corn and nuts. Having reached him, Kazuro asked his father when the train would arrive to meet him and left the hospital. Kento arrived shortly after the boy left. He forcefully opened the doors without hesitation and immediately began asking his ex-wife questions about the boy and why he came here. He was very aggressive and strict. One look scared everyone he interrogated. Seeing Kento, the woman got very scared and started screaming at him to leave her alone. Her eyes began to water from worry, and knowing what this man was capable of, she began to scream for help. He grabbed her by the pajamas, not afraid of anything, and began to threaten her that if she didn't tell anything, then she would definitely not survive. He looked at the frightened woman and did not feel a drop of pity. He only wanted to find out information that would help figure out who Kajuro was and who his parents were. Hanami's mother knew that she would not survive and that he would get her anyway. And without an ounce of respect, she tried in every possible way to remain silent and not say anything to Kento. After a lot of insults and disrespect, the woman spat in the face of the head of the absorbers and said that she would never tell him anything. It was unexpected for Kento that such a weak and stupid woman would do such a thing. She looked proudly and a little fearfully at the angry Kento, feeling a little pleasure. Her weak body was unable to fight back, so she did this. Kento was very proud, and no one dared to do this to him. His impudence and arrogance would not leave it so easily. Without keeping her waiting long, he threw the woman onto the floor, smiling with all his might and pointing her to her place. She hit the floor. It hurt her a lot, but she couldn't fight back. Realizing that now he would only mock her and continue to beat her, she tried to at least tuck her legs and arms in order to group herself and prevent her from damaging her internal organs while screaming for help. Receiving kicks in the chest area, she experienced severe pain, but did not give up and did not say anything to Kento about the boy. She pretended that she didn't understand what he was talking about, if he so wanted to harm his ex again, then why not kill him right away and not mock him like the last scum, Hanami's mom said. He took pleasure in beating women. He felt sincere pleasure when he beat his ex and threatened that he would kill her if she did not tell why Kazuro came here. A look full of anger wanted to achieve what he wanted by any means possible, and nothing would stand in his way. Experiencing severe pain all over her body and trying to hold on, she refused to tell him anything. For all the pain he caused her and her daughter, he should be in prison, not in power. People like him only destroy people and don't care about anyone except themselves, the woman said. Leaning closer to her, the head of the absorbers grabbed her by the hair behind her head and began to lift the already badly beaten woman. He did not feel any regret for his actions and only wanted to find out what he needed to know. He continued to demand that she tell him everything she knew about the guy and screamed while beating her. Behind him, his daughter Yui entered the room and saw her father beating the unfortunate woman. She was shocked and did not understand what was happening. Kento, hearing his daughter's voice, immediately changed his face and was surprised why she came here and didn't stay downstairs. He didn't know what to say or how to explain the situation. 
Hanami stood at the entrance without moving, trying to digest everything she saw. Yui began to ask her father why he was beating an unfamiliar woman, and how he even dared to do such a thing. She is very disappointed in her father's behavior because she has never seen him like this. He was always kind and friendly in front of her. The father began to make excuses, saying that she was a criminal covering up for her accomplices. She doesn't want to open them and so she has to use force. Bandits are very dangerous and have harmed many people and they must be stopped. Standing up and walking towards his daughter, he said that it was true and began to apologize for his actions to her. Yui was no longer sure that her father was telling the truth. She remembers him always being kind, but here it is, which completely changes everything she thought about him. The woman behind introduces herself to Yui as her ex-wife, who was robbed and beaten by her father and now has to live in a hospital and eat only pills. This man is very cruel and two-faced. They are kept in power, the woman said, sighing in pain. The head of Kentu immediately began shouting at her to shut her mouth and not lie. Everything that this woman said was not true, and he never knew her, continuing to lie to his daughter. Kento was already on the verge of failure and saw distrust in his daughter's eyes. Yui, hearing the woman's words, began to cry, realizing that this was most likely true, and began to run away in tears and complete disappointment in her father. Kento wanted to catch up with his daughter, but she was against it and did not want to see him. The head was very disappointed that his daughter saw him like this, but it was already impossible to fix it. After many blows and herbs, the woman sat on the floor holding her stomach and leaning on the bed, laughing with Kento that he was so two-faced and hid all his sins from his daughter. Kento stood and looked at his daughter running away down the corridor and was very disappointed, but the matter had to be completed. Meanwhile, Kajuro had already approached the station and was expecting his father to appear. His train arrived at the station two minutes ago, and his father should already be near the exit. Kazuro notices a strangely dressed man with a yoke, and looking closer, sees his father in him. Starting to wave his hand to attract attention, Kajuro welcomes his father to his arrival. The father notices his son, and rejoicingly approaches him, holding the yoke on his shoulders. The father was very happy to finally see his son after a long break. He arrived with two buckets of nuts and words of congratulations on entering the university and starting a new adult life. Kajuro was pleased, but he was a little surprised to see so many nuts, but thanked his father. The father, wiping the sweat from his face, began to show pride in Kazuro, saying that he was the only one in the family who entered the University of Absorbers and would become the most glorious and powerful of them. Kajuro, smiling, begins to ask why he decided to come and why only one. The father replies that he just wanted to check on his son, and the mother stayed on the farm with her daughter, who is still sick, but is slowly getting better. Kazuro is glad that everything is fine with them and suggests they go for a walk. Taking a bucket of nuts, Kazuro and his father told each other interesting stories that happened in their lives, smiled, and had fun. Dad looked like he was just from the field, but it made his body look more toned, and his muscles were visible. Leaving the station, the father begins to notice how many interesting things have appeared in the city, how polite and kind everyone is. In the few years he was out of town, so much had changed. Kazuro said that people really became kinder, but not everywhere. Paying attention to the large and lovely beauties around, the father became a little embarrassed. Kajuro looked at him and was a little surprised and thought that even his father looks at attractive girls. Then maybe this is normal. Deciding to remind my father that my mother was clearly more beautiful than the girl who passed by, my father became embarrassed and agreed with Kazuro. Having told your son that you can watch, the main thing is that your beloved does not find out about it. Otherwise, you will be in trouble. Having reached the nearest cafe, Kazuro suggested stopping and having a snack and at the same time learning more about their life in the village. The father agreed because he was already tired and wanted to drink a glass of water. Walking inside, they were greeted by a waiter wiping the table. He suggested that they choose a place to land, since it was only daytime outside, and there weren't many people there. The father immediately asked to bring a glass of water to their table, and the waiter agreed. Having sat down at the table, my father immediately began to drink a glass of water and enjoyed every sip, 
since it was quite hot outside. The waiter came up to them to take their order and politely began asking what the guys wanted to try. Behind the father, the door was slightly open, from behind which a beggar came out and asked the waiter for some food. He entered the establishment with his bowl and asked for at least some crumbs of food, otherwise he would not survive. I haven't eaten anything for a very long time. A pitiful and skinny face spoke of the poor condition of the greenhouse. The waiter did not listen to the guy and asked him to leave and not interfere. He now has too few people to give alms and treat the homeless man. Kazuro notices that the boy has no hands and decides to take a closer look. He realizes that this is his classmate, who helped escape from the absorbers on the night the tomb was opened, and immediately rises to greet his comrade. He had not seen them for a long time and did not know what happened to them after the discovery. A classmate, hearing Kazuro's voice, raises his head and sees him. He was very glad to find out that the boy survived, but his condition was now much worse. Kazuro immediately called him to the table and asked the waiter to bring hot food to his friend. The boy attacked the food and ate greedily, smacking both cheeks. He had not eaten for so long that he was afraid to die because no one wanted to help him. The father watched Kajuro feed the homeless man and smilingly asked where they met. While the boys were eating, the father looked at the boys and was glad that Kajuro grew up to be kind and generous in helping others. Did you really meet in a trash bin? The father asked. Kajuro looked at his father in bewilderment, feeling ashamed in front of his classmate and said that this was his classmate. They studied at school together. After the exam, he lost his arm and wanted to commit suicide but my friend Hanami saved him by taking him in. And in general, he helped save my life when they dragged me from the tomb, Kazuro said. The father felt awkward and apologized to the boy without an arm, showing his regret and thanking him for saving his son. Kazuro watched as his comrade greedily ate the dish, that he was afraid for the others, and thought that he should ask for the others where they were and what had happened when he passed out. Having filled his belly with delicious food, the classmate thanked Kajuro. Afterwards, Kazuro asked him what happened to the rest of the guys and where did they all go. The boy, wiping his mouth, asks who this man is next to him, and is it possible to discuss this in front of him? Kajuro apologizes for not introducing his father earlier and introduces them. He was worried about the others, that even such an ordinary incident was forgotten in his head. A classmate greeted Kazuro's father, and realizing that there was nothing to hide, decided to reveal what they had seen. His face changed from smiling to frowning. He began to say that when they decided to distract the guards so that Hanami would drag away the unconscious Kazuro, there were too many opponents, and a terrible thing happened. Just before the exit, near the point of their gathering, the jock was attacked and captured. Since the absorbers grabbed him, they would definitely interrogate him. We were nearby, but we couldn't do anything because it was scary. Such a guy will last a long time and will not reveal all the secrets of our team. But everyone has a chapel. The head of the Absorbers is very cruel and is capable of extracting information from anyone. So we need to save the guy if possible. Kazuro, looking completely confident and calm, agrees with the words of his classmate to pull the jock out to freedom. But to do this, he needs to find out where he is being held and how to get there. The father looked at his son and was surprised that the once very modest and cowardly man suddenly became so fearless. Kazuro was thinking out loud and thinking about how to rescue his comrade. He suggested talking with Hanami and getting them all together for further actions. The father listened to his son talk about saving his comrade and was a little surprised, realizing that this was very dangerous, but he did not try to dissuade him. Kazuro asks his father to go back to the village since it is very dangerous for them here. Given that the Absorbers are interested in Kazuro, his father agreed to go back. But this was not true, just like the fact that he is a farmer. After having lunch together and having a heartfelt conversation with their father, they said goodbye and went home. Kazuro was very happy to see his father, but circumstances force him to save his comrade. The father was also glad to see his son, and realizing how he had matured and become more independent and decisive in action, was proud of him. Kazuro and his classmate walked towards the dorm carrying heavy buckets of nuts. The father, in turn, realizing how dangerous it is to get involved with the Absorber Bureau, 
decides to help and save the prisoner without putting his son in danger. Lowering his head and covering it with his hat, Kazuro's father walked to the main entrance of the absorber's office. He was very serious and ready to put an end to them, since they did not give a quiet life to his family. What he was doing was quite dangerous and secret. Approaching the entrance, there were two guards standing in front of him who were stern and did not let anyone through. They saw a man dressed as a farmer approaching them and tried to stop him by saying that there was no way through. The boy's father, still not raising his head, approaches and prepares to hurt them very much. Hearing the banal ways of the guards to stop the man, the father smiled, doubting their competence and raised his head and opened his face, lifting his hat, taking out the magic box from his pocket. The father, without saying anything, activates a powerful artifact and begins to pull monsters out of the absorbers. Unfortunately for the enemy, such an artifact can kill, depriving the bearer of the monster, feeling intense pain from the loss of the monster's soul. The guards fall to the ground unconscious. The father, without raising his head, walks by holding an artifact in his hand, which is a very dangerous weapon against any absorber. The guards fell to the ground, their bodies did not move. The father passed, and his robe fluttered in the wind. He knew that there were many cameras around, and it was better not to take off his hat so as not to harm his family. Under the setting sun, the father climbed the stairs and prepared to enter the station to find Comrade Kazuro and save him from the hands of the damned Bureau of Absorbers. Despite their appearance, the Absorbers had no idea that the most wanted man had come to them. Entering the corridor, where there were many Absorbers and they were all fussing, as there were many robots to capture various criminals. One of the Absorbers notices a suspicious man entering without security escort. Holding a folder with documents, she decides to approach and ask the man how he got here. Asking questions to the man, the father did not react in any way and simply stood with his head down. There was noise and commotion all around. Everyone was going about their business. But when they heard one of the employees begin to raise her voice at some man who entered their office, they began to pay attention. The girl notices that the suspicious person who came in had a very strange box in his hand. At first, she did not attach any importance to this. But the feeling that something was wrong here did not leave her. Memories of what it is began to spin in my head. Suddenly, a clear explanation comes to her mind that in front of her is a man with an artifact capable of sucking out the souls of monsters and killing a person. She became very frightened and began shouting to her colleagues to start fighting immediately. Everyone began to summon their monsters to attack the enemy. But not yet realizing how bad things were for them, they behaved a little nervously, but confidently. Unfortunately, summoning takes some time, and at this moment, the absorber is very vulnerable. Raising his head, realizing that the enemy is now vulnerable and clearly weaker than him, he uses the absorption artifact. His gaze was very calm and cool. There was not a moment of hesitation to hurt anyone. Experiencing terrible pain from the monster's soul being pulled out, the entire department was exposed to the attack of a strong hunter, and they had no chance. The artifact could affect large groups of people and was able to activate very quickly. The merciless expression on his face, without feeling pity, watched as the lifeless bodies fell to the floor. No one managed to resist the power of the artifact and survive. Without a shadow of a doubt, the father headed through the crowd of lying corpses in search of his imprisoned comrade Kazuro. Walking along the corridor past tables and offices, entering each one to find the guy. At the same time, in the interrogation room, two police officers were interrogating a muscled guy with no leg, trying to find out where his henchmen were and what they were doing at the scene. Aggressive cops threatened and beat him every time the guy refused to answer. Kachek sat shackled in a chair. His body was covered in bruises and abrasions. He tried to hold on and not tell anything to the mongrels of the head of the absorbers. Every time he was asked about the tomb, he answered with caustic jokes and only teased the enemy. These jokes only aggravated an already difficult situation. One of the cops decides to use a more brutal method of torture and invites the guy without a leg to tell everything. Otherwise, he will feel something unpleasant. Having refused once again, the cop presses the button 
and the jock experiences strong electric shocks. He is shaking, and the intense pain makes him scream. A loud cry of pain begins to be heard along the corridors, and this helps to find him faster. The father, hearing the screams, immediately went to the interrogation room and without hesitation kicked down the door. In the room, two policemen were very surprised and did not understand how some guy got here. The cops were very scared, and they began to suspect that the man was there for a reason. They did not understand why the alarm did not go off if the station had been infiltrated and were thinking of attacking the man in the hat with their monsters. Entering the interrogation room, Father Kazuro greeted those present and was glad to see that the jock was still alive. His expression intimidated the enemy whenever they saw him. One of the cops recognizes the man who knocked down the door and tells his comrade that this is the fugitive from the report, for whom several squads have already been sent. All of them turned out to be dead. They became very tense and began to try to roll up their sleeve to summon the monster to fight. A quick movement of the hand with a sharp blade cuts through the air, delivering fatal blows without giving the enemy a chance to understand what happened. Frozen in one position, the cops were already beheaded. The fatal blows were inflicted by the professional blows of a very experienced and skilled warrior. Fear and horror froze on the faces of the police. Approaching the muscle man, Kazuro's father began to untie and remove the shackles from the guy's arms and legs in order to free him and take him out of the station and take him to a safe zone. The jock was surprised and a little scared that he was saved by an unknown person with such incredible fighting abilities. Such a person clearly has balls of iron if he entered the station and freed me, the jock thought. Having freed the boy, the jock began to thank the man for saving him and asking how he got here and who sent him. To which Father Kazuro replied that he was just passing by and heard terrible cries of pain and wanted to help. The father did not want to give himself away that he helped Kajuro, otherwise he would quickly be discovered. The father gave the jock a card to go to a secret place and stay there until everything calmed down. With trembling hands, Kachek takes the card and promises to do whatever the man tells him. Walking along the corridor back to the exit, the jock was frightened, realizing that the man who saved him was so strong that he could single-handedly cope with an entire area of absorbers. Kashik looked at the secret savior and was amazed at such a level of composure and calmness in front of the enemy without receiving any damage. It was clearly no coincidence that such a warrior passed by and wanted to save him. Someone definitely sent it, the jock thought. Meanwhile, Kajuro finally made it home with two buckets of nuts. He opened the doors and greeted Poe, saying that he had spent the day with his father and received many souvenirs from the farm. Kajuro sees himself watching the news in surprise and reacts nervously. The news said that some man in a hat came to the absorber site and mercilessly killed everyone. Anyone who can provide information about the attacker will be generously rewarded by the head of the absorber bureau. Kazuro noticed that the attacker looked very much like his father, but he couldn't believe it. He is an ordinary farmer who was never rude or shouted at anyone. He was kind and a little stupid in his habits. After all, he did not have a higher education. Evening came. Kazuro again moved into the forest to find a monster that would help tame the swordsmen in battle. Fen, Yui, and Suyuki again began to follow and chase him into the dense, misty forest. Running into the middle of the forest, Kajuro notices a huge cave made by people. There were obelisks with inscriptions around. Kajuro suspected that a strong monster was located in the cave. Approaching Kazuro, he tries to catch his breath and prepare for battle. In front of the entrance, behind the obelisk, a little boy appears, watching Kajuro and not understanding what he forgot here. Kazuro notices the little monster and grabs him by the t-shirt and starts asking about the strongest monster that lives in this forest. If the boy tells where he is, then Kajuro will not kill him. The boy was scared and immediately agreed, pointing to the cave. Kazuro, not feeling sorry for the little monster, throws him to the floor and kicks him into the cave with the words, Show your monster. The boy was weak and in great pain, but if he took Kazuro to a strong monster, he would be spared and not killed. Having flown several meters along the ground from the impact, the boy screamed, putting his hands out in front. 
A thick layer of dust rose behind him from sliding on the ground. The cave was abandoned long ago and covered with cobwebs. At the end of the corridor, there was a large room where two monsters sat and ate a corpse. They chomped loudly and did not hear the boy's screams. Severe hunger forced him to mercilessly kill a weak monster in order to restore his strength at the expense of the flesh of another monster. The boy got up and started running down the corridor towards the monsters and screaming about the guy who had come to fight them, a real living person. One of the monsters heard the boy's words, was distracted from eating his hand and raised his head, becoming interested. Another monster was eating the body and did not pay attention to the noise. The monster with long hair, who ate the hand, is surprised at such a strange act of an ordinary person and invites his lizard-shaped monster to go and have fun by killing the impudent boy who dared to distract them from the meal. Realizing that he had not eaten fresh human flesh for a long time, he was pleased with this opportunity, but he did not want to figure it out himself, since he was rather weak, and sending his servant was a very good idea. The lizard monster, rising from its knees after eating the corpse, agrees to go and kill the boy and taste fresh human flesh. Although the lizard was a servant, he was also a very strong monster, capable of fighting many absorbers. The boy was on his knees and said that the boy was standing in front of the entrance and asking the strongest monster to come out and give him a fight. The long-haired monster, holding a piece of his hand and enjoying the taste of flesh, tells his servant to go and finish this circus and then come back with the body of a fresh person will give even the little one some. The lizard's ability was quite strong, since its speed could be incredible and invisible to the eye. While the master monster was eating the corpse, he was already imagining the taste of human flesh and was waiting for his servant to deal with the boy. Kajuro stood at the entrance and waited for a strong monster to come out to fight him. He hoped that the sword monster could come out long enough for Kajuro to tame the ghost. The silhouette of a monster had already begun to appear from the cave, approaching him at high speed. Kajuro, seeing the monster's aura, was a little upset, as he expected a much stronger opponent and relaxed. He began to tell the monster to go back to the cave and call the strongest monster. The monster was outraged by the impudence and reckless self-confidence that the monster immediately wanted to teach the boy a lesson and kill him in the most cruel way. Using its ability for incredible speed, the monster prepared to attack. Having gained maximum speed and used its tail to strike, the monster strained all its power into its legs and accelerating begins to spin for the strike. Kajuro doesn't even have time to understand something. A strong blow throws the boy a long distance. Kazuro feels severe pain in his abdomen. The internal organs were clearly damaged after such a blow, but it was not fatal. From a strong blow, Kazuro flies off and hits a tree. A thick cloud of dust rose all around that even the birds flew away from the noise. The lizard monster was pleased and thought that the boy certainly would not have survived such a blow. Having received numerous injuries to internal organs and broken ribs, Kazuro was coughing up blood and could barely stand on his feet. The left arm was broken, but the monster swordsman did not show up. Kazuro understood that this was not enough, and it was necessary to bring the lizard so that it would finish off Kazuro. Barely breathing and holding back from the pain, Kazuro began to provoke the lizard by the fact that he had very weak blows just like his sister, raising his right hand and showing his middle finger. The lizard monster approached the guy slowly, without fear and completely confident in his victory. With a quick movement, the lizard strikes the guy in the chest. Kajuro didn't even notice how the monster had already hit him. From deep shock, the boy did not feel pain in the first second of the blow. The lizard monster with its blow slammed Kajuro into a tree trunk, using a very strong and fast blow. The guy felt his body being nailed to a tree at great speed, and severe pain ran through his body. The monster's hand pierced the guy's chest and tore everything inside. Kajuro immediately began to choke from the amount of blood entering his mouth. His eyes began to roll back. This was definitely a fatal blow. Three classmates spying on Kazuro see how the boy was severely injured and stood, motionless, pressed against a tree trunk. The monster, without removing his hand, said that the guy had come here in vain, unless, of course, he wanted to commit suicide. The guys were shocked by what they saw and scared. 
They didn't understand why the guy gave in to the monster so easily without fighting it with his monster abilities. Yui was shocked and could not believe that someone who interested her father so much could die so easily. Suddenly, Kazuro's heart begins to glow blue and beat. The guy begins to come to life and the mana of the sword monster begins to leave his body, restoring the guy. A strong cry of pain excited the guys watching the guy being beaten. The lizard monster was surprised that the boy did not die with a hole in his chest and began to get nervous. The swordsman's monster captured the guy's body, turning his arms into bone. The guy's head was lowered and did not yet understand what was happening. Placing his bone hand on the hand of the lizard monster, Kazuro sighed and said, Thank you. Now it's my turn. Emitting a strong glow of power, his eyes began to glow and look very scary. The lizard monster does not suspect that the guy owns a very dangerous monster, and he needed death to release his power. A magic ghost sword appears from the boy's hand, with which Kazuro, without any problems, cuts the lizard monster in half, exuding enormous power and glow. The lizard was shocked that the guy was able to defeat him and screamed in pain with his last breath. Fen and Suyuki, seeing how Kajuro was resurrected and was able to kill the monster with one blow, were very scared that someone could have such enormous power. Yui looked, not understanding how this was possible, and remained silent. The brother and sister were very frightened and began to worry that if he took them away, he would kill them without any doubt, remembering everything that they had done to him and wanted to do. Fen began to reassure his sister with the words that they should be quieter and not give away their position, then nothing would threaten them. Yui began to suspect that Kajuro was the one who opened the tomb, but what he received inside the crypt is a very powerful monster, and apparently to activate such power, one must die. Yue thought that now she had to convey her thoughts to her father, but remembering his actions in the hospital, she didn't really want to talk to him yet. Suddenly she notices that Kajuro's body stops glowing and restores his arms and body. Apparently this ability does not last long and is a weak point, the girl thought. Kazuro, seeing that his body was changing, but he was still unable to talk and conclude a contract with the ghost swordsman, began to worry and try to come up with something. The strength gradually left him, and his bony arms grew in muscle. Trying to call the ghost back, Kajuro held his hand tensely and begged the monster to enter into a contract with him. His desire to help his friends and use power for good was felt by the monster swordsman and decided to give the guy a chance. Signs of magical power began to appear from the hand, and Kajuro began to sense a powerful force. A voice sounded in my head that the swordsman agreed to help the guy with his blade in the fight against the enemy. From Kazuro's hand, which is released along with the sword and envelops it, giving the owner unlimited power of the sword. Kajuro is glad that he was able to conclude a contract with the swordsman much faster than Director Sota told him. This meant that the boy was capable of incredible things. Kajuro decides to test his strength under controlled consciousness and strikes a nearby boulder. The force was so great that the stone shattered into pieces. Remaining full of strength, Kazuro understands that sword attacks do not take away the absorber's magical power, but are fueled only by the abilities of the sword monster. Kazuro understands that these are endless attacks without the expenditure of strength and magic, which means you can be sure that there will be enough mana for the rest of the monsters when fighting against several opponents. The sword mark now appeared on the hand and was active for use. Realizing his capabilities, Kazuro wondered what he should do now. Red Eye decided to congratulate the guy on the successful mastery of such a ghost and hear words of praise, since it was thanks to him that the guy succeeded in everything in the crypt. The monster with the chainsaw, sensing the powerful power of the new monster in Kazuro's body, crawled out and began to be indignant that he was now not the strongest and wanted to fight to determine his strength. Kazuro, hearing the indignation, tried to calm his monsters and promised to appease them with goodies and not worry about who is stronger. The main thing is that they will now fight together. While Kajuro was talking to his monsters trying to calm them down, he felt a powerful aura coming from the cave. The guy began to slowly turn his head towards the monster and was preparing for battle. A barely walking monster emerges from the cave, leaning on a cane. 
His body exuded a strong aura and scared Kajuro a little. He had never killed such a strong opponent before. The monster looked like a very angry grandmother with glowing eyes. The monster looked very old, and its enormous strength was the only thing that bothered Kazuro. He didn't know what the monster was capable of, and not wanting to die anymore, he decided not to let the monster get close. Meanwhile, at the monster bride's estate, the beauty stood in front of the mirror and applied makeup to her face. Having painted her lips with poisonous red lipstick, she used the paper to remove the excess layer of lipstick. While she was putting on makeup, the maid knocked on the door and entering began to tell her that the beloved lady of the bride was in danger. He went into the old forest and fights a long-haired monster. The bride, hearing that Kazuro had taken such a step, began to change her face with excitement. She began to scream in anger at Kajuro and worry about her lover. The maid added that she was told that Kajuro was able to kill the assistant of the long-haired monster and is now fighting with him himself. Hearing that Kajuro was able to kill the strong servant of the long-haired monster, she was surprised and glad that her fiancé was quite capable of killing such a monster. But worried about the guy's life, she decides to send help to her lover. The bride orders her best warriors to be gathered and sent to help Kazuro. The maid, lowering her head, promises to convey the order to the soldiers and thanks the bride for the right decision. The maid, leaving the estate, took a whistle from her pocket. Taking a deep breath and drawing in full lungs of air, she began to whistle, calling for the ladies' warriors. The sounds and stomping of monsters began to be heard on the street. Rising from the ground and listening to where the sound was coming from, the monsters moved towards their mistress's estate to serve her and give their souls for the happiness of the beautiful bride. The monsters approached the house and waited for their mistress. At the noise of his warriors, the monster bride came down the stairs towards them and began to tell them the reason why they were called. Telling that her husband was attacked by monsters and he needs help, she sends her army into the depths of the dark forest. Meanwhile, three schoolchildren who were spying on Kajuro watched as some strong monster and his servants approached him. They thought that now Kajuro definitely had no chance to survive and win. Even Yui felt the strength of that long-haired monster's aura and knew that he was strong. Kazuro realized that in front of him was a very strong monster with his servants, and it was very dangerous to fight with them. There were too many of them, and Kazuro decided to try to negotiate and not continue the fight. Kajuro began to apologize to the long-haired monster for the death of his servant and ask him to let him go. The long-haired monster was very angry with Kajuro for killing his strongest monster, and for this, he would not let him go anywhere. Death is the only thing that awaits Kazuro. The enraged monster begins to order his monsters to attack the guy and tear him into small pieces. Kazuro, hearing that no one would let him go and that he had little chance against such a crowd, began to gradually retreat back. The long-haired monster took out his dagger and pointed it at Kajuro, ordering his monsters to attack. The monsters rushed to attack, and one of the monsters, using its sharp claws, extended its hand and wanted to cut the boy. The rest of the monsters were also ready to grab Kajuro's body and tear it apart, bent down on Kajuro and was ready to cut the guy. But an unexpected blow from the shadows cuts off the monster's head and kills him. The rest of the monsters did not understand what happened and stopped. Suddenly, a monster appears in front of Kajuro and saves him from the attack. Kajuro is happy that he was saved and does not understand why the monster helped him. He was big and strong with a huge cleaver with which he cut off the monster's head. Kajuro recognizes this cleaver and understands that this is the monster who was supposed to marry the monster's bride, and he replaced him and saved him from family life. Kajuro felt awkward and asked how he knew he was in trouble and where he was. A monster with a cleaver points his finger at a crowd of monsters led by a monster bride. She gathered her best warriors to save you. Kajuro was surprised that the one he doesn't reciprocate was trying so hard and trying to save him. Having led her army to the center of the old forest, with a loud cry, she directed her monsters to kill the enemy and bring the long-haired monster to her. She was very serious, and the desire to save her lover was very great. Monsters on both sides rushed to the attack, killing each other and fighting for their leader. They were brave and fearless in using their abilities. 
The entire forest was covered in loud screams and the noise of battle. In battle, the monsters showed all their abilities trying to defeat their leader and survive. One of the monsters had the power to kill an enemy with one blow. Other monsters were capable of vomiting acid and disintegrating their opponents. Each side had its own strong warriors, but no one could compare in strength with the leaders of the long-haired monster and the monster bride. Kazuro looked at the big battle and was amazed at the number of monsters who fought using their skills and head, rather than running away mindlessly. Such a sight drew you in and made you not look away. In the heat of battle, the bride sees Kajuro standing to the side and runs up to hug him and make sure that he is safe and healthy. She was glad that he was as beautiful and healthy as when they first met. She hugged the guy to her and looked with a loving gaze, a little embarrassed and showing it through the redness on her cheeks. Kazuro looked at her and saw a beautiful girl with attractive shapes and a gentle voice, but everything was spoiled by the fact that she was a monster. While Kajuro was hugging his bride, the long-haired monster fought off the attacks of the bride's warriors. He used strong magical skills and scattered the warriors in all directions. The bride notices that the long-haired monster wants to attack them and covers her groom behind him. She prepares to fight that monster and asks Kajuro not to interfere in the fight. She loves Kajuro too much to risk him. Kazuro, hearing such words, begins to wonder whether it is possible to live together with a monster. The monster bride, using her magic, decides to attack the long-haired monster with sharp poisonous darts. Using her magic and abilities that are on par with her opponent, she attacks him. The darts fly into the crowd of monsters and hit almost everyone who was there. The long-haired monster manages to jump away and avoid being hit by such a powerful attack. When a dart hits the monster's body, they begin to feel an unpleasant state and fall into a stupor. Affected bodies begin to melt like ice cream in the sunlight. The power of poison in the darts created with the help of the bride's magic is capable of causing fatal damage to all weak monsters and can cause critical damage to strong ones. Kajuro saw what was happening and was amazed at the monster bride's abilities. This ability can hit many targets and cause enormous damage to weak monsters. Some monsters managed to jump away from the attack and were shocked by such an attack and retreated in fear. The long-haired monster knew how to control and kill the enemy with the help of voodoo dolls. He was very angry that the bride came to his territory with a crowd of monsters and started a massacre. Realizing that she does not compromise on force, he takes out the doll to teach the beauty a lesson. Pointing the doll at the beautiful monster, the long-haired monster began to damage the doll and connect it with the bride. While everyone was fighting and not paying attention to him, he managed to create strong voodoo magic and prepared to harm the beauty. The small hay doll with magical properties was ready. The long-haired monster, using a thick needle, begins to pierce the doll in the heart area. After this, the monster immediately began to look at the bride, checking whether the voodoo magic had worked on her. The monster bride, covering her groom Kazuro, watched the fight and tried to control that no one would come into the back. Suddenly she feels severe pain in her chest and begins to fall exhausted. Kazuro saw the monster bride fall to the ground, and fearing for her condition, he ran up to her. Approaching, he begins to lift and press him to himself, asking if everything is okay. The girl, having received a severe wound, says that she received a wound, but not a fatal one. She looked at Kajuro, who was sincerely worried about her, and she was pleased. She could not allow him to be killed in front of her eyes, and began to fight the wound using her defensive abilities. Kazuro said that he would not allow her to die and would help. Having filled her heart with feelings for her beloved, the monster bride begins to use her most powerful magic, gradually rising above the ground. She was preparing to teach the long-haired monster a lesson and finish him off. The long-haired monster notices that the bride begins to use strong magic and responds in kind. Using his powerful abilities, wrapping himself in mana for protection and preparing for a counterattack. Having risen into the sky to meet the bride, a battle ensued between the two strongest monsters on the territory of the university. The ringing sounds and powerful blows looked like fireworks in the sky. Such a sight could be seen far away, 
but not enough to worry about the appearance of the head of security's people. Kajuro, watching the battle, decides to use his monsters to help his new friends and give his monsters an opportunity to have fun and increase their confidence level. Having summoned a monster with a chainsaw and a busty beauty to his aid, Kajuro, armed with a sword, began to attack the enemy monsters with enormous force. The monster with the chainsaw was glad to finally join the fight and cool down his desire to fight. In the heat of battle with monsters, Kazuro notices a monster preparing to cast a fire spell. Realizing that he has no protective magic, he pays attention to the vampire standing behind him and decides to ask him for help. The vampire, while fighting, feels how Kajuro begins to grab him by the back and asks him to cover him from the fire monster. The vampire, not understanding what is happening, turns around and leads the fireball approaching him. The vampire feels the fire covering him, and he experiences intense heat. Kazuro was hiding behind him and also experienced heat, but not direct contact. The vampire was a strong monster, and a weak fire attack would do nothing to him. After the fire attack, the vampire was not happy that Kajuro had set him up like that and began to show his displeasure and yell at the guy. Kazuro felt ashamed, but understood that nothing would happen to the vampire after this. Scratching the back of his head, he began to apologize to the vampire and say that he had no choice. In the heat of battle with the long-haired monster, she noticed how the fireball was approaching the guy, but he managed to hide behind the vampire. Worried about the guy, she was distracted from the battle and revealed that she was worried about the guy in front of the enemy. The long-haired monster notices the bride's strong concern for the guy who killed his strongest servant and understands that he must attack the boy. Using his sharp and durable needles, he decided to attack the guy while the bride was distracted. The long-haired guy uses a throw boost and uses his needles to throw them at the guy. The monster bride manages to notice that the attack is on the guy and using her abilities, tries to save the boy. Kajuro was fighting monsters and had no idea that sharp needles were flying at him at great speed. Suddenly, a huge, beautiful flower appears in front of his head and takes the blow of the long-haired monster. The long-haired monster was puzzled by the fact that all his attacks were successfully repulsed. Angered, he uses a power-up strike with a fast sorcery technique and decides to strike the monster bride. Before she can dodge the blow, the bride takes a very strong blow, which takes her out of the fight for a short time. A strong blow to the stomach can stun any monster. Kazuro notices that the fight is not going in favor of the monster bride and decides to help her. After telling his buxom beauty to use stunning magic on the long-haired monster, Kajuro is worried but hopes to help. Using his zither, waves of deafening notes began to fly towards the enemy. The long-haired monster suddenly freezes, receiving strong sound waves that take him out of the fight for a short time and block his abilities. The monster fights with such force, but cannot win, and any attempts are even. The monster bride took advantage of the moment and pulled the needles out of herself, experiencing severe pain. She began to try to quickly heal her wounds and figure out how to attack the long-haired monster so that he would not have time to defend himself. Kajuro did not count on the bride's intervention and decided to finish the fight himself by asking your chainsaw monster for help. The monster with the saw readily agreed and launched Kajuro at the long-haired monster. Kajuro was flying with his sword and wanted to quickly kill the monster. Flying up to the monster, the boy begins to use his sword and fill it with powerful force to strike. The long-haired monster slowly begins to come to his senses and notices the boy's approach. He begins to try to escape from the stun and block the guy's attack. The sword was already approaching the monster's body and began to intensify its glow, showing its growing strength. The long-haired monster doubted that the boy would have the strength to break through his protective magic and smiled nervously, hoping to survive. The unexpected enormous power of the blow knocked the long-haired monster to the ground. A huge flash from the impact lit up the entire sky within a radius of several kilometers. From such power, all the monsters froze around and stopped the fight, realizing that it was their leader flying to the ground. Kajuro landed after the blow next to the remains of the body of the long-haired monster and stood proudly, holding a sword in his hands. 
The mighty monster was dying, exuding its power as if fiery tongues of flame were coming out of it. Among the remains lay the monster's soul stone. The monster of the bride rose above the monsters of the enemy and invited them to surrender in an amicable way. Otherwise, they would be killed without a shadow of a doubt. The monsters looked at the remains of their leader and realized that they had no choice if they wanted to live on. The bride, with her proud and threatening appearance, showed that only she is worthy to rule this place and serve her as a great honor for the monsters. If they agree to become her servants, they must bow and kneel in praise of her. Monsters, feeling her power and realizing that they must do everything she says, otherwise they will set their minions to kill them, or the guy with the sword who killed their leader. All the monsters knelt down and began to bow to the monster bride and show her their devotion. The girl was very glad that she was finally able to put an end to the long-haired monster thanks to her brave hubby and rejoiced. By the way, about hubby, the bride began to turn her head in search of her beloved and wanted to quickly fall into his arms and his tender arms. Realizing that he had helped her so much, she had no doubt that he was a worthy husband for such a beauty as a monster bride. Noticing that Kazuro was near the remains of the long-haired monster and was collecting something in admiration, she flew towards him. Kazuro, seeing how many monster stones were on the ground after the battle, immediately began to fill his pockets and rejoiced that he could sell them profitably. And the stone of the long-haired monster was different from the others, being larger in size and purple in color, probably very valuable, Kazuro thought. Rejoicing at so many treasures and figuring out what to spend the money for them on, he didn't think about anything. The bride, flying up to the guy, began to hug the guy from the back with gentle movements of her hands, and, a little embarrassed, thanked him for his help. Hugging him tightly and snuggling as close as possible, she was happy with him and felt strong feelings. Kazuro, on the contrary, wanted to quickly unhook from her and quickly return to the location of the dorm, since tomorrow there are classes. He understood that there could be no love relationship between a man and a monster, and tried with all his might to explain this to his bride. The girl, when she heard the boy say this, began to say vulgar things that the boy simply did not understand what he was giving up, and every time he refused to continue the evening, he only fell more in love with himself. Kazuro is once again convinced that girls are very strange and do not understand when they are rejected. Kazuro looked at the bride, embarrassed by her words, and understood that such a beauty clearly deserved the best, but not with a person. Her appearance was stunning and attracted everyone, but fate was against it. Kazuro said that it was time for him to return to the dorm since it was already late, and he had achieved his goal of fighting the strongest monster on the university grounds. The bride, having met his desire, did not stop, but saw him off, waving her hand and waiting for a quick meeting with her beloved. Meanwhile, three exchange students sat behind a ridge of bushes and watched what was happening. They were greatly frightened when they saw a huge fight between crowds of monsters and Kajuro taking the fight. Fen was so surprised that he didn't know what to say to the others. The only thing that came to his mind was to tell Yui to call his father and warn him about Kajuro's abilities. Yui was also frightened by what she saw and agreed with Fen's words that it was necessary to warn the head of the absorbers. Remembering the incident at the hospital, she didn't really want to call her dad and still couldn't see or talk to him, so she decided to write a message. Suyuki asked why she couldn't just call and tell it like it was, to which Yui replied that there were too many monsters around and they could be heard. Trying not to reveal her condition, Yui thought that this would be better than telling what she saw in the hospital. Having received a message from his daughter, the head of the Kento Absorbers urgently convened a meeting and began to bring all employees up to date. Nada had to urgently come up with something and do something with this guy, otherwise he poses a threat to his existence. It has not yet been possible to find out who his family is, but then we need to grab the boy and wait for them to appear, said the head of Kento. Kento began to warn his employees that the boy already owned four high-ranking monsters and was only becoming more dangerous. We found information in school records that he was only able to summon one half ghost and no more. And now he already has four high ranks. 
Something else is clearly involved here. Either he hid information about himself, or he has a very rare ability to increase the possibility of absorbing monsters, the head of Kento nervously said. The director of the Mauchi Supreme Devourers University, Lin, was very worried about this problem, because his children were in danger, and if they gave themselves away, they would pay with their lives. He wanted to ask Kento to call off the undercover students and deal with Kajuro to his people. Kento replied that as long as he did not do this, it might cause suspicion, and added that there was no need to worry about them. They were capable of taking care of themselves. Director Lin, having calmed down a little, begins to ask the head, What options will there be for capturing Kazuro then? Kento, from his long experience of serving as the head of the absorbers and in the ranks of ordinary soldiers, remembers that for such strong opponents, it is necessary to carry out an ambush on a huge scale with the participation of outsiders in order to remove suspicion from what is happening. Director Lin remembered that there would soon be a competition between universities to catch dangerous monsters in a closed city. This is a very suitable place to ambush and capture the guy. There won't be many people there and the chances are quite high. Chief Kento agreed with Director Lin and thanked him for the great idea. Meanwhile. At the time of the monster battle, the director of the cell was on the street and noticed bright flashes from the battle. He immediately realized that it was Kajuro. He would not confuse such strong sword magic with anything, pulling his hand with a lit cigarette to his mouth. Feeling severe pain in his lip from the charred part of the cigarette, director Soda cried out in pain and shed a tear. Without realizing it, he decided to smoke a cigarette on the wrong side and was caught by his carelessness. The awkward situation could have seriously damaged the respect for the director, but it's good that no one saw it. We are transported to the moment when Kajuro has already arrived in his room and is getting ready for bed. Climbing onto the second tier of the bed, he remembered that Khan had shown how to increase his strength with the help of a monster stone and decided to try it. Taking the lotus position, he began to meditate, trying to channel the energy of the stone into his body. After several minutes of meditation, the stone began to emit a strong purple glow and power began to flow out of the stone into Kajuro's body. A state of calm and balance in the soul helps to quickly absorb the powers of the stone and increase the level of mana and strength in the guy's body. Having absorbed all the power from the stone, Kajuro woke up and holding the stone in his hand, was glad that Han's words were true and helped raise all the characteristics and restore his condition. This is great advice that will help you recover faster after fighting monsters, Kazuro thought. Feeling much better, Kazuro decided to go to bed and get some sleep while he could. After so many events that happened that day, I really needed to rest and gain strength and vigor for the upcoming couples. Classes began as usual and soon, Director Sota received information that a competition between universities to catch monsters would soon be held. The university must nominate groups of students to fight, and the winner will be named based on the results. After the announcement, there was a buzz in the class, and everyone was heatedly discussing who would go and exactly how many students should take part. Some wondered why the first year was also allowed to compete. Director Soda began to calm everyone down and say that no one would force anyone. The competition is exclusively for those interested. Kazuro heard such a great chance to show himself and level up, as well as collect a large number of stones, that he decided to try his hand. He recalled how during the exam he collected a whole bunch of treasures, and the money from what he sold on the black market still hasn't run out. Director Sota, seeing many interested parties, decided to clarify that they would have to act in groups. It would be very dangerous alone, and none of the participating universities would agree to allow one participant to do this. Kazuro, hearing such a prohibition, thought a little. Kajuro decided to invite Han to go with him to the competition. Kajuro began to explain that this was a great chance to prove himself and secure his future. Realizing that Han was not interested in money, Kajuro decided to lure him with a decent career ladder and a glorious future. Khan agreed, but said that it wouldn't be easy for the two of them either. Kajuro decides to invite his friend Po to the team so that he can improve his skills and be more useful. The fat man sat and played on the phone and didn't care about the competition, since he himself understood that he was weak and had no business even getting into it. 
Kazuro thought about how to lure his friend to participate in the competition. He is too cowardly and has a weak monster. But Kazuro knew his friend's weaknesses and decided to use a cunning method. Taking out his phone, Kajuro said that he had Sarah's number and could give it to the fat man if he went to the competition with them. The fat man was wearing headphones, but he heard the name of his beautiful Sarah clearly and turned his attention to Kazuro. Glad that Kajuro had Sarah's number, Po reached for his phone to take the number. Kazuro understood that the fat man would definitely want the number and would be ready for anything. Po began to beg Kazuro to give Sarah's number and he would do whatever he asked, but he was afraid to take part in the competition, since he was very weak. Kajuro replies that Po will be able to increase his skill level and become stronger. Kajuro encourages Po and says that if they win, then Sarah herself will come up to Po and greet him. Po thought about it and was a little scared that he would have to risk his life again, but wanting Sarah's praise was probably worth it. The guys agreed with Kazuro, but Po was still afraid that he was too weak and might die. Kajuro sat and listened to the instructions of Director Sota and was ready for battle. The rest of the children in the class did not want to participate, realizing their abilities. After classes, Kajuro decided to come to the infirmary and check on Hanami. Sitting down on a chair next to her, he began to peel the apple with a knife. He wanted to tell her about the competition in which he wanted to take part with his classmates. Having finished peeling the apple, Kazuro gives Hanami an apple so that she can eat some vitamins and get better faster. Telling her about new competitions between universities, that they will be able to earn a lot and pay for her mother's treatment. Biting an apple, she says that she won't be able to do much since she is still very weak. Kajuro takes the apple and agrees not to force her to eat it. Smiling, he takes the apple and continues to say that he is not interested in winning but only in the opportunity to collect as many stones as possible or find jewelry to sell on the black market and give to her. Hanami says that she doesn't like the fact that Kajuro is willing to risk so much for her. She expresses her concern and invites him to refuse, and she can find the money for treatment herself. If something happens to him, she will not forgive herself. Kajuro listens that Hanami is not happy that he wants to participate in the competition, and unknowingly begins to eat the apple after Hanami, without thinking that she was poisoned by the bite of Director Lin's wolf monster. Hanami notices that Kajuro started eating the apple and shows his displeasure, because there was her drool. Kazuro said that he was not disgusted and only began to bite and smack harder, eating the apple with pleasure. He smiled and finished the apple, saying that the apple tasted even better after her. The awkward compliment gave rise to a short silence and a strange situation. Hanami was a little surprised and didn't know how to tell Kajuro something important. Hanami, lying in her bed, said that the boy did not understand that she was poisoned and drool on an apple could transmit poison. Kazuro, throwing the stupidity out of his head, realized that he could have made a mistake and would be poisoned by the same poison. He was very frightened and turned pale, covered in cold sweat. Kajuro immediately grabbed his stomach and began to think that now he would feel ill and would not be able to participate in the competition. Hanami starts laughing at the boy and teasing him with the words that now they will lie in the same room and eat apples. While Kajuro was visiting Hanami and entertaining him, Yui watched him and noticed that that girl looked a lot like her. Remembering how her father beat the woman in the hospital, who is the girl's mother, Yui felt awkward and wanted to talk about everything. Yui was sure that she and Hanami had something more in common than their acquaintance with Kazuro. She felt that she definitely didn't know everything about her father's life, and when she caught him beating that woman in the hospital, she was finally convinced that he was clearly hiding a lot. After pleasant conversations and a good time with Hanami, Kajuro returned to his room and decided to discuss plans for the competition. Po approached Kajuro and asked him to give him Sarah's number while they got ready, and Han sat in the lotus position and rubbed his maple, bringing it into perfect condition. Kajuro folded the card in half and hit Po on the head with the words that he needed to think about how to win the competition and draw up an action plan for an additional prize. When I got hit on the head, I was a little surprised. 
And when I heard about additional plans for the competition, I became interested in what Kazuro had come up with. Han sat further and cleaned his sword and did not attach importance to Kazuro's words, but listened carefully. Showing on the map an interesting place in an abandoned city where they could look for supplies for the future, he began to tell them that there was an opportunity to clean out the bank and divide everything equally. Kazuro told the guys that he plans to look for money in the bank, hoping that there is still money there in order to pay for the treatment of his friend's mother. Po and Han, having heard Kazuro's words, said that they would help in clearing the bank and they didn't need anything. Poe said that he would help, but he urgently needed Sarah's number. He wanted to send her an interesting photo. Kazuro, hearing Poe, began to suspect that after that photo, Poe would have problems with Sarah and he refused, saying that only after the competition and nothing else. It's time for the university monster-catching competition. All students gathered in a closed area in front of the entrance to the abandoned city. In addition to the participants, there were rescue vehicles and military vehicles on the territory, so that in case of an unforeseen situation they could intervene and eliminate the threat. Among the many children from different universities, Poe notices that among the crowd are his classmates, exchange students from the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University U, and Brother Fen and Sister Suyuki. They also took part in the competition, and this made Poe a little tense, since Kajuro told him that they could not be trusted. Gathered near the performance area, Director Lin came onto the stage and welcomed everyone to take part in the university competition for the title of Best University of the Year. The director began to tell them what awaited them in the closed city and their upcoming goals, for victory which we will have to work hard for. Some of the participants were scared that they would have to fight monsters, but they came here willingly, wanting to succeed and become stronger. But Director Lin's words only reminded that there are a lot of dangers in the city, and you need to be very cold-blooded and strong to win. Kazuro, listening to Director Lin's loud statements about all the obstacles that await them, heard that some participants began to change their minds about taking part in the competition and wanted to go back home. They were filled with fear for their own lives, and the decision for which they came here was in vain. Director Lin after telling them what awaited them all in the closed city, decided to ask one last time if there were anyone who wanted to refuse to take part in such a dangerous competition. He wanted to weed out all sorts of weaklings as much as possible, so that the competition would be as dangerous as possible. Some began to raise their hand, trembling in fear. One of the participants refused to take part, thereby exposing his classmates. He only wanted to survive and his friend dragged him here, but he himself did not want to risk his life. His bandmate attacked him, grabbing his t-shirt and starting to shout that he was a coward and was only ruining everything. He is already very weak at the university and could improve his skills by taking part in such an important competition between universities, but now they will all be expelled if the group is not complete. The boy was scared and did not know that because of his cowardice, the whole group would suffer. Suddenly, they are pushed aside by the invisible forces of Director Lin's abilities. A statement that before the competition, they must not injure themselves or anyone in the squad. The punishment would be exclusion from the competition, Director Lin said. Having dropped out of the competition, the participants begin to leave the closed area and the safe zone point of the abandoned city. They were very upset that this happened but at least they would not die because of their stupidity in thinking that they could cope with strong monsters. Director Lin looked after the weak children and stood near the entrance watching the others. He saw Kajuro with some guys and thought that everything would work out and they would be able to catch the boy without attracting attention and deal with his comrades, risking an accident and death at the hands of monsters. Finally, the start of the competition was announced and large armored doors began to open in front of the guys letting them into the abandoned city. Most of the participants proudly began to walk towards the door, as did our heroes Kajuro and his comrades. Behind the open gates, only destruction awaited everyone, human skeletons and remains, and many dangers at every corner. Kajuro and his comrades went inside and passing by the remains of last year's participants, were a little scared. After walking a few meters, Kazuro stopped to look where they should go and assess the situation. Khan watched what was happening on the left 
and tried to remember which of the participants went in that direction. Poe watched from the right and remembered how much went to the right. He was scared and felt fear from every dark corner of this abandoned city. Most of the buildings were covered with corrosion, began to be overgrown with moss and covered with dirt. From long periods of inactivity and the influence of weather, the buildings could collapse from any movement. No human has set foot in it for more than ten years. The whole city was filled with monsters. Such a place was ideal for holding such a dangerous competition. The guys walked along the old open street and looked at the old city. On some buildings, there were old signs and signs that could be used to navigate. Kajuro took out a map to make sure they were going in the right direction. He wanted to quickly find a suitable road and get away from the prying eyes of other participants, who were also still following the main road and were afraid to turn into a dark alley. Trying to see where they needed to go on the map under the light of the moon, he came across one place on the map where they could look and stay there until the right moment. It should be safe and not far from the bank where they are going. Poe stops the guys, saying that while passing by a tall building, he saw something strange there, and suggested that monsters could hide in buildings and only come out when they see lonely targets in order to surprise and kill. Han, listening to Poe's story, was not surprised and knew that he could not be approached unnoticed. Kazuro, looking up from the map, was captivated by Poe's opinion and agreed that this could be so. Poe noticed that the guys in front of them were walking from the very beginning and weren't turning anywhere. Maybe they knew something, Poe said. Kazuro was completely indifferent to the presence of other participants and replied that if so, they would clear the way for them from the monsters. Among the three guys, there was a girl in a military suit. They approached a small building with a sign about car repair. Perhaps they wanted to go to the service to see if there were monsters there so they could fight them. They were very quiet and calmly observing their surroundings. Kajuro said that if they plan to go where he is, then Nada will stop them and prevent them from taking all the money from the bank before them. Kajuro didn't want to let anyone stop him from saving Hanami's mother. He was very serious and did not intend to lose. Noticing that Kazuro was right, and the guys began to enter the building with a sign on the wall of the car service and climb the stairs to the top. Kazuro calmed down, and the guys continued to walk to the given point on the map, simultaneously looking at the group of guys entering the building. Having reached the next alley, Kazuro looked out to make sure there were no obstacles or troubles. Poe also decided to look out, and trying not to shake with fear and maintain composure, looked to see if there were any monsters there. Kazuro notices a suitable house where they can stay. It was an old abandoned small house surrounded by a fence. Poe and Han began to approach him, looking around a little and making sure he was safe. The doors were broken, and there was a lot of dirt and cobwebs inside from the lack of people. Kajuro smiled and said that this was a suitable place to spend the night. Khan went inside and did not show any emotions. He just looked around and assessed the situation. Poe tensely entered the building, afraid that they would sleep in a house without doors and be vulnerable. Khan, having found a good place, decided to wipe it down so that he could sit down and not get his clothes dirty. It was a little unexpected for Kazuro that such a quiet man and a master of the sword was so neat and always carried a rag with him. Having wiped the place for himself, Khan wanted to sit down and start checking his blade, but without having time to do anything, he sat down on a clean place. Poe, and with great zeal, began to say that it was time for them to have a snack and fill their bellies before bed, not paying attention to Han's surprised and slightly angry face. Kazuro took out crackers from their small supply of food and began to slowly enjoy eating one. Food was scarce, and they had to save money, so there was no time to waste. The competition lasts a day, and the first thing each group needs to do is find shelter for the night. Kazuro gave one cracker to Han, saying that he had to save money and would have to starve a little. Khan agrees, realizing that with large supplies, they would have to go slower and come under attack from monsters. Meanwhile, Poe greedily ate several crackers at once, not thinking about the consequences. He just wanted to eat and eat, and also Sarah's number. Kajuro began to reprimand Poe that he was eating all their food and they would be weak when attacked by the monster 
and would not be able to cope because of such a glutton. While the guys were talking about Poe's bad deed, that he immediately decided to gobble up all their supplies, some guy comes into their house. Kazuro and Han, hearing footsteps, turn their attention to the entrance and notice it. They were a little worried, but remained where they were. It was a guy from the group that entered the building with a sign for a car service. He came to them with two large pieces of meat and smiling offered to take them, since they caught a deer in this city and cut up its carcass. And there was quite a lot of meat, and so as not to waste, they decided to share it. Kajuro and Han stood behind Po and were surprised by such generosity from a potential enemy and began to suspect that something was wrong. Po was so hungry that he began to approach the boy with the meat, rubbing the back of his head and asking what they wanted for such a delicious piece of meat. The boy replies that it is a gift and he doesn't need anything. He just didn't want the meat to go to waste. Poe was already reaching for large and juicy pieces of meat with the desire to quickly devour them. Kazuro, sensing some kind of catch, decides to stop Poe from taking the meat and manages to stop him. Kazuro is still sure that no one will simply give food as a gift in such competitions between university participants. Kazuro thanks the boy for coming to treat them to such delicious pieces of meat, but he doesn't quite understand how an ordinary animal like a deer could survive in an abandoned city with a lot of monsters. But when I turned my head, I also suspected something was wrong. Khan began to come up and say that on the way he only saw ravens that flew above them, but he didn't see any other animals. And it was really strange. The guys were hungry but not so stupid as to believe some unfamiliar guy that he would bring large and juicy pieces of meat to the opposing group for no reason at all. The boy with the meat, realizing that he had to somehow get out, says that there is a zoo nearby and the deer was behind the fence. There was a lot of grass around and that's why he survived and regular rains in this area filled the drinking bowl and did not allow the animal to die. There were several weak monsters around the cage that wanted to taste the deer, but they couldn't get inside. Kazuro, listening to all this nonsense, decides to play along with the guy and agrees to find out what all this nada is for, and at the same time make sure that this is a setup and this is not deer meat. If this is a setup, then perhaps other members of the group can wait for the right moment and attack. Kazuro agrees with great pleasure and, pretending to believe it, takes a bunch of two juicy pieces of meat from the guy. The boy gives the meat away with great pleasure and thinks that he managed to deceive the guys. Kazuro, remembering that Han said that his sword can determine the monster's abilities, thinks that the meat is not deer after all and they will find out the truth. Having given the meat, the boy got ready to leave through the broken doors of the house and waved to the guys, smiling. Such a friendly guy in such an abandoned place was clearly suspicious, and Kajuro understood it. After leaving, Kajuro asked Han to check the meat for any suspicious substances. Placing the bundle on the table, Kajuro tells Han to act. Po looked at the meat and salivated with desire to taste the tender and juicy meat. Khan pierces the meat with his blade and Po doesn't like it, causing him to raise cries of misunderstanding. Kazuro stops the screams by saying that this is how it should be and they must make sure that the meat is safe and can be eaten. Having cooled down a little, he begins to understand Kajuro's idea and why he so kindly agreed to take the meat after he himself had forbidden it. Khan took out his blade from the pierced pieces of meat and began to look at the blade. When it changes color and begins to give off an unpleasant odor, he can determine what kind of animal or monster the meat is. It takes some time, but the answer will be soon, and the guys need to wait a little. Meanwhile, Poe can no longer control his hunger and, drooling, greedily looks at the meat and reaches out to devour it. He is so stupid that his brain turns off at the sight of food and his patience disappears. Khan finally realized whose piece of meat it was, and the information was unpleasant for the guys. The meat was a monster capable of causing severe paralysis and sleepiness. After eating such meat, they would never wake up again. After hearing Hana's words, he was very upset and hungry. He understood that Kajuro was right and no one could be trusted in this abandoned city. Kazuro stood with his head bowed and realized that the boy had hardly gone far and would wait for the poison to take effect in order to inform his comrades in the group.
Kazuro invites his comrades to pretend that they have eaten meat and go to bed, simultaneously preparing for an attack. Kazuro asked Han to throw the meat somewhere, and Po to make sounds of pain and show concern about the condition. If that boy is nearby, he will hear and tell his friends. Then we will attack them if they appear. Po began to make sounds of regret and pain from meat poisoning. The other guys also tried to pretend that they felt bad. The boy who brought the meat heard that they bought and ate the meat. He was nearby and realized that he had succeeded in deceiving those three and poisoning them. The insidious plan to eliminate the competition participants worked. Even no one will understand who did it, since the monster's meat could be eaten at any time. The boy was sure that now no one would stop them from finding a high-ranking monster in this area and killing it, delivering the stone to the exit and winning. The guys pretended that they had gone to bed and tried to act convincing. Poe, after so much loud snoring, suddenly fell asleep for real. Having cleaned the floor before bed and laid down their sleeping bears, the guys rested on the wooden floor listening to their surroundings. Suddenly, they heard loud words arranged in rhyme. At first, they did not understand what was happening and thought that it was the group that poisoned them that decided to attack in this way, accompanying the attack with poetry. But this was not so. Beautifully composed words came from the theater stage located nearby. Two monsters appeared on the theater stage and played the play, not paying attention to the fact that there were no spectators or anyone at all. Their playing was quite loud and could be heard throughout the entire area in that area. The ghost woman was dressed in a beautiful and ancient robe made of silk and had long sleeves. She had a short hairstyle on her head, decorated with red stones and designs. Her eyes glowed and evoked fear from the mysterious monster. The stage comrade looked like an ancient warrior in golden armor skillfully operating a naginata. They played a scene together in the theater and were happy on stage. Their story of a warrior in love and the daughter of a ruler was played every evening in an abandoned city. Seeing through the window that two monsters appeared on stage and were performing a play, Kazuro was a little surprised. He had never seen anything like this and thought that such monsters were clearly different from ordinary low-ranking ones. Khan complimented Kazuro's guesses by saying that he felt a strong swordsman's aura from one of the monsters, and they were definitely strong. Meanwhile, another group of students with a boy who tried to poison Kazuro and his comrades began to invite their roommate to go together and fight the monsters. Since they were of high rank and by winning, it would be possible to deliver their stones to the gate and win the competition between universities. The girl in a military suit agreed to attack the monsters on stage and began to summon her monster, which looked like it was made of mud and was melting before our eyes. Their attitude was serious, and they were preparing to attack the monsters on stage, interrupting the performance. While Kazuro and Han were discussing their next steps, Poe began to wake up after some girl's loud vocal performances. Yawning, he asked the guys what was going on and where were they going. Kajuro looked at Poe and said it was time for them to seize the moment. He looked at Poe and said that after trying to kill them and hearing that strong monsters had appeared on stage, Kajuro suggested going to the stage and watching the show without interfering with the fight. If possible, and most importantly, do not show fear then they will not be touched for now. On the stage, a girl in the national attire of the old era sang a song about love for her warrior groom, fighting with other countries and warriors. Kazuro and his comrades came to the stage and began to listen and encourage the monsters to perform well. Poe tried not to show that he was scared and sat quietly on the bench. Khan cautiously approached Poe to sit next to him. Only Kajuro did not hesitate to express his emotions and loudly applauded and praised the theater actress. A girl from the squad saw that three guys came to watch the concert and decided that the meat had a very strange effect on them, and, being poisoned, they were able to come to the concert. Probably, the poison of the meat and the song of the monster act on them like a trance and attract them to themselves, the girl in military uniform thought. She decided that the monsters would be distracted by the guys and ordered her comrades to attack the girl on the stage and quickly kill her. Having waited for the right moment, they ran towards the stage, and preparing for battle, they were confident of victory.
As they approached the scene, they mistakenly thought that the monster would not pay attention to them and did not try to act quietly. A girl on stage performing a song and dancing notices how a crowd of people and a monster are approaching the stage. With its singing, the actress's monster causes paralysis in those who fled. They begin to feel strong tension in their body and cannot move under the influence of such force. The guys began to worry that everything did not go according to plan and hoped to quickly get out of the effect of paralysis. From the sudden stop and the paralyzed body, their bodies fell to the ground right in front of the actress. The effect did not last long, but it forced the attention of another monster. The guys made a big mistake by attacking such monsters without using cover and ambushes. One of the guys fell face up and notices that a monster with a naginata is approaching him and wants to kill him. Trying to move, he strains with all his might, feeling cold sweat running down his face and images of the past begin to appear in his head. The monster with a naginata came closer in his shiny golden armor and a merciless face, swung with a desire to chop off the head of the arrogant guy who dared to interrupt such a beautiful singing of his beloved. At the last moment, the effect of paralyzing the body ends, and the boy manages to turn his head, but after experiencing terrible pain, he loses his hand from the sharp blade of the naginata. His face expresses great shock, and tears of pain begin to come out of his eyes. The guys start to get up and realize that everything is not going according to plan. One of their comrades has already lost his arm, and things can only get more difficult. Getting up from the floor, they, trying not to panic, decide to resort to using their monsters and kill the damned warrior with a naginata. The guy stood opposite a warrior in shiny golden armor and nervously tried to summon their monsters. They were sure that such a warrior would not survive against a crowd of monsters and would fall. The swordsman warrior was calm and waited. He did not try to attack, but was patient and wanted to kill every monster that dared to interrupt their performance. Five monsters stood in front of the armored warrior at once and each of them had to attack the armored warrior. Each of the monsters that the group of students summoned on stage were quite weak, but against such a strong monster and in a crowd, one could try to win. Monsters began to surround the stink in armor and try to attack him from blind spots while receiving as little injury as possible. One of the monsters grabbed the warrior from the back, and the other ran up from the other side to grab his left hand and prevent him from attacking with a naginata. Kazuro looked at what was happening on the stage and seeing how the warrior was beginning to be surrounded, indicating that he needed to get out of the encirclement and heal from the attacks by using his sword power. The swordsman warrior heard that some guy was giving him such advice and was extremely surprised. A group of guys whose monsters attacked a warrior in armor were very annoyed by such statements from the guy and helping the monster that they realized that the attempt with poisoning the meat was not successful and they did not eat it, but simply pretended to be poisoned. Kajuro notices that the monster of the knight's bride is standing aside and doing nothing. He starts shouting at her to use her ability on the monsters. Otherwise, her warrior will die, and then she will die. Kajuro forced the monster actress to accept his words and act. Having gathered herself and calmed her tender and vulnerable soul as an actor, the girl, after Kazuro's advice, begins to give out high notes with her voice, forcing her warrior to rise and fight, enhancing his abilities with her voice and the power of skill. The warrior, lying on the floor surrounded by a crowd of monsters, unable to move, begins to hear the beautiful voice of his bride, and her power begins to be transferred to the warrior forcing him to rise and give battle to the monsters who dared to interrupt the performance. Having filled his body with the magical power of his beloved, he rose from under the crowd of monsters, throwing them in all directions with his naginata. Using such power, the armored warrior takes his power to a new level and lets out a loud roar to intimidate his opponent. Without a hint of regret or fear, the golden armored warrior cut one monster in half with a powerful blow from his naginata. His body is overflowing with power and mental strength after strengthening the bride. One of the monsters decides to try to attack the armored warrior from behind, using a quick attack without attracting attention, while he is distracted by other monsters in front of him. The monster of the girl in a military suit was stronger than the monsters of the other guys. Sensing the presence of another monster behind him, 
The warrior in golden armor begins to heal himself, using an incredible technique of doing a back somersault while jumping over the monster behind him. Everyone did not yet understand what had happened and watched the battle. The warrior who tried to attack the armored warrior from behind crashes into the mummy monster who was fighting the warrior face to face. Having jumped over the monsters and not allowing himself to be grabbed, the armored warrior dodged and prepared to strike. Finding himself behind those monsters that tried to attack him, the warrior in golden armor delivers a strong and accurate blow to another monster, who did not expect such a turn and loses his head. The mummy monster and the swamp monster fall to the ground without understanding how this happened. Kajuro begins to loudly support the warrior in golden armor, thereby surprising everyone that a person is rooting for a monster. The warrior in golden armor was also surprised, but tried not to be distracted and keep an eye on the other monsters. While a crowd of monsters tried to attack and kill the warrior in golden armor, another boy ordered his monster to attack the monster's girlfriend from behind, thereby provoking the armored warrior to become distracted or give up and die, sacrificing his life in place of his bride. While the warrior in golden armor fought against the monsters and tried to fight back using various techniques, he managed to kill the mummy monster and assess the situation and determine another target for attack. A warrior in golden armor notices that a monster is creeping up on his bride from behind and immediately decides to attack him. Running up and jumping over the monster, the warrior began to swing his naginata and kill the damned monster. A strong blow at an unexpected moment for the monster who wanted to attack the monster's girl led to instant death. The armored warrior pierced the monster's head with his sharp naginata blade, causing him to experience severe pain, as did the owner of the monster. All monsters and people were neutralized or killed. The golden armored warrior proved that his abilities were high and his sword skills were amazing. Such a warrior is a worthy opponent for a strong opponent. One of the attackers was still alive and able to fight, but the fear of the monster and the understanding that it is strong enough and even stronger than she expected begins to beg for mercy and try to crawl away. The girl was scared and felt that she had no chance against such a strong monster alone. The fear of imminent death appeared on her face. Tears appeared and cold sweat ran down her face. In the last moments of her life, she tried to figure out how to survive and do something. Seeing Kajuro, she began to beg to help her and save her, bowing low to the guy and apologizing for trying to poison them. The armored warrior came closer and prepared to deliver the final blow. Being next to her dead classmates, the girl was in despair and begged for salvation. Kajuro was relentless and was not going to forgive the attempt to kill him. If she intended to kill him without any regret, then she did not deserve mercy. Kajuro pretended not to hear her begging him to help and simply winked at her before dying. After a strong swing of the warrior in golden armor with his naginata, the girl's head was chopped off with a sharp maple. Kajuro did not feel pity and believed that there would be no mercy for any attempts to kill or maim him or his loved ones and friends. After such a strong performance from the monsters and fighting alone against a crowd of monsters, Kajuro stood up and began to applaud the monsters, showing his respect and courage for such talented creatures. The warrior and his bride stood ready and were not going to give in to some guy who supported them in battle. Kazuro, realizing that the monsters are quite strong, decides to activate his sword skills and prepares for the battle. The armored warrior is the most dangerous of them, but attacks from his bride cannot be ruled out, for they can inflict paralysis or enhance the skills of their warrior. Kajuro began to climb onto the stage, where a crowd of corpses of monsters and students lay. The warrior in golden armor came closer and prepared to attack the guy. Kajuro was ready for the attack and kept an eye on the monster's movements in order to react in time. The warrior girl began to sing a quiet song and cast some kind of spell. The warrior in golden armor was waiting for the right moment to attack and was very serious and suspected that the boy did not just interfere in the battle, but observed and suggested without even resorting to the help of his comrades. The boy began to feel strong magic around him. It was reminiscent of winding fog, blinding the enemy. This technique would have worked if the boy was not ready for this, 
but the premature activation of the skills of his swordsmen of the highest rank blocks all weak attacks of the enemy. A warrior in golden armor, thinking that the boy is now vulnerable and will not be able to repel the attack, begins to attack him, running with a sharp naginata and smiling, confident of his victory. His movements were honed and perfected over hundreds of years of living as a monster. Such a monster was quite a difficult opponent. Kazuro, showing his disappointment, begins to summon his monster with a chainsaw, saying that it was in vain that they decided to attack him. Rolling up your sleeve and pressing the symbol on the saw's arm, a blue glow began to break out, from which a monster should appear. A strong monster with a chainsaw pops up unexpectedly for the monster in golden armor and repels the attack with its saw, causing the warrior to doubt his actions a little. He began to understand that the boy was much stronger than all those who attacked him combined. A huge monster with a chainsaw showed its power with its terrifying appearance and began to attack the warrior in golden armor with a saw. The warrior managed to put a block with his naginata, but he couldn't hold out like that for long, and he had to do something. The bride looked at the battle and did not know how to help him. Her strength was exhausted, and she needed to rest and gain strength to help her warrior. She was worried that the warrior wouldn't cope, and the boy would kill them. The strong attacks of the monster with a chainsaw forced the warrior in golden armor to strain all his remaining strength to protect himself and not allow himself to be pierced. He fought with all his strength and did not want to endanger his beloved. The warrior's bride in armor began to worry about her lover, but she did not have enough strength. She needed to help her betrothed and use reinforcement. The warrior in golden armor was at the limit of his strength and could not withstand the power of a huge monster with a chainsaw for a long time. Unable to bear it, feeling that he might lose his love, with the last of his strength, he tries to cast a strong spell and singing a song about love, begins to create a spell. Her heart began to beat faster out of fear for the warrior in golden armor. Enormous power began to be released from the singing of the beautiful singer and fueled the abilities of the warrior in golden armor, giving him a chance to confront the monster with a chainsaw. The warrior begins to increase his strength and absorb the golden mana of his bride's enhancement. His face begins to become covered with veins from the great absorption of his beloved's power, and the power begins to grow. Overcoming the pain in his body, the warrior in golden armor begins to shout, intimidate, and try to repel the attack of the monster with a chainsaw. A warrior in golden armor, having overpowered a monster with a chainsaw, successfully throws away the saw with his naginata and frees himself from the protective stance. Now he can, thanks to his speed and increased strength of his beloved, attack. Ignoring the stunned chainsaw monster, the armored warrior tries to dodge past the monster and attack Kajuro with his naginata. Kajuro pays attention to this and, calling on his sword, stands ready. The warrior with the chainsaw did not understand how it happened that some monster weak for him could resist him in such strength. Imbuing his sword blade of the highest level with magical and powerful power, Kajuro prepared to repel the attack of the warrior in golden armor. He was absolutely confident in his actions and was not afraid to engage in battle. The sword exuded enormous power and intimidated the enemy with just the sight of it. Swinging, Kajuro tried to hit the armored warrior with his sword, but he managed to block with his naginata. The force of the blow was so strong that the warrior could not stand on his feet. No one in this city had ever seen such a fight on the stage of an open theater. The battle of so many monsters and scavengers was incredible and brutal. After being struck by Kazuro's sword, the golden armored warrior flew back and fell to the floor of the stage. He was shocked by the guy's power and began to realize that he couldn't stand it that easily. A warrior with a chainsaw stood next to the guy and did not interfere yet, but waited for an order. The warrior girl in armor was scared and worried about her betrothed. The warrior in golden armor was angry and filled with rage at such an impudent interference in their performance on stage. Lying on the floor of the stage, he wanted to take revenge on everyone who had somehow offended his bride and kill the arrogant people with their henchmen monsters.
Kajuro began to raise his mighty blade above his head for the final blow, enhancing the characteristics of the sword and wanting to finally break through the defense of the golden armored warrior. He looked at the monster and thought that such a worthy warrior could join his collection of monsters, but for this he had to subdue him by breaking through his defenses. An incredible force fell upon the warrior in golden armor. After the blow, he was thrown to the side with his naginata broken in half. The blow also caused damage, causing the warrior to cough up blood. This seriously frightened the bride. The monster girl with acting talents and beautiful singing was very scared and feared for the life of her beloved warrior in golden armor. Her eyes and mouth were wide open in fear and surprise. Cold sweat ran down my face from fear. Looking at the badly wounded warrior, she could not stand it and began to run to him to help and restore his body. The stage actress and beloved armored warrior's abilities included buff and stun skills. She could heal the warrior constantly, and then it would be difficult to defeat. Kajuro understood this, assessing the enemy's skills before engaging in battle himself. Summoning his monster, a busty beauty, Kazuro orders his beloved warrior in golden armor to stop. The busty beauty agrees, and using her zither, begins to perform the melody with a stunning effect, not allowing her to move. The bride feels the influence of the abilities of the busty monster and begins to stop, feeling dizzy and weak. Her body could not withstand the abilities of the camp and begins to weaken. Her legs begin to give way, and she falls. Kajuro runs up to her in time and catches her, preventing her from falling. The monster actress was very weak, after so many attempts to save her warrior in golden armor, that she needed rest and recovery. Kazuro understands that thanks to such a beauty, it will be possible to try to subjugate a warrior in golden armor by breaking through his internal defense. Kazuro begins to pull the monster girl closer to him by the waist, and while she is weak, tries to provoke the armored warrior by trying to damage his defense. The girl was not yet able to fight off the guy. Kazuro took her hand and began to say various kinds of compliments, trying to attract attention and turn her attention to himself. The warrior in golden armor was very angry, and after a strong attack with a blade, he was weak and could not get up and fight. His wounds, both external and internal, were quite severe. Hearing how the guy began to pester his beloved, he only became angrier and wanted to kill the bastard. While the warrior in golden armor was rampaging and shouting all sorts of insults towards Kazuro, a monster with a chainsaw sat on the warrior, not allowing him to stand up, pressing him harder to the ground. Pulling the corpse of some monster towards him, he decided to have a snack while Kazuro was busy attracting the attention of the warrior's bride. Kazuro began to say that he was much stronger than the warrior in golden armor and could give the girl more than the pitiful warrior. By stroking the warrior's bride on the back, he only further provoked the monster in golden armor, but this was not enough to break through his internal defenses. Kajuro, it was necessary to act more radically. The armored warrior began to try to get up, but the monster with the chainsaw was too heavy and did not allow him to do this. Kazuro pulled the girl tightly by the waist with one hand and with the other began to touch the bride's beautiful face, saying various compliments and trying to attract attention. The girl, after so many awkward actions, began to blush from awkwardness and realizing that she did not want to endure this because she loved her warrior in golden armor, she decided to take action. The girl, having gathered her strength a little, decides to attack the guy and freeing herself from his tender and strong embrace, tries to hit him with her sharp claws. Kajuro quickly stops her attempt by saying that the monster with the chainsaw will cut off the head of the warrior in golden armor if she hurts him or wants to kill him. The monster with the chainsaw lowers the loudly screaming saw near the warrior's head, and pressing the gas, begins to spin the chain on the floor, producing a loud and nasty grinding sound on the concrete. The warrior in armor began to scream and close his eyes so as not to see this whole nightmare, seeing that the boy was not joking and that the monster was really approaching the head of his beloved warrior in golden armor with his loud and nasty roar, the girl got scared and stopped. She felt intense fear and realized that she could do nothing. Her hand stopped just short of touching Kajuro's neck. Sharp nails could simply cut the neck and kill the guy, 
but the realization that a loved one could die stops all attempts. Kazuro, with a slight grin, realizing that he had her under complete control, did not worry, and continued to resort to drastic measures to break the internal defense of the warrior in golden armor with the help of his dear bride. Her eyes began to cry, and her angry face was very irritated from the realization that she could do nothing. The girl was very beautiful and loved her beloved so much that she could harm him with her actions. She wanted to kill the boy with all her soul, but she couldn't. Kajuro stood with his arms crossed, showing complete confidence in his actions. He smiled and continued to show his respect and compliment the beauty. The girl, frozen in place without moving her hand to her neck, tried to fight her desire to kill the guy. The face was very tense, and tears came out in streams from the eyes. Kazuro looked into her eyes and decided to gently take her hand, moving it away from her neck and complimenting her on the softness of her skin. The girl's head dropped, closing her eyes. She stood there, realizing that she couldn't do anything, and endured everything that the boy wanted to do to her. Kazuro decided to wipe the tears from the beautiful and gentle face of the beautiful girl, showing his admiration for her attractiveness and trying to calm the girl down. This is quite a tender moment, and the warrior in golden armor should definitely react, Kazuro thought. The warrior, out of anger that the guy is touching his beloved's face, begins to flare up with anger and scream, begging the guy to stop. The monster with the saw continued to hold the saw nearby and, if the monster tried to rise, immediately cut off its head. Kazuro decides to do a very dirty act and, hugging the girl by the waist, bends her over and reaches out to kiss her face. The girl begins to understand what the guy is trying to do and gets very worried, realizing that he doesn't want this. Kajuro feels that if the monster sees the kiss, then its defense will definitely fall and it will succumb to absorption. Pretending that he was kissing the girl, having first turned her to the side so that the warrior would not see the kiss itself, he waited for a reaction and hoped that it would work. Kazuro's cunning act was very ugly, and he understood it, but the warrior's abilities would be very useful to him. The warrior in golden armor saw that the bastard began to kiss his beautiful beloved and became very angry. His emotions were very stormy and he felt enormous disappointment in himself that he could not save his beloved in any way. The warrior's defense fell after this, and Kazuro felt it. Without wasting any time, Kajuro begins to absorb the warrior in golden armor. A monster with a chainsaw, sitting on a warrior, eating the monster's leg, felt how the body of the warrior under him began to disappear, and he plopped down on the ground. All this time, Kajuro kept the girls back to what was happening, and she did not know what was happening. Kajuro devoured the warrior in golden armor and was pleased, but now he had to do the same with the girl, so as not to be a scumbag in their eyes further, and then explain his intentions and apologize to them. The girl didn't quite understand what was happening and why the boy pretended to want to kiss her. Having released the girl, Kajuro began to think about how to break her defense. The girl turns around, and sees that her beloved warrior in golden armor has disappeared and not a trace remains of him. She begins to ask Kajuro where he took her lover, and if he killed him, then she will do everything to kill the guy. Kazuro, listening to the girl's threats without answering anything, decides that if she is shamed, the protection will fall and he will be able to absorb her. While the girl did not understand anything and was at a loss, he took advantage of the moment and began to try to remove her outfit, thereby exposing part of her body. His perverted face showed great interest and desire to see a woman's breasts. The girl, realizing that the boy had completely lost all shame and was starting to undress her, she was very scared and did not understand what to do. Her eyes began to cry and her closed eyes showed only an unpleasant feeling in her soul. Kazuro began to pester him even more, trying to cause intense shame and weaken the beautiful girl's internal defenses. He began to pull his lips closer to her face and try to kiss her, saying all sorts of obscene things. He started talking about how they could have a good time alone without anyone bothering them. The girl, realizing what she was getting into, got very scared and started screaming, calling for help. 
Kazuro feels that the girl has given up and her defense is broken. He lets her go and says that everything will be fine now, trying well to calm the girl down. By using the absorption ability, Kajuro activates his powers. The girl begins to be absorbed, emitting a pink aura and forming another symbol on the guy's hand. Now these two will serve the guy together, and no one will separate them. On the stage, now only the corpses of the guys who tried to kill Kazuro and his comrades, and the stones of their monsters remained. Kajuro now owned another attacking monster, and a monster with new abilities that could strengthen all monsters giving more power. These were pretty good monsters, and now you can be calmer having two warriors at once. After contemplating his achievements, Kazuro absorbs the chainsaw monster and the buxom beauty back into his body and stands on the open stage, wondering what to do next and where to go. He begins to descend from the stage and feels something unpleasant. The soul of the warrior begins to rage and scream that as soon as he gets out, he will immediately kill the guy showing his broken feelings and seeing what the guy did with his beloved. Kajuro begins to say that he did nothing wrong, and all his actions were to weaken the warrior's defenses for further absorption. Kazuro understood that the couple of lovers now felt great distrust and anger towards him for his actions. But Kazuro was a rather smart guy, and thought about how to calm them down and convince them that everything was to save them and preserve the relationship, leaving them now together forever. A warrior in golden armor hugging his beloved shouted at the guy, showing his hatred for kissing and indecently touching someone else's lady. Kazuro began to make excuses, saying that he did not kiss his bride and only touched his waist without opening his arms in front of him. The girl confirmed the guy's words and admitted that the boy really only pretended to want to do something, but only provoked the warrior and she decided not to tell the guy's action after absorbing the warrior, blushing a little, for safety. The warrior in golden armor heard from his beloved that the boy did this only to save their lives, and so that they could always be together, he was surprised. Having thought carefully about what the boy had done for them, they agreed to such conditions, and were glad that they could always be together while continuing to perform. The warrior in golden armor promised to help in battles for decent treatment of them, and their talent for theatrical acting. After such an interesting fight and the absorption of two monsters, the guys decided to go to the house where there was a group of guys who decided to poison them, check if there were any provisions there and maybe something else. Walking inside, the guys came across food lying on the table and a box with stones of weak monsters. Poe held a bundle of meat in his hands and was glad that he could eat normally. Khan, having checked the food for poison, said that everything was safe and they could have a snack. Kajuro was very exhausted, and after the battle, he needed to rest and restore his abilities and gain strength. He yawned and stretched, showing his fatigue and desire to sleep. Beside him lay his backpack, in which he kept all his belongings. Kazuro decided to go outside, taking his backpack with him and telling the guys that he wanted to go outside to unwind a little and get some fresh air. Han was surprised that Kajuro, instead of sleeping, decided to go outside and breathe. Kazuro said that he would not be long and would return soon, but for now they could have a snack, since they would soon move on. Han looked at Kajuro and felt that the boy was growing stronger, and his aura was filling with new colors and increasing in size. Such power was quite dangerous even for the owner of so many monsters. Han was beginning to worry that Kajuro might lose control of the monsters and die. Kazuro, going outside, decided to sit at a table and take stones from his backpack to improve his strength and the strength of the monsters. It was quite light around from the cloudless sky and moonlight. Kajuro laid out the stones on a napkin. He summoned the busty beauty to improve her abilities and try to unlock new skills. Such a monster deserves attention and strengthening. Kajuro began trying to activate the stones and charge them with energy. The stones began to glow and rise as if by the magic of levitation. Kajuro sent a large amount of power at them and asked the buxom monster to absorb the stones. Now the girl's abilities will be enhanced and will be able to provide new skills for further use. The busty beauty, opening her mouth wide, began to absorb stones saturated with powerful power, improving the abilities and strengthening the monster. Her aura began to glow more intensely and slightly enlarge her beautiful body shape. 
The busty beauty was surprised that her breasts had grown so much, and felt awkward and uncomfortable that her breasts could fall out of the dress. Kazuro, embarrassed, tried not to focus on his large breasts and wanted to see how much the busty monster's strength had increased. Having discovered the characteristics of the monster, he began to check whether he had enough stones to activate a new skill. The points were enough to activate the skill, and looking at the busty monster, Kazuro realized that after all, the bra that he had given earlier would definitely not be enough now. After the busty beauty, Kazuro decided to increase the skills of another monster, and taking the backpack in his hands, the guy turned it over, pouring the remaining monster stones onto the table. A large number of stones can pump up the strongest skill of a monster, and Kajuro began to summon it. Having opened his red voice, Kajuro began to absorb all the remaining stones on the table, strengthening the skills of the red eye and allowing him to open a new ability. Having collected a sufficient number of stones, Kazuro was eager to test the capabilities of his half-monster. Having opened his eye, Kajuro became able to see through objects and walls. The power to notice the aura of monsters in dark places began to progress and turn into X-ray vision. It was very cool and useful. Now the guy will be able to see the enemy, no matter where he is hiding. Kazuro notices that if you look closely, you can see all the points of contact of power and the channels of the soul through which mana moves. This ability allows you to assess the enemy's strength reserve and the amount of strength for further battle. Kazuro was pleased with such improvements and rejoiced. Red Eye agreed with the guy and pointedly showed how strong and dangerous he was now. Such superior skills will not hide anything from the Red Eye when the enemy is in front of them. The ability to analyze the enemy's abilities speeds up the speed of action, and there is no need to wait and evaluate. You can now immediately attack knowing about the enemy's abilities using Red Eye skills. After some time, having had a snack and collected their things, the guys moved to the point they needed on the map, to the bank. They walked along a small path. There were only power lines and green hills around, hiding from the wind. The guys looked around and were always on the alert. Suddenly, some guys appeared in front of them in bandages and with many wounds. They ran and screamed in fear. Judging by the fatigue, this lasted quite a long time, and the guys were very exhausted. Kajuro pays attention and thinks that someone is following them. Running past, Kajuro manages to ask the guys why they were running like that and what happened. The guys, very tired, say that a crowd of monsters is chasing them, and they also need to run away. Kazuro, hearing that there was a whole crowd of monsters there, got a little scared and thought about it. Having decided to fight them, Kajuro and Fen ran towards the crowd of monsters with great pleasure. Fen took out his sharp blade and prepared for battle. When he saw that his comrades began to run towards the monsters, he got a little scared and asked to wait for him. Poe didn't want to be left alone in a dark and dangerous city, but he was also scared to fight a crowd of monsters. The fleeing guys noticed that the guys they met, running away from the monsters, ran in the wrong direction, but towards a crowd of scary monsters. He started shouting at them to come back and run in the other direction, otherwise they would die. Kazuro and Fen were in the mood for a worthy battle and ran towards the crowd of monsters with great pleasure. Once on the bridge, a crowd of monsters appeared in front of the guys, and they continued to run without stopping. The monsters were of a weak wound, but there were dozens of them, and with their mere scream they scared ordinary people but not our guys. Fen uses his shadow monster in front of Kazuro for the first time and orders him to fight. The monster looked like death with a large and sharp scythe that cut through the enemy like a knife through butter. Fen did not lag behind and acted like a ninja, attacking from above with his sharp sword. Their attacks were coordinated and honed to perfection. They acted together and covered each other. Such a monster was very strong and capable of standing up to a crowd of monsters alone. Fen, covering his monster with filigree precision, throws his sword at the head of the monster that was trying to attack the shadow from the back. Kazuro, trying to keep up with Fen and his monster, summons his chainsaw monster and a warrior in golden armor to fight. A monster with a chainsaw offers a bet to a warrior in golden armor on whoever kills the most monsters wins. The warrior in armor reacted to such a proposal only with a grin 
and simply said that we would check which of them was the more effective and capable warrior. Crowds of monsters moved towards our guys and did not feel any fear. The horde of mindless creatures only wanted to eat as many people as possible and did not pay Nina any attention. Their loud roar and aggressive attitude caused fear. Sharp teeth could tear flesh with one bite and no one wanted to get caught by something like that. Kazuro, skillfully wielding his powerful blade, scatters monsters to the right and to the left. He sees how many monsters there are and is happy that so many monster stones can be collected and sold on the black market, which may be enough to last him a long time as president. A warrior in golden armor and a monster with a chainsaw scatter small monsters with their moves and sharp weapons. There are only more monsters, and they keep coming and coming. The monster with the chainsaw takes notice of this and warns Kajuro to use a stronger attack and kill them faster. Kazuro, in the heat of a back-to-back -back battle with his monsters, hears the words of a monster with a chainsaw and wonders what to do. Remembering that one of the red-eye skills can kill a crowd of low-level monsters at once, he decides to use it. Kajuro begins to use the red-eye skill on the explosive ability of a group of low-rank monsters. He is overwhelmed with emotion and the desire to kill as many damned monsters as possible. The monsters approaching Kazuro begin to feel something strange inside themselves and stop, wondering. Something began to grow inside and increase the state of anxiety and pain. Kajuro, realizing what was about to happen, cheerfully showed his calmness and slight pleasure before seeing the result of improving his red eye. Kajuro snaps his fingers, thereby activating the ability. The monsters begin to fly into pieces, exploding and making large fireworks. Kazuro, seeing that he was able to defeat a large group of monsters with one ability at once, understands that it was not in vain that he improved the ability of the Red Eye to the maximum level. After such a battle, the guys stood in the middle of a bridge strewn with corpses and stones of monsters back to back. They defeated the crowd of monsters and were happy. The fat man stood behind with those guys who were running away from the monsters and were shocked to see such strong absorbers. There was a dead chaos on the street. Only the idling of the monster's chainsaw and the heavy breathing of everyone after the battle could be heard. Having finished the battle, the guys began to check their weapons and try to catch their breath. Poe and the three guys stood in shock that his comrades were capable of such a thing. The guys were shocked to see such strong students taking part in the university competition and realized that they had no chance. They saw such brutal killings of monsters without any hesitation or fear. These were real maniacs. Kajuro and Han looked like real serial killers, and they liked to kill. The guys were so scared, looking at such fearless warriors, that they didn't even notice that one of them was standing nearby and did not take part. They decided to ask Poe why he didn't help his comrades. Poe himself was scared, but decided to pretend that he was very strong in front of the guys, saying that such weak opponents were not worthy of fighting against him and looked ominously at the boys. The guys thought that such strong absorbers would clearly be able to defeat the main monster and began to applaud and thank Poe for helping them by ordering his comrades to deal with the monsters. They were so scared and impressed that they believed every word of the chubby. After talking with the frightened guys, Poe begins to run to Kajuro, experiencing pleasant feelings that he was praised and admired. Kazuro, collecting stones in his backpack, told Pio not to play the fool, but to help collect stones and to get out of here quickly. The guys who thought that Poe was in charge instantly realized that they had been deceived and that he was just a burden who clung to such dangerous absorbers in order to level up. They were slightly surprised, but quickly realized that they had fallen for an obvious scam. Meanwhile, in the tallest building in the center of the closed city, there was a strong fog, hiding many things from prying eyes. At the entrance to the building, there was a guard standing and monitoring the surroundings. The building looked undamaged by the absence of people and was completely intact. On the top floor, the main monster sat on his throne in the company of his two beautiful companions. A skeleton approached him and, kneeling on one knee, greeted the ruler. It was quite cozy around, and there was harmony and comfort, just like among people. The head was sitting on a soft sofa and sipping a delicious drink and enjoying the pleasant company of his beauties. 
he noticed that a servant had come and wanted to tell him something. The Lord was in a good mood, and he became curious about what the servant wanted to tell him. A servant, on his knees, came to report that the monsters who were sent to kill all the people who dared to enter the city of the Lord were killed by several absorbers. Also, several strong monsters disappeared from the theater stage. Apparently they were killed by absorbers, the servant added. The crowd of monsters standing in the room was a little scared that strong absorbers had appeared that were capable of killing a crowd of monsters without any difficulty. Some monsters were wondering what kind of absorbers were capable of doing this. One of the Lord's main servants, in an office suit and gold jewelry, offers to send strong monsters to capture those insolent people who dared to kill the master's slaves. His gaze was filled with the desire to fight with such absorbers and asked the master to send him on this task. Behind the monster in an office suit stood another monster with a large mustache and smoked a pipe. He looked rather modest, but his impressive body showed that he was no ordinary servant. He also wanted to evaluate the abilities of the absorbers and look at them. The Lord agreed to resort to stronger monsters, but for now he did not plan to send his main thugs and ask them to wait a little and still check those absorbers. The fact that they were able to defeat an army of weak monsters is not enough to fight such generals, the Lord said. After the battle, the guys already walked further through the ruined city, and looking at the frightening things around them, such as an old corpse suspended from the frame of a billboard, and ominous sounds coming from all the dark corners of the city. Kazuro was grateful that they were not far from the right place. Seeing the bank building, Kazuro told his comrades that they were almost there and would get there soon. Nada will hurry, as it will soon be dawn, and Nada will be looking for a way out of the city. Kajuro, seeing the bank in front of him, really hoped that there would be money or some kind of jewelry there to pay for the treatment of Hanami's mother. Suddenly the guys began to feel a slight trembling, followed by an explosion, and everything was covered in dust. The guys were a little scared and prepared for something unexpected. Poe said that it felt like someone had broken through the wall, and the guys, trying to see what was hidden by the thick layer of dust in the air, began to look closely. Kazuro begins to notice through a thick layer of dust using the red eye skill the silhouette of three large creatures with horns. They stood motionless and made angry sounds. Kajuro asked everyone to get ready and wait for the signal. The dust began to settle and three high-ranking evil buffalo monsters appeared in front of the guys. They were very fierce and ready to tear everyone to pieces. Kajuro began to sense their strong and evil aura. Realizing that they may not be able to cope with such monsters, Kazuro decides to come up with a plan. Fen also senses their strength and advises them to run away, otherwise they will die before they can do anything or even get to the bank. Such monsters have great strength and high speed, so they have little chance. The guys agreed with Fen and began to run away, trying to break away from the huge and ferocious buffalo monsters with bats. Poe was too fat and did not have good endurance or speed. They will quickly catch up with this one and eat him up, thought Kazuro. Kajuro ran as best he could and glanced at Poe. Poe was very frightened and ran crying a lot, realizing that he could not escape. He held on to his backpack, which he hung over his stomach. Kajuro decides to help Poe and save the fat man. Stopping quickly, he uses the red eye skill, which is capable of stopping any monster, but not for a very short time if the monster is strong. The skill makes you freeze in place and blocks all movements of anyone who falls under the effect of the red eye's power. The monsters began to feel very dizzy and stopped unable to move. They were strong enough and tried to break out of this ability of the boy's red eye. The monsters stopped, but when the guys ran out to the intersection, they noticed that everything was very bad. Poe only got more scared and doesn't know what to do. Kajuro, seeing so many strong monsters, was also scared. The guys were surrounded. There were various monsters around, blocking the path in all directions. Even on the houses, there were monsters with wings that could attack from above. The guys began to realize that they couldn't get out and would have to fight. Khan, realizing that they were trapped, decides to use a very strong skill and tells the guys to come closer and stay close to him. Kajuro, feeling a little fear, looked around when he heard Han's words and agreed in surprise. Khan. 
touching the ground, begins to call upon the most powerful ability of his monster, forming a huge shadow around himself, which only increased and spread across the entire earth for tens of meters. Poe and Kazuro stood wondering how this would help them and watched what was happening. A huge dark shadow begins to grow and absorb everything that comes under its influence. The monsters around do not have time to notice how a huge, dark entity has appeared under their feet, blocking their movements. The shadow spread tens of meters across the entire intersection, blocking everything that came under its influence. Each of the monsters felt that they could not move and escape from the cursed black substance. While the monsters could not move, Khan said that they had to run, otherwise such power would not be enough for long and the monsters would run after them. The guys rushed towards the bank as fast as they could without looking back and stopping. He ran gasping for breath and begged himself not to fall exhausted and die. Kazuro ran past the monsters and noticed that they really couldn't get out and move their legs from the shadow of the monster Han. Such an ability was very powerful and strong against so many monsters. Poe began to sweat and out of fear tried to run as long and as quickly as possible. He prayed all the way and really wanted to survive, running down the street. Houses and trees rushed around, but Poe, not paying attention, simply ran as best he could. The guys were almost there and the main entrance to the bank appeared in front of them. The guys began to run inside and hoped that the monsters didn't see where they went and lost track of them. Having entered the middle of the bank, the guys collapsed and tried to catch their breath. They had never run so fast before. Poe fell to the floor from fatigue and couldn't catch his breath, throwing off his backpack and throwing it next to him. Kajuro, leaning on his feet, also tried to catch his breath and hoped that the monsters did not have time to see them. After several minutes of trying to come to his senses and catch his breath, an old acquaintance, Kazuro, comes out of the corridor. He went out to check what the noise was at the entrance to the bank and who might have entered them. Seeing Kazuro, the boy was surprised and froze in place. They looked at each other and were not happy that they had to meet. The bespectacled boy remembered how Kajuro set him up in the exam before entering the university and was very angry with the boy. Kazuro remembered the arrogant bespectacled man who bullied him and his friends at school. The bespectacled boy began to ask how such a poor and weak absorber decided to take part in a competition between universities. Kajuro said he was lucky because he had strong teammates to help him. Poe wanted to say that Kazuro was the strongest student at the university. But Kazuro interrupted Poe's indignation and covered his mouth so as not to reveal all his plans. Kazuro asked why the bespectacled man was sitting in a bank and not looking for monsters to defeat. And why was he alone? Suddenly, three guys with very serious faces and extremely unfriendly attitude towards uninvited guests emerged from the shadows of the corridor. One of them was dressed extremely provocatively with a huge chain around his neck and glasses. The other one had a scar on his face, and their leader was just a jerk and said he didn't like anyone coming into his building without asking. The bespectacled boy, without waiting for a command from his group commander, decides to teach the uninvited guests a lesson himself, and, insulting Kajuro, offers to fight for a place in the bank. Kazuro, having heard such a proposal, decided to agree and clarified whether the bespectacled man really wanted this. The bespectacled boy reacts indignantly to such arrogant and arrogant words from Kazuro. He rolls up his sleeve and shows that with two mid-rank monsters, he can handle an upstart like Kajuro. Kajuro, without showing emotion, calmly rolls up his sleeve, exposing his hand, on which the bespectacled man sees many signs of high-ranking monsters and is very frightened that his eyes are already popping out of their sockets. After what he saw, the bespectacled man became very tense and began to regret that he agreed to the duel. The bespectacled boy, seeing so many monster marks on Kazuro's hand, couldn't believe his eyes and began to assume that he was a swindler and was deceiving everyone that he had so many monsters. Kazuro, not paying attention to the bespectacled man's words, decided to go further along the corridor and find the safe where the money was kept. The leader of their group was not happy to see strangers and decides not to let Kajuro through saying that he is a nobody and he has no business coming here. They were the first to occupy this building, and if they want to stay here, they will have to fight.
Kazuro and Han agree to a duel and with great pleasure teach the arrogant students of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University a lesson. While the guys were getting ready to fight, a red eye suddenly pops out and begins to tell Kajuro that something is wrong here. He feels the approach of a very large and strong mana from the street. Red Eye sensed that very strong monsters were approaching the bank building very quickly, and among them was a monster of the highest level. It was a horde of high-level vampires with their leader, a monster with a pipe and a beard. A very powerful magic wafted from him, and a battle with so many strong monsters would not be easy, and he would have to retreat. Kazuro, realizing that it will soon be very difficult, decides to retreat without attracting attention and leave leaving the bank to those students. Po and Han were surprised and did not understand why Kajuro suddenly changed his mind and refused to fight. Three strong students of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University were surprised, but agreed to let the guys leave without a fight, feeling their superiority over the arrogant guys of the Fu Fel University. The bespectacled boy did not miss a moment to gloat over the upstart Kazuro and show his guesses about the rogue Kazuro and his unfair battles. Going out into the street, Kazuro hurried the guys and told Po to urgently summon the garbage can monster. A crowd of strong monsters were approaching here and they couldn't handle it, so he took the guys away from the bank. Po, hearing without any questions that strong monsters are coming here, begins to summon his trash can monster. Kajuro asks Po to hurry up and sit very quietly. The boys began to climb into the trash can and hoped that the monsters would not be able to find them, due to the aura of the trash can monster, which hides it with its smell and abilities. Sitting in a trash can, the guys saw a crowd of monsters passing nearby and tried to be quiet. Afraid of giving themselves away, the guys began to sweat a little. Meanwhile, at the bank, the guys heard that there were a lot of monsters near the entrance, and the guys got a little scared. They began to prepare for battle and turned their backs to each other. A healthy man with a beard and a smoking pipe walked into the bank. Without looking up at the guys, he sensed their weak aura and was not worried about fighting against them. The head of the group of students orders everyone to summon their monsters to fight. They began to suspect that the bearded man was very strong if he controlled an army of monsters of strong rank. Kazuro, using the red eye skill, became able to see through walls and observed the battle of the students of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers. Po got worried and started asking if they had a chance. Kazuro and Han were a little surprised that Po decided to worry about their enemies and thought that the boy was too soft on battles between absorbers. Po replied that they had misunderstood. He just wanted those students to be able to kill as many monsters as possible so that we could enter the bank and finish off the remaining and weakened ones, and then take the money from the vault. Meanwhile, four students fought with strong monsters and were able to kill several, but their strength was already running out. Kazuro looked at what was happening and told the guys that those students were not so weak and were able to kill several monsters. Having received several severe wounds, the guys were very tired and understood that if they continued the battle, they would definitely not survive. The leader of the group invites the monster with the cigar to let them go and they will do whatever he wants. The monster with the cigar, exhaling smoke and smiling, replies that they can only go to the world of the dead and begins to use his powerful magic of the highest level. Huge crosses began to form from the smoke to which four students were chained by the smoke. They could not move and were trapped. The bespectacled boy was more frightened than anyone else and felt a very strong fear. A huge bloody whip began to inflict mortal wounds on the guys. They experienced severe pain and screamed, realizing that this was the end. They could not resist such magical forces. The smoke began to clear and bodies fell to the ground. The bespectacled boy and his friend were lying on the floor with severe wounds. Some were already dead. The rest took their last breaths. The leader of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University student group was already dead with his comrade with a large chain around his neck and glasses on his face. A monster with a beard and a smoking cigarette stood sneering at his weak opponents and was upset that he didn't get to have enough fun. Kazuro, seeing that all the students were dead and had not killed many monsters, made the guy a little surprised that even such trained students of the strongest university, Mao Chi Supreme Devourers, were killed without any problems by that bearded monster. Han, 
Listening to what Kazuro was commenting on while watching the duel between those guys and a crowd of monsters, notices that none of them owned weapons and could only fight with their monsters. Kajuro thought about it, because Han was right. Having their powerful sword and defense skills, and Khan has masterful sword skills, then they have a better chance of killing that group of remaining monsters and fighting the bearded one. Without thinking for long, Kazuro agrees with Hanam to attack the monsters using not only the monsters, but also fight themselves. The guys jumped out of the trash and decided to go to the bank. Poe, sticking his head out of the tank, suggested not to interfere in their battle and stay in the tank so that the guys would not worry about him. Han and Kajuro paid attention and, knowing that the software was weak, agreed. The bearded monster with a cigar felt a strong aura of the absorbers, who were not far away. The trash can hid their power so well that even such a monster could not sense them. Turning around after the fight, he looked towards the exit and told his monsters that a couple of tasty people who longed for death were waiting for them on the street. The monsters, licking their lips, did not make their master wait long and rushed out into the street. Having flown out of the door, the vampires, using their speed, began to approach the guys very quickly and with a great desire to kill them. Kajuro and Han were ready for the fight and waited for the approach. Khan fought his shadow monster back to back, killing the vampires with his bladed weapons and strong fighting skills. Khan masterfully wielded his sword and did not let the vampires even touch him. Kazuro, armed with his mighty blade and summoning all his monsters to fight, gave the command to them to fight and not let them kill him. The monster girls were very aggressive in the fight and were preparing to use their stun skills. The warrior in golden armor began to hold his naginata at the ready, and the monster with a chainsaw started his saw and attacked the vampires with a terrifying roar of the engine. The battle began, and all the monsters entered the fray using their fighting skills and magical abilities. The girls stunned the enemy, and the warriors finished them off and thereby gave them a chance to win. Kajuro, keeping up with his monsters, attacked the two vampires with his powerful blade and caused severe injuries and broke the monster's defenses. He did not give a chance to approach him, and was clearly stronger than them in strength. Having managed to help Kazuro in time, the busty beauty using her zither inflicts stun on the vampires, preventing them from moving and thinking normally. The chainsaw monster uses its ability to spin the saw and cut everything into small pieces at high speed, leaving no chance for the enemy. There were fewer and fewer vampires left and those in the sky no longer knew what to use and how to fight such strong absorbers. They tried almost all their abilities and understood that they could not let their master down and lose. But there was one more way, and the vampires began to spin into a bloody whirlwind using their blood magic abilities. Bloody tornadoes began to appear in the sky, sucking everything into themselves and throwing them very far away. Against the backdrop of dawn, it looked very scary. Kazuro and Han were surrounded by bloody tornadoes and did not know what to do. Strong magic could simply suck them in and kill them, leaving the tornado without air inside. Suddenly, Poe appears behind the guys with a trash can in his hands and shouts at them to get ready to jump inside. The tank monster, seeing the impending disaster, was scared and did not know whether he could cope. Poe throws a trash can on their heads to cover them, and he runs to get there in time. The huge tornadoes were getting closer and closer to the guys, and there was less and less time left. Having opened in the air, the trash can began to fall, covering the guys with itself and Poe in a very spectacular way, tries to get under the can and escape from the bloody tornadoes. Tornadoes began to hit the tank, beating it with various debris that had been sucked into it, but they couldn't lift the tank. The ability of a trash can can increase or decrease its weight depending on the situation, and can withstand heavy loads. Poe, smiling, says that they are safe for now and will be able to wait out the attack. Bloody whirlwinds hit the tank mercilessly and gradually began to disappear. Kajuro was surprised by the Baka's ability and asked Poe how long does such strong protection from the enemy's magical actions last. Poe replied that it wouldn't take long at all. About 10 seconds, they were completely safe. Khan draws attention to such a short period of validity and asks, what will happen when the protection ends? Showing your concern. Suddenly, after the bloody tornado stops, one of the vampires breaks into the tank and greatly scares the guys, 
taking them by surprise. Khan, quickly getting his bearings, grabs his sword and pierces the head of the vampire with it, who dared to scare them so much and pierce the garbage can monster. Without pity or respect for the monster, Khan kills him. After receiving the wound, the garbage can monster was forced to return back to Poe and recover. The guys found themselves on the ground surrounded by other vampires and understood that the battle was not over yet. Considering that it is too dangerous for Poe to remain among such monsters and he will not be able to do anything, the guys offer him to run away, and they will distract the attention of the vampires and fight. Kazuro and Han, standing with their backs to each other, fight with all their might and do not give the vampires a chance to inflict any damage on them. The guys' sharp blades are capable of cutting through monsters like paper. After such a fight, all the monsters were dead and chopped into pieces. Kazuro and Han stood a little tired and tried to catch their breath, looking around to see if there were any more enemies willing to fight. The bearded monster with the pipe felt that these two were much stronger than those four weaklings from the bank building, and decided to see if they could amuse him with a worthy battle and opposition to his magic. He inhales smoke from the pipe and releases it, forming a huge cloud of smoke. His ability was dangerous and hid everything that fell into the smoke. Kazuro and Han, seeing how they were enveloped in a thick smog of tobacco smoke, began to cough and try to collect themselves and not allow themselves to be attacked from their blind spots. Kazuro covered his mouth with one hand, trying to breathe, and was ready, looking in all directions. Khan stood behind and carefully tried to sense the enemy presence and act proactively. Kajuro begins to sense the enemy's presence using his red eye and tries to quickly turn around and attack the enemy. His confident actions were fueled by his phantom swordsman abilities and red eye skill, preventing his opponent from catching him by surprise. The bearded monster gets hit with a sword and is very surprised that the guy could see him in such a thick fog of cigarette smoke. He doesn't understand how this is possible. Kajuro looked at the bearded monster and showed his disgust for smokers. His eye glowed red, and the monster realized that this was the ability of one of the monsters, and all attempts to attack from an unexpected direction would be stopped. In an attempt to finish off the bearded monster, Kajuro holds out his sword, but the monster quickly disappears in a thick cloud of smoke. The guys continued to stand and control the approach of the enemy. Suddenly, the monster appears from above and tries to pierce Han's neck with his pipe, realizing that it is too early for him to interfere with Kazuro and tries to leave him alone. But Khan manages to dodge the attack of a bearded monster with a pipe using his fighting skills. The monster was very surprised here, too, because all his attacks were even and did not cause damage to the guys. After dodging, Khan delivers a strong blow to the bearded monster's neck, and he begins to fall. His eyes showed great surprise and fear that he might lose to some students and even inexperienced absorbers. From the wound he received, the bearded monster, barely able to stay on his feet, tries to get away and heal his wound by resorting to magic. Khan, having dealt damage, tries not to lose sight of the enemy and monitors his movements. The monster was very surprised that the other guy was able to dodge hidden attacks and realized that he had underestimated the enemy and was in vain to attack mindlessly. Khan looked at the bearded monster, and using his sense of detecting mana, he could easily see the enemy without even making visual contact. Now the smoke began to clear, and Kajuro and Han prepared to fight, and looked at the bearded smoker with contempt, and looked quite dangerous. The bearded monster with a cigar gets a little scared, and decides to try to retreat. Having received several minor injuries, the bearded monster, pointing his finger at the guys, was extremely annoyed that they dared to come to his city and kill his monsters. A cloud of smoke begins to form under the feet of the bearded monster, and the monster, holding his wounded neck, tries to threaten the guys that a crowd of monsters will soon come to them and kill them. Rising into the sky, he no longer worried, because here he was out of reach of the enemy and calmly watched the guys, showing his superiority over them. Kazuro and Han watched the monster, and realized that he could really go for help, and then they would definitely not be able to cope with a large number of monsters. Nada had to do something, but at such a height, none of the attacks would have reached her. Kajuro remembers his newly upgraded red eye skill, and decides to attack the bearded monster with the explosive tag of the red eye ability. 
The bearded monster notices that a symbol appears on his hand and begins to blink strongly. This confuses him and leaves him bewildered. His hand explodes, flying to the side, and the monster spitting out his pipe begins to scream in pain and understands that he must leave here. Experiencing hellish pain, the bearded monster will no longer be able to heal the wound and will forever lose his arm. The pain was severe, and the only thought in my head was to quickly get to the head of the monsters of this city and tell him about what happened. In the meantime, the guys did not stand idle, but decided to return to the bank and, while they had time, try to find the vault and check if there was money there. Having found the vault, the guys stood and watched as a monster with a chainsaw tried to cut the hinges with its saw and open the armored door. Everyone was excited and didn't know what to expect. The hinges were cut off and the door began to fall from its weight, raising a cloud of dust. The monster with the chainsaw stood and turned off his saw. The room was dark and it was hard to see where anything was. But in one corner one could see a huge stack of money stacked on top of each other, and nearby were gold bars. These riches have been untouched for so many years, since no one managed to get here due to the large number of monsters in the area. The guys' faces were filled with happiness, and a lot of thoughts about what to spend such huge money on. Khan was already dreaming of how he could buy himself a huge stone from the strongest monster and absorb its powers, becoming much stronger. Poe dreamed of tasting the most delicious dishes from all over the world. The guys hugged a bunch of money and were blinded by happiness. Now they had to deliver such a lot of money home and divide it among themselves. Kajuro was happy because there was enough money to pay for Hanami's mother's treatment and even for a long and happy life. Calling for a trash can, he opened the lid and began to throw all the money and gold that they found in the bank into it, rejoicing and dancing a little with happiness. The trash can looked at the happy guys and was a little perplexed. Meanwhile, a bearded monster with a pipe arrived at the house of the head of the city and holding his severed hand, tried to run and tell the ruler about what had happened. A monster in an office suit and gold jewelry was already standing there, discussing the further development of their city. Having lost enough strength and blood, the bearded monster falls to the floor in front of the ruler, emitting sounds of pain and weakness. The lord and the monster in the suit were surprised, and they were very interested in what happened to one of the leaders of the army of the lord of the city. The bearded monster, holding his hand, said that he came across two guys who were very strong and had strong fighting skills. They were capable of killing a monster like me, the bearded man said. The monster in the suit, smiling about the failure of his comrade, decides to try to stop and finish off those two guys himself. The lord listened sipped a glass of wine on his sofa, and wondered how his general could lose the battle to some two brats who had not even seen life yet. Having listened to the proposal of the monster in a suit and gold jewelry about the desire to deal with those boys himself, the ruler agrees and asks him not to make such stupid mistakes as his comrade. While our guys were filling the trash can with money and gold bars, smiling and having fun, not thinking about what awaited them outside the walls of the bank, Various noises began to appear on the street and increased with every second. While Kazuro and Han were condemning their assumptions about what to spend money on as more important and priority, Poe notices that it became somehow noisy on the street, and he began to take a closer look. Having seen in the window that there were a lot of monsters on the street in front of the entrance, he begins to tell the guys to stop arguing and look at what awaits them behind the doors. The whole street was littered with different monsters, and it was very dangerous to go out. The guys began to take a closer look and saw that they had no chance if they decided to take a break. Kazuro and the guys stood in the lobby of the bank and saw how a huge crowd of monsters simply walked in front of the entrance, but did not enter. They began to suspect that this was the work of that bearded monster who fled after the battle. Poe was so scared that he thought he would have to spend the rest of his life in a jar without food or water. He was scared and he felt sorry that instead of escaping from the city, they decided to rob a bank and fell into a trap. Kajuro began to calm down. Poe and an interesting thought appeared in his head. They can escape without attracting attention only if the monsters do not see them. That is, if they are inside the monster. Poe immediately understood and summoned the garbage can monster. 
telling him that they must climb into it and go through the huge army of hungry and angry monsters that were waiting for them on the street. Having opened the lid of the tank, the guys took turns climbing inside, simultaneously trying not to damage the money that they so badly wanted to get. Only the monster with the trash can try to leave the bank, trying not to attract attention. How two monsters stop him, not allowing him to pass. The trash can monster was a little scared and tried to behave naturally for a monster. The scarred dead man's monster asks the trash can why he never saw him in their overlord army. The guys inside tried to sit quietly and not make any sounds. Kajuro, realizing that the trash can is starting to get stupid, tries to give him advice and tell him that he was transferred from another army. The monster follows the words of the trash can and no longer blocks the path. The trash can is still standing and smiling awkwardly, trying not to give himself away. Suddenly, the comrade of the monster with the skull who stopped the garbage can begins to get angry and say that he is fed up with everything and wants to eat normal human meat. The monster with the skull, listening to the complaints of his comrade, decides to throw the skull of the corpse into the trash can. He still has a few human habits left. Having opened the tank, he begins to smell a strong smell of people. The trash can's ability to hide the power within itself was disrupted by the discovery, and all the monsters could smell a person nearby. The monster begins to shout at the trash can with the words where the human smell comes from and begins to attract attention to itself. The trash can monster begins to get very worried and says that he recently ate a person and maybe the smell is left from him. The monster does not believe that such a monster could kill a person and suspects that he is being deceived. Suddenly a hand comes out of the trash can and grabs the monster by the neck. The monster was very surprised and did not have time to say or do anything. Kazuro grabs the monster by the neck and pushes it into a trash can and prevents them from being given away among the crowd of monsters. The garbage can monster himself did not expect that a monster would be thrown into it and was a little scared. Grabbing the monster and preventing it from moving, Khan delivers a precise blow and cuts off the monster's head. Having gotten rid of the monster, the guys began to bide their time so that no one else would suspect their monster. Meanwhile, in the neighboring area, the game of dice was in full swing. A talented and cunning player very often won and left no chance for his opponent. It was a monster in an office suit and gold jewelry. His strength was gambling, and he played the game of dice for a living. His addiction from his past life made him a very strong and capable monster. The guys who played with the monster for a living understood that they could not kill such a powerful monster. Their group leader decided to play and could not win. He is very frightened, since now he must die and understands this. The teammates, without having time to understand anything, see how their comrade's head explodes and fills everything with blood. They stood in horror and did not know what to do or how to escape. The monster in the suit started screaming for the other guy to play with him for his life too. They played on the hood of an old car near an office building. The guy refuses to play, explaining that he doesn't like gambling. Crying heavily and begging to let them go, the guy gradually begins to move backwards. The gambling monster did not appreciate the guy's answer and mercilessly threw the dice at the boy's head, smiling angrily. His head also shattered and only one frightened girl remained. She, crying, tried to beg the monster to let her go because she did not want to die. The monster says that there is only one way to leave, and that is to play. When rolling the dice, the girl had one point less than the monster with the gold jewelry. She realized that it was all over and, trying to survive, still begged the monster to let her go. The monster mercilessly throws a dice into the girl's throat and thereby kills her. She, feeling severe pain, cried one last time and began to fall. A monster in a suit with a large golden chain ridicules such weak absorbers who could not even fight him, but immediately tried to beg for their miserable life through a game in which he has no equal. After killing the entire group of students, the monster in the suit begins to walk away smiling contentedly. Now he was heading towards the bank, where his fellow bearded monster was beaten by two pathetic scavengers. Meanwhile, other monsters were wandering around the trash can and trying to figure out where that human smell came from. They were dumb and didn't bother other monsters. The guys opened the lid to the permissible height and watched, waiting for the opportunity to leave the dangerous area. Khan began to panic and think that they would not be able to leave. There were too many monsters around and they would have to sit here for too long. 
Kajuro notices the intense apprehension on Han's face. His trembling voice was full of disappointment, and Kajuro began to try to calm his comrade. While the guys sat in the garbage can monster and tried to calm down from fear, loud and terrifying laughter was heard on the street. Crocodile leather shoes with gold accents pointed towards the tank. While the guys tried to calm down and behave quietly, without giving away their presence, a monster in a suit and gold jewelry approached the trash can and opened the lid, greeting the guys. Seeing that they had been discovered, the guys prepared to attack, but the monster said that he was not going to kill them and asked them to leave. A monster in a suit, smiling slyly, offers to play dice with the guys. As a reward for victory, he will let them go and will not kill them. Having laid out his sets of dice, he smiled and offered to choose the one who would be the first to want to play with him. He knew that the guys had no chance, since he had never lost. Without showing his fear, Kajuro clarifies what the rules are in his game and what will happen if they lose. A monster in a suit and gold jewelry shows his skill and invincibility in the game of dice, and some boy is no match for him. Kajuro behaved very defiantly, and his comrades were frightened by such actions. They sensed the strong aura of the monster in the suit and began to worry. Kajuro agreed to willingly play with the monster. The monster in the suit was pleased and rejoiced that without much effort, he could kill the arrogant boys who dared to tear off his comrade's hand. Kazuro and the monster each took a bowl of dice and began shaking them, wanting to knock out the highest number possible. Kajuro was cunning and did not agree to lose so easily. A monster with a very cunning face prepared to lay out his stones. It was a very dangerous and insidious monster. Kazuro felt that he couldn't win honestly and decided to come up with something. The bones of the monster in the suit were laid out on the table. The number was the maximum possible. This combination of numbers was very suspicious, and Kajuro sensed it. Han and Po, seeing that the monster had the maximum number, were very frightened and understood that even if Kazuro knocked out the same number, they would still lose. The monster began to tell the boy to roll the dice and find out the result. Kazuro continued to shuffle the dice and tell the monster that he still didn't lose because he didn't throw the dice, which means he had to wait. Kajuro wasn't going to roll the dice until he was sure he could distract the monster's attention and roll the number he wanted. The monster was already very angry and felt that the boy was only stalling for time and was not going to roll the dice. Kazuro, realizing that the time has come, decides to roll the dice. Having thrown the bones onto the ground, Everyone began to look with a surprised face at what fell on Kazuro's bones. After such anger, the monster saw that the boy finally threw stones and also decides to see what the guy got. Everyone was surprised and even shocked that one of the bones was broken in half. The number rolled is one higher than that of the monster in the suit. The monster in the suit, seeing that the guy had a higher number, fell into depression and kneeling down began to scream from failure. Kajuro smiling that he was able to defeat the monster in his favorite game and taking advantage of the opportunity and giving his word that he would let them go. Kazuro told his comrades to hurry up and get out of here before the monster came to its senses. Khan, unable to bear the misunderstanding, decides to ask Kajuro how it happened with the stones. Kazuro explained as they walked that by using his red eye skills, he could always see which stones were falling out and using a magic blade he would quietly cut the bone in half. The guys, hearing how Kajuro had unleashed that strong monster, began to laugh and run away. The background was dark streets and old cracked houses. After walking around the old town for a short time, Kajuro decides to look at the map and see which way the exit from the city is. The guys notice a huge monster in a swimsuit rushing towards them. Behind him was a bull monster in a suit who was also chasing them. The boys wasted no time jumping into the trash can monster. A monster in a swimsuit hits a trash can monster at great speed, which flies off a huge distance. After a strong impact, the garbage can begins to fall down the slope of the street, rolling along the road. The guys inside were also annoyed by this situation. After so many somersaults and hits against the walls of the tank, Poe begins to feel sick, and he screams that he is going to throw up. Khan tries his best to hold on, and also begins to feel bad. The slope of the street was very long, and the guys only got worse. 
The monster in the swimsuit was breathing heavily and angrily as he watched the trash can roll down. Meanwhile, something strange was happening in the dark underground parking lot, and strange sounds were coming from there. The doll monster, with the help of its magic, looked quite dangerous and, controlling the abilities of others, took itself by the throat. The monsters, under the influence of the doll's abilities, began to beat each other, unable to resist such strong body control magic. Yui, controlling her doll monster with control skills, easily killed two high-level monsters. After killing the monsters, Yui absorbed her monster doll back. She killed monsters, but felt little pity for her actions. After the death of the two monsters, the rest of the group runs up to Yui, happy that she protected them from such powerful monsters. Unexpectedly for them, a garbage can monster flies into the parking lot and crashes into a pole. Everyone was surprised and a little frightened by the unexpected appearance of the monster. Kajuro and his friends climbed out of the open trash can. Money and gold bars also spilled out of the tank. Yui and the other students stood surprised that they were still alive. Some of Yuya's group, seeing that the boys were with a lot of money, offered to kill them and take the loot for themselves. The guys began to come to their senses and, having recovered, noticed that they had fallen into an underground parking lot and Yui and other students were standing in front of them. Kajuro felt bad, and wiping his mouth, began to raise his eyes. Kazuro notices that these are the same guys who attacked him in a dark alley after the fight with Suyuki's brother Fen. These scum were mercenaries and students of the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University. The guy with glasses suggests attacking and not hesitating. Yui stops them, saying that this is not the right time and it is not worth making a fuss and fighting just yet. There are still too many monsters around. Kazuro, having recovered from the strong shakes and impacts of the garbage can, notices that there were a lot of stones around, and this interested him greatly. Kazuro and the guys started collecting stones and were glad that they had the opportunity to improve their skills. Yui approached them and began to say that these were their stones and they should not take them. Kazuro saw Yui. He was very unhappy and angry. He will never forgive her family for hurting the Hanami family. Kajuro said that he would never follow or listen to her, and he was not interested in her opinion. Yui, having once again heard insults directed at herself, was very angry, but was going to do nothing with Kajuro. Her friends, hearing the guy's words, decide to cheer up their friend Yui and take her away, saying that he is not worthy to help them. Turning around, she agrees not to accept them into her group and leaves in disappointment. The friends and Suyuki, looking back at Kajuro's bad deeds, leave. The blonde leader of the mercenaries who attacked Kazuro only grinned and showed his contempt for Kazuro and hoped that he would die in agony. Kajuro, showing complete disrespect and remembering that he tried to kill him, showed his middle finger and stuck out his tongue. Yui and her comrades decided to leave the dungeon and go outside to find a way out of the old city. When they went outside, they stopped and were very scared. Feeling a strong smell and a burning sensation in the eyes from tear gas, they were very frightened by what they saw. Yui closed her nose and squinted her eyes and froze at the difficult situation. In front of them stood a huge pile of strong monsters with their leaders of the strongest rank. One of the generals had the ability to make explosives and playing with his dynamite sticks was preparing to throw them into the crowd. Yui realizing that the enemy is outnumbered and everyone's power level is too high to fight. She asks everyone to run as quickly as possible. Trying to break away from the crowd of monsters, Yui jumps out from around the corner at high speed, trying to control the others so that they do not lag behind. All the guys are very scared and try to keep up with Yui. Yui stops realizing that they cannot escape, and understands that they must give battle to the enemy. The guys behind were very scared and did not believe that they could defeat so many monsters. Yui begins to summon her monster doll, hoping to defeat her enemies and give her the opportunity to break away from the pursuit. The guys understand that they really have no choice and will go on to fight. The guys begin to summon their monsters to fight. A monster with dynamite sticks decides to attack the kids and not give them the opportunity to escape. The monster laughed evilly and mocked the weak people, saying that they could not cope with him. From the explosives, the guys were scattered on both sides of the street. From strong explosions and loud screams, the guys could be heard quite far away. 
The guys were shrouded in smoke and did not see the enemy in the thick smoke. Another monster also wanted to take part in the fight and jumps into the fog with great pleasure. A blonde guy found himself in dense and thick smoke that someone was watching him and began to suspect that someone wanted to attack him. The blonde guy instructs his monster to check who is behind him and attack him. This is a very serious situation and the fight will be difficult. It was a guy with glasses. He was very scared and shouted to the fair-haired guy that this was his friend, don't attack him with a monster. The blonde man relaxed a little and looked back, where he saw the same guy with glasses who was lying on the ground from his injuries. It was a fatal mistake and the blonde guy realizes that it was a monster in the guise of his friend. But he realizes this too late, and the monster tears out his heart with his bare hands. His body falls lifelessly to the ground with a large hole in his body. At that moment, Kajuro and his comrades heard loud explosions and came out to see what was happening. Kazuro sees that Yuya's group is fighting monsters and has already lost several guys. Kajuro watches with great surprise as those guys fight very strong monsters. Khan is also surprised and offers to help them or retreat. One of the guys notices that his friend was killed by a monster with the ability to change his appearance and everyone needs to be careful. Some guys heard that there is a monster that can copy their appearance and began to suspect each other. The monster, seeing that there is discord in the team, decides to act. Throwing a saber at the quarreling guys, there was an explosion. Several guys were killed and blown apart by the explosion of the monster's explosive checker. Upon seeing a strong explosion, he begins to suggest that something should be done, or those guys will not survive. Kajuro thought about it, but understood that everyone in that group wanted him dead. Kajuro notices that there was a strong aura behind them, and he notices that there is a monster behind them that has been watching them all this time. This was a girl of the highest level. Her robe resembled eggshells, but was made of ice. The girl herself exuded a strong aura of water magic. She notices that the boys have noticed her and are preparing to do something. The girl doubted the strength of those guys and looked down on them. Kajuro and the guys decide to attack the monster's girl, not allowing him to take them by surprise. Khan prepared his blade and ran with the desire to kill the ice monster. Khan, using shadow magic, summons his monster with a scythe. He ran with a confident face and a willingness to win and show his strength to be able to face a monster of this level. The ice monster decides to use its ice breath and stop the guys. Kajuro, using the skills of his red eye, manages to dodge and jump away. Han and Poe did not have time and fell into the trap of the ice monster. Han and Poe are trapped in ice and are trying to get out and pry their feet off the ice. Poe began to get very worried and try with all his might to escape, wanting to survive and not die in this abandoned city. Kajuro, jumping back, realizes that his comrades are trapped, and he urgently needs to stop this monster and prevent him from killing them. Kajuro decides to use the red-eye skill and slow down the ice monster for a while. The ability could affect such a strong monster for a very short time, but this would be enough to strike. The ice monster, feeling the strong influence of the red-eye, tries to resist. She was very strong and capable of blocking attacks from weaker monsters. Kajuro, without hesitation, tries to hit the ice monster while it was under the influence of the red-eye skill. Kajuro swung his magic sword. A strong blow should have caused large wounds to the ice monster and stopped it. Kajuro hoped that he could stop the monster. The strong blow left no trace on the ice monster's body. Kazuro realized that he needed to change the strategy and, probably thanks to his ice armor, the blow did not go through. Kajuro decides to use the explosive gaze skill and see if it works on her. If this does not work, then there will be little chance of salvation. The monster notices how a magical seal begins to form on her body and blink violently. She was afraid that this ability was strong and did not have time to react to it. The explosion threw the ice monster aside and hit the wall. The monster was stronger than that bearded man and did not receive colossal injuries. After hitting the wall hard, she held her stomach and was in severe pain. It was the first time she had experienced the pain of fighting a human. While the ice monster was trying to recover from such an attack, Kajuro decided to take advantage of the moment and call on his monsters to help the guys get out. A monster with a chainsaw and a warrior in golden armor tried to pull out Han and Po using their weapons. The warrior in golden armor was not happy that he was called to save people and not fight a monster. Kazuro told his comrades to get ready and quickly get out of here. 
Kazuro understood that they would hardly be able to cope against such strong monsters. While the guys were running, Kazuro felt someone grab his left leg. He got a little scared and thought it was a monster. Turning around, Kazuro sees how the monsters grabbed the legs of some girl and began to eat them. High-rank monsters are quite dangerous, but they haven't paid attention to the guys yet. It was a girl from Yui's group, and experiencing terrible pain from eating her legs, she begged Kajuro to help her and save her. Kazuro saw that the girl had very little chance, and from the injuries she had received, she would not last long. Making a very difficult decision, Kazuro refuses to be saved. Kajuro gets out of the girl's hand and continues to run. The girl screams in despair and begs for help after the guys, trying to ignore the screams of the dying students. Kajuro and his comrades began to run as fast as they could and get as far away from this area as possible. Yui shouts to the others that they should run away too and turns around. She sees her comrades being killed by monsters right before her eyes. One of the guys is punched by a monster with horns and impaled on the horns. Yui and Suyuki, seeing their comrades being killed, decide to quickly run away, shouting to the others who survived to follow them. Meanwhile, Kajuro and his comrades ran as fast as they could, trying to escape and find a way out of the abandoned city. Kajuro notices that Poe is running too fast and it's not like him. Just recently, he couldn't run at all, but here it is. Kajuro hesitates and decides to say that his phone broke when they fell and he no longer has Sarah's number. Poe, running, said that he did not have time for this now. Khan also realized this and, using his blade, strikes the monster in the form. Then they stop. Kazuro and Han, taking a fighting stance, began to ask who he is and where is the real Poe. Poe's mask begins to peel off and the face of a real monster appears underneath it. There was blood coming from his neck and he didn't understand how the guys were able to figure him out so quickly. Kajuro, taking out his magic blade, stood opposite the monster and Khan walked around from behind and did not want to give the monster a chance to escape. Khan, standing behind the monster, threatening with his sharp sword and asking where the real Poe is. Kajuro was also interested in this, and he was waiting for an answer. The monster was not scared and smiled slyly and clapped his hands. His face showed a strong interest in the further battle and noticed that the boys were not as simple as they seemed at first glance. After clapping his hands, the monster disappears and puts Kazuro and Han into a state of surprise, and observing the remnants of magical power, they do not understand where it went. Khan felt that a monster had appeared behind him, and using his shadow abilities began to dodge the attack. The monster hits the shadow with its hand, but the boy Khan dodged to the side. The shadow began to grab the monster with its hands and prevent it from escaping. The shadow, blocking the monster's hands in itself, decides to swing its huge and sharp scythe and use a powerful blow on the monster. The blow was very strong, and the monster, with the ability to transform into people using a mask, flies to the side, receiving severe injuries. The monster with the masks fell to the ground, holding onto the large wound that left him a shadow with its sickle blow. The monster was at a loss and understood that he could not cope with them. Kajuro and Han with their monster stood and looked at the wounded monster asking where the real Poe was. The monster, realizing that it is badly wounded, decides to retreat and disappears into a cloud. Han and Kajuro understand that they need to go back and look for Poe, since he is their friend and team member. Kazuro really didn't want to do this, but he had no choice. Kazuro and Han ran back, and Yui's group appeared and ran towards them. They were scared and ran as fast as they could. Yui stops Kajuro by saying that it's too dangerous there and they can't run there, otherwise you'll die. Kajuro notices that Yui took his hand. Kajuro pulls his hand out of hers and says that he doesn't care about her opinion and doesn't need to interfere. The girl was surprised and confused that they treated her like that. Kajuro continued to run, and Yui's company stood and looked after them. They didn't understand why the guys were coming back. At the place where there were many opponents and a terrible battle, Kazuro and Han began to look for Poe and shout his name. They hoped that the fat man was alive and well. Walking through the mountains of corpses of monsters and people, Han shouted Poe's name and looked at everything. Kazuro looked in all directions and also looked for the fat man. After several minutes of searching, Kajuro notices that Poe was underneath the large monster's body and was waving at them. 
Poe lay there and told the guys to hurry up, otherwise he was already tired of lying there. Kajuro tells Han that Nada will first make sure it is the real Poe. Kajuro says that he is very glad to see the software, but there is bad news and said that his phone was broken in the battle, and now he does not have Sarah's number. Upon hearing that Kajuro no longer had Sarah's number, he was very upset and began to cry and scream in grief. He started punching the ground and cursing all the monsters around him. After a few seconds of hysteria, Poe simply fell unconscious and lay under the body, making quiet sounds of disappointment. Kazuro and Han, delighted at this reaction, realized that they had found the real Poe and began to run towards him in order to get him from under the monster's body. While the guys were trying to get Poe, a huge army of monsters appeared behind them. Kazuro felt a very powerful aura behind his back and froze in fear. These were the monsters that Kajuro had already seen and dealt with. They stood at the head of a crowd of monsters and looked very angry. Kajuro could not restrain himself after seeing so many monsters that he was already very upset and angry that the monsters did not give them peace. He showed them the middle finger and began to insult the monsters for not leaving them behind. While the monsters were arguing with Kazuro and exchanging all sorts of insults, a monster came up from behind and hit the bearded monster and the monster in a suit on the back of the head, thereby catching them by surprise. Turning around from the unexpected blow, they were frightened when they saw their head of the city. He was a very handsome man and dressed in national attire. Waving his fan, the head asked the monsters to calm down and show their manners. This monster exuded a very strong and evil aura. Kazuro had never met such a strong monster before. He was frightening with just his appearance. Kazuro and his comrades stood and realized that even if they used all their monsters, they would not be able to resist such a powerful demon. Kazuro felt that he had little chance and did not want to show weakness and tried not to shake with fear. He was trying to figure out how to fight such a powerful monster using the red eye skill and assess the opponent's abilities. Oh, the loud and poisonous aura of this monster with a fan exuded hellish anger and power. A powerful and self-confident monster decides to deal with the boys himself. The monster with a fan shows his finger that he is very interested in what the boys are capable of, who were able to defeat his generals and asks to attack him. Kajuro, holding his mighty sword in his hands, was confused and did not know what to use and how to attack such a strong monster. He decides to use the red eye's explosive gaze, but only by putting more magic into its power, thereby increasing the explosive power of the technique. The monster, dressed in a classic outfit with a fan, did not show any fear when he saw the mark placed on him. Using his magic, the monster, opening his fan, began to form strong currents of wind and showed his displeasure that the boys used such a pathetic attack against him. The whirlwind formed by the kimono-wearing monster's abilities begins to carry the explosive tag away. He rose high above the heads of the monsters. Kajura watched and realized that his attack had failed. The monster in the kimono stood calmly and did not show the slightest fear. A loud explosion sounded over the city, and a bright flash illuminated the surrounding neighborhoods. The enormous power contained in the seal was used in vain. Kazuro, seeing that his abilities were very weak compared to the monsters in Kimono, was scared and tried to come up with at least something that would help him escape. Khan, seeing that Kazuro was very tired and scared, asked not to provoke the monster, and it was better to try to come to an agreement. Meanwhile, the monster in the Kimono was pleased and rejoiced that everyone applauded him and praised his power. Trying to be modest, he began to cover his face with a fan and feel embarrassed. Yui and his comrades were fleeing the city and heard a loud explosion in the direction where Kajuro ran. They paid attention and stopped. Seeing a bright flash, Yui thought that Kazuro was there fighting the most powerful monsters, and they needed help, but it was risky to act since there were few students left from her group. The guys stopped and saw a bright explosion and also thought that Kazuro was fighting and hoped that he would finally die and stop interfering with them. Yui thought that when they got out, Nada would ask for help. Kazuro understands that their strength cannot compare with such a monster, and understands that they need to be more cunning and take advantage of the monster's weaknesses, one of which was vanity. Kajuro begins to applaud and praise the kimono-clad monster, which takes his comrades by surprise. 
Kajuro touches Po and asks him to applaud as well while he figures out how to escape from such a strong monster. The monster begins to laugh and think that the kids are observant, but naive if they decided that they could appease such a smart and strong monster. In an instant, the mood of the monster in a kimono changes and using his magic, he waves his fan and releases sharp waves that strike anyone with their blows. Kazuro manages to regroup and realizes that nothing will work out for him, and there is simply no chance of salvation. Such a monster was very intelligent and was not going to let them go, surrounding them with his warriors and taking them into a ring. Kazuro falls to the ground on one knee from his injuries and begins to beg for mercy and beg to let them go. His clothes were damaged, but if he had not had the protective magic of a swordsman, the wounds would have been deep and maybe even fatal. Po also kneels and tries to help Kajuro. He hears the boy begging the monster to let them go and understands that even if Kazuro asks for mercy, they really have no chance. Po begins to cry and beg for mercy too and tries to grab Han's hand and force him to sit on his knees and also beg. Khan replies that even if this is his last day, he will never kneel before the monster and will beg for mercy. The monster liked this and was only too happy to start killing them in a humiliating way, but the fool who dared not bend the knee before the great monster would be killed first. Everyone heard the words of the monster in the kimono clearly and, looking up, they saw that he was beginning to increase his strength and release his sharp waves with the help of a fan. Khan, having taken a defensive stance, begins to receive many wounds from the sharp waves of the monster in a kimono. His shadow monster is capable of absorbing damage, but only against such a strong monster, its absorption power does not help much. Khan does not give up, and after so many wounds, he is still not going to kneel. But on the contrary, he begins to ridicule the monster for weak attacks, suffering from pain. Khan raises his blade and prepares for the monster's next attack. Kazuro cannot get up from his wounds and asks Hana not to be stubborn. Sitting in hysterics and fear, he trembles from imminent death. The monster in a kimono decided to approach such a humble boy and, showing his respect that he did not give up, said that his choice was worthy of death. Releasing sharp and poisonous thorns from his fan, the monster in a kimono tried to hit the boy with the blade who did not want to bow his head in front of him. Showing a furious roar and abnormal laughter, he attacks the boy, trying to cut off his head. Kazuro understands that now Han could die and asks him to urgently sit on his knee and beg for mercy while living for him. But at the last moment, a carrier pigeon with demonic eyes flies over the monster in a kimono. He held a letter with a seal in his claws. The monster in the kimono notices the seal and becomes afraid. His face begins to break out in a cold sweat as he realizes who the letter is from. The dove descends into his arms and releases the letter. The monster in the kimono tremblingly accepts the letter and releases the dove. No one had ever seen him so scared. The monster, with trembling hands, begins to try to open the letter, prying up the edges of the seal with his fan. He begins to take papers out of the envelope and read. What he saw greatly frightened him, and the realization that he had almost brought upon himself the death of the entire city and all the monsters was extremely agitated. He begins to read the letter out loud and ask the boys who they are, loudly and with apprehension. The guys began to suspect something strange. Kajuro, raising his head, replies that they are ordinary students from Fufel and have no idea what the monster is talking about. The kimono-wearing monster reveals a letter containing a photograph of Kajuro. The text below says that under no circumstances should you kill him. Kajuro was very surprised and did not understand who could help him like that if he definitely did not know anyone from the high ranks of monsters. This was very strange, Kazuro thought. The monster in the kimono gave up trying to kill them, began waving his fan and asking how they know the greatest warrior from the world of monsters. But Kajuro didn't understand who he was talking about. A monster in a kimono, using his magic, shows an image of a great monster that is capable of destroying everyone in this city and beyond. He, a little nervously, asks Kajuro if he knows this man. Kajuro did not understand or know this monster, which made the monster in a kimono surprised. He had never seen the supreme monsters protect anyone so much, after resting a bit and getting up with help. On his feet, Kazuro asked the monster in a kimono if they could leave here. The monster, realizing that it is better not to test the words spoken in the letter from the supreme monster, 
decides to let the guys go. Kazuro, not understanding what happened and what kind of letter saved their lives, begins to turn around and slowly leave with his comrades from the encirclement of hundreds of monsters. The crowd of monsters parted on the orders of the head of the city, and without interfering with the guys, they let them go, following them with a hungry and angry look. The head of the city told his generals to keep an eye on the boys and make sure they left the city as quickly as possible. The monster in the suit and gold jewelry was also scared when he found out who the letter came from and wondered who this guy was and why he was being guarded by the supreme lord of the monsters. Meanwhile, the guys, having recovered a little, began to run along the road. There were many monsters around, but they did not attack or try to chase them. Kazuro notices that no one is bothering them and understands that now they can safely leave. And it was very strange. He held his wounded hand and was surprised at what was happening, remembering the story that his parents told him as a child, that there was one monster that led a huge army of monsters behind him and destroyed everyone in his path. His name was Insei, the great emperor of the monster empire. Han also remembered this story and asked Kajuro how he knew the great emperor of monsters. Kajuro did not know this emperor and did not understand why such a great monster saved them. Rejoicing that now nothing threatens them, he jumped and hugged the guys, showing his joy and telling them not to bother themselves. Now they can calmly leave this damned city. Kajuro agrees, but suggests visiting one more place before leaving. Meanwhile, his family went about their daily routine on the farm. Mom was doing the laundry and talking to her husband while he smoked his pipe. A girl appears outside the farm gate holding a full bucket of water. She walked towards them and notices that her father has arrived from the city. It was Kazuro's sister, Kihiko. She was glad to see her father and wanted to know how Kajuro was doing and what he was doing now. The bucket in her hands was quite large and heavy, which was clearly undesirable for a small and fragile girl like her. The father, seeing that his daughter was carrying a heavy bucket full of water, immediately got scared and ran to her. His daughter was very weak due to illness and did not want to exert herself. Fearing for his daughter's condition, he ran up and grabbed the bucket from her hands, showing his fear for his daughter's condition. Kihiko was very happy to see her father and, hugging his hand, walked with him and asked how he went to visit her brother and what Kazuro was doing now. The father said that Kajuro is now in a closed city and undergoing a test. Kihiko was afraid for her brother, realizing that it was definitely dangerous there and they could kill him. She remembered that Kajuro's absorber abilities were too weak, and it was always difficult for him. The parents began to reassure their daughter with the words that Kajuro had already matured and gained experience for such competitions. His absorber level rose, and he even had comrades. The father said that when he saw his son, he even helped the poor and wounded, saving their lives. Kihiko was very touched that her brother had become such a good person. The father trying not to say too much, tried to change the topic. Otherwise, his daughter, due to her weak body, mostly sits at home and watches the news on the internet. She might suspect something. Kihiko behaved quite modestly and was pleased with her father's story. She was proud that her brother had become very mature and capable of achieving anything in life. Meanwhile, outside the wall of the abandoned city, at the point of the safe zone, there was a large tent from where light and noise could be heard from loud conversations. Inside, Director Lin watched the competition take place. Yui appeared behind her, having successfully made it out of the city with her comrades. There were many cameras in the city, and the director was watching everything. He wondered what happened to Kajuro and whether he could survive with his group. Director Lin wanted to know what kind of monsters he had absorbed and how many of them he had. The main task was to find out what he found in the crypt. Yui looked at Director Lin and was a little angry that he could not send his people to help seeing how monsters were killing students. Director Lin approached and grabbed Yui by the shoulders and began to say that he did not care about the fate of all those students, like her father. Their task was to find out Kiyuro's abilities and understand whether he is dangerous to society. He told her that if he survived, they would find him and end his life. There was no talk of salvation. Having gathered his men, Director Lin begins to leave the tent and move towards the abandoned city to find Kajuro and make sure that he is dead. Yui, 
hearing Director Lin's words that her father also wanted Kazuro dead, began to suspect that there was something more than just fear about his strength. Meanwhile, in the city, the guys, feeling no problems and in a good mood, walked around the city surrounded by monsters, realizing that no one would touch them. Kazuro asked the guys to stop by another bank on the way and check it out. When they went inside, they saw many empty cells and were a little puzzled. There was no safe here, nor was there any money. Kajuro was angry that they had arrived too late and someone had passed them by. His calm voice hinted that they would already take a lot from this city, so there was no need to worry. But Kajuro was a little offended, since this was a good chance to get even more rich in such a short time. He walked out of the bank door, kicking the stones under his feet. Suddenly they see a man falling from the roof. He breaks in front of the guys and it scares them a little. Kajuro and the guys were surprised and decided to check what was happening. And why were there adult absorbers here? Kajuro, with the help of his red eye, notices that there is a strong commotion going on on the roof between the absorbers and the monsters. These were Director Lin's people and himself. They fought monsters on the roof of the building. The monsters pressed them against the fence and did not give them the opportunity to leave. Kajuro, seeing that Director Lin was on the roof, became very angry and wanted to deal with him himself, since he was supposed to have an antidote to wolf bites for Hanami. Director Lin summons his wolves, grabs his comrades, and tries to go elsewhere to search for Kajuro. Some people were attacked by monsters and could not be saved. Director Lin was very selfish towards his people and had no pity if they died. Kajuro was filled with anger and hatred towards Director Lin that he did not want to let him leave. He must fight him and take the antidote. Kajuro begins to run towards the flying Director Lin and tries to chase him. Han and Po were surprised and did not understand why Kajuro reacted to the director this way. Kajuro runs after the director and says that he must have an antidote for Hanami. It was he who poisoned his girlfriend with his monster. The guys heard that if they could defeat the director, they would save Kajuro's friend. They agreed and began to run after the guy. Meanwhile, director Lin and his soldiers stood at the crossroads, where there were many corpses of monsters, and they examined the bodies. The director notices that someone very strong is approaching them, as the power of the aura was very dangerous. They were two monsters of the highest level, a monster wearing a suit and gold jewelry, and a monster with a beard and smoking a pipe. Director Lin, seeing such strong opponents, decided to call his wolves and get away, feeling fear away from here. A strange sign very quickly appears on the summoned wolves and begins to flash strongly. This was the effect of Kajuro's red eye's explosive gaze. The bearded monster with a pipe, seeing a familiar sign, was very surprised that the absorbers were being attacked by the boy who fought against him. A large explosion occurs behind Director Lin and blows up his monsters. Everyone was surprised and did not understand what was happening. Director Lin saw the actions of the monsters that stood in front of him, and they did not use any techniques, so it was someone else, Lin thought. After Director Lin's monsters exploded, he and his soldiers stood ready to fight. Some strange shadow begins to appear in front of them, moving along the ground. Kajuro appears in front of them, running with a sword at them and shouting that he wants to deal with Director Lin. Khan, using his monster, said that he would cover him. When Lin saw the boy, he was surprised that he was still alive and said that he was glad because he could kill the impudent brat himself. Kazuro decided not to stand on ceremony and immediately summons two of his attacking monsters to help. Kajuro was very determined to save his friend and did not want to give Director Lin a chance to win. The three of them begin to run towards the director with a great desire to kill. Lin was greatly frightened by seeing so many powerful monsters near Kajuro. He, nervous and very frightened, begins to roll up his sleeve and call on his monsters for protection and try to fight off such formidable opponents. Two of his monsters, the water and the bloodthirsty monsters, come to the defense of Director Lin. They fight Kazuro's monsters but their chances are slim. Khan, meanwhile, using his shadow skills, ends up behind Director Lin's soldiers, placing one of his blades on their necks, preventing them from entering into battle. While Han was tying up Director Lin's soldiers so that they would not interfere, monsters were watching them and did not understand what was happening. For the first time, they saw how the absorbers fought among themselves and did not pay attention to them. Realizing that the letter said that no one should touch Kajuro, they thought about whether to intervene and save the guy. While the monsters were thinking about their further actions, 
Kazuro punches director Lin in the stomach with a strong blow, damaging internal organs and causing him to cough up blood. The director was on his knees experiencing severe chest pain and could not fight. Kajuro, holding his mighty sword in his hands, walked towards the director, full of confidence and desire to deal with him. The monsters, in the heat of battle, notice that their master, director Lin, has been severely beaten and is facing death. Kajuro, in a fit of anger and intense hatred towards director Lin, due to his attempts to kill his girlfriend and harm all his comrades, jumped up for the final blow. Kazuro's incredible power burst out and enveloped the guy's body. His eyes began to glow red and lightning began to shoot from his body from the strong power of the guy. Having fallen under the guy's enormous force before the impact, director Lin, out of horror, begins to feel his body being slightly damaged and his clothes starting to tear. Kajuro did not attack the director, but pointed his sword at him, intimidating and threatening that he would kill him if he did not give up the antidote. Kazuro did not stand on ceremony with Lin, and, having hit him in the stomach, reminded him that jokes with him were bad, and he would kill a person like him without a shadow of a doubt. Kazuro once again asked the director, where is the antidote to the bite of his fucking wolves? His patience was beginning to run out. Hearing another stupid answer from director Lin, Kajuro strikes and cuts off Lin's ear, causing severe pain to Lin. Director Lin, having lost his ear and experiencing severe pain, lay on the ground with tears and horror on his face. Kajuro reminded Lin that if he continued to answer like that, he would cut off a piece of his body until he heard the desired answer. The director of the bottom does not believe that the boy can kill a man without hesitation and continues to defy the guy expressing his doubts in his words. Kajuro was very angry and realized that the director was right about something, and knowing that there were high-level monsters nearby, he decided to threaten the director that he would give his soul to the monsters. The director was scared but still did not believe Kazuro's words. Such an arrogant boy from the bottom would not do such a thing, said director Lin. The director lay on the floor and did not agree to give out information to Kajuro about the antidote. Kazuro felt that he needed to act more radically and attract more experienced and ruthless creatures. Kazuro started calling out to the bearded monster, and it was very strange. The director, hearing that the boy was calling the monster, got a little scared and tensed. The bearded monster, holding a pipe in his mouth, was very surprised that some guy was asking him to come over. This was very surprising to him since he was the general of an army of monsters. Realizing that they have no right to kill the guy, they decide to approach and find out what he wants from them. The monster in the suit also went with his friend. The monsters approached Kajuro and director Lin, who was lying on the ground. Kazuro asked the bearded monster to really hurt the director and have a lot of fun with his soul. The monster stood over the director and looked at him ominously. Lin realized in horror that he would not be able to resist such a strong monster after so many injuries. Kajuro was happy and thanked the monster for his help, showing his respect. This confused the monsters a little, and they felt very strange. Director Lin, realizing that now he will be in great pain, decides to grab Kazuro by the leg and beg him not to resort to such terrible torture. Kazuro replies that it is too late and now they can find out where the antidote is using a cruel method. The bearded monster begins preparing his torture whip. Kajuro turns around and moves away from the director so as not to disturb the monster. The director shouts after the guy that he is begging him to stop all this. The monster grabs the director's ugly face by the hair and begins to pull. Lin, in pain and crying a little, begs them to stop. The bearded monster, using his abilities, begins to blow his cigarette smoke into director Lin's face. Director Lin falls to the ground and begins to writhe in pain. His eyes began to roll back in his head and foam began to come out of his mouth. After much torment, the bearded monster, with the help of his magic, takes out the director's soul chained to the cross. His soul was chained and prevented from moving. This ability of the monster made it possible to kill the enemy's soul without resorting to physical influence on the body itself. The monster, holding a whip in his hands, began to say that now, under the influence of magic, the director will tell all his sins and will be punished with blows of the whip for them. Kazuro asked director Lin for the last time where the antidote was, but Lin, being terrified, still did not tell Kazuro anything. The bearded monster begins to ask what sin the director committed as a child. 
Lin recalled that when he was little in the winter, he decided to urinate on a cat. He was not aware of his actions, and it was funny to him. The cat died, and the boy laughed and enjoyed her torment. The bearded monster deals a strong blow to Lin's soul with a whip, and sentences that for such an act on the poor animal, it is not enough to kill him. Then the director begins to tell another story from student life. He was cowardly from fear and pain, but he could not resist the charms of a strong monster, and told him. During the exam, instead of helping his comrades, he watched as they were killed by the monster he himself brought. He wanted to conclude a contract with him, but for this, he had to feed him, and he fed his comrades. After hearing what Director Lin did to his comrades, Kajuro became very angry and knew that such a person did not deserve to live. The bearded monster delivers powerful lashes again for each person eaten by that monster. The director screams loudly in pain and can barely hold on. Po and Han were shocked that he could do this to his comrades. Such a person does not deserve to be the director of the university and is not even there. Kazuro, unable to bear it, begins to kick Director Lin's body, saying that it was he who should have died, and not those poor guys. Lin's soul was cheerfully bound in chains and was severely beaten. His condition was critical, but he still didn't say anything about an antidote for Hanami. Khan showed violent disrespect for him and in every possible way wanted him to meet the more cruel monsters in hell as quickly as possible. He grabs the director by the neck and wants to look him in the eyes and understand whether such a rotten person really doesn't have a drop of conscience and compassion. But then Kazuro realizes that there is no need to waste his energy and nerves on such a rotten monster, imbued with inhumanity. You still can't get anything out of him. Kajuro turns around and no longer wants to be involved in this matter. He asks the bearded monster to finish with him quickly. The bearded monster said that even he is not as cruel as Director Lin and would be happy to rid the world of such garbage. Using his smoking pipe, the bearded monster pierces Director Lin's soul with all his might, leaving no chance of survival. His body died and froze in a state of shock. No one will miss such a bad person except his family. Kazuro notices Director Lin's wounded wolf monster nearby and begins to approach him to kill him. A sharp blade pierces the soul of the wolf monster and kills it. Kazuro was calm and cold-blooded. Now he had to find another way to save Hanami. At the site where the wolf was killed, his stone appeared and Kajuro began to pick it up, thinking of selling it later on the black market. Unexpectedly, Kajuro remembers that monster stones can be absorbed, as Han showed then, and thinks that it will help Hanami heal if she absorbs the monster stone that poisoned her. Kazuro, with positive emotions, begins to thank the monsters for their help and says goodbye to them. The bearded monster even smiled, showing his pleasure in what he was doing. By the way, he notices that there are two more guys tied up there and they should also take them off to talk. Kazuro replies that he is not interested in them and allows him to do whatever they want with them as payment for their help. With that, they parted ways. The monsters grabbed the corpse of the director and his two guards and went in their direction while Kajuro and his friends went to the exit. Po decided to ask Kajuro why Director Lin was pursuing them, and why did he poison Hanami? What is happening between universities that they are ready to kill students from other universities? Han said that the director was with guards from a group of absorbers who work for the head of Kento. Maybe he too was one of the members of the absorbers department, Khan thought. Khan remembered that his father once performed magic tricks in the village, and staged head-cutting shows at fairs. He was a master of his craft, and none of the residents were ever harmed by him. So, in that village, all the men worked at construction sites, and the main ones there were people from the absorbers' department. They were conducting some kind of excavations and building structures for something. Kazuro interrupts Han with the words, why he suddenly remembered his father, and he was a clown, Kazuro replied, smiling. Khan, a little angry, replies that he worked at a construction site but also loved to amuse the villagers, and that made him a pretty good person. Kajuro, putting his arm around Han's shoulder, said that he did not want to offend him, and he strongly supports this decision. People should be happy in difficult situations. After some time, in the office of the head of the absorbers, Kento, there was a secretary who came with a report on what happened in the closed city. The report said that Director Lin and several of his bodyguards were missing. Head Kento showing no pity for his colleague, waves his hand, causing the secretary to stop reading the report. He already understood that the mission was a failure. He began to think that Kajuro was definitely very dangerous, 
and that he needed to act more radically. His face showed concern that his plans might be thwarted. Meanwhile, Kajuro and his comrades were already approaching the exit from the abandoned city to the safe zone. There were many wounded children around, and some did not return at all. One of the groups of students was intact, and ridiculed the others for being so weak that they could not survive and get to the safe zone as a full group. They stood and laughed loudly, showing their disrespect, and were proud of being the first to arrive. The rest of the children, having lost many of their comrades and received various injuries, looked at them with contempt. Kazuro, hearing such laughter and insults towards other participants in the competition, decided to ask such tough guys where they were then if there were so many monsters in the city. The leader of the group of students said that they were smarter and killed the monsters at the beginning of the competition and spent the rest of the time in the open area and did not meddle in the city. Thanks to this strategy, not to go into the city, but to work on the outskirts, they were able to survive. All his comrades applauded their leader and praised his brilliant decision. Kazuro and Han stood with stone faces and understood that this was only suitable for cowards, and if they were faced with a truly strong opponent, they would die immediately. Meanwhile, the head of the Ministry of Education came on stage and announced the final stage of the competition, namely the evaluation of their trophies and the determination of the strongest university this year. The minister asked all the students to come out in their groups one by one and present their catch for evaluation. The best stone sellers in all of Japan were invited to evaluate. They began to take their places at the table and wait for the students. The two wounded guys brought only one stone and, with a very pitiful and tired face, put it in a plate. The evaluators took the stone in their hands and began to examine it, assessing it as a stone of a low-rank monster. The proud students of the University of the Supreme Devourers, named after Mao Chi, decided not to wait their turn and began to walk, scattering the rest of the participants to the sides. They felt like the winners and the coolest at the university competition, since they were students of the most prestigious university in the city. Proudly approaching the inspectors, the leader of the group, taking off his backpack, begins to pour stones into a plate, smiling proudly. The evaluators began checking the stones and saying that many of them were high-ranking monsters, and this was a worthy result. All the students under the stage were surprised and understood that the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University had won again, as it had many strong students. The examiner from the Group B school exam was also at the competition, and hoped that the students from his university would be able to achieve a positive result. There was also a teacher from the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers University, who was not very happy for her students. She assessed everyone's skills and understood that such guys had no chance at all against a really strong opponent. From the crowd of students who were waiting for their turn, a hand rose and made the remark that the inspectors had too small a vessel for their extraction. The minister responded to the boy's words and said that he doubted that their stones would not fit into such a plate. A group of disciples from the Mao Chi Supreme Devourers were also surprised. Kajuro asks Po to summon his trash can monster and show them their loot. Po begins to roll up his sleeve and begins to summon the monster with a big smile. A large trash can appeared in front of the students with a strange smile and prepared to open its lid. A huge pile of different stones fell onto the table and everyone was shocked since each bead is one monster. All the students who took part in the competition were shocked by this result and did not believe their eyes. They had never even seen so many stones in their lives. The inspector was also shocked to see so many beads of the strongest demons and even wads of money among the stones. Kazuro, realizing that he has humiliated the University of the Supreme Mao Chi Devourers, continues to point out that the vessel is too small and their loot does not even fit on the table. Everyone was surprised by this, and the inspectors, going through the stones, only made sure that they were all received in battles in the next 24 hours. Stones of this quality are very expensive. A teacher from the University of the Supreme Devourers, named after Mao Chi, seeing Kazuro, remembered that he was not allowed to study at the university at the request of Director Lin and the head of the absorbers. She was sure that the boy was very capable. After a few moments, the minister, realizing that no one else could collect stones than the students of the Fu Fel University, makes a decision and announces the winner. This year, the prize for the best university is taken by Fu Fel and its best students. The guys stood on stage and everyone applauded them. Confetti flew around and festive music warmed my ears. 
After presenting the awards, the guys called a taxi and drove back to their university. The taxi was rushing quite quickly along the road leading into the city. Kazuro encouraged the taxi driver to drive faster and threw money stolen from a bank in an abandoned city. The silhouette of large buildings appeared from the car window. These were the buildings of the Fu Fell University. The sign glowed brightly from the sunlight as it was written in gold letters. Upon arrival, the high speed made the guys sick and getting out of the car, they started vomiting. Only Kajuro felt good and wanted to see Hanami quickly. Opening the doors of the ward of the medical building, he left very happy to finally get there and tell Hanami that he had found the antidote. Opening his eyes, he saw that the bed was empty and Hanami was not here. Kazuro was very surprised and thought that she was with the director. Leaving the room, he meets the nurse who looked after Hanami and treated him. She said that the girl is now in the library and reading books. Kajuro was delighted and approached his sister, asking her to take the strong monster's stone in gratitude for looking after Hanami. He wanted to see Hanami so much that, without stopping, he finished his words of gratitude as he ran and moved towards the library. The girl stood and looked at the boy and understood that he was in love with Hanami and would do everything to help and protect her. Meanwhile, in the library, Hanami sat in the middle of the room on a round rug and read books. She collected many different books near her and tried to learn something interesting. Kajuro runs into the library and runs towards her with a happy face and loudly shouting Hanami's name. Hanami was scared at first, but she was happy when she saw Kajuro. She stopped him and said that it was forbidden to shout in the library and asked him to be quiet. Kajuro stopped, calmed down a little, and agreed with her. She asked to sit next to him and began to read to Kazuro interesting facts that she had learned during her time in the library. Kajuro sat down next to him and began to listen. Hanami began to reveal that in one book she found an interesting article related to Kajuro or his ancestors. Kajuro didn't believe it at first and said that he doubted it since his parents were ordinary farmers and had never known anyone from the high ranks of government. Hanami said that maybe he doesn't know everything. Taking his hand, the girl says that back in the tomb, only he was allowed to follow the hall full of warrior statues and obtain the sword monster. Kazuro thought for a bit and said that maybe he had the blood of the ancient kings in him, but that was a very long time ago, and it's unlikely that this means anything anymore. Kazuro took the piece of paper that said about the ancient family that was royal. He read it too when he came to his senses and went to the library after school. Hanami said that she found in one book a story about the city of Fuji, which told about the last royal family that lived quite recently. She started showing photos of that royal family to Kajuro for him to take a look at. The boy in the queen's arms would now be Kajuro's age. Kajuro started laughing and patting Hanami on the head for her wild imagination and skills. She reminded him of a detective investigating a family tree. Hanami removed Kajuro's hand from her head and took it, turning it around with her palm and began to draw a symbol along his lines proving that he was that boy. Having drawn the symbol, Kazuro began to look, and his consciousness began to send pictures from the past into his head. He begins to remember his childhood and the day the fire started. He was overcome with horror and the realization that this was really happening to him. When a fire started in the palace, the queen was holding a little girl in her arms, and a boy was standing next to her. A man was on his knee in front of the queen and begging her to run away. She refused and asked to look after her children and take care of them as they are the future of this country. The man agreed, but did not understand why the queen did not want to leave. She, shedding a tear, was very saddened that the palace was attacked and understood that if they did not find her body, then they would not leave anyone alone who was in any way connected with her family. The boy did not want to leave his mother and began to cry and ask her to stay. He grabbed her hand and did not want to let go. Mom, kneeling down, began to wipe the boy's tears and reassure him with words that she would always be there and hoped that he would never let his people and her down, becoming a worthy king. After a tearful and difficult farewell, the man began to get out of the burning city with the children, becoming in sequence their father. Kazuro was pondering such serious thoughts that he could be the heir to the throne of the city of Fuji. Hanami was proud that she was able to find enough information to prove that she was right. She began to rejoice and scream with happiness, for which she attracted the attention of Kazuro, 
who began to try to calm the girl down. He gave her a cracker and asked her not to make noise in the library. The girl immediately fell silent and, closing her eyes in pain, became a little indignant. Holding her head, she said that it was possible to ask her more gently to be quieter and not to let go of her hands. Kajuro, clasping his hands, said that he was a prince and did as he wished. Hanami was indignant, and Kajuro tried to get away from his words by laughing it off and blushing a little, humming his favorite song. After the library, the guys moved back to the ward, since Hanami already needed to take medicine. Yui walked towards them. She passed by, but at the last moment decided to greet Kajuro and his girlfriend and congratulate him on winning the competition. She congratulated Kajuro and asked how they dealt with a crowd of monsters while surrounded. Kazuro, not wanting to communicate with her, only replied that it was none of her business and turned away and walked on. Yui felt like she was very much not loved, and it hurt her. Hanami asked Kajuro if it was true that he won the competition. Kazuro replied that yes, he even managed to collect a lot of money for the treatment of Hanami's mother. Hanami, unable to bear it, jumps into Kajuro's arms and begins to hug him and be very happy that he did so much for her mother and herself. Yui felt a very strong feeling in her stomach when she saw Kajuro and Hanami hugging. After that, already in the ward, Kazuro stirred and cooled the soup. He didn't want Hanami to get scalded and experience any pain again. He handed Hanami the soup and asked her to eat carefully. Standing nearby was Sarah, who came between classes to visit them and congratulate Kajuro on their victory and express gratitude for helping to draw attention to their university. Hanami, without waiting much, begins to slurp loudly and strongly, eating the soup without a spoon, simply drinking it. Kajuro and Sarah begin to laugh because Hanami's desire to eat is so great that she even forgot about manners and simply filled a bowl of soup like a pig. After the conversation, Sarah got ready to leave because she had to go to class. She said goodbye to the guys and advised them not to stay up until late, since Kazuro had to go to classes tomorrow. In the evening, Kajuro walked along the road to the dorm after talking with Hanami and spending quality time together. Suddenly, his phone starts ringing. It was his parents. He picked up the phone and greeted them, saying that he was fine and alive. He was glad to hear them, but there was a topic he wanted to talk about alone with his father. Father, sister, and mother began to congratulate Kajuro on his victory in the competition between universities and asked about his condition. Kajuro, trying to find out if his father is really not a father at all, decides to ask about the time when he served the queen and whether he was married to his mother. Hearing such words, the father and wife immediately realized that the boy had probably found out everything and was perhaps in danger. Trying to change the subject and pretend that they don't understand what he is talking about, they decide to give the phone to Sister Kazuro, who wanted to chat with him so badly. Kihiko was glad to hear from her brother and began to ask about his promised life and how many friends did he make during his studies. While the daughter was talking with Kazuro, the father and mother began to think about what to do and how to protect their son from unreasonable actions after what he had learned. Father, thinking what to do in such a situation. And did Kajuro really learn about everything and most importantly from whom? Then he notices a silhouette approaching their house. It was the demon male raven that was approaching their home. He carried in his claws a letter from the great emperor Insei. The father, taking the letter in his hands, hoped that the emperor already knew that Kajuro had learned the truth about his family and could help. Opening the envelope, he began to read the letter from the emperor and carefully tried to understand. The wife stood holding her heart and hoped that everything would be fine with Kazuro. After reading the letter, the father turns to his wife and says that he has a new task and a good idea on how to protect their adopted son, Kazuro. Having finished a long conversation with his sister, Kajuro began to say goodbye and say hello to his parents and wait for their next call. Walking further down the street, Kajuro notices Director Soda standing with his back to him and waiting for the guy to appear. Kazuro was happy to see the director and said that he had glorified the university, and now more students would come here, having learned how strong we are. Director Sota, not paying attention to the victory, decides to reproach Kajuro, saying that he did not do a good enough job and could have died. Kajuro, scratching his head, was surprised that the director found out that they fought with the head of the city and really could have died, but a letter from the monster emperor saved them. 
Kajura with a very serious face and pointed out that the boy still had to train a lot and make progress if he wanted to defeat the head of the Absorbers. Without waiting for an answer from Kazuro, Director Sota begins to summon his monsters and teach Kazuro a lesson. Two demonic monsters of Director Soth's level appear in front of the boy and he becomes very tense. Kazuro began to think that the director was not happy with something if he summoned two such formidable monsters to teach the boy a lesson. The director, in a calm tone, begins to say that now he wants to see what the boy is capable of and show his skills so that he is confident and allows him to engage in battle with the absorbers. Kajuro was very frightened and understood that even using all his monsters to attack, there was no way he could resist such demonic monsters from the director. The director, using his high skill in force management, begins to use the ability to reduce force. He reduces the size of his monsters to the size of Kajuro's monsters and limits their abilities so that they fight on equal footing. Kazuro, seeing that the monsters have become weaker, assumes that after the competition he will be honored at the university and shown gratitude and not challenged to a duel. Director Soda looked at the boy and said that this would be his reward for winning the competition. Fighting the director is a reward in itself. Kajuro agrees and begins to run towards the director, preparing to attack and creating sketches of a strategy for the battle in his head. He summons his monsters and thinks about where the weak area of Director Sota's monsters is to attack them. Summoning a monster with a chainsaw and a buxom beauty, Kazuro sends the saw to attack as a distraction, while the busty beauty, using her musical instrument, the zither, begins to play a stunning melody. Director Soda and his monsters react in time to such a sound wave and jump back to a safe state. Kajuro notices that the director knows at what distance his monster's abilities operate and understands that he needs to come up with another way to attack. While the monster with the chainsaw was running, trying to divert attention to Director Suta and his monsters, Kajuro also began to run behind him to attack. Kajuro calls the rest of the monsters and thinks to use the encirclement method and take the director's monsters by surprise. While Director Sota and his monsters jumped away from the sound wave of the busty monster, Kajuro and his monsters tried to come in from several directions and attack the director. The director noticed all this and understands that the boy has an understanding of strategy and is quite capable, but he is still damp and weak. A warrior in golden armor attacks a monster with a scythe, but he parries the blow without even straining. The monster with the chainsaw has also come quite close and uses its chainsaw attack on Director Soth. But the monster with the scythe manages to react and repel the attack of the monster with the chainsaw using his combat weapon skills. After the attack is repulsed, Kazuro's monsters decide to attack at the same time and hit the scythe-wielding monster with their weapon skills. The writer's monster uses his powers and makes the chainsaw monster slip and lose his body balance. The monster with the chainsaw feels that his body is starting to fall to the side and he can no longer control it and falls. A warrior in golden armor, in the heat of battle, notices that a huge monster begins to fall towards him and does not have time to dodge. A monster with a saw crushed a warrior in golden armor with its body. This made him very angry, and he began to tell the monster with the saw to quickly get off him and not disgrace them. Director Soda, standing over two lying monsters, was very disappointed with such weak attacks from the boy and advised him to more competently evaluate the enemy. After such a pathetic attack, the director decided to test what his defense is capable of and asks his monster with a scythe to attack the boy. While the attacking monsters were lying on the ground and trying to get up, a bone monster with a scythe was already running towards Kajuro and trying to attack. Kajuro notices this and realizes that he must make a quick decision and repel the attack. He begins to summon the sword monster's sword. The sword begins to appear from the boy's hand and is immediately ready for use. Kazuro, trying to fight back, immediately attacks the monster running towards him, but the skeleton manages to dodge and prevent himself from being caught. The skeleton's stance with a scythe confused the boy, and he thought that the monster simply dodged, but he was covering another monster that was preparing the main attack. Kajuro understands this, and when he saw that the writer's monster was preparing to strike, he was very afraid that he had miscalculated and did not understand the enemy's plans. The writer's monster throws its ink pencil at Kajuro using the magic of enhancing and accelerating the object. Kajuro realizes that he won't be able to dodge and therefore tries to fight him off with his sword. But the speed is too fast, and the boy may not make it in time. 
He tried to use the red eye skill to weaken the monster and prevent him from controlling the item. But the monster was too smart and closed his eyes when he saw that the guy's red eye began to light up. Kajuro realized that he had been too naive to hope that everything would work out for him if he fought the way he always would. But he had miscalculated. The ink brush slammed into Kajuro's stomach. The boy experienced severe pain and had a strong expression of fear and awareness of mistakes on his face. The boy flew several meters away and fell to the ground. The strong blow caused quite a bit of pain to the guy, but did not break anything. Kajuro felt a little like he was in pain, but he didn't intend to lose like that. He began to think about what to do. The director began to tell the guy that he was too impulsive and did not think with his head when he attacked. There are too many emotions, and this makes it difficult to correctly assess the enemy. Kazuro, listening to the director's advice, having caught his breath a little, realizes that he needs to find a way to break through the enemy and decides not to hesitate. Having risen to his feet, the boy immediately began to run towards Director Sota with his monsters and try to attack him. Having used his blade, Kajuro decides to increase its power and uses a large supply of magic to strike. The writer's monster was too experienced and smart and, using his brush, decides to hit the guy first while he is gathering strength to strike. Kajuro gets hit in the head and stops. He received, but did it in order to divert attention, while he is attacked from behind by his stink monsters in golden armor and a monster with a chainsaw. But the writer was much smarter than the boy and suspected the same. The writer jumped away from the attack and avoided damage. The warrior and the monster with the chainsaw did not have time to react and missed. Kajuro teamed up with his monsters and began to tell the plan for the attack and who should do what. He suggested attacking together, taking him from different sides and giving our girls the opportunity to stun him and immobilize him. The warrior in golden armor and the monster with a chainsaw were very angry from so many losses that they agreed to do anything if it would give them the opportunity to win. After several battles, Kazuro's squad was defeated again, and Director Sota and his monsters stood without experiencing the slightest problem in battle. Kazuro, wiping sweat from his face and blood from his wounds, suggests that it is impossible to win against such a strong mentor with his incredible monsters. The director said that if the boy resorted to a more reasonable battle strategy and divided his monsters into groups to attack from different sides, then the boy would have a chance. Kajuro began to shake his head, disagreeing with the director and showing that such a strategy would definitely not work against him, as well as against the soldiers of the head of the absorbers. The director was surprised and said that this was a good strategy and one should not underestimate his knowledge. He used one himself when he was young. The director began to explain that if the boy does not take his head and start thinking normally in battle, then he has no chance in battle with the soldiers and even with the head of the absorbers. He grabbed Kajuro by the t-shirts and began to explain in a more rude manner that his life and the lives of his loved ones depended on it. If Kajuro continues to attack the enemy so thoughtlessly, he will most likely die very quickly. After several seconds of rude treatment, the director quickly changes his tone and, holding the guy by the shoulder, begins to say that he will still learn and the director will help him with this. Kajuro began to smile a little in bewilderment. They continued training and this time Kajuro's monsters captured Director Sota's monsters in their pincers. Kajuro decided to take advantage of the situation and attack them from above with his powerful sword while they were distracted by their surroundings. Kajuro was approaching the enemy from a height but the monster with the scythe notices him and tells the monster to the writer about this. Kajuro receives a strong blow from the leg of the writer's monster and flies off. The monster says that such attacks cannot penetrate him and Kajuro need to think better. The training had been going on for several hours. All the students around could have come running to such loud sounds of battle. Kajuro and the chainsaw monster fought the scythe monster. After another attack, Kajuro almost lost his head after blocking a monster with his monster's scythe. Kajuro was already severely crippled and tired, but he had more persistence and did not plan to stop. Meanwhile, Hanami and Sarah came out to watch Kajuro's training. They sat at a table and talked. Sarah smiled and told Hanami that Kajuro was a great fellow and a true friend. He does so much for her and doesn't even suspect that someone likes her. Hanami tried to pretend that she didn't understand, which made her a little nervous and said that they were just friends. Sarah began to laugh and say that, of course, a friend 
and there was nothing else in her thoughts than to embarrass and reveal Hanami's feelings for the boy. Meanwhile, Kazuro tried to somehow strike a blow at the monster rider and win at least once, but the next attempt ends with Kazuro being kicked in the face, and the boy flies away from the pain and force of the blow. From the blow, the boy lost a tooth and blood sprayed from his mouth. His body was like a rag, all wrinkled and dirty from falls. Kajuro was not taken aback by his injuries, but told his warrior in golden armor that now it was their turn to attack. The monster, lowering his head, notices that he is surrounded by two monsters and did not notice this when he beat the boy. The actress's monster begins to use her ability to stun, singing high notes in her voice and trying to influence the consciousness of the writer's monster. Meanwhile, a warrior in golden armor prepared to strike at the writers and finally gain his first victory. But the writer's monster was ready and said that the attempt, of course, was good, but it was not enough for victory. Using his abilities, he suppressed the power of the actress's form and cast an attack spell in her direction. Kazuro was once again defeated and his monsters could not cope. In the background, his girlfriends tried to support him and watched him. Hanami stood up and clutched her heart, worrying for Kajuro that he would get too many injuries. Sara reassured her by saying that Director Sota was careful and experienced enough to inflict this kind of injury on the boy. While Director Sota's monsters were fighting Kajuro and his monsters, a loud clattering sound of a crowd of monsters was heard from the forest behind him. It was the monster of the bride with her warriors and she ran to help Kazuro. Since her servants reported to her that they were spying and observing in the area that Kazuro was being beaten. The girls notice that a crowd of monsters is running here and are very scared. Hanami notices that the girl at the head was shouting, I will save you, my hubby. She didn't quite understand who it was addressed to. The bride's monster and her monster with a large cleaver attacked director Sota to kill such an arrogant old man that he dared to offend Kazuro. The director, Noticing the approach of the enemy, tried to jump away and told the boy that he would deal with them himself. Kazuro, seeing his bride, tries to stop her and grabs her by the dress, shouting that this is his mentor and they are training. Unknowingly, Kazuro tears the monster bride's dress and exposes her body a little, thereby embarrassing her a little. Kajuro, realizing what he did, tries to apologize and hopes that she will forgive him. She thought that her husband, from the long separation, probably missed her so much that he began to tear her clothes and wanted to quickly fall into passionate embraces. Kazuro, listening to all this nonsense, tried not to drop his jaw from such wondrous thoughts of such a beauty. Hanami, seeing Kajuro talking to the monster and tearing her dress, only became more perplexed by what was happening. He suspected that Kajuro had known such a beautiful monster for a long time, and they did not have a hostile relationship. Kazuro, while talking to the bride, begins to feel an awkward feeling that he has done something wrong. Hanami in the background is completely indignant and very jealous, although she has not confessed her feelings to him. The monster of the bride, blowing a kiss to the boy, wants to go further to the old man and teach him a lesson for mocking her beloved. Kajuro screams and asks her to stop, since this is his teacher and this is how they train. The girl, Scratching the back of her head and seeing that she is only upsetting her hubby, begins to understand that this is all true and no one is threatening her lover. Kazuro, hearing words of understanding from the bride, begins to sigh with relief. The bride begins to shout to her soldiers to stop attacking the old man and return back to their positions in the forest. The monsters, having heard the orders of the bride and their leader, were very surprised that everything had changed so quickly and they would not be able to kill and devour the old man. The vampire and the monster with the cleaver were puzzled, but they could not argue with the decision of their queen. Director Sota stood surrounded by monsters and heard that Kajuro was negotiating reconciliation with some monster. But the conversation was too frank and with more loving actions. This greatly surprised the director and gave rise to very strange thoughts and questions for the boy in his head. From the director's awkward question about the monster who is so ardently trying to hit on the boy, the bride bursts with emotion and begins to shout at the old man and say that this is her husband and no one should insult and humiliate him. Otherwise, he will have to deal with her. Kajuro tried to calm them all down and stop this whole circus. The girl listened to Kajuro and, clinging to his chest, 
began to ask him to go with her and continue what they started on their wedding night. Kazuro felt awkward and understood that he did not want to deal with the monster, but tried to explain that he still had too much work and training to become a worthy husband. The girl understood everything and, feeling pity and resentment that the boy was again too busy to devote time to her, turns around and, wiping her tears with a handkerchief, goes into the forest with his soldiers and monster generals. While Kajuro was saying goodbye to the monster bride and the rest of the monsters, Director Sota appeared behind him, very angry and not understanding what it was all about. His gaze showed great surprise, and he wanted to teach Kazuro a lesson again. The boy felt the director's cold, piercing gaze on him and was very frightened, feeling the sweat on his face. Director Soda begins to use his abilities and suggests intensifying the training. He exuded a strong, magical aura and showed incredible abilities in his abilities. He summons another monster with a large shield, which immediately begins to attack Kajuro. Seeing a large shield rushing towards him, the boy manages to jump to the side and dodge the blow of the shield. But the monster was quite a strong and experienced warrior. Seeing that the boy dodged his attack, he immediately used his powerful hand and hit the guy before he expected it. Kajuro, having received such a strong blow, felt that his bones would soon not be able to withstand it and would begin to break from a hail of attacks and unsuccessful attempts to attack Director Soda's monsters. The director, Seeing the guy's condition, decides to stop the training, and, standing with his back to him, tells him to get ready for tomorrow, but for now he can go and rest. Kazuro, sighing heavily from fatigue and pain, realizes that it's finally over, and he can rest. Hanami runs up to Kajuro after hearing that the training is over, and begins to help him come to his senses and get up. She gently begins to wipe his face with a napkin, and tells him that he needs to get a good rest and see a doctor, afraid that there may be more serious injuries. Sarah, laughing and encouraging the boy that he lasted longer than anyone trained by Director Sota, advises spending more time assessing the actions and abilities of the director's monsters and finding an approach to them in order to attack. Kazuro, having heard the advice, thanks Sarah and agrees to look into this issue. Sarah remembers that she was very curious. What kind of monster was it that threw herself so hard into Kazuro's arms and gently whispered all sorts of words into his ear? Kazuro, realizing the awkwardness of the situation, is very surprised and tries in every possible way to avoid answering and not tell the girls what happened to him in the forest when he wanted to test the capabilities of his monster swordsman, saying that she was just an old acquaintance whom he took pity on and did not kill. But in return, she agreed to help fight the monster in the forest, which was greatly bothering her. Sarah started laughing, pretending to believe the boy. Hanami does not understand what is happening and wants to hear a specific answer. Who is this girl for Kazuro, and why did she behave so depravedly with him? Kajuro became very tense and began to think about what to tell her. Kazuro, rubbing the back of his head, begins to say that this is all really true and she just helped him fight a strong monster in the forest. His appearance showed him and proved that the boy did not know how to lie properly. All his attempts to stop this conversation and go to rest were in vain, and the girls won't let him go so easily until they find out the truth. Kazuro says that this was so, and he did not come to her house or spend the night there. Hanami, hearing such words, tells Kajuro that he himself is giving away the information that he hides so much. Sarah begins to tease Kazuro with words. What was he doing in the house with such a beautiful girl, and how did he sleep? Hanami did not yet understand what Sarah was leading to, and simply listened to what Kajuro had to say. Kazuro, realizing that his attempts to lie are only making the situation worse, stands there, biting his tongue and nervously trying not to say anything more, so as not to be driven into a corner even more. Hanami, blushing from guessing, begins to demand that the boy tell everything and not lie to her anymore. Otherwise, she will stop talking to him. Kajuro, seeing Hanami's strong dissatisfaction and Sarah's interested look that she already suspects, decides to tell everything as it happened. He began to tell a long story about how he received the power of the sword from the crypt, where he fainted and then woke up in the infirmary. The director called him to the roof in the evening, where he told him about powerful monsters who could help conclude a contract with the swordsman's monster by letting them kill themselves. 
Kazuro ran cheerfully towards the monsters and came across a vampire, who agreed to take him with him to the house of the bride, who was getting married that evening. The bride was the most powerful monster in the forest, and Kajuro thought that she was the one who could kill him. Once at her house, Kazuro tried to find her and try to provoke her into a fight. Entering the room, he saw a girl with a veil and thought that this was the bride. Raising the veil, he began to ask to fight with him and kill him. The bride began to talk about some ancient traditions and refused to kill the guy, but said that he was now the groom. Kazuro was very frightened and not ready for such a turn, but he could not escape. The bride used her charms and put the boy to sleep, and in the morning he woke up very tired and exhausted. And then he came to the hostel having run away from his bride in the morning and that's it, while the girls stood with their mouths open and tried to understand what the boy told them. Kajuro took advantage of the moment and began to run home to rest and get some sleep. He waved to the girls and said goodbye to them, wishing them good night. The girls were very puzzled, but Sarah began to tell Hanami that Kajuro clearly experienced new sensations from that evening, but did not remember since he was passed out. Hanami stood with her eyes wide open and didn't quite understand what Sarah was hinting at. After thinking a little, Hanami became very angry and began shouting after Kajuro so that he would come back and tell her the truth about that evening. She was very worried that Kajuro had already found a girlfriend and even a monster with whom he probably had something. Kazuro ran to the dorm and smilingly said that if he didn't remember anything, then nothing had happened. Let them not worry or worry about the monster's girl. She herself knows that nothing will work out with a person. This only surprised Hanami more, and she was filled with different thoughts that she already thought that Kajuro was married to a monster. Hanami stood a little saddened and blushed with shame that she could think very scary things for her related to Kajuro and that monster girl. Sarah stood nearby and began to hint to Hanami to tell the boy about her feelings for him in order to resolve this issue and not worry anymore. Meanwhile, Kajuro had already reached the dorm building. It was already late evening, and many of the students were already asleep. Kazuro went up to his floor, went to the door, and began to open it. Entering the room, he notices Poe sitting on the bed and quickly begins to hide something with his hands. Kajuro was a little surprised and asked him what he was doing. Poe, smiling, begins to say that after Kajuro gave him Sarah's number, he thought for a long time about what to write and decided to send one funny photo. Kazuro, thinking for a while, remembers and tells him not to overdo it and throw something unnecessary. Poe reveals that he wrote her declaration of love and desire to meet, describing the feelings that he felt when they first met and saying that he had always dreamed of someone like her. Poe decided not to hesitate and laid out a piece of his body. Kazuro, hearing that Poe didn't understand what he was doing, asked to urgently delete it. Otherwise, he would have big problems tomorrow. He felt that Poe did not know how to hit on girls and therefore gave him a completely different number. Poe sat with a very concerned look and waited for Sarah to write to him, not suspecting that Kajuro had set him up and given him a completely different number. There was a package of napkins next to him, and Kazuro decided to go to the bathroom to take a shower without seeing what could be disgusting. Suddenly, Poe receives a message from the one he loves so much. It was Director Sota's number, and he sent a response in the form of the same photo, which greatly upset Poe. He sat in horror for now, not realizing that Kajuro had played such a joke on him. Kazuro was at the shower table, and while washing himself, he heard Poe's screams and his disappointment that Kazuro gave him the director's number. Kajuro laughed with all his might and realized that this was the best joke of his life. With nervously shaking hands, I tried to delete the correspondence and photo, but they had already been viewed and it was in vain. Poe began to write words of apology and make excuses so that he would not be punished tomorrow for such a mistake in front of the director. Poe was so scared that, remembering that it was Kazuro who gave him the number, he started screaming very loudly and swearing at Kazuro, throwing his phone on the floor and making a lot of noise in the dorm. Khan woke up from Poe's strong screams and grabbed his sword, thinking that monsters had attacked and thinking of intervening and helping repel the attack. His gaze, 
full of determination to action, showed to attack the monster. But when he saw an irritated Poe throwing his phone in all directions and shouting all sorts of nasty things towards Kazuro, he was surprised. Meanwhile, Kazuro, while washing in his soul, felt great pleasure from such a joke on Poe. And realizing that it was too early for him to start relationships with girls like her, he decided to give the director's number, but did not even imagine what it would lead to. The next morning, Kajuro decided to go up to the roof and upgrade his monster's skills and prepare for the evening's training with director Sota. Kajuro summoned his chainsaw monster and decided to improve its attack skills first. Using his stones that he collected from competitions between universities, Kajuro begins to absorb their power into the chainsaw monster, raising its level and strengthening its skills. The monster with the chainsaw began to feel a strong increase in strength and power that his desire to kill only intensified, and with joy he began to scream loudly and enjoy such power. The loud screams of the monster woke up some of the guys and Khan, unable to bear such noise in the morning, decided to go out onto the balcony and find out who it was on the roof screaming so loudly. He was very angry because he wanted to sleep and relax before studying after the competition. Han, seeing that it was Kajuro with his monster, was very surprised and did not know how to react. Kajuro apologized for the noise and promised that it would not happen again. Khan pretended to believe it, agreed, and went back to bed, realizing that none of this would most likely work out. Kazuro approached his monster and asked him not to scream so much anymore, since there were a lot of people here who needed to rest. The monster, sensing an awkward situation, agrees and tries to remain calm. Kajuro continued to imbue the monster with his monster power stones and increase the attack stats of the chainsaw monster. The monster, absorbing the power, became a little larger and more ferocious. After strengthening the chainsaw monster to its maximum levels, it reached a new level of strength and became quite a strong opponent for Director Sota's monsters, Kazuro thought. After such an enhancement, Kajuro absorbs it back and thinks about who to improve next, assessing his strength and abilities in battle. Kajuro begins to remember and imagine what battle strategies he should use and what he might need in battle. He decides to improve the performance of a powerful sword in order to improve his abilities as a swordsman and better strike and block attacks from monsters. Strengthening will require quite a lot of power stones, but fortunately, Kazuro had plenty of them. Kazuro, having strengthened the abilities of the sword, began to feel a greater surge of strength and a more tense and muscular body. Such a sword was capable of strengthening its owner visually and physically. He notices slight changes in his body, increased muscle mass and better sword skills, Kajuro thinks that these are very good reinforcements and will allow him to fight back against Director Soda's monster. Testing his abilities, Kazuro notices that the sword in his hands began to feel lighter and the blows became faster and stronger. He could now better control his body while wielding such a sword. After strengthening some of his monsters that needed it most, Kajuro decided to go back to his room and get ready for the evening's training. He walked with a light and relaxed gait feeling that now he would have a chance to win. Finally, it was time for training, and Kazuro showed up after school to fight. He wanted to demonstrate to Director Sota his new abilities, and that his training had not been in vain to prove that he had enough strength to fight the head of the absorbers. The director immediately points his finger at Kajuro and begins to tell him to prepare for battle. Today it will be much more serious and dangerous than yesterday. Kajuro, Having heard such words, was a little scared, but he was not going to wonder and was preparing for this. The director lights a cigarette before the fight and gives final instructions to Kajuro so that he prepares for the fight and uses his skills with dignity. Kajuro, having learned his lesson from yesterday's training, was ready to fight Director Sota's monsters. The director began to tell the boy that he was still too young and inexperienced to fight with the head of security and it could take years of training for him to show a worthy fight. And the director will have to see that the boy is really ready for such a fight in order to let him go. The director quite seriously said that the head of the Absorbers is very dangerous and owns very strong monsters. He is capable of defeating many Absorbers alone. Kajuro must work hard and prove to director Sota that he is worthy 
and will not die in the first minutes of the fight. Kajuro looked quite determined and asks the teacher not to cut him any slack and to fight him for real. Only then will he feel the real combat experience and prepare for the fight with the head of the absorbers, Kento. The director, having heard the boy's request, agrees, feeling that the boy was preparing and drew conclusions from yesterday's battle. He begins to use his abilities and summon his monsters. It was a writer's monster that already looked quite formidable, since its characteristics were not cut down, but were completely ready for a fight with Kajuro. He was already ready to write down spells for battle in his book and use them without a twinge of conscience. The second monster was a skeleton with a scythe. His eyes glowed menacingly and were determined to attack. The fighting abilities of such a monster were at the highest level and alone were capable of destroying an entire army of monsters. And the third monster was a monster with a shield that was capable of demolishing opponents at great speed without receiving damage due to the power of the shield, which could not be penetrated. Director Sota was determined to show Kajuro what his monsters were capable of and to test how long the boy could hold out after being attacked by such monsters. Kajuro tensed a little but did not show fear, but proudly rolled up his sleeve and began to summon his monsters to fight. His only concern was that if he trained poorly, he would not be able to kill the head of the absorbers soon and would waste time. The battle began, and both groups of monsters rushed to attack. Kajuro, calling on his sword, also ran into the attack and was ready for the abilities of Director Sota's monsters, since he already knew them all by heart. This will be an exciting fight that will show how much Kajuro has grown in his abilities.